Buried. Book One in the Underground Series. Written by Kennedy Plum. Narrated by Devin Barrington. Prologue. It all goes downhill from here. My father is pacing back and forth in the kitchen. There is a bulging duffel bag sitting by the back door. His eyebrows are creased worriedly. He keeps checking his watch. What is he waiting for? Mom is pretending to cook dinner in the kitchen to cover up the fact that she is crying. She keeps one hand on her protruding belly, protectively, lovingly stroking the growing life inside. She's due in a couple months. Girl. The TV in the living room is on low volume, but I can make out pieces of what the reporter is saying. Los Angeles. Orlando. New York City. Images flash of what were once giant cities, now reduced to a piles of rubble and ashes. What were once golden with life are now gray with destruction. It scares me to watch, but I can't tear my eyes away. A pit grows in my stomach as I imagine what my house would look like under all those ashes. Executive Order 153 will continue to be enforced. Phoenix was just announced as the next region to be... My dad switches off the TV with the remote, cutting off the reporter's words. No one will tell me what's going on. Everything has been different ever since they took me out of school. My best friend Frankie down the street doesn't know a thing either. But he says his family is moving back to Denver soon. He says things are getting weird at his house too. All I know is they've been keeping something from me for months. Something big. At night, when they think I've gone to bed, I can hear them talking at the kitchen table. I hear whispers of, They can't do this. And, The children. But not enough bits and pieces to understand. No one will tell me anything. They think I'm just a kid, but I'm almost nine. I'm big enough to handle it. Dad stops pacing and comes over to the kitchen table where I'm sitting. He gets on one knee so his eyes are level with mine and looks at me severely. Listen to me very closely, Samuel. I lower my eyes so he can't see how scared I am. I'm ashamed of the knot forming in my throat. I try to gulp it down. He puts his hand on my shoulder and forces me to look into his eyes. I don't have much time, he whispers. Are you leaving us? My voice sounds small and afraid no matter how much I wish it sounded big and brave. My eyes well up with tears, stinging around the edges, but I bite the inside of my lip until I taste blood so they don't fall. I am surprised to see my dad's dark eyes brim with tears too, sliding down his face like melting snowflakes. I've never seen my father cry before. I wish someone would just tell me what's going on. Sam, you have to understand. I have no choice, he says, his voice cracking. I have a new job now. We all do. Bad things have been happening and we have to stop it. You have to promise me you'll take care of your mother and sister while I'm gone. That you'll keep your sister safe. You have to be the man of the house now. Do you understand? I can't fight back the tears any longer. I splutter out my insistence in between sobs, begging him to stay begging him to at least just tell me why. There are cars approaching, tires screeching, doors slamming, boots on gravel. I sniff, wiping my tears with the back of my hand. Sam, please, promise me. Promise me you'll take care of them. Dad's voice raises with a new urgency as he hears the group approach the house. It feels like my chest is caving in, my throat so tight that the words can't escape. I jump at the loud knock, knock, knock at the front door. Henry James Carmichael, open up! We are an escort team from the United States Federal Pursuance Agency. We're here to take you to headquarters under Executive Order 153. My dad stands slowly and gives my mom a bereaved look. She pulls me in close behind her as four large uniformed men enter our kitchen. They surround my dad quickly on all sides trapping him inside the circle of burly soldiers. My eyes widen upon noticing the black assault rifles they have strapped onto their backs and the rows of ammo on their belts. 
Dad, who are these people? The biggest uniformed man shakes hands with my dad. I'll give you exactly one minute to say your goodbyes, he says gruffly. The circle around my dad opens, allowing him to approach us one last time. He goes to my mom first, with tears in his eyes. She clings to him desperately, her arms tight around his neck. They share a long kiss. My throat tightens. Dad whispers, I love you to the moon, Annie. And back a thousand times, my mom replies. Her voice is no louder than a breath. Her syllables choppy. Dad kneels down and kisses her belly, a wordless goodbye to his only daughter. He turns to me, but I look away, trying to hide the fresh, hot tears. I want to scream at him. How can you just leave us like this? How can you say you love us and then leave? But all I can manage to say is, Please don't go. He smiles a sad smile. I'll be back before you know it, Sammy. But something about his expression betrays the doubt behind that promise. He pulls me in close. I can feel his beard tickling my neck, his breath against my cheek. I don't want to let go. If I do, he'll be gone. No more water fights in the blazing summer sun. No more batting practice after sunset. No more wrestling before bed. He always lets me win. Time's up, Carmichael, the uniform man says. I wish in this moment I was bigger so I could reach the man's eyes and tear them out. I hate him with a burning passion. Why is he doing this to us? Why is he ruining our family? I love you, buddy. My dad squeezes one last time before letting go. Remember the promise I asked you to make? Carmichael, we're on a tight schedule. I'm not going to tell you again. The men surround my dad again suddenly, and one grabs his arm, ushering him firmly out the door and toward their big, black SUV. Wait, please, Dad begs. I'll come with you just, please, one more minute. When Dad tries to shake free of the firm hold, his hands are bound tightly behind his back. His boots scrape across the gravel, rocks spraying in all directions as he struggles. Despite his efforts to break their grasp, they remain in stoic control. They are too strong. They've won. I look up at Mom with a voiceless plea. Do something! I beg her silently. She looks down at me with a silent, defeated reply, a look that tells me we have lost. I start to run over to him, but Mom holds me back. I try desperately to shake free from her grasp. Just one more hug. Just one more minute. You can't do this! My screams sound childish, broken, drowned out by the brisk autumn winds. Mom puts a firm hand over my mouth, shushing into my ear gently, but holding me tightly. They shove him into the car, the doors locking him in from the outside. I can hear Dad banging on the doors, his yells muffled by the thick, dark windows. I fall down onto my knees, crying out for him. Mom pulls me into her chest, her quiet sobs mix with her soothing coos. It's okay, baby. We'll be okay. Another one of the men approaches us. Mrs. Carmichael. Doctor, sir. Doctor Carmichael. My mom interrupts coolly. His eyes flash impatiently. Doctor Carmichael. He corrects, waving to her belly. You have exactly seven days after the baby's born to self-report to Phoenix HQ, or we'll be back. My mom's body tenses. Sir, my last C-section took five weeks to recover from. I could barely walk. From a medical standpoint, I... I don't make the rules. He spins around on his heel without further comment and piles into the SUV with the others. I remain curled up in my mother's arms, the gravel digging into my legs like little knives as we grieve the present and fear the future.
Her grip was tightened on my shoulders protectively, as if on cue. My unborn sister gives a feeble kick against my ribs from inside my mother's bulging belly, prompting me to remember my father's last words to me. It is here on my knees, on the sharp rocks of our driveway, in the arms of my mother, that I make a silent vow. I promise, Dad, I'll take care of them. Message from the President, Executive Order 153. What a horrific year we have suffered here in the United States of America. This year will live on forever as the darkest year our country has ever seen. Millions of our fellow Americans have fallen because of attacks of cruelty and savagery. These continued acts of war will not go unnoticed. The deaths of our loved ones will not go unanswered. To our beloved fallen Americans who remained loyal to their country to the very end, your deaths will not be in vain. This act of terrorism will not stand. In light of these recent events, new measures have to be taken for the few but steadfast remaining citizens of this country. The United States will remain strong, a country of freedom and prosperity. In order to maintain this freedom, as supported by and enforced by our new military, the Federal Pursuance Agency, all men and women living as citizens of the United States of America between the ages of 18 and 65 are required by law to register for the FPA and will be regionally drafted for involuntary military deployment beginning on October 1st of this year. Non-compliance with this mandate is considered a capital offense and will be punished accordingly. In light of treason that has taken place by our own citizens in recent years and caused this needless violence, it is the duty of all American citizens to honor those who have lost their lives due to that violence and to ensure no more violence continues. Civilians now have the opportunity to protect their families and to serve a generous and forgiving government so this great country may live in liberty. All underage, elderly, and disabled civilians will be left to the safe care of the U.S. government. To be protected from further attacks of war, both foreign and domestic, and from the grotesque effects of radiation, they will be granted access to government-sanctioned homesteads underground, where they will receive the promise of safety and a good life because of the noble sacrifice of their loved ones and the generosity of our country's leadership. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand this first day of February, in the year of our Lord, 2038. Signed, Marvin A. Walker. Chapter 1. Is this a nightmare, or just my real life? 2,922 days since I've seen the sun. Every month or so I count up the days to stay sane and angry. Keeps me grounded. Or I guess, under-grounded, if you want to get literal. I wipe a bead of cold sweat off my forehead as I try to forget the details of the dream I have just awoken from. The nightmares come every night. Or at least they have for as long as I can remember. Memories mixed with fear and pain, tangled up in a web of the past. Some nights are worse than others, and this one was particularly unforgiving. My eyes wander across the steel ceiling, which is a little more than an arm's reach away from where I lie. I'm lucky enough to be assigned to the top bunk in our quarters, where I get to be worried every night I'll roll right off the edge. But maybe that would be a better end than literally freezing to death. At least it'd be quicker. Put me out of my misery. A shiver runs down my spine and remains relentlessly deep in my bones. A chill I can't ever escape from. The layers I have on do nothing to provide warmth against this cold. And it's not even winter yet. It doesn't help that the steel walls trap the freezing temperatures inside and seem to multiply its extremity. Growing up in Arizona definitely didn't prepare me for this. Or really anything for that matter. We were in what, like, 48th place out of 50 for quality of education? No one ever says, Yeah, the education I received in Arizona really set me up for success in the real world. Not that they could have possibly known that this is what the real world would be like, but still. Our recorders are pitch black except for the dim light emitting from our wall tabs, which are mounted securely next to our heads. All this does is cast eerie shadows across the surrounding steel walls. A reminder that I'm not actually being buried alive as much as it may feel like it. 
I hear a family of rats squeaking nearby, reminding us that we are the intruders here. I got used to the constant muffled smell of soggy dirt a long time ago, but sometimes on especially cold nights, my senses pick up on it again. Yum. Time. I whispered to my wrist tab, careful not to wake everyone else up. I finger the cold metal absent-mindedly as a red 5:12 a.m. blinks brightly on the small screen until I dismiss it with a flick. Still, a couple hours until check-in. Wages. I'm afraid to know the answer. 45 RP blinks three times. I sigh. Barely enough ration points for the day. I readjust my pillow and try to push the images from my most recent nightmare out of my head, begging my subconscious to let me go back to sleep. My sister Ella mumbles in her sleep on the bunk beneath me, her sleep apparently just as restless as mine. Sam? She reaches out her hand, disoriented. Sam, where are you? I'm right here, don't worry. Go back to sleep. I reach down, squeeze her hand reassuringly, and she drifts back to sleep. If it weren't for Ella, I would have given up a long time ago. She's all I have left. She would never admit it, but I know she gets nightmares too. Her imagination is too active for her own good, and all the stories people tell around the zone don't help. I try to avoid talking about how we came to be here in C9, at all costs. A few years ago was when she first started asking the questions. Questions about the underground. The war. About the executive order. Where do babies come from? Our parents. If they were out there somewhere. Let's just say I may have let her believe in the best possible reality about that last one there. A fictional reality. I was too big of a coward to tell her the whole truth. Recently, she has stopped bringing it up, but I know her colorful imagination. Trust me, I know it's wrong to let her believe a lie, to just not talk about her parents. But she's only eight years old. She's not ready to know the truth. Let her be a child a little longer, for God's sake. But, if we're being honest, the truth is, I think I'm just not ready. I'm not ready for Ella to know the truths. I failed my father's last wish. I couldn't protect them. I'm a giant mega coward, etc., etc. But even still, I know that's no excuse to lie. Brother of the year right here, folks. I jumped down off my top bunk, my legs brushing against the cold metal frame on the way down. I carefully pull the blanket up around Ella's shivering body hoping I won't wake her. I saved up my ration points for two months so I could buy her a thermal blanket for her birthday. I told her it was a birthday gift from our roommates. She doesn't have to know I skipped lunch every day to save up. She would just feel guilty. She gets a better night's sleep now, which makes her less grouchy in the mornings, so I call that a win. I climb the ladder of the bunk quietly up to my bed and wrap my thin, scratchy blanket tightly around me, making myself into an icy burrito. I try to not think about how bone-chilling cold it is. I imagine myself on an island, lying on the beach. I try to feel the sand between my fingers and the sun drowning me in an inescapable warmth. I think comforting, warm thoughts until I slowly drift back to sleep. Okay, this one's an actual nightmare. I am standing in the middle of an empty, gray room. The room is familiar, somewhat nostalgic, but something is missing. Something is wrong. A woman screams, a piercing sound that penetrates my very soul. A desperate, agonized scream that rattles the windows and structure of the empty, gray room. I turn around frantically, trying to find an exit, to find the source of the scream, but everywhere I go, I am lost. Trapped. My vision is blurred and distant, like a thick mist is fogging my eyes. Blood is covering my hands, dripping off of my palms like thick honey seeping from a honeycomb. Her screams for help get louder and more urgent. Sam! There's no time! You have to help me! 
I try to yell back to reassure her that I'm here, but my voice is soundless. Something grips my vocal cords, holding back sound, no matter how hard I try to scream. The gray room is closing in on me, smothering me from all sides, getting narrower and narrower. I fall to my hands and knees, leaving bloody handprints on the white carpet as I crawl toward the window. The screams are at their loudest, desperate, pained, filling my eardrums until they are about to burst. My heart fills with a hopeless panic as the room closes in around me in a final suffocating moment. I faintly hear a baby crying in the distance as the room devours me. Chapter 2 The Roomies and the Good for Nothings Chief's screams coming through the intercom wake me with a start. Rise and shine, you lazy good-for-nothings! Residual panic from my nightmares still encompasses me. My heart thuds rapidly in my chest. The buzzing of the alarm on my wrist tab isn't helping my heart rate either. The steady pulsing vibrations send an uncomfortable tickle up my arm and all the way up to my neck. I eye the steel walls around me suspiciously and shudder, trying to shove the suffocating feeling from that nightmare out of my mind as I dismiss the alarm on my wrist with a flick. I toss my pillow at Ella's face to wake her up, and she groans. How she always manages to sleep through Chief's daily wake-up call is beyond me. I jump down off the edge of the bunk bed quickly and try to stretch out the soreness on my neck as I wave my wrist in front of my personal effects closet. The others are already up and in routine. We share our quarters with two other siblings. There used to be six of us, but we've had two empty beds ever since the twins Rosie and Reggie aged out. I reminisce sometimes about having my own room back at home. We've lived together so long now, though, that it's hard to remember what personal space even feels like. Teo yawns next to me, lacing up his boots sleepily, and Eddie makes faces at Ella as she wakes up. She punches him hard in the arm, and he laughs, continuing to mock her, but keeps a noticeable distance now after the punch. Teo's full name is Mateo Alejandro Francisco Barajo Galindo. I like calling him that every so often to mess with him, but we mostly just call him Teo. He's 15, about a year and a half younger than me. He and his nine-year-old brother Eddie checked in not long after we did and have roomed with us in M quarters since then. Yeah, we didn't have the greatest relationship at first. When they first moved in, they didn't know much English. For almost a year, they only spoke to each other in Spanish. They basically ignored us. I'll admit it made me mad, and I may have caused a few fights over it. I felt like they weren't even trying. That they didn't even want to communicate with us at all. Things were so tense all the time, and having to do charades to relay information was getting old. Chief loved the language barrier. It gave him an excuse to pick on them mercilessly. Every day he was getting in Tio's face, telling him to speak English or leave America, and punishing him because he didn't understand orders and couldn't react fast enough. I tried to stand up for him when I could, but it was hard to take penalties for him all the time when he obviously didn't even want to be my friend. The tables really turned for our room when I found out a Spanish-to-English dictionary at the library. Full honesty, I had never actually been into the library before that. Never saw the point. But I was meeting a girl there. Turns out it's not so bad there after all. They laughed at me so hard when I tried to formulate my first sentence in Spanish. I really butchered it. But after they were done making fun of me, they helped me with my pronunciation. Every night from then on, before we went to bed, we would work on it together. Rosie and Reggie weren't interested in participating positively. But they listened in every so often and made fun of us all the time from their bunks. With a lot of pointing, hand gestures, charades, and sketches, we began to teach each other words in both languages. They would teach us how to say something in Spanish, and we would pronounce it for them in English. Eventually. It got easier to communicate, and our friendship with them really progressed. I sometimes forget now that they didn't know much English in the beginning. 
Every so often, they talk in Spanish to each other when they want to make fun of me without me knowing what they're saying. But I know enough words now to get the gist, and I usually award them a vulgar gesture or pillow to the face in response. I slide my night clothes off and toss them into the chute. Crossing my fingers, I don't get assigned to laundry services today. Good morning, Samuel, my PEC says routinely as the metal doors slide open with a clank. I programmed it to sound like a British woman as a joke a few years ago, but I ended up liking the way her good mornings sound. So it stuck. And now, Rhonda and me, we're tight. I like to picture her as a hot, older librarian lady who would tell me to shush in British if I was being too loud. I'd visit the library more often for you, Rhonda. A fresh pair of folded common clothes has replaced the ones I dirtied yesterday. I pull them on over my shivering body. Gray long sleeve, gray canvas work pants, gray coat. They never seem to get my size right. These ones are too baggy. The frigid air invades the loose space in the uniform, biting my forearms and sides. I try to remember the unbearable Phoenix summer heat I once had to endure every year. Somehow it doesn't seem so unbearable now. What I wouldn't give for a little bit of that sunshine right now. My PEC doesn't hold many things of importance. Just a few sentimental items I was able to smuggle in. A raggedy baseball glove, and an old photograph. In the photo, my dad is younger than I remember him. He lacks the worry in his eyes, the gray in his beard. He is mid-laugh. His demeanor is youthful and carefree. I am a baby here, sitting pleasantly on his lap. My mom is seated next to us, her head resting on dad's shoulder. She looks at us as if the entire world were gift-wrapped in front of her. Chief's voice comes on over the screeching intercom again, reminding us we are worthless, slow, lazy, etc., and that we have exactly three minutes to get our ugly butts to check in before punctuality. I finish making my bed hastily, tucking the blanket in tightly around the thin mattress, making sure it's up to standard. It's not an easy feat for us top bunkers, but I do my best. I quite literally have to push Ella out the door and pray we will get to check in on time. The three family quarters, L, M, and N, are the farthest from the square, so it takes us even longer to get there than everyone else. I break out into a jog, pulling Ella with me, who groans and complains the whole way. Believe it or not, this current grouchiness level is progress. Thank you, thermal blanket gods. Other zoners are making their way hastily towards the square, each sporting their gray work clothes and their nervous expressions for what the day will hold. It's not particularly bright outside yet, but it's blinding in comparison to the near darkness we prefer in our room. The overhead lights installed into the steel top shell of the underground are programmed to follow the light of the sun and the moon. It's currently set to early morning autumn light. Street lamps that line the spidering pathways throughout the zone also reinforce the schedule of light. Their dull orange glow is dim right now, but by midday, they will be at their brightest. I use my hand as a shield, but the light still burns my tired eyes. I squint, careful to not trip over myself or Ella as we jog across the gravel pathway. Even after all this time here, I still forget the distance and the time it takes to get the check-in from our quarters. You'd think by now, I'd be used to the half-marathon I have to travel to get there every day. Not really. But when you're basically still asleep, that's what it feels like. I've heard C9 is the second largest common zone in the underground, but who can be sure? I've never been to any of the others. We're not allowed to leave, like frickin' inmates. Common zones are where they keep all the nothings. You can buy your way into the elite zones if you're important enough, or rich enough. But Ella and I, obviously, are neither. It's dangerously close to the start of punctuality, so I break into an all-out sprint towards Central Square and have to drag Ella behind me. The square is the main part of the town, which includes Town Hall, the nursery, the mess hall, 
the hospital, the school, and the various function buildings. We pass a few parks on the way to the square, and I smirk, as I always do, when I see them. The parks are just small lots in between various quarters with green turf and playgrounds that resemble the ones in horror movies where the swing and the merry-go-round always creak eerily. They thought, I'm guessing, that by putting in these pathetic parks, it would feel less like an underground summer camp from hell and more like an uptown suburban neighborhood. Great job, guys. Solely because of these parks, I almost forgot I'm a hostage in a prison cell called C9. Sorry. I also get a little cranky in the mornings. The living quarters surround the central square in circular layers, and the farther away from the square you live, the less of a priority you are. So as you can probably guess, the mayor, chief, and the guards are front and center. Their four quarters comprise the first circular layer around the square. Not only are they closest to the square, but they are also bigger and significantly nicer. Each steel cabin is spacious and private, each with a front porch and balcony. I've never seen the inside of their quarters, but I've heard rumors they are elite zone quality. Which doesn't surprise me, our zone leadership is pretty self-important. The next circular layer is out for the elders. Not that they're a priority, they just can't walk as far without breaking a hip or something. We don't see much of the elders because they are kept busy in the nursery, taking care of the babies and toddlers who are too young to be useful. Sometimes, on days where karma is out to get me, I'll be assigned to function of elder assistance. I hate old people, so this task is a severe punishment for me. They just smell like death and Vaseline, and they never shut up about the good old days. The rest of the layers are the living quarters, in alphabetical order back toward the families. We're the kids that still have some family left, so they keep us herded together. The other slabs of metal, supposed to pass as cabins, are for the kids that don't have anyone left. The street lights flicker eerily beside us as we approach the square. All of our fellow zoners are already waiting in line behind the R2-D2 looking machine that we call BART, big annoying robot thing. BART checks us in, takes our points for meals and extra privileges, assigns us our daily functions, and pays us our wages. We step in formation just as Chief arrives to check punctuality, followed closely by the other guards who hold their weapons in front of them, tightly, a constant reminder of what they're authorized to do if you step too far out of line. They harass some of the kids toward the front of the formation, pushing around a couple and insulting a couple others. Chief's insults have a lot to do with people's mothers today, which means he's in an especially bad mood. Great, I can already tell it's going to be an awesome day. The Elite Zones for Dummies. Only slightly more helpful. E1, the party zone. For hotshot celebrities and kids of billionaires. They avoid the draft by filming cheesy propaganda to keep up morale in the common zones. While we work, slash suffer all day, they are burdened with having too much fun all the time. E2. The money zone. Not just people who are well off. This is the money money. They avoided the draft by paying a heavy tax that helped finance the underground. Funny how they can just keep on making money, even down here. E3. The feds. The home of our beloved government. The people who started this war get to be nice and cozy. Must be nice to live in cushy safety while sending people away to do the dirty work for you. Chapter 3 If Soggy Bran Flakes Were a Food Group Somebody's cutting it close again! My buddy Foster hisses from a few zoners up as Chief is screaming in some blonde's face in the front. I shrug in response. Foster worries about everything. That's just how he is. Just by looking at him, you'd think he was born down here, with his super pale skin and red hair, but he's been here just as long as I have. He gets twitchy when he's stressed out, which is most of the time. If you can see his eyes behind his black-rimmed glasses, they're usually darting around nervously, anticipating trouble. He's always there to remind me when I'm being an idiot, which is often, 
I'll admit. As a result of the frequent idiocy, I'm a frequent flyer to the penalty podium. So his worry isn't exactly unwarranted. What I can say, sometimes my sarcastic tongue just gets the better of me. I'm usually tagged for insubordination or questioning authority, but mostly because Chief hates me. Always has. Nothing to warrant expulsion, much to Chief's dismay. Just frequent penalties and harassment from the guards. They can't get rid of me that easy. But overall, I really do try to behave and keep my head down, because I remember what they did to the real rebellious ones in the beginning. I shudder as I remember the first few months at the zone. The elders who put up a fight when they realized they had purposely been put in a different zone than their grandkids. The zoners who refused to comply. I've been trying to get that image out of my head for eight years now. All I can say is luckily I got here at a much younger age because who knows how current 16-year-old me would have behaved back then. Chief makes his way down the line, passes us, and rips away a senior from D quarters, who stumbled into line just after we did. No, 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 I was here on time, I swear! He splutters wildly as Chief tosses him over to the guards. They throw him onto the penalty podium for his public punishment, and I glance at Ella, relieved it's not me this time. She makes a gesture across her forehead in response, sharing my relief. Chief's sudden bellow behind me makes me nearly pee my pants. Carmichael, I see you can't be bothered to follow orders today. I turn to protest. I wasn't. Before I know it, I'm in motion and my face is digging into the gravel pathway. His heavy boot pushes on the back of my neck so hard so I'm forced to eat a mouthful of dirt. The rocks and dirt particles crunch through my teeth. First you break formation, and then you backtalk me? Sounds to me like you're begging for a penalty, Carmichael. Is that right? Maybe it's the mouthful of dirt talking, or the lack of sleep I got last night, but the sarcasm slips through my teeth before I even think about it. Yes, please sir, I'd love nothing more. He squats down low so his mouth is closer to my ear. His voice is low and threatening. Watch your mouth, boy. You have a lot more to lose here than I do, and I'd love nothing more than to watch you lose everything. He kicks my shoulder blade for good measure before sauntering down the line to give someone else a hard time. I stay on my belly for a second longer, mostly out of pride, but also to spit out all the dirt from my mouth without anyone seeing. I hop to my feet, and Ella looks over her shoulder with a worried expression. I shrug it off, giving her a smooth smile and foster a casual wink. I only massage the new bruise forming on my neck when they look away. Guess my brain slept in today. That was way too close. I step forward as the line begins to move, the taste of mud still on my tongue, as people are allowed to begin checking in for the day. I guess that's how they make sure none of us run away, although it doesn't stop the occasional idiot from trying anyway. They make it seem so easy to escape. Electric gates you can't actually see, so you question whether they actually exist. Wide open planes around us. Unsupervised time before curfew. But everyone knows it's a trap. Escape attempts are basically suicide. So usually zoners only try when that's an outcome they're ready for, anyway. Luckily, having Ella mostly keeps me away from imaginings like that. But some of the others aren't so lucky. A young girl a few zoners up is whispering down the line in a frenzy, but discreetly so as not to be heard by the chief. Has anyone seen Zoe? Miner from A quarters? I haven't seen her since check-in yesterday. Anyone? No one responds, so I shrug and offer my apologies. She looks like she might cry, but everyone just shuffles into the cafeteria, ignoring her completely. She gives up and heads through the door. I feel bad, but there's nothing we can do. She'll turn up one way or another. It's my turn to check in. I hover my wrist tab under Bart's scanner. Samuel, Carmichael, Senior... He says in his computer-generated monotone voice, not nearly as friendly as my buddy Rhonda. 
I select on the screen what Ella and I want for breakfast. Bran flakes, all we can afford right now. It deducts 14 RP from my total, and I'm on my way inside. Since I'm her guardian, her wages and deductions automatically go to my account. When she turns 12, she'll be responsible for her own finances. My bet is she'll probably spend all of her RP on bacon, within the first day. Ella's confirmation rings behind me. Ella, Carmichael, Minor. As I'm heading inside the noisy mess hall, I ask my wrist tab what my function for the day is. An animation of dancing washers and dryers with smiley faces on them plays on the screen. Laundry. Great. I jinxed it. But at least it's not elder assistance. I'm not in the mood for that kind of torture today. What do you have today? I ask Ella, who is now caught up to me. We wait in line in front of the dispenser to get our bran flakes. My stomach growls as I smell the eggs and pancakes some zoners are enjoying around us. World history, she says dryly, still waking up. You know, the time before the whole world started blowing each other up. Since she's a minor, she has classes every day instead of a job. Once you reach seniority at age 12, you're expected to contribute to the zone by fulfilling a daily function. I'm a senior, but I'm getting closer to major age. At 18, they send you off to who knows where to do who knows what for what's left of the military, or should I say, the Federal Pursuance Agency, FPA, as they insist on being called. Teo and I joke that FPA stands for something else, but it's not appropriate to say in front of the children. We wave our wrists at the dispenser and it spits out packaged bowls of bran cereal with two small cartons of milk. Ella doesn't complain, but I apologize anyway, wishing I could afford to get her a decent breakfast. She pretends not to hear me. We take our seats in our usual spots next to Foster, Teo, and Eddie. Ella and Eddie immediately start whispering mischievously. They like to pull pranks on their poor, unsuspecting roommates. As a reminder, by poor, unsuspecting roommates, I mean Teo and me. We are the poor, unsuspecting roommates. Just last month, they lit a New Year's Eve firework they had somehow acquired and threw it into the sanitation center right as the door sealed shut for my shower. So picture this. There I was, minding my own business, trying to relax with a nice shower after a long workday, when all of a sudden, I'm getting lit up like it's the 4th of July. Luckily, the walls are thick enough that they didn't hear me screaming like a little girl. I still have burns on my manhood from the incident. Literally and metaphorically. What you got today, Sam? Teo asks in between shallows of oatmeal. Laundry. You? They got me and Foster in the parks today, man. He replies with a sly grin. Everyone knows park maintenance is the easiest function. Lucky. Foster eyes my bran flakes and gives me a look like, really, this trash again? He tears his bacon strip apart and hands me half. I don't take it at first, but he tosses it onto my plate stubbornly. I know from experience he'd sooner throw that half in the trash than take it back, so I might as well accept it. I split it in half again, throw it to Ella, and nibble on my piece gratefully, savoring every juicy, crunchy bite. Foster and I met on our orientation day when he told me I looked like a half-eaten piece of toast, and I told him he looked like the Lucky Charms leprechaun, and the Easter Bunny had a love child. Best friends ever since. The doctors say he got more radiation than the rest of us. Texas got hit pretty hard. Which is why he's so spazzy all the time. He's my best friend, but I also sometimes feel bad for the guy. He has this delusion his parents are going to come for him someday, and it has kind of become an obsession of his as of late. Some kids still hold on to that hope, and I have nothing against them. I just try to be realistic. Obviously, they're not coming back. If they haven't managed to get blown up somewhere already, they're busy being goons with guns off doing the dirty work upstairs while the government lives comfortably in E3. But for the sake of people like Foster and my sister, I keep these bitter thoughts to myself. 
The mess hall is noisy with the chatter of the rest of the zoners from C9. Light conversation and hesitant laughter, utensils scraping on plates, chairs scraping on off-white linoleum. I'm not feeling particularly sociable today, so I play chess against an anonymous zoner on the table tab absent-mindedly. The brightness of the table surface burns the edges of my eyes a little bit, but I continue anyway, focused on beating my opponent. Next to me, Teo and Foster have started arguing about politics. I stay out of it. They don't like when I get involved anyway, because basically my personal view is life sucks and then you die, so therefore, I never really offer anything constructive to the conversations. So, I'm just saying, Teo says, keeping his voice down, without the red and blue war, we would still be stuck with President Orange Peel in the office, and who knows how much worse off it would be then. Worse off? Foster's expression is incredulous. Worse off, Mateo, do you hear yourself? The Civil War and White House assassinations literally caused World War III. Not to mention destroyed the environment, caused nationwide famine, got several states nuked, and left us with President Crackbucket Walker, who forced us to move under. Am I missing anything? How much worse could it get? Um, are we not alive? Are you not currently breathing right now? They continue arguing, but I tune them out and try not to gag as I force down the rest of my cereal. It tastes like soggy cardboard. After destroying my new chess opponent without much effort, I look up and notice Ella has moved and is now sitting next to a small, inconsolable girl a few tables over, who is sobbing and clawing at her wrist tab. Ella has her arm around the girl's shoulders, soothing her gently, motherly. It's okay. We all have one, see? It only hurts for a few days, I promise. I remember when I got my wrist tab, my first day in C9. I tried for weeks to remove it, horrified at the new implant, and also livid they were tagging me like some kind of criminal. It's a four-hour optional procedure performed during orientation. I found out quickly that optional means you have the option to do it either the easy way or the hard way. During the procedure, the zone surgeon connects the device to your ulnar artery and secures it in place with the surrounding flesh. It's supposedly, scientifically engineered to create oxygen, using a mixture of the underground moisture, our sweat, and the carbon dioxide we exhale. It makes this mixture of chemicals and not only spits it out into the surrounding space, but also injects it into your bloodstream directly, allowing us all to breathe down here. Removing it would not only make you bleed out, but it'll also cause your lungs to implode. That's what they tell us, at least. Teo has this conspiracy theory that they are actually electroshock mechanisms and we are all implanted with them as a means of control and mass torture if necessary. That honestly wouldn't surprise me. I've also heard the theory that instead of injecting oxygen, they're actually injecting drugs into our bloodstream to weaken us and make us subservient. That also wouldn't surprise me. All I know is I'm not going to be the first guy to try to take it off. So it stays. I got angry about it for years, but I don't really think about it now. What's the use? Which is actually kind of the motto I live my whole life by now. What's the use? Ella is still holding the small girl, trying to comfort her by telling her a joke. I can't make out the words, but I'm guessing by the animated gestures and ridiculous facial expressions that it's a good one. Ella's an old soul, so wise and caring for her age. Mostly because, like all the kids down here, she had to grow up way too fast. Looking at her is hard sometimes, especially as she gets older. She looks more and more like mom with every day that goes by. The same long, dark hair with a glint of gold in the right light. The same big eyes, vivid as sapphires, deep like the sea. The same outer ferocity and independence, but with innate kindness and love to the core. Everyone always told me I, on the other hand, am a spitting image of my dad. We have the same sharp jawline, the same pin-straight red-brown hair, the same boring brown eyes and thick eyebrows. 
My mom always said we had the same stubbornness and inarguable need to protect. Same sense of duty and loyalty. I'm sure I am looking more and more like him every day too as I get older. I keep my hair longer than he did though. Kind of in rebellion. Growing up, he'd always make me keep it short so grandpa couldn't accuse me of raising a damned hippie. The noise in the mess hall ceases almost immediately as Chief steps onto the raised platform to deliver the daily announcements. Today's announcements include an introduction to four newcomers and threats to an anonymous zoner that if they don't stop leaving their dirty socks on the steps of the town hall, there will be serious consequences. Chief also informs us of the newly available poll on our wall tabs for Walter West's expulsion trial and encourages us to vote promptly reminding us of the guilty incentive. But of course, we should review the evidence and always remain unbiased. He then steps aside to allow the latest commercial from E1 to play on the projected display hovering just over the wall behind the platform. This one features a hip-hop artist wearing branded clothing, a pretty blonde actress whose face I can't quite place, and that old American Idol host. They're gliding down the streets of E1 in slow motion, along carefully placed pavers, beside perfectly manicured shrubbery and bright gardens that line the sidewalks, holding cans of sponsored soda pop. Sipping. Laughing. Not tripping. I die a little inside at the typical cheesiness, though I can't help but tap my foot along to the catchy beat. The music plays over any sound in the scene, but they are each smiling radiantly, waving at people passing by laughing together in camaraderie. It fades into the FPA message of the week. Stay grateful, stay alive, brought to you by the Federal Pursuance Agency, in partnership with E1. The projection goes dark, and we're all forced to clap. Luckily from this distance, Chief can't tell the difference between my enthusiastic clap and my sarcastic clap. I pair my slow clap with a mocking facial expression one in which I pretend to wipe a tear passionately. We all stand routinely, accompanied by the surround sound symphony of hundreds of chairs scraping on the cafeteria floor as Chief leads us in the pledge. I mouth the words with my hand floppily on my heart, too lazy today to be patriotic. I zone out among the unison chants around me, my stomach still mumbling in dissatisfaction. Bacon. Sausage. Waffles. The siren rings, snapping me out of my food lust haze, signaling it's time to begin our functions. I wave goodbye to Ella and drag my feet toward Town Hall reluctantly. Time to start another day. Chapter 4 Second Breakfast and Broken Noses. I go into autopilot mode as I begin my function with the other zoners assigned to laundry. We spread out among C9, each with a giant laundry hamper on wheels and head to our sections. I decide to start with Town Hall today, hoping desperately I'll avoid confrontation with the mayor if I go early. Unfortunately for me, he seems to like me better than the other zoners, which I'll never understand. I'm barely even pleasant. Try to imagine the most useless man you can possibly imagine, and that's Mayor Ramos. He spends his days at Town Hall being waited on by the daily staff of zoners. They are assigned the task of making his life as carefree as possible. His main responsibilities include have the appearance of authority, occasionally make an example out of an unlucky zoner, once a year congregate with other zone mayors at E3 to discuss current events of the underground, welcome new zoners, and keep up zone morale with quarterly pep rallies about how lucky we are to be chosen for this life underground. For the most part, he spends his days getting fatter and more pathetic. I make my way down the cobblestone pathway lined with young trees to the huge, white building of Town Hall. Two white braided pillars frame the arcway I step through to get to the big oak doors. I wave my wrist tab at the doors in order to be granted access into the large, white building. It lets me in with a beep. The cold air of the hall smacks my face as I step through. I am the only soul in sight, a good sign so far. 
I head toward the kitchen with my laundry hamper. My attempt at being discreet is annihilated by wheels on my mobile hamper that squeak with every rotation. Under my breath, I curse the manufacturer of the hamper for sabotaging my secrecy, the narc wheels, and Bart for assigning me laundry service. I pass the community wall tab on the way to the kitchen. I don't pay much attention to the announcements, as I am still cursing everything associated with laundry. But something catches my eye. I bring my squeaky self to a halt and step backwards to the tab. I touch the lower right corner of the screen so it returns to the previous announcement. A familiar text is displayed in front of me. The blocky letters triggering a wave of old rage. A message from the President of the United States, Executive Order 153. It's been a few years since I've read the original proclamation. Every time I read it, my fists clench and I can feel my blood boiling underneath my skin. An infuriated sweat breaks out on my forehead now as my eyes follow the words of the old proclamation. The culprit. The reason my sister has to grow up having never met the source of her life. The reason children cry for their parents at night after they think everyone else is asleep. The reason 12-year-old kids begin a lifetime of servitude as young as infancy to a government that keeps them prisoner underground. I read it word for word to reinvigorate my hatred for the government and what it has forced upon my life. A country of freedom and prosperity. Oh yeah, I totally feel both free and prosperous locked up down here and orphaned. These words thrust me into a rage-filled daze that holds me hostage in another dimension. Samuel? Samuel Carmichael? A voice startles me back into reality. I am no longer standing, but kneeling on the ice-cold marble floor below the wall tab. The laundry hamper next to me has fallen over onto its side, the wheels still rotating slowly from the force of the fall. Squeak. Squeak. I look up to see the source of the voice and immediately leap to my feet, embarrassed. It's none other than Mayor Ramos himself, all 400 pounds of him. He's dressed in a navy blue suit that must be custom made. The buttons are secured miraculously around his giant waist. His shoes are light brown and appear to be recently shined. His mustache and beard are groomed perfectly and his black hair is greased back neatly. His thick eyebrows wear a concerned expression, his beady eyes staring at me through heavy eyelids. Are you alright, son? He is breathing heavily, as if he walked at an average rate to approach me. Yes, sir. I was just taking a break. I lie. Maybe he won't notice I'm still shaking. You look a bit shaken up. Why don't you come into my office? I have a nice comfy sofa in there that you can rest on. Please, no. Please, anything but that. I want to kick myself for not having better self-control. I can't curse all things laundry this time. This one was all me. I just can't control the rage when I think too much about life down here. Things go best for me when I turn off my brain entirely. He keeps chattering as he ushers me against my will into his office down the hallway, his voice echoing off the minimalistically decorated walls. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid. Why does he have to like me so much? There are plenty of zoners that would love to have his eyes on them. He basically throws me onto the large leather sofa and waves the door closed behind him. It slides shut with a whoosh click. I observe the surprise that he can still fit through the doorway, considering the sheer size of him. He waddles behind his desk and picks up his walkie-talkie, wielding it like some kind of superpower. I'm going to make a call to laundry services. I'll explain to them that I have you on a very important errand, and you'll be unable to complete the remainder of your function today. He winks at me, as if we share some kind of inside joke. Sir, that's very kind of you, it's just... Oh, don't worry, he waves, shutting down my excuses. I'll see to it, you still get your ration points for the day. You've got that lovely sister of yours to take care of. I'll also get a message sent to Mateo. I know what a loyal and concerned roommate he is. Wouldn't want him to worry. How long does he plan on holding me hostage? Why would Mateo worry? 
He makes a muffled call to the elder in charge of laundry services and explains the situation. He smiles at me knowingly as he delivers the excuse. I am still kicking myself mentally for allowing this to happen. I could be stuck in here for hours. Last time this happened, he held me hostage for four hours. Judging by the chipper mood he's in, I can only imagine the kind of torture he has in store for me today. I fidget with my wrist tab uncomfortably and my eyes keep eyeing the door, hoping someone will interrupt us and require the mayor's presence at a very important meeting with other very important people. As if by cue, a small knock comes from outside the office door. My spirits raise, hopeful. Mayor Ramos perks up immediately. Yes, come in. Then to me, I've ordered us a proper breakfast. If he knew I was going to be here for laundry services, maybe it wasn't my fault I got caught after all. Maybe it was just the inevitable of the day. The door swishes open, revealing a small boy, about 12 years old. His white apron and clear gloves signify that his function today is kitchen assistance. He shoots me a quick glare, his eyes accusing me of cozying up to the authority. I'm no kiss-up, but I also won't be disrespected by a child. I send an icy glare his way, reminding him of his place. I shift in my seat bitterly, this being the very reason I hate to be seen with the mayor. I don't want anyone to think I earned what I have by any other means than with my own two hands. The boy is pushing a steaming food cart, upon which are plates on plates of every breakfast food I can imagine. Eggs, scrambled, deviled, sunny side up, French toast. Pancakes, sausage, crepes, bacon, bagels, fruit, donuts. My stomach growls greedily, and I salivate at the smell that encompasses the room. The boy unloads the plates from the cart and places them on a large desk between me and the mayor. He pours me a glass of orange juice and deliberately spills a few drips into my lap. He apologizes innocently, but throws a discreet scowl at me before excusing himself from the room. I hope you're hungry. I sure can't eat all this by myself. Patting at the orange juice in my lap with a napkin, I lie involuntarily. Oh, I'm stuffed actually. Just ate. I hate myself. Mayor Ramos must see me peeking at the bacon lustfully because he pushes the plate toward me with a sly smile. Go ahead. Guilt slices through me as I slowly grab a piece of toast. I shouldn't be enjoying this without Ella. Maybe I can stuff some in my pocket without Ramos noticing. You know, I've been meaning to have you back in here for a while now, he says, his mouth full of pancake. There are a few things I wanted to talk with you about. I load my plate with food as I pretend to listen. He starts talking about my frequent disciplinary encounters with the chief. Something about my mediocre grades from my minor age. More chatter about my less than exemplary function performance. He rambles on, and I nod occasionally with feigned agreement as I overstuff my mouth eagerly with sausage and french toast. I am paying less than a respectful amount of attention to him when I notice a framed badge resting on the surface of the desk, next to his three plates of food. The overhead lights create a glare on the dusty glass, but I can still make out the words engraved on the badge. Josephine, County Sheriff's Office. Trust. Integrity. Bravery. My mind slithers backwards to my childhood, to memories of playing cops and robbers with my dad's police badge. I was always surprised at how heavy it felt, how lucky I'd felt that my dad let me play with it for a few hours. Feeling like the coolest kid in the world because my dad was a hero in my eyes. I bragged about him to my friends almost daily at school. I was so proud he was my dad. He would tell me stories about the things he would do at work, and my imagination went wild, picturing him breaking down doors, cuffing bad guys, saving helpless people in grandeur. He was literally Superman to me. I shake away the sneaky memory before it steals its way too deep into my subconscious. I bring myself back to the present, annoyed that this blast from the past snuck up on me and then sucked me in like a black hole. I try not to think about my father much. In all honesty, I still feel angry toward him sometimes, even though I know it wasn't his choice to leave. I feel angry that he let them win. 
My perception of him as the indestructible hero was shattered as they dragged him away. He lost. And in return, I lost everything. I often wonder what became of him. I sometimes feel that desperate need for closure, for even just an answer. But the possibilities dissolve into the unknown, and I am left with only my imagination, an old photograph, and a tattered baseball glove. Does that make sense? For a moment, I don't realize he has asked me a question. My eyebrows raise expectantly. Yes? I answer hesitantly. Good, because what I want for you to realize... My attention trails off again as I poke at the remaining crumbs on my plate with my fork. I move them into various shapes and continue to nod occasionally. My mind inches back toward that place again, tiptoeing back into the past hesitantly, hoping I won't rip it away from the comforting nostalgia. My thoughts and Ramos's unceasing rambling are suddenly interrupted by a knock, then a swish. It's a guard. A guard I don't recognize. He looks young, his slight lack of confidence giving away his rookie status. Most people wouldn't notice. Most people wouldn't notice how his navy uniform is creased perfectly, as if he has something to prove. How his posture is apprehensive, his eyes evaluating the boundaries of his new authority. But I'm more acquainted with the guards than most people, so I notice everything. Yes? Ramos says his forehead crinkled with annoyance at the interruption. Sorry to interrupt, sir, but I need the boy. He looks at me. It's your sister. I am on my feet immediately. What happened? The guard looks at Ramos, wordlessly asking permission to take me with him. Mayor exhales loudly, but waves us away. He winks at me. We'll finish up our little chat later. I follow the guard hastily out of the town hall and toward the school, the large rounded structure with reflective steel-plated walls mirror back my distorted tense expression as we near. We pass under the colossal shaded portico, past the copper columns that twist down from the top like braids. The metal of the column rings as, by way of tradition, I tap my fingernails in a three-count rhythm on the cold surface. The sharpness I now feel in my fingertips from the icy cold only fuels my anxiety. We enter through the first set of security doors, but are trapped awkwardly in the stuffy vestibule that always takes a half second too long to scan for authorized visitors. I tap my left hand nervously on the side of my thigh as we wait to be approved. The guard still says nothing despite my constant questioning. My thoughts have run wild with possibilities. The worst scenarios I can come up with keep replaying in my mind, worrying me beyond control. I notice with pride that a few other zoners have now scratched in their names to the metal frame of the second security door next to mine. My legacy. We are finally let into the school, the warm heat from inside slapping my face like an open oven as we enter. The guard takes me to the front office. I am relieved to see Ella sitting there in the office. I can see her through the clear glass of the walls. She is sitting next to an elder woman whose expression is unclear but not pleasant. Ella's legs are swaying off the edge of the chair she is sitting on, her feet hovering above the ground, her fingers tapping her knees. The clear glass doors of the office beep twice and slide open with a swish, detecting our arrival. When I enter the office, Ella quickly lowers her gaze to her lap. What happened? The elder addresses me, her tone sharp and disapproving. She got into a fight today. She's lucky we intervened before she could do more damage to the victim. Or else she would have been suspended. I keep my expression neutral, but I'm not really even surprised. I wish the guard would have just led with that. Then at least I wouldn't have been so worried. It's not like this hasn't happened before. She's a feisty one, with a mean right hook. I should know. I taught it to her. The elder looks at me expectantly, so I raise an eyebrow at Ella for explanation. Well? Ella looks up at me from her seat. Her blue eyes are sparkling with defiance, her mouth in a stubborn pout. He had it coming. The elder gasps incredulously. If she had pearls, I imagine she'd be clutching them for dear life. 
At least she can't actually discipline the miners herself, because I imagine she'd smack Ella over the head right now. You're lucky I don't suspend you right now, Missy. She turns to me, her eyes cold. She was seen by multiple witnesses attacking Jonathan Mooney. He barely reached seniority yesterday and was fulfilling his first function before the altercation. We had to pull her off of him. He will likely have a black eye and a broken nose from this obscene act of violence. I try my hardest not to crack a smile at the thought of my tiny sister picking a fight with a boy four years older than her and winning. Though my heart is swelling with pride, I clear my throat and force my voice to sound stern. Thank you, ma'am, for calling me. No need to escalate the chief. I will deal with this. I grab Ella's arm and usher her toward the office exit brusquely. We have deducted 10 ration points from her wages to compensate for the lost learning time and the cost of medical repairs for Mr. Mooney. The woman spins around and continues working at her desk, and we exit the office, the doors swishing closed behind us. Ella tries to pull her arm from my grasp as I drag her through the empty hallway. Our footsteps echo loudly against the metal walls, sounding like a tap dance performance rather than a struggling child being dragged through a school. The warmth of the heater in this building is overpowering. Sweat prickles on my forehead. Faint sounds of classes in session can be heard as we pass by the classrooms. Let go of me! She struggles feebly against my firm hold. This isn't fair! She protests the unjustness of the situation and hits my chest repeatedly with her free hand, accusing me of hypocrisy and betrayal. I think I even hear her say the word treason at one point. Did she just bite me? Once we are out of sight from the elder and safely out of the school, I let her go and inspect the bite marks on my arm. I look down at her with a really expression first, but then finally release the grin I have been suppressing. Okay, tell me everything. She freezes. Her mouth is caught open mid-sentence, her posture frozen in her outraged slouch. She blinks, surprised, and I'm sure mentally retracing her steps past the treason accusations and bites. I thought... She straightens her canvas gray uniform awkwardly and gives me a sheepish smile. Sorry. I chuckle quietly so as to be unheard by other elders in the area. You broke a kid's nose, sis. I'm supposed to be a responsible guardian and punish you. My expression hardens and I kneel down so I'm closer to her eyes. My voice is not much louder than a whisper. I touch her arm gently. Did he hurt you? If he even touched you, I swear I'll... She clenches her tiny fist as she remembers her anger. The spark returns to her eyes. He didn't. He just needed to be taught a lesson. I roll my eyes. Okay, Batman, but you can't just go around breaking people's noses any time you feel like they need to be taught a lesson. She looks up at me with her fiery sapphires, defensive, but silent. Her fists are still clenched, her jaw still set. What did he do? I prod, preparing to rip apart a 12-year-old if I find out he even looked at her wrong. She sighs dramatically before spilling. My group finished our subject early, so they let us play catch outside. He was walking by and told me I threw like a girl, so I threw the ball at his face and asked if he still thought I threw like a girl. I bite my fist to keep from laughing so I don't miss the rest of the story. Then he started saying all these terrible things about you and... About me? He was calling you a brown noser and a suck-up and other stupid stuff. I couldn't just stand there and... What's so funny? I laugh as I remember the small angry kid from Ramos' office. Must be this Jonathan Mooney. I ease myself down onto the ground and lean my back up against the cool outer shell of the school. I pat the ground next to me, motioning for her to join me on the ground. She ignores my motions for a brief moment before huffing and plopping down cross-legged next to me. I tousle her hair. L, when I taught you how to fight, it was so you could defend yourself. Anytime a punk kid like Jonathan Mooney disrespects you, punch him straight in the nose, just like you did today. And don't stop until they pull you off of him. But me? I smile down at her. You know I can take care of myself. 
But Sam, you don't understand. I interrupt her. No buts. If it's about me, don't even give those jerks the time of day. Just shake it off. Promise me? No more fights on my behalf? Ella sighs and grumbles her promise. Save all your good hits for the times they really need to be taught a lesson. I slug her shoulder playfully until she smiles back at me. Now, not to condone needless violence, but... How epic was the punch? Chapter 5 Did I mention I hate running unless it's away from human interaction? It's 5.28 a.m. I set my alarm to wake me up early today so I can reserve a good shower slot. Everyone in end quarters are early risers, so they usually snag the morning slots before we even wake up. But not today. For the past few weeks, I've had to shower last, the slot right before curfew. It's the worst to have to go to bed still wet when it's already so cold. I roll to my side and prop my head up on an elbow. I pull up the shower schedule on my wall tab, the bright screen blinding me slightly, and select the first slot, which hasn't been claimed yet. It's a good day so far. I have a few minutes to spare, so I browse the market on my tab sleepily, lusting after all the gadgets I will never be able to afford. Virtual reality glasses and contact lenses, mag boards in different colors, wall tab game programs, self-heating thermocoats and boots. I sigh, knowing that they only keep the market active to keep hope burning. No one in the common zones is meant to enjoy such luxuries. But if a better life is just slightly out of grasp, we'll just keep working and working ourselves to death. Forever reaching for that better life we'll never quite be able to reach. Not many people realize that, but I do. Yet here I am, daydreaming anyways. I jump down from my bunk and grab a fresh towel from my PEC, being careful to not wake up everyone else. I feel groggy, not fully rested. My eyes droop as I walk to the sanitation center next door. I have my wrist tab and step inside to the small, dark waiting area, the door sliding shut behind me. I shudder a bit from the PTSD of being trapped in here last time with ear-splitting pops of the colorful exploding gunpowder of Ella's last prank. The claustrophobia-inducing space rotates around me so quickly it creates a chilling breeze, scanning me to make sure I am alone and infection-free before opening up the larger space of the shower room. Good morning, Samuel Carmichael, it says as I step into it. The freezing steel floors sting my bare feet. I select a warm temperature on the wall tab and charge the cheapest soap available to my tab number. With a sigh of relaxation, I enjoy the warm water on my skin. My toes begin to unthaw as they soak in the warmth of the trickling water. Even the countdown display on the immersive wall tab doesn't distract me from my few moments of bliss. If I had some extra RP laying around, I could have paid for a scene for the surrounding walls of the shower room. The available scenes, such as the Grand Canyon, remote woods, open desert, anything you could imagine, are meant to create a momentary atmosphere of absolute peace. The more realistic the projection, the more RP it costs. Just another luxury I'm not meant to enjoy. I have barely rinsed off the bubbles of soap from my body when the countdown reaches zero and my bliss ends. The automated voice instructs me to exit the SC quickly so it can sanitize itself in time for the next slot. I slip on my work pants and exit the center, patting my dripping wet arms and torso with a towel as I walk. The overhead lights are still dim. The shell up above the rumbles slightly and bits of soil falls onto the bridge of my nose. Frustrated at the dirt on my just barely cleaned face, I brush it off too aggressively and graze my cheek accidentally with my thumbnail. That's when I hear a clattering behind me. It's a zoner crouching just outside J quarters, not close enough to make out the details of his shadowed face, and far enough where he doesn't notice me staring right away. His hair and forehead are covered by a plain black hoodie. I make a few guesses as I watch from afar, 
as I shake water out of my hair with a damp towel. Marco? Liam? He is bending over a spilled canvas backpack. The belongings sprawled out across the gravel trail. Dehydrated packs of food, bottles of water, first aid kit. It's a survival pack. He quickly stuffs the items back into the backpack and looks around anxiously. He spots me watching him and freezes. His eyes meet mine. It's Seth Martin. He's fairly new to C9, but only a few months younger than me. He stands, throwing the backpack straps around his shoulders. Sam! He mutters, nodding once in greeting. I move closer to him, my hand still gripping my now cold towel. The frigid air is nipping at my bare back, and goosebumps are forming on my forearms and shoulders. What's up? My eyebrows crease in concern, hoping this isn't what I think it is. I gotta get out of here, man. His eyes dart around, apprehensively. I can't do this anymore. And where exactly do you plan on going? I ask him, scoffing slightly. You do know we're underground? I just, I gotta get out of here. I'm done with this. They can't keep me hostage here anymore. I admire his will for action, but pity his foolishness. If the possibility of escape existed, after eight years here, you'd think I would have discovered it by now. Come on, you, you know you can't leave. You won't even make it past the gates. I have to try. He grips the straps of his backpack and takes off running. Toward the northern boundaries. I drop my towel and chase after him in a sudden panic, certain he doesn't know what he is about to get himself into. Seth! Wait! I am running as fast as I can, trying to push myself further, faster, but Seth still has several yards on me. I continue to yell as I follow him through the pathways around the outer quarters, hoping someone, anyone, will hear me and help me stop him. Seth! Stop! The streetlights do not follow us past the quarters. The only light is from the still dim overhead lights miles above us. I can barely see his hooded figure moving hastily toward the gates. The past boundaries is an underground uncharted wasteland. Assuming you survive past the fence, you'd never be able to find your way to another zone, let alone find the way upstairs. It's a black hole of the unknown. Everyone knows it's suicide. We learn about the dangers of the boundaries during orientation. In the welcome presentation, the guards display graphic illustrations of what happens to zoners who try to run away. The photos alone are usually enough to abolish any pending hope of escape from the rebellious ones and reaffirming obedience to the scared ones. In all my years here, I've never witnessed an attempted escape through the boundaries, firsthand. Only heard about them afterwards or saw the wreckage after. Yet here I am chasing after a hooded figure, my breaths short, the adrenaline surging through my veins. My wrist tab is getting warm on my skin as it works overtime to pump extra oxygen into my bloodstream, trying to beat down the excess of adrenaline as it goes. It glows with red warning signals. Low oxygen levels. Use caution. I keep shouting Seth's name, trying to get him to stop the orientation illustrations replaying in my head. My heart is surging with panic as he nears the boundaries. Do not enter. Danger ahead. The fence is not visible to the human eye, but as we get closer, I can hear it buzzing dangerously, and I can feel its energy pulsing in my bones. Seth crosses a marked threshold and a siren goes off, a final warning. A red light flashes, and deafening sirens echo off the steel beams that support the roof of Earth above us. Seth! Come back! I stop at the markings in the ground. I continue to yell after him, but my calls to him get lost in the sea of sirens blaring around us. Zoners from nearby quarters who heard my pleas for help join me at the threshold, trying to help me coax Seth back to safety. As word travels... The group around us largens and we are soon surrounded by what feels like the entire zone. We shout at him to come back. Don't do this! Stop where you are! 
Seth looks back at the group and for a second, I think he might come back. But instead, he lifts his hand into a salute and takes another step. I am suddenly blinded by a flash of electricity, followed by a deafening crack that bounces off the surrounding beams. A wall of dust spirals toward us. There are screams around me, terror erupting through the crowd like an earthquake. The blinding white flash is pulsing. The sound of electricity making contact is cracking like thunder and lightning across the night sky. Waves of energy and dust knock me off my feet. I cover my face to keep dust and dirt from suffocating me, but my bare chest is pelted with razor-sharp rock shards and showers of dust particles. My ears ring with the force of the crack and the screams around me sound like they're underwater. After what seems like hours, the crackling of energy dies down to a quiet sizzle and the bright flash dims to a glow. And then finally, it ends. I am afraid to look around at the wreckage that surrounds me. The smell is repulsive, overpowering. It's unlike anything I've ever smelled before. Worse than burnt rubber or rotting eggs. A combination of smells that will haunt me for the rest of my life. Burnt flesh. Smoke. Damp earth. I gag on my first inhale, but can no longer hold my breath. It stings my nostrils, makes my eyes water. Guards have arrived and are the first to approach the scene. Med elders move in with a mag stretcher, which floats next to them eerily, like a ghost claiming its prey. A wave of disgust courses through me as I observe the meds lifting a mangled body onto the stretcher. Seth's body. I have to gulp down the bile that rises in my throat, but my eyes refuse to let me look away. I am frozen in place, unable to tear my eyes away from what remains of him. A haze falls over me as I struggle back up to my feet. His eyelids are wide open, but his eyes are lifeless, leaving a haunting stare that looks right through me. What is left of his skin is blackened. Dust-caked bones are exposed through scraps of charred flesh and already drying pools of blood. His limbs are limp and hang unnaturally off the edge of the stretcher. The other zoners around me are clinging to one another with horror as they watch Seth's body crumble onto the stretcher. Guards usher us away from the scene, telling us to congregate in the square, to get cleaned up and ready for breakfast. As if any of us could eat after this. I am still frozen in place, unable to forget the haunting stare from Seth's lifeless eyes. Someone bumps into me, and I'm shaken out of my haze. I vomit into the dirt next to me. It takes me a second to control the heaving, but I steady myself with a few deep breaths, trying as hard as I can to push the images, the smell, out of my mind. I straighten out and will my wobbly legs to move forward. I look for Ella in the crowd, praying she isn't here. Praying that she, too, doesn't have the image of Seth ingrained behind her eyelids. I scan the crowd, unable to find her in the sea of people. Zoners are in every direction, holding on to each other for support, especially the young ones that have never before experienced death. The feeling of fear lingers, but no one dares talk about what just happened. It just hovers above us like a looming storm cloud. I follow the flow of traffic toward the quarters, scanning faces as I go. No, Ella. There's hope so far. A shiver runs down my spine, reminding me I am not fully dressed. I suddenly feel cold as the adrenaline begins to drain back down to an average level. I am approaching M quarters, my legs still unsteady, when a voice calls out behind me. Sam! It's the voice of the singer from Sea Quarters I made out with behind the sanitation center last month. Leah? Lily? Lucy? Ugh, why am I so bad with names? But, can I really be held responsible for vital information like that when she's attacking my face with her lips? She is jogging toward me, navigating through the sea of people to where I am standing. Her red hair is damp and her pretty face is flushed pink under the spread of freckles scattered across her cheeks. She wears a small smile even though her eyes are sparkling with tears threatening to drop, but they don't. They never do here, as if it were written into the bylaws of the zone itself, 
We do what we always do after something bad happens here. Distract and forget. Why face your fear head on when you can just pretend not to feel anything after the memory goes away? So I smile back casually, trying to do just that. Hopefully she won't realize I've forgotten her name. What's up? She smirks at my exposed torso. I suddenly feel naked. The hairs on my lower back standing straight up. Nice outfit, she says, holding her arms across her chest. I adjust my footing and puff my chest out dramatically. Don't be fooled, it's just an act. Can't have anyone knowing how awkward I actually am. Thanks, I say, making a theatrical face. I'm modeling a new brand of invisible fabric. Invisible fabric? What is wrong with me? She smiles flirtatiously, stepping so close that I can feel her breath on my chin. Well, this invisible fabric looks good on you. Where can I get some? Two young girls pass right by us in the traffic of people. A blonde and a brunette. Their arms are linked, their faces close together, a sign of many whispered secrets. The blonde one waves enthusiastically over in our direction with her free hand, despite the graphic scene they have just come from. Distract and forget. The brunette is smiling shyly next to her friend, her arms still linked safely to her friend's. Hi, Lauren, the blonde says, still waving. Lauren, I knew it started with an L. See, I'm not a complete douchebag. Hi, Sam, the girl coos. The two girls giggle and continue walking with the flow of traffic, whispering feverently and giggling back at us as they move farther away. Lauren throws her head back in a laugh. Her voice rises in pitch mockingly. Hi, Sam. I tuck my hands deep into my pockets, amused, but mostly cold. How can I casually get out of this? Yeah, a distraction would be nice and all, but it's already been one hell of a morning, and Lauren's high-pitched laugh and sing-songy voice are not helping my blaring headache. Another beat of silence. Her eyes suddenly get serious. She lowers her voice. I heard you were the first one to see Seth just now. I don't answer. What happened to distract? Forget. Talking about this won't make either of those possible. I rub my temples, trying to push the headache away and to possibly send a message to Lauren that I don't want to have this conversation. I heard you went after him. I shrug, but the image of Seth's haunting stare comes back into my mind. Those eyes. This is exactly what I wanted to avoid. You know, you could have gotten baked too with how close you were. I inch slowly toward the doors of my quarters, hoping she'll get the hint. Maybe if I get close enough, it'll read my wrist tab, swish open the doors, and I can just slide right into escape. I just thought that was really brave of you, that's all. Her eyes are soft with sympathy. Were you guys close? Not really, I reply, simply, now backed into the cool entryway of the cabin. Is she seriously still talking? She steps closer and rests a hand on my arm. Well, if you need anything, I'm here for you, okay? Thanks, Lauren. I gestured to my quarters. I should probably, you know... Retiring the invisible fabric so soon? She nudges me playfully with her shoulder. Meet me after breakfast. Yeah, maybe. I give her a small smile before waving my wrist tab at the scanner above the door. The steel doors slide open with a swish and I stumble in. I tap the close button on the control panel repeatedly until the doors clank closed. I sigh with relief, glad to finally be in a place with peace and quiet. Who was it this time? The voice startles me. Teo is mocking me, his white teeth shining in the dim light. He is sitting on his bed, playing solitaire on his wall tab. He has no idea how lucky he is to have missed the excitement of the morning out there with Seth. It's always the same with you, man. He laughs. Always running away from the ladies. I shrug and play along. You're just mad it's the opposite in your case. The ladies are always running away from you. 
He laughs and throws his pillow at me. I swear, you pull more girls than anyone else I know, but you have the least amount of game. How does that work for you? I give him a sly smile, tossing the pillow back. I don't know. Dude, it's just a natural gift, I guess. He shakes his head and grumbles something about my ego as he climbs down from his bunk, throws on his work button-up, and exits the room. I get ready for the day slowly, finally alone, and I consider the conversation with Lauren. Her endless chatter, her big sympathetic eyes, the stroking hand on my arm, her assumption that we have this kind of bond now after our few stolen minutes behind the SC. She doesn't know how many others I've made out with in that exact same spot. Listen, I'm not intentionally a jerk. I don't even seek them out. I mean, I don't say no, of course. I just roll with it, and when an opportunity presents itself... It's not my fault those opportunities seem to come more often than not. It's usually a good temporary distraction. A way to get out of my head for a few minutes. It doesn't usually happen like this where they suddenly want to talk about something important. That's the part I suck at. The whole talking thing. So I usually try to avoid it entirely, or else I'll make it awkward, or accidentally say something offensive like, no shallow conversation or shallow girl will change the fact that we're imprisoned orphans underground. Yeah, that's a true story. Yikes, right? So I usually try to turn my brain off and plaster on a charming smile. Soon enough, I'm back on my way toward the square, this time fully dressed. I walk slowly, my calves sore from my unexpected morning run. Luckily, since I actually woke up early today, I can afford to take my time. I try to stretch out the soreness in my calves with every step, hoping that maybe the image of Seth's charred skin will stretch out along with it. As I near the square, I search for Ella. I find Foster instead. He is sitting on a concrete bench that faces the mess hall. He is looking intently at his wrist tab, murmuring words to himself I can't make out. He sees me and his eyes narrow. It's always you in the middle of trouble. Why is it always you? I sit next to him on the bench, still scanning the faces around for Ella. Why couldn't I be best friends with someone like, like Peter Evansby? Foster gestures towards Peter, who is already waiting in front of Bart patiently. He's always the first to check in. Someone who gets into trouble so infrequently, you almost forget he's there? He sighs. You guys seem like a great match, I smirk. I can introduce you. Let him know you're looking for a new best friend. While you're at it, why don't you get me some new roommates too? They stay up way too late and it's taking years off my life. He gestures towards the wrinkled bags under his eyes. I snort, used to Foster's constant complaints after all these years. My wrist tab says 7.03 a.m. Zoners are beginning to line up for check-in already. Is this what it's like to be a morning person? Having time to actually breathe? I see Ella's giant mischievous grin first, and then Eddie following closely behind. They are speed walking toward us with an air of excited urgency. That can't be good. Suddenly, a series of loud pops comes from the direction of the guards' quarters, followed by several cries of, Come on! And, Really? Huge clouds of white powder envelop a few guards who have just emerged from their cabins. The clouds so dense that their faces can't be seen through the thick powder. When the clouds settle, three livid guards are left completely white, the powder covering their faces, their clothes, their hair. Thunderous laughter erupts from the witnessing zoners, some kids pointing, some yelling out chants of mockery. Foster shakes his head, but even he can't resist joining in with the laughter. The guards try to shake off the powder, but it sticks to their bodies like glue, creating an increasingly humorous scene. The zoners' laughter cannot be tamed, and the guards grow angrier and angrier as the laughter grows stronger and stronger. The devious duo next to me laugh along innocently, but discreetly high-five each other when they think it will go unseen. I send a shocked look over to Ella, 
who shrugs her shoulders in feigned innocence as if to say, Who could have done this? I shake my head, dumbfounded, that she had the guts to do something like this, but I can't help but laugh along with the other's owners. If there was a day when we all needed a good laugh, it would be today. Although I'll most likely pay for it later, I appreciate it now. Where Ella inherited her impeccable timing and talent for a good prank, I will never know. The guards let a few warning shots fly, which shuts everybody up real quick. We head into breakfast, all trying our best not to crack a smile within hitting distance of a guard. Chapter 6 They Call Me Goat, Scapegoat We are all sitting at our usual spot, eating our breakfast. We are whispering sneakily about the looks on the guards' faces when there is a call to attention. It's Mayor Ramos. He has managed to hoist himself up onto the raised platform in the front of the room and waits for the chatter to die down. His rosy cheeks are stretched into a sickly, sweet smile. Chief is standing stiffly next to him, his uniform creased to perfection and his face in an unchanging grimace. Here comes the lecture. Ramos lifts a microphone to his lips and addresses the crowd of zoners in the mess hall. There are a few items of business we need to discuss, he says, his smile as stiff as his overgelled hair. His mustache twitches as he talks. There was a tragedy in our zone this morning, as many of you may have heard. Seth Martin has taken his own life in the attempt to run illegally from the borders of our safe and secure home. He will be missed dearly and will be remembered as part of our zone family. May his memory live on among us as we take to heart the lesson he has taught us today. The only place you are truly safe is here in C9. Murmurs rise among the audience. Foster whispers next to me, Oh yeah, I sure feel safe in a place where people get cooked to death. Ramos passes the microphone to the chief, whose voice is deep and raspy. In order for our society to function peacefully and successfully, each zoner must comply with the rules and bylaws of the underground. Acts of rebellion and lawlessness will not be tolerated, and punishment will be severe. Seth Martin has acted in selfishness, not taking into consideration the safety and prosperity of his fellow zoners. Seth's act of rebellion not only costed his life, but risked the safety of each and every one of you, as it threatened the foundation upon which our zone was built. Because of Seth's thoughtlessness, each member of C9 will be working double functions for the next six weeks. The chief is interrupted by outcries of disbelief and outrage from the mess hall. He can't do this! This is so unfair. He can't be serious! The guards that are in formation around him, cleaned up now and powder free, take a few steps forward, tightening the grip on their weapons, which stops all cries of indignation immediately. While you are each working double time, you can be contemplating the effect your actions have on the good of the zone as a whole and the consequences the community suffers because of acts of disobedience. He pauses to let that sink in. There has also been an unacceptable display of hate against a few of our honorable zone guards. The ones that have sworn to protect you day and night, have been disgraced and humiliated. Due to this shameful attempt at a joke, your second daily functions will go unpaid. Silent but incredulous expressions plaster everyone's faces. Everyone looks at the people sitting around them in quiet outrage. Ella fidgets in her seat uncomfortably. I squeeze her hand. We are determined to find the person or persons responsible for this and will not rest until they are punished. For that reason, until the perpetrator turns themselves in or until we receive information regarding the identity of the responsible party, your first daily function will be paid at half rate. My own jaw drops. Unpaid second functions and half rates? Mayor Ramos lowers himself from the platform with some difficulty as the chief continues. This is just a reminder that our community only prospers in peace when we have selfless and law-abiding citizens. No society can thrive in lawlessness. If you have further questions, 
Refer them to the submission forms on your wall tabs. Double functions begin today. He pauses for effect, pleased at the looks of anger that scatter around the room. We have also been informed that several miners have not checked in or reported to their assigned subjects for the past three days. So, if Felix de Leon, Zoe Quentin, and Holly Marana are here, please report to Mayor Ramos's office so we can review what the word mandatory means in regards to attendance. Thank you. Ella is whispering feverently to Eddie by her side. They share grim expressions. I consider what could happen to her if someone turns her in, and a worry settles in my gut. I've never heard of someone being expelled for just playing a joke, but judging by the kind of mood Chief is in today, the punishment can't be good. Hopefully this will all just die down. The alarms sound, and we begin to file out of the cafeteria toward our functions. Before Ella heads off to her subject, I grab her hand and tug her over to me. Her big blue eyes are lined with tears. Hey, I say quietly, ducking my head downward so she can hear me. It'll be okay. This is just a power play to show us they're in charge. It'll all blow over in a couple days. She doesn't look at me, but she nods. I squeeze her hand again, reassuringly, before we head in our different directions. Foster, who waited for me outside, is now chattering on about the injustice of these consequences, but I am barely listening. The reality is that I can't afford to be paid at half rates. I can barely afford day-to-day -day expenses as it is, let alone now with the decrease. I wave to Foster as we split paths to our separate functions. I walk slowly toward the waste center on the west side of the square, and Foster heads east toward Town Hall. The time-adjusting lights are up to full brightness of midday, illuminating the endless gray of the zone. The gray gravel pathways winding throughout the zone like ghostly veins, the gray steel quarters circling around in ever-gray town square, zoners dressed in gray walking to their functions, resembling a herd of the walking dead. An endless gray, day in and day out. I'm picking up trash around the zone with my function team, Lost in my own thoughts, when I overhear my sister's name, Zach Burris, a singer from B Quarters, is speaking in hushed tones with a girl I don't recognize. I eavesdrop on their conversation, pretending to be really interested in the piece of trash I am poking with my picker-upper tool. Jordan and a couple other guys are gonna go talk to Chief tonight after dinner. In my peripherals, I watch as the girl glances over in my direction carefully. Unaware that I am listening, she responds quietly. Good. We don't all have to be punished because of some dumb joke. You know Jordan, he can't afford to take half rates. Taking care of two miners and all? I stab my tool into the gravel and glare at Zack. His posture straightens when he meets my eye. The girl looks at me and her hazel eyes widen. Zack holds his hands up, palms toward me to signify he's not looking for a fight. Look, Sam. I interrupt. How do you even know it was her? Where's your proof? It's nothing personal. You, you know, everyone loves Ella, but we can't afford to be silent, and frankly, neither can you. That wasn't my question, I add with my fists clenched. My question was, where is your proof? It could have been anyone. The girl speaks up, her voice gentle. People saw her, Sam. It's not like it was very discreet, she adds quickly. And normally it would have been funny, but when so much is at stake, I'm sure the chief will take it easy on her. Probably just give her a warning or something since she's a minor. Like Zach said, it was just a dumb joke. Our other function mates have begun to gather around us, interested to hear the confrontation. With my fists still clenched tightly, I spin away from them and kick the nearby metal trash can with a force worthy of an applause. It rings loudly and echoes for several seconds, like a church bell at noon. There are whispers behind me as I throw my garbage tool off to the side of the walkway. It clanks as it bounces off the ground a few times. Although I haven't yet consciously made up my mind about what my next move will be, 
I find myself walking toward Town Hall, muttering to myself and cursing Zach Burris. So much for hoping it will die down. Of course I'll take the blame. I just thought I had more time to figure out a plan. I figure they won't ask too many questions. I'm sure they'll be relieved to have a finger to point, a scapegoat for everybody to hate that's not them. Funny how it usually ends up being me. A brisk draft pricks my nose and cheeks. The smell of the damp earth that comes with it is both familiar and daunting. Though I've never really feared being underground, the steel ceiling crisscrossing overhead reinforces the safety of this town and disguises the miles of soil we are buried beneath. I do sometimes feel a little claustrophobic, trapped. Just once it would be nice to take a deep breath of air that's not damp and muggy and just soak up a little sunshine. I wouldn't even mind a sunburn or getting stuck in the rain or waiting in hours of Phoenix traffic in the hot summer. All of that would be worth it for just a little freedom, a little bit of my old life back. I know, I know, even if they did let us go back upstairs, there wouldn't be anything left. Just ashes. Ruins. But still. It's nice to imagine it every once in a while. As I get closer to Town Hall, my blood still boiling, various groups of zoners are working on their functions impassively. The trick to functions is you put in just barely enough effort to get it done and get paid. No more and no less. You get the same amount of ration points for doing an excellent job or for doing a mediocre job. Most of us long-timers have figured that out by now. I look for Foster, hoping he can lower my blood pressure a bit before I talk to the chief. I spot him across the pristine garden that decorates Town Hall. He is haphazardly raking the fallen leaves of the trees that line the stone pathway to the hall into little piles. Foster is muttering to himself as he struggles to stuff a pile of leaves into a large black garbage bag. He jumps a little at the sound of my voice when I say, You know, you could make a living out of this whole leaf stuffing thing. He continues to struggle as I watch with enjoyment. I can see it now. Foster's tremendous raking services, where we belief in efficient bag stuffing. He glares at me, not amused. Come on, you have to admit that was good. I laugh in his place, patting myself on the back because I'm hilarious. Tremendous. His eyes narrow. You're turning yourself in. I grab the lips of the black bag and hold it open for him to dump the leaves into. Well, what do you suggest? I'm sure as hell not going to let Ella do it. And she will if I don't do something first. I pick up a leaf that didn't make it onto the bag and shove it in. And there are people who want to turn her in. He takes a bag from me and ties it with a secure knot, moving on to the next pile. Well, yeah, life kind of sucks even more than usual right now. Can you blame them? You know you don't have to fight every battle for her, right? She's gotta learn eventually. Yeah, eventually. But she's only eight years old. I just want her to enjoy being a kid for a while. She has plenty of time left in her life to be grown up and responsible and boring. Okay, I just hope you're prepared for yet another penalty. You remember your old friend? He ties the last black bag and throws it onto the waste trailer with the rest. I scoff. Old friend? More like the crazy ex-girlfriend I can't get off my back. Literally. What would you know about crazy ex-girlfriends? Foster rolls his eyes and plops himself down on the grass under one of the trees. But hey, I'm just relieved it's you and not me. If it were me, I'd be just so stumped about what to do. His ability to keep a straight face while punning is uncanny. Our pun wars can go on for weeks, each one more truly terrible than the last. Most of the time, Teo forces us to stop, saying he'll stuff our socks with peanut butter if we don't shut the hell up. I plop down next to him, the grass still a little wet from the last irrigation rain. 
a greenhouse-esque moisture that drizzles down from the upper shell every other week during the most inconvenient times possible, like when I have just showered, or when we are outside working. I begin plucking out blades of grass from the lawn around me, tying them into little knots. What can I say? I'm just a sappy guy. We sit quietly for a brief moment, the tone shifting. It's my job to make sure she's safe. If I don't, who will? I say, mostly as a reminder to myself. Well, all I'm saying is you can't shelter her forever. He looks at me, blinking vigorously behind his black-rimmed glasses. Sometimes things happen that are just out of your control. On that note, I stand up, stretching my arms behind my back. Yeah, well this, at least, is still in my control, and I have to do something about it. I spin away and start toward the main entrance of Town Hall. Pausing, I turn to Foster with a grin. Oh, hey, and by the way, thanks for volunteering to be my accomplice. They'll be glad to hear you were willing to come forward too. Now the mystery will be solved. His protests behind me fade into the background as I make my way, chuckling, to the building and toward the mayor's office. Chapter 7 He and Satan Go Way Back Mayor Ramos, I need to speak with you and the chief. Ramos looks up from the pile of papers he has been sorting through and eyes me over the brim of his reading glasses. Removing his glasses, he continues to stare at me, severely, as though I have just interrupted his final goodbye with a dying relative. I suddenly feel a little unnerved. He's usually so happy to see me. What is this about? He asks, his eyes narrowing. I just have something I'd like to say, sir. Ramos makes a swoosh motion on his desk tab, closing whatever windows he had open, and calls for the chief on his walkie-talkie. He continues sorting through the pile of papers on his desk, looking up at me over his glasses occasionally. I don't really feel nervous about the punishment. I've had more penalties than I can count over the past eight years. I actually currently hold the zone all-time record, not to brag. And at this point... They are more of a nuisance than an actual punishment. I have a strategy for numbing myself to the pain, and my body has learned to heal quickly. They typically only last a few seconds anyway. Chief's heavy footsteps stomp down the hall. His footsteps often remind me of an earthquake. Booming. Destructive. Never wanted. Children are afraid of it. Nothing good ever follows it, etc., etc. Though I stopped fearing him a long time ago, to reinvigorate my hatred of him, I will sometimes remember his words to me after my first penalty, when I was a new zoner. Scared, crying in pain. You know what's worse than an orphan, Carmichael? Two orphans. Now get your damn sister to shut up, or I'll be back. That's me, Sam Carmichael, taking penalties for Ella since day one. Ella was a really fussy baby, and the elders could never get her to eat or sleep. Her face would always get really red and angry, the tiny veins on her neck would pop out menacingly, and I would worry she was in pain or that she was going to explode somehow from the force of her furious little screams. I was the only one who could ever get her to stop crying, so I spent a lot of long nights in the nursery patting her back gently until she calmed down walking with her until she fell asleep in my arms. After she dozed off, I would just look down at her, so afraid to move a muscle, and admire the sheer tininess of her, the small little life in my arms. Chief, however, wasn't as charmed by her. He stands in the doorway now, his arms behind his back and his posture confident. His brows are creased in usual displeasure. Flecks of gray are becoming visible in his mustache and eyebrows, and I imagine if he had hair it would also be graying. Seeing him getting older and eventually frailer just gives me a sweet sense of joy. Nature's payback for being Satan's right-hand man. Teo, 
Foster and I joke that the chief feeds on the souls of kittens and Girl Scouts in order to stay permanently evil. He raises his eyebrows at me impatiently, still standing in the doorway. Well? I look back at Ramos, who has once again removed his glasses. He also has an expectant expression. I clear my throat dramatically, trying to make light of the tense situation. The two men are less than amused. It was me, I say. I prank the guards. Chief snorts, wearing a satisfied smirk under his mustache. I knew it. Didn't I tell you, Ramos? Ramos narrows his eyes at me suspiciously. You were seen by multiple witnesses chasing after Seth Martin that morning. How could you have orchestrated something like this? I knew that one was coming. I woke up early so I could set up everything before people started waking up. You can check my tab. I woke up at 5.30. Well, I must say, Ramos says, shaking his head, betrayed. I'm quite disappointed in you, Mr. Carmichael. Especially after that little talk we just had. Ramos sighs and gestures to the chief in the doorway. As I'm sure you're familiar, Sergeant Hollows here is in charge of the disciplinary action for these kind of misdemeanors. It is his job to see to it that this kind of idiocy will not happen again. He waves us away with indifference, sealing my fate but keeping his hands clean in the process. Chief grunts at me and jerks his head in the direction of the hallway. A signal for me to follow him. I know the next steps well. He leads me outside to the penalty podium, which is directly in the center of the square, so it's visible from every angle. Everyone is beginning to collect wages from BART and get their second assignments before lunch. Ella is waiting in line behind Eddie. Foster and Teo are toward the back, laughing about something with one of Foster's roommates. The other guards move to make an arc around us and are standing at attention, waiting for a command. Familiar with how this goes down, I kneel at the podium and begin unbuttoning my work shirt while Chief makes the announcement. He quiets the dull roar of conversation in the square and speaks loudly, his voice echoing off the steel beams around us. Samuel Carmichael has been found guilty of the obscene crimes against our guards this morning, and is therefore the cause of your extra labors going unpaid. He pauses, hoping to spur an outrage against me. I faintly hear Ella's protests above the other outcries and murmurs of the crowd. After we're through, you can all personally thank Samuel for his selfishness. With my shirt unbuttoned, I wait patiently for my punishment. I start holding my breath to begin numbing my senses, getting myself almost to the verge of passing out. I stare up at Chief, dizzily, awaiting his command to the guards around me. He is looking back at me with an expression I can only describe as satanic. It's no secret he's loving every minute of this. This is a man who loves his job, that's for sure. He continues. Wow, he had a whole speech ready and everything? As you all are aware, Mr. Carmichael here has received more penalties than any member of this zone because of his continual misbehavior. It is clear the penalties are no longer effective in portraying the message to him that only exact obedience is tolerated here in C9. For that reason, Mr. Carmichael's penalty today will be adjusted to maximize its effectiveness. I let out the breath I have been holding, surprised. Well, this is new. So what's it gonna be, Chief? New tools? More guards? Stronger volts. I prepare myself for anything he can do to me. As much as he'd like to see me suffer, I will never give him the satisfaction. Chief pauses his speech to whip me up onto my feet and throw me over to a nearby guard. The quick movement causes my unbuttoned work shirt to fall to the ground of dirt, leaving my torso exposed once again to the entire population of C9. 
it is eerily quiet as everyone anticipates what will come next. The guard's grip is tight on my arm. He throws me up against a nearby support beam, and I wince as the freezing metal meets my bare skin. I look at Ella standing by Eddie. Her expression is livid, questioning why I would take the fall for this. I smile at her reassuringly. She'll forgive me later. In a series of fluid motions, my back is pressed firmly against the steel beam, and my arms and feet are tied tightly around it. I stare at Chief coldly, but proudly ready to accept his adjustment with indifference. We lock eyes in the corners of his mouth curl up slightly. He continues to stare at me as he delivers the verdict. So for maximum effectiveness, his penalty will be received by his sister, Ella Carmichael. My heart drops to my ankles in shock. When I realize what this means, I explode. Every ounce of pride I once held dissolving as I tried desperately to free my arms and legs from the tight bands. You sick bastard! You can't do this! It was me! Punish me! My outrage is futile. Chief signals to two guards and they move in one uniformed motion toward Ella, whose outward expression is ferocious, but her eyes whisper to me the hidden fear underneath the rugged exterior. They tear her away from the crowd and throw her onto the podium. Shocked murmurs scatter throughout the crowd. A penalty on a minor? Ella kneels on the podium with remarkable grace, her chin high and her jaw locked, her posture proud and tough. She holds her hands out insolently for the guards to tie them to the podium, her glare at Chief unwavering. In the crowd, Teo is consoling a frantic Eddie covering his mouth to keep the cries from being heard by the guards. His cries of protest, like mine, are lost in the void. We are hopeless. My throat burns from my unheard screams of rage, and my restraints dig into my skin as I rip and pull against the ties. My screams settle into despondent whimpers of helplessness as I watch the guards prepare their tools for the penalty. Ella's hair covers her face as she waits for the delivery. A waterfall of dark brown that hides any expression, any reaction. Goosebumps are visible on her bare back. The guards remove the weapons from their belts, gripping them tightly in front of them. Spikes scatter across the lead clubs, threateningly, like mountains across a nightmarish landscape. At the push of a button, as if they couldn't get any worse, the electricity is initiated. Sparks come alive on each individual spike of the club. The zaps of voltage preparing to meet its target are ear-piercing and familiar as they crackle wildly on the grisly spikes. My body recognizes these crackles and sparks from our frequent encounters. My muscles tense in anticipation. My knees are weak, but the restraints do not allow me to fall. Warm drops of blood fall down my wrist tab for my useless attempts at freedom. Sweat lines my forehead, hollow cries of hopelessness escaping my lips. Chief, please, don't do this, I'm begging you. Without even a glance at me, Chief gives the final signal, a complete indifference to my desperate pleas. The guards take turns delivering blows to Ella's bare back each blow meeting the skin with equal measures of thunder and lightning. Whack! Scream! Whack! Scream! The volts of electricity charge through her body, seizing her muscles without mercy, and the spikes penetrate the skin, ripping and tearing with each blow. Each blow to Ella's back feels like a knife being plunged into my own chest. I feel every contact of weapon to skin. Each zap of voltage and her screams of pain echo in my eardrums. My peripherals begin to go dark, a blackness creeping into my vision as Ella's screams rattle through every nerve and atom of my body. The blows continue across her helpless body, blood dripping down her back from the torn skin. 
I beg them to stop, for them to punish me instead. Please, punish me. My pleas are unheard, and the guards continue, awaiting further direction from the chief. As the guards continue well past the average penalty length, several zoners from the crowd joins my cries for mercy, stunned by the extremity of chief's punishment. Some elders have gathered around, infants in their arms, terrified, watching with shock as the blows continue without end. Mayor Ramos stands next to them, stunned but silent. His hand is covering his mouth, his eyes wide, yet he does nothing to intervene, nothing to save my sister, coward. Teo takes a pleading step toward the chief. Please, she's had enough. She's only a child. Chief shoves him onto the ground, kicking him furiously in the stomach with his steel-toed boot. Who the hell are you to question me? Teo moans in pain, clutching his abdomen. She's had enough when I say she's had enough. He addresses the crowd as Teo struggles to get back onto his feet. Anyone else have something to say? The crowd is shocked, but quiet, afraid to speak up. Foster helps Teo stagger back to the group, away from Chief's zone of outrage. Ella's body goes limp, her hair still hiding her face. Her body barely responds now to the continued strikes on her back. A twitch here, a shiver there. My chest heaves as dry sobs escape my lips. My limbs are weak. I remain a dejected and hopeless hostage as my sister's tiny body is mangled before my eyes. Chief raises his hand and it finally stops. The guards drop their bloody tools in the dirt next to Ella's unconscious body. They spark and sizzle as the voltage fades out of them. The guard next to me cuts my restraints and my knees buckle under me, sending me flailing onto the dirt ground below. Unable to pull myself onto my feet, I crawl to Ella as quickly as my body allows me. My muscles quiver under my weight. I wrap her ripped shirt around her and cradle her in my arms. Oh, Elle, I'm so sorry. I rock her in my arms as if she was that tiny fussy infant again. I'm so, so sorry. Her body spasms as the electricity in her nervous system slowly dissolves. Blood seeps from the open wounds onto my work shirt, soaking into the fabric. It destroys me to see her like this. What have I done? May this be a lesson to everyone, Chief yells. That the bylaws of this zone are no joking matter. The kind of disobedience running rampant in C9 is unacceptable and will no longer be tolerated. Penalties will be escalated from here on out for anyone, senior or minor, who decides to take the law into their own hands. Chapter 8 As bitter as I am, you'd think I'd do better with tension. The four walls of our holding cell seem to get smaller and smaller with every hour that goes by. An overnight sentence is feeling more like 20 to life in a cell this small. If I stretch far enough, I could probably brush my fingertips on one wall with my back against the other wall. Ella is lying face down on the raggedy old cot that takes up the majority of the cell. She groans into the old, musty mattress as I clean her wounds. She winces with pain as I carefully dab the deep cuts with alcohol. Ow! Her groan is low and muffled. Sorry. Dab. Dab. We need to make sure to thank the guys for bringing the stuff. These could get infected if we don't clean them. This must have cost them a fortune to round up. I pat her back gently with my rag, washing the dried blood and dirt away from the angry, red cuts. One of the more severe gashes drips fresh blood at any point of contact, making it impossible to clean properly, but I do the best I can to bandage them up. I instruct Ella to remain lying on her stomach in order to keep the cuts from reopening for as long as possible. Sitting down on the cold concrete next to the bed, I study her face. Her cheek is resting on her crossed arms. Her eyes do not meet mine. 
The feeling between us is tense, unfamiliar. The silence looms over us, taunting us, taunting me. The floors of town hall above us are eerily quiet in these late hours of night. Pretty much the only sounds besides our own breaths are the drips of a leaky faucet somewhere, the natural creaks and groans of the old building, and the quiet snores of the guards sitting nearby. I break the silence, shifting awkwardly on the ground. L, I... Don't. She interrupts. Please, don't. She gets up with much effort, wincing with pain, and sits cross-legged on the bed, still avoiding my eyes. I shake my head. This should have never happened. It was supposed to be me. That's why I went to Ramos in the first place. I never asked you to! She finally looks at me, her eyes glittering with anger. I was going to own up. I was going to talk to Ramos myself. You know I couldn't let you do that, I say softly. She flies up onto her knees furiously. You couldn't let me? Let me? Do you hear yourself? I sigh, hoping to interject, but she continues. You always take the fall for me. For the mistakes I make. Every single time, and I hate it. Her eyes are on fire. Every time you step in, you're just telling me I'm too weak to do it myself. But I'm not weak. I'm not a baby anymore, Sam. I have to learn how to protect myself. You're not going to be around forever. You're going to leave too, just like mom and dad. That feels like a knife to the gut. I open and shut my mouth stupidly over and over again, trying to find a response. But what can I say? She's right. She's right about everything. We sit in silence for what feels like hours as I try to assemble my thoughts, words escaping me as always. It's not that I have nothing to say, I just don't know how. I want to scream at her that I've never thought of her as weak. She's the strongest person I know. At only eight years old, she puts most adults to shame. She puts me to shame, that's for sure. She's so full of life, especially down here where everything feels lifeless. I want to tell her she's the biggest light in my life. That she's driven and funny and independent. That even though I have to eventually leave, I won't actually leave, leave. But of course, that makes no sense. And I know, deep down, she can protect herself. I've known that for a while, whether or not I've admitted it. Maybe I've just been in denial that it's over. That she doesn't need me anymore. Which kills me. If my sister doesn't need me anymore, what purpose do I have? After some time, I find my voice. L, I'm so protective of you. Not because I think you're weak, it's... Well, you're all I have left. The words I haven't been able to find all these years escape my lips before I even realize it. You're all I have left of her. She stares at me, her brows creased. She whispers, What do you... Left of who? I draw back into silence, dread tearing my insides to pieces. She repeats herself louder, with fervor. Left of who, Sam? My continued silence confirms her suspicions. Her voice is no louder than a breath. You told me she... I thought she could be... I force myself to look at her. Her expression is distracted, busy, as she tries to fit the pieces together. I never told you the whole truth, I finally say. I could never find the right time. The right way. She jumps off the bed, throwing her arms around wildly. So you just let me believe my mother was alive? That she could still be out there somewhere? It's not like that. Let me explain. She hits my shoulders, my chest, my arms, screaming at me in fury. Why? So you can keep lying to me? Liar! You're a liar! I hate you! I was going to tell you when you were ready, 
I say quietly, trying to catch her tiny fists mid-punch. When you could handle it. When I could handle it. She storms away from me and sinks down in the corner of the cell in a silent rage, her knees tucked into her chest. Her long hair is tucked behind her ears, leaving her face visible. I can see a busy expression in her eyes, her mind going 100 miles per hour, trying to put clues together, like trying to complete a puzzle without ever seeing the full picture on the front of the box. With pieces missing. She speaks down into her knees, so quietly, I almost don't hear her. The betrayal in her voice kills me. How long have you known? She's still so young, so innocent. All these years, variations of the same nightmare have haunted my dreams every night. My mother's screams, the blood on my hands, the baby crying, the walls closing in on me. I realize now that each nightmare is just a reminder of the guilt and shame I have been refusing to face. The reality I have been hiding from Ella about our mother's death. Was I really trying to protect her, or was I just protecting myself? Finally, telling Ella everything will force me to dive into the nightmare head first. She'll probably never look at me again. I wish there was more time. If I just had more time, I could figure out how to break it to her gently. How to make it all better. After some thought, I reply softly. Eight years. She stares at me with dead eyes and says flatly, You've known my whole life? And on that note, I drag Ella down under with me, head first into the nightmare. Chapter 9 Nightmare on Elm I mean, Mesa Drive Before Okay, so you filled up the bottle with warm water. How many scoops of formula go in the bottle? She's quizzing me again, to fill the silence, so we stop thinking about the fact that Dad is gone. He's been gone three days, and it still feels like there is a black hole in the middle of our house. Her hands shake as she empties the spaghetti package into the boiling water. She looks back and observes my blank expression. She raises an eyebrow. Did you hear me? I rest my chin on my arms, which are folded over the checkered tablecloth on our dining room table. I don't know, I mutter. She's been quizzing me for months on the ins and outs of having a new baby sister, the joys of having a doctor as a mom. Due to her untiring efforts, I'm an expert on the following baby sister routines. How to change a diaper. Yuck, by the way. How to prepare a bottle. Proper feeding techniques and how to soothe and dress, and to put to sleep and bathe, and a million other things. But I don't want to think about the baby being born right now, because that means everything will change. When her life begins, mine will be officially over. Mom finally told me everything yesterday. Why they took Dad. Why they'll be taking her as well. She told me about the war and the attacks. How lucky we are to be alive. She said after the baby is born, they'll be taking us too. To keep us safe. In underground cities. Where the baby and I will have to live. Like some twisted sci-fi movie. But don't worry, baby. She had said after delivering the life-alerting news like it was all still okay. I'm sure they'll let us visit. Before you know it, the war will be over and things can go back to normal. Come on, Sammy. You know this one. She turns to face me and leans against the counter. She has her long, dark hair up in a bun, but a few strands have fallen loose and frame her heart-shaped face. Her blue eyes don't sparkle like they usually do. They look cloudy and empty. Let's say... She says, You filled the bottle with four ounces of water. I sigh. How... Many scoops. She stresses every syllable, her tone impatient. Two, I grumble. See? Told you you knew it. She turns back to the spaghetti and stirs it slowly. We have some ice cream left that we can have for dessert. Would you like that? We can make root beer floats. Your favorite. 
She doesn't wait for me to respond. She just keeps talking and talking and talking. I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Do you want to come? They're going to make sure everything is squared away, that she's healthy and ready to come. You can see what she looks like. I'm in a third trimester now, Sammy, which means pretty much all she has left to do now is grow. Can you believe you'll have a new sister in two months? I'm going to need a lot of help. I'm going to get even bigger than I already am. Isn't that crazy? She drains the spaghetti and mixes in the sauce. She hums an unrecognizable tune as the red, chunky sauce drowns the slimy noodles. Graham will be here next week to stay with us. Fun, right? She still has a few months until she has to go under, so she's going to help us with the baby. Can you get the garlic bread from the oven for me, sweetie? Be careful. I get up grudgingly and drag my feet over to the oven. This doesn't even feel like real life anymore. Everything is so different. The last thing I want to do is eat spaghetti and garlic bread. Not even a visit from Graham can cheer me up right now. The burst of warmth from the oven stings my face. Suddenly mom gasps sharply behind me. The saucepan clanks loudly on the tile floor. Sauce and spaghetti splashing everywhere. I straighten, startled. Mom doubles over, her hand gripping the underside of her belly. Her eyes are squeezed shut, and she is breathing out through her mouth in short, loud breaths. Mom? I put my hand hesitantly on her back, worried I might make it worse. I'm fine. Don't worry. She huffs, her hand still gripping her abdomen, her eyes still shut tightly. I help her to her feet and hold her arm as she lowers herself slowly onto the couch in the front room. She's just reminding us that she's... She interrupts herself with a pained groan. Her face is scrunched and red again. When it's over, she looks at me and smiles half-heartedly to calm my worry. Everything is fine. Worry settles in my gut as this process repeats itself several more times. Pained groan, red face, shut eyes, short, loud breaths, in, out, in, out. What do I do? Is this normal? She grips my hand so hard I feel the circulation draining out of it. At the same time, we both notice dark blood seeping through the fabric of her skirt and onto the couch. She touches the blood with her hand slowly and stares at it blankly for a second. She says to me, calmly but breathlessly, Sam, I need you to get my phone and I need you to call 911. My heart drops. What is it? Is she okay? Her reply is an anguished cry, growing louder as the pain intensifies. My fingers tremble as I dial the three numbers on her cell phone. It rings. Come on! Come on! I plead as it continues to ring, pacing back and forth on the carpet. A recorded message plays after there is no answer. Thank you for calling the Phoenix Distress Hotline. Your call will be answered in the order it was received. Due to the large volume of calls, the estimated wait time for an operator is 4 hours and 13 minutes. Thank you for your patience. For life-threatening emergencies, please proceed to your nearest Federal Pursuance Agency headquarters. Thank you for calling the Phoenix Distress... No, no, no! I hang up the phone and dial again. My mom's cries next to me amplify an urgency. The same recorded message plays again, but this time the estimated wait time has increased to 6 hours and 39 minutes. No answer? Mom whispers next to me. Sweat lines her forehead. I shake my head, my eyes wide. She instructs me breathlessly to call several other numbers she has saved in her contacts. I pace around the room in all-out panic, praying someone will pick up, anyone. Doctor, neighbor, anyone, please. No answer. Her groans have heightened to a throaty wail as her pain continues relentlessly. Sam! She howls. Sam, I need you to go get my med bag. The baby is coming. She's coming now. I forget how to move. 
I am frozen in place. Considering her words, the baby is coming. Now? Isn't it too early? I thought we had more time. Should I go see if the neighbors are home? They can drive us to... They're already under... Buddy, bag! Med bag. Right. I fumble around the house uselessly for a moment, my brain not communicating with the rest of my body. My mom's scream from the other room jolts my brain back to activity. Her med bag is sitting by the front door, next to her work shoes. Many evenings over the years, she would get called into work as dad tucked me into bed. She would tell me a bedtime story as she pulled on her scrubs and her plain white shoes. She would kiss my forehead and tell me she'd be home before I even woke up. In the morning, she would make me breakfast, pretending not to be tired, and would tell me about the people she had helped that night. Sam! I grab the bag and rush back to her side, the tools inside clanking together as I run to her. She has set down a towel on the carpet and is struggling to lie down. Her breaths are labored and ragged. With shaky hands, I help her lie down and prop her head up with a mountain of throw pillows from the couch. My heart is pounding. Is this really happening? My mom takes my hand. She smiles at me. Behind the smile is a sadness, a fear. My Sammy, I love you so, so much. We can do this. I'm scared. Her smile fades and she squeezes my hand. I'm so sorry to ask this of you, Sammy, but I need your help. You have to help me get your sister here safely. Sweat drips down her forehead. I can't hide my fear. I can't. What if... She wails miserably in response, clutching her knees to her belly, scrunching her face. Sam! Her voice is more urgent now and almost hysteric. I'll tell you what to do. You just have to trust me. Now, put on those gloves, honey. We need to make sure she's okay before I can start pushing. I want to cry. I want to run away. I can't do this. I can't. She screams. Sam, help me! I choke back a sob as I shove my shaking hands into latex gloves from the med bag. I take a deep breath and try to calm myself. This is really happening. Right now. In my front room. I'll tell you what to do. Trust me. There's so much blood. I close my eyes, hands shaking, her firm grip on my arm guiding my examination. My heart sinks as I make sense of what I feel. A foot. I whisper, hoping it's not true even as I say it out loud. What did you say? My mom breathes. Louder, I repeat. A foot. I feel a foot. Immediately, I spiral into panic. I've watched enough TV to know this isn't good. What do I do? Mom, what do I do? My mom is momentarily frozen, the medical side of her brain trying to process the information in between bouts of pain. I'm trying to remember movies I've watched, TV shows, school, anything. What do they do when a baby is upside down? Think, Sam, think. My mom whispers it at the same time I remember. C-section. I jump to my feet immediately. What? No, no, absolutely not. You can't possibly think- She interrupts me and pulls me back down close to her face. Shh. Come here, sweetie. You're joking, right? You're not actually considering this? She smiles at me again, the same sad and scared smile as before. Her eyes brim with tears as she strokes my face gently. There's no other way. She whispers her medical reasoning, her professional opinion. Something about a likely tear in the uter... uter something? From her last C-section, baby could suffocate... All I can think is the aftermath. Does she not realize what she's asking me to do? I take her hand against my face. My throat tightens. But you'll... She shushes me again and closes her eyes. 
Tears stream down her cheeks as she squeezes my hand. She opens her eyes, and in them is my childhood. Countless occasions where she entertained my ever-curious mind. My countless questions and wonders about the world. In her eyes, I saw the answer to every question, to every wonder. The solution to every problem she hid behind her knowing blue eyes. For all the fear that has been surrounding us lately, I could always still find courage by looking in her eyes. By looking through her eyes. Her eyes are still knowing. In them, there is still wisdom and strength that has somehow overcome the fear. Her voice is only a whisper. You listen to me, Samuel. You are so brave and so strong. I close my eyes and the tears come. Sobs break through any resolve I once held. You are going to be the best, big brother. Take care of her. Keep trying 911 and the other numbers. Graham will be here soon to help. She groans in pain again. The pool of blood around us is growing, soaking into my jeans. We're out of time. We have to save her. It has to be now. I feel distant, like I'm in a dream. It feels like the walls are closing in on me. They're getting tighter and tighter. I'm suffocating. I can't breathe. My mother's commands sound like echoes through a canyon. Somehow I managed to fumble around in the med bag effectively enough to find her requested tools. Scalpel. Scissors. Various bandages and wipes. Alcohol. Stitching materials. So maybe this will all be okay. She's a doctor, after all. She can do this. She folds her shirt up over her belly and shows me exactly where the incision needs to be. She hands me the scalpel. I look down at the tool and it feels miles away, like I'm looking at it through a telescope. There is a dark, angry scar across her belly from her last C-section. From me. The scar is so big. The incision needs to be so big. I gag and suddenly feel sick to my stomach. Bile rises in my throat and I try to choke it down. My mother takes my hand and squeezes it. I love you, Sammy. Always remember that. Always. I sob helplessly. She screams through clenched teeth. Her screams pierce my eardrums, rattle in my brain. Do it now! Now! I hesitate. My hands are shaking uncontrollably. My vision is blurred. She takes my hand that is holding the scalpel suddenly, her grip strong and unnaturally steady. Without hesitation, she shoves the blade into her skin, cutting a smooth and solid incision over the existing scar. Dark blood pools out of the cut and all over my gloved hands. The scalpel clanks to the floor as my mother loses consciousness. Her arms drop. Mom? I pat her cheeks repeatedly, trying to get her to come to. Mom! Please! Wake up! I cry shaking her shoulders desperately. I check for a pulse in her neck, look for signs of breathing. She's lost so much blood. I shake her again. Nothing. No! No! Mom! Please! Please wake up! I sob into her unmoving chest. I beg her to wake up. I beg her to come back, to help me through this. Please don't leave me! I can't do this without you! A voice inside me wills me to get up. Sam, you have to finish this. You have to be strong. My clothes are soaked in blood. The incision is still bleeding profusely. I force myself to keep breathing. In. Out. In. Out. You have to finish this. You have to save her. With the scalpel, I cut the next layer carefully. My hands trembling, scared to death of cutting the baby. I gag, but choke it down. I can see her body. I can almost reach her. Her feet have gotten tangled up in the umbilical cord. Ever so carefully, I pull her out, careful to support her head like mom taught me. My heart drops. There is only silence. Time stopping silence. But then, after a second that feels like a lifetime, she cries meekly. I cheer, so incredibly relieved. I cry as I stare down at her in my hands, the little life I'm holding. 
She is so impossibly small. Her little legs kick as she cries. Her face scrunched up and fiery. How can she be so tiny? I rock her slowly, soothing her cries, trying to choke back my own. Shh. It's okay. We'll be okay. I think for a moment as I admire her in my arms. I think quickly to come up with a name that is equal parts beautiful and strong. I remember my favorite grandmother, Eleanor. All of my cousins were scared of her, but I always saw the warmth behind the tough. Don't worry, Ella, I say. I've got you. I'll always keep you safe. Chapter 10 The Guilty Incentive Give us your soul in exchange for 20 RP. There is silence between us for a few seconds. Ella's hands cover her mouth. Her eyes are horrified and tear-filled, just like I knew they would be. So it was me? Her voice cracks. I killed her? I killed my mother? A clatter against the steel bars of the cell startles me to my feet. It's the guard. Rise and shine, he says. He unlocks the cell and opens it up, motioning for us to exit. Your sentence is over. Ella runs past him immediately. Ella, wait! Hold it right there, the guard says, stopping me in my tracks by grabbing my arm firmly. You need to sign this before you can go. I groan in annoyance, snatching the pen from his hand and signing furiously on the paperwork before me. I run up the stairs and out of town hall, hoping to catch up with her if I can just go faster. She's already gone. I curse and punch a nearby tree. My knuckles stink from the punch, but I barely notice. All I can think about is her face. Her horrified, betrayed face. It's relatively quiet outside, with occasional zoners pretending not to notice me as they make their way to the mess hall for breakfast. My wrist tab buzzes three times against my skin, signifying a new message. I curse again loudly. What now? All zoners report to the square immediately for the expulsion trial of Walter West. I groan, annoyed at the inconvenient timing, but grateful, at least, it will give me a chance to talk to Ella. I am greeted by the enthusiastic cheers of Teo and Eddie, who are overjoyed to see me alive and well. With how pissed Chief was last night, we all thought he was going to get rid of you for good. Teo's hands move animatedly, and his eyes widen as he explains. Like in movies, you know? Like you just all of a sudden mysteriously disappear, and it's like this huge crazy thing, and we all cry and wonder where you are. But really, you're just dead in a ditch somewhere? And it turns out it's just the CIA at it again? Those bastards. Just because you knew too much? Teo pats my back in a congratulatory way, even though I have no idea what he's talking about. Dude, you're a legend. I wave it off. We can talk more about old school government conspiracy theories later. Have you seen Ella? Teo looks at Eddie, shrugging. Nah, man. We thought she was with you. She was, until I... I trail off and leave them, searching for her among the crowd that has gathered in front of the mess hall. She is nowhere to be found. Even as the trial begins, I can't spot her anywhere. Walter is kneeling on the podium, his hands cuffed in front of him. Guards surrounding him on both sides. He looks exhausted. Exhausted and terrified. I don't know him very well, as he mostly keeps his attention on girls. That is, girls that can stand his douchey personality. He's apparently the son of some MLB player, but not an important enough one to land a spot in an E-zone. He came into C9 as a transfer from C3, one of the rare few who have actually seen another zone. He was close to expulsion in his other zone too but got off with a transfer because of some dirt he'd been able to dig up on the mayor there. No such luck this time. Hard to find dirt on someone so inconsequential. I scan the crowd for the millionth time as Chief reads off the charges. Grand theft, assault, 
three counts of sexual conduct with a zone member, resisting arrest, and general violation of zone code of conduct. Basically, what happened is he broke into one of the guards' quarters, cleaned the place out, and was dumb enough to try to pawn off the loot to other zoners. When he got caught, he not only tried to run, but also hit the guard in the face. Yeah, smart guy. This was around the same time that his girlfriends found out about each other, so they were more than happy to provide details anonymously about his other dirty deeds and misconduct. So, altogether, because he made more enemies than friends in his time here, most zoners took the guilty incentive instead of voting for his innocence. As much as I could have used 20 RP, I still voted innocent. No one deserves expulsion for just being an entitled idiot. But I can't speak for everyone else. 20 RP can go a long way here. Especially for us Guardians. That's why I'm not surprised when Chief announces Walter as guilty and his sentence as expulsion. Walter is frantic, but the guards already have his arms in a tight grip, preventing him from going anywhere. They drag him off the podium and out of sight toward the southern boundaries. I continue looking for Ella in the crowd as people begin heading toward check-in, hoping I can find her and distract her before bang, bang. The shots echo off the surrounding steel beams and settle in my bones. Time stops for a millisecond. Everything is frozen. For just a millisecond. But then life goes on and everyone continues the normal process of pretending they didn't hear anything. Like they didn't just hear a life ending. If you don't acknowledge it, it didn't happen, right? Can't really blame them. Indifference is easier than fear here, because at least it keeps you alive. Fear makes you reckless. And just ask Walter, no good ever comes from recklessness in the underground. Through lunchtime, there is still no sign of Ella. I've been back to the quarters countless times, hoping the sliding doors will clank open, revealing her there, in her bunk, or by her PEC. I'm officially starting to worry. I keep battling myself on if I should just let it go and give her space. I know I should be patient with her. I know that. But she really shouldn't be alone right now with what she's just learned. Angel on my shoulder. She just needs time. You've had eight years to deal with this. She hasn't. No. I just need to explain. I can make everything better. I just need to explain that nothing is her fault and everything is mine. I could have done so many things differently. Maybe if I hadn't been such a coward, or maybe if I had acted quicker, mom might still be alive. This internal war keeps me distracted through the remainder of my function and through dinner. Still no Ella. I have begged Eddie to tell me where she is, but he insists he hasn't seen her. Teo suggests I ask the mayor if I'm really that worried, but I brush it off. I do my best to keep quiet so her absence doesn't get noticed by any guards, but I ask basically everyone I cross paths with if they've seen her. All no's, or no response at all. I'm more unpopular than ever around here. Talking to me is still considered a risk. Yeah, I seen her. A boy drawls. I stop in my tracks, prodding for more information. In my dreams? Ain't she that real hot one with the blonde hair? L quarters? He continues to describe in degrading detail a girl who is not my sister, but could be someone's sister, so I punch him across the face. He curses at me, clutching his likely broken nose, but I'm already gone. I make my way back to the quarters where Teo and Eddie are, playing some kind of fast-paced card game. They curse at each other in Spanish across the desk. I sit on the edge of Ella's bed, my elbows on my knees to keep my head from hitting my bed above it. I watch their game, but barely pay attention. I've now checked every major building in C9 and talked to at least a hundred zoners. Where could she possibly be hiding? I've scoped out every inch of this place over the years and have become pretty familiar with all the best hiding spots. But she's nowhere. Hey, Teo says, pausing their game to come sit next to me on the bed. She'll turn up, dude. Don't worry. Probably just caught up in homework for her subject or something. It's not like she would avoid you. I look at him. He narrows his eyes 
to tiny slits. Unless there's something you're not telling us. I don't answer. What happened in there, man? You've been weird ever since you got out this morning. I hesitate, but then decide if they know the whole story, they can be more useful to finding her. I tell them everything. Everything from when they took Dad down to when they took Ella and me. It took me three hours to dig the hole my mother would rot away in. Eddie and Teo grimace at each other, but I continue. I buried her in the backyard, next to the grave we dug under the tree for my dog, Buddy. Ella cried all night. It's like she knew then that our lives were over. I waited for Graham to show up, but she never did. Never even answered her phone. I guess they must have taken her early. I took care of Ella by myself for nine weeks before they came. I barely slept. I fortified her nursery like Fort Knox. I snort dully, remembering. <laughs> you should have seen it. I gathered all of my dad's guns and ammo, his hunting crossbow, every pocket knife I owned, and just waited. I probably looked like hell when they busted through the door of the nursery. Scrawny kid with a .45 in one hand, baby in the other, rifle strapped around my back. I shot the first guy in the leg as a warning, you know? To let them know they couldn't take her. But they didn't stop. It didn't take them long to have us surrounded. No matter how many warning shots I got in. It's like they didn't even feel them. Soon there were seven guns pointed. Not at me. At her. They told me if I dropped my weapons, they would let us stay together. That we would be safe. We are not the enemy here, kid. He told me. As they had assault weapons pointed at my newborn sister. What was I supposed to do? And now? Now what am I supposed to do? She's gone. There is a brief silence as my words sink in. I bury my head in my hands in shame. Eddie breaks the silence timidly. I might know where she is. Eduardo! Teo hisses. Followed by a livid slur of scoldings. Eddie shrinks guiltily but leads the way. We follow him into the dark, using the flashlights on our wrist tabs to light our paths. Even at night, it's never completely dark here with the overhead lights above us. I think maybe they tried to resemble light from the stars or the moon, but it doesn't do much for actually seeing since it's up so far. Since it's almost curfew, the streetlights that line the pathways are almost completely dark as well, leaving little light and casting looming shadows everywhere that feel like they are watching our every move. He explains as we jog toward Town Hall. We needed a place to meet in secret where we could plan our pranks, gather supplies, talk, you know? The library was too quiet and the mess hall was too loud. We found this place only by accident. He leads us to the southeast side of Town Hall, into a dark corner covered by a small bundle of tiny trees. The leaves crunch under our boots as we advance slowly into the shadows. Dim light shines through a few upper windows, but not enough to light the shadowed corner. We walk carefully and slowly. Even though it's not past curfew yet, we are still supposed to be in our quarters until lights out. If we get caught, they'll make us run laps around the zone all night. We stop in front of a patch of grass and fallen leaves facing the eastward wall of Town Hall. Teo protests impatiently, but Eddie shushes him. Camouflaged by the grass and the leaves is a door. A basement door. Huh? Either this is new, or I'm not as much of an authority to sneaking around the zone as I thought I was. We think it's some kind of emergency exit from Town Hall. Some kind of hidden passageway from the mayor's office. Obviously, we've never been dumb enough to test that theory. Eddie grabs onto the handle and hoists the wooden door upward, revealing a set of stairs encased in dust and cobwebs. He apologizes. We don't usually have time for housekeeping. We make our descent down the stairs and into the dark basement, descending even further underground. Ella? I whisper loudly. It echoes off the cement walls surrounding us. Teo and Eddie imitate my whispers but there is no response or sign of movement. At the bottom of the stairs is a small room with dimly lit hallways on all sides, leading, 
I'm sure, to different locations in Town Hall. In the small space are two stools, and, to an unwanted trespasser, just a random collection of unnecessary supplies. Shaving cream, balloons, various types of fireworks, fishing wire, etc. All of their prank materials, hidden in plain sight. Teo glares at Eddie, who only shrugs innocently. No, Ella. I observe the layer of dust and cobwebs on the stools. No one's been down here for days. I really thought she'd be here, Eddie whispers. Sharing my concern, I pat his shoulder, thanking him for revealing their secret hiding place. I try to hide my disappointment. Without words, we make our way back to M quarters, a cloud hanging over the mood now that was once so recently filled with hope. We say our goodnights, and I climb onto my bunk. Worry settles in my gut, and my brain spins, trying to think of where she could be. Think, Sam. Think. The night drags on, and Ella remains missing, and I can do nothing about it. Chapter 11 Oh, how the tables have turned. I finally caved and asked for help. It took a lot to put the pride aside and ask the mayor and chief for help considering what they recently put my sister through. When I look at them, all I see are two cowards. A man who mutilated my sister and enjoyed it, and a man who did nothing to stop it. But I decided after much deliberation, no matter how much I hate it, that I need their help. For these last few days, I've been quickly spiraling into a chaotic mess. I haven't slept at all, and I've barely eaten. Foster says the circles under my eyes look like black holes, and not in a cool supervillain way. I've been getting into constant trouble with guards for distractedness during functions or formulations, and Teo says I look like The Walking Dead. But I just can't think about anything else besides Ella. I feel sick at all times just thinking about how she could be in trouble. My current theories go far beyond her just trying to avoid me. Although those thoughts do trickle in occasionally as I remember her horrified expression from our last interaction. But overall, I've pretty much convinced myself that she would have come back by now. She's stubborn, but not that stubborn. Every time we've gotten in a fight before, she stays mad at me for maybe 30 minutes before she gets bored of it. Also, she needs me to pay for meals, and I know how hangry she gets when she skips even one meal. She wouldn't have tried to run away, simply because she's not an idiot. There's no way she'd risk getting cooked by the gates, let alone brave whatever's beyond the boundaries. Also, Eddie is her best friend, so if there was one person she'd go to for food slash supplies slash help slash advice, it would be him. I believe him when he says he has no idea where she is. He's just as worried as I am. No. All of my theories involve something far worse than her running away which is why I haven't slept in three days. If she's been hurt, or if she's stranded somewhere and can't get home, kidnapping, trafficking, these seem to be the only logical reasons for why she would be missing this long. The possibilities seem to be endless, and I've exhausted all my resources. I'm completely and 100% helpless, and that destroys me. I'm also pissed that Ella has been missing for three days and they didn't even notice. What's the use of the wrist tabs if they don't even monitor who's here and who isn't? Why did I have to be the one to come down here to report that a child in their care has simply vanished? I'm sitting in the office now, the space completely silent after finishing my story. Ramos and Chief stare at me across the massive desk. Chief crosses his arms, his beady eyes staring at me under his bushy, graying eyebrows. So where could she have gone then? I glare at him. I reply through my teeth, my voice thick with malice. If I knew that, why would I be in here asking for help? My fists tighten in my lap, thinking about how I wouldn't be surprised if Chief had something to do with this. I'll kill him if that's the case. Sergeant Hollows, Ramos says, seeming to realize 
if Chief and I continue to be in the same room, things will escalate. Will you and Guard Jones please conduct a thorough perimeter search? Chief glowers at being sent away, and it brings me a small amount of joy that he has to take orders from someone like Ramos. How it must feel to him. But he exits the office heavily without question. The door slides shut behind him with a swish, and Ramos lowers himself into his seat. He puts his elbows up on the oak desk and supports his chin with his thumbs, covering his mouth with his clasped hands. His demeanor is different, less peppy, more mayoral. I feel uncomfortable immediately. What is he going to do? Give me another lecture on doing my duty to the zone and being an effective citizen of the underground? Tell me how irresponsible it is to withhold the location of an alleged runaway? He lowers his hands from his face, clasping them together on the desk surface. He breathes in slowly and meets my eyes, finally speaking. Samuel, there's a problem in our zone, and I need your help. I blink at him in surprise. Sure I misheard him. Huh? There are now six miners missing from C9, your sister included. I answer slowly, processing. So, you don't think she ran away? Over the past four weeks, six miners have disappeared without a trace. No check-ins, no appearances, no cashed-in ration points, nothing. Just gone. Now, usually the disappearances go unreported or unnoticed for nearly a week because they have no other family in the zone. But your sister's disappearance has come to my attention much sooner due to the distress you've been raising these last few days. You've known this whole time. It's more of a statement than a question. My ego is a little bruised upon finding out my reconnaissance. Hasn't been as low-key as I thought. Ramos gives me a smug look. I know more than you think, son. I'm naturally suspicious of leadership, so it's hard for me to take anything Ramos is saying seriously. He can't honestly think I'll fall for this good cop routine. Key strategy. Let suspect in on the investigation make him feel needed, and then use that to extract information. I don't know what information it is he thinks I have, but maybe it would benefit me to play along. Okay, I say slowly. So what do you want me to do? I fold my arms across my chest and lean back in my seat. I've looked everywhere I can think of. I've talked to at least a hundred zoners. No one believes me that she's missing. The guards won't help me. Chief won't help me. Ramos leans forward in his desk, toward me, and whispers so softly that I have to strain my ears to hear him. That's the thing, Samuel. Someone in a leadership position has to be assisting in these disappearances. Sergeant Hollows and the other guards may be involved, but I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there's an explanation. Okay, this definitely has to be a trap. Did he really just suggest what I think he did? Is Chief about to storm in here and pick up the bad cop role and punish me for taking part in these accusations? I choose my words carefully. What makes you think they had something to do with this? He looks anxiously around the room, as if to be sure there is no one in hearing range. Only myself and three others have the codes to disarm the electric gates. So only four people in the underground have the ability to allow people in or out of C9. I'm still careful, but intrigued now. Can't you just track their wrist tabs? Isn't that what they're for? For stalking purposes? I've been watching their locations for weeks now, but it's inconclusive. They each appear to be at their assigned quarters, but when I request more precise coordinates... Through the system, it reroutes and says they're here in Town Hall. So officially, they are still here in C9. But you don't think they are. He demonstrates on the surface of his desk tab, which is activated with a tap. The surface comes to life as Ramos swipes and taps on different areas of the desk. He flicks the screen with two fingers to project the display vertically in front of me. The hologram blinks in front of me, awaiting my touch. 
Ramos peers at me through the display, waiting for me to interact with what I see. There are six ovals blinking over various spots on a grid-like surface, each displaying a name and an ID number. A blue translucent halo-like shape pulses out of each oval to signify these are active in current locations. I hover my index finger above the oval with Ella's name and ID number on it, and it indents to acknowledge my touch. The other ovals stack over to the left of the holographic display, and Ella's location expands in my view. An overhead view of the zone appears with outlines of shapes to represent the buildings, pathways, and parks of C9. It zooms in quickly to a clear box labeled M Quarters. Ella's oval pulses inside the clear box, now joined with ovals for Teo, Eddie, and Foster. I know she's not there, I say quietly, still fascinated with the illumination in front of me. I've torn the place apart. There's nowhere she could be hiding. Trying zooming in, Ramos suggests, still studying me, testing my reaction perhaps. I zoom into Ella's ID by hovering my thumb and index finger over her oval and sliding my fingers outward. It zooms in closer to Ella's coordinates and blinks as it triangulates a more precise location, freezing momentarily. All of a sudden, the display changes. The grid jumps over eastward to Town Hall, where Ella and the other five ovals now blink, the blue shape pulsing out of them rhythmically. That's weird, I say staring at Ramos's illuminated face through the grid. Ramos collapses the display by pinching his thumb and two fingers against the hologram. By tapping a few more buttons on his surface, the screen goes dark. I've been doing that for weeks now, checking every few hours to see if their locations have updated. I lean forward and rest my elbows on my knees. My thoughts are flying at high speeds, processing all of this information. They aren't here in Town Hall, somewhere? Ramos stares at me dully. Do you really think they would still be missing if the answer was that simple? The only explanation I can think of is either their wrist tabs have been removed, or the tracking elements have been tampered with. Is that even possible? I breathe, not bothering to conceal my wonder. I won't admit to Ramos how many times I've attempted to hack my wrist tab. The security protocols are no joke, and even after hours and hours of manipulating code and tinkering with the hardware, I hit dead ends every single time. There's only so much you can do when the thing is literally attached to a major artery because you could, you know, die. It would take an extensive medical training and knowledge about the anatomy surrounding the wrist tab to successfully disconnect it and extensive technical training to hack past the security features of the software to falsify a location. I just don't see how these kids would be capable of something like that. So you think they've somehow gotten their wrist tabs to lie about their location? I don't know, he replied honestly. All I know is six highly motivated, intelligent, and talented children are missing, none of whom are likely to run from the only life they've ever known especially knowing that doing so would risk their lives. I don't respond. I mull over this information, still not sure I believe him. I mean, it's crazy, right? There are so many things about this whole situation that are just unbelievable. A wrist tap being wrong about a location? That a high-ranking official would help smuggle kids out of the zone? And why? Like Ramel said, these are kids, like Ella, who have never known any other life besides C9, all with a track record of high performance and intelligence. This is a pattern that can't be ignored. One or two could be a coincidence. A kid, maybe, who was able to convince a guard to let him slash her out for the right price. But six? And Ella included? It just doesn't add up. Still cautious, I reply. So what do we do? I think I have a plan, but I'll need you to trust me. My eyes narrow. Yeah, I'm out. Only someone who has something to hide ever says, I'll need you to trust me, 
everything is off about the situation, and my gut is telling me to run. I've never trusted the mayor, and I'm definitely not going to start now. How can I trust a man like Ramos? All this time, he has been getting fatter and fatter in his office while we are out there working day in and day out to keep this zone afloat. Now suddenly, he's worried about a few kids? Where has this concern been the entire time? Suddenly, I'm pissed. You know what? If you care so much about my sister, tell me why you just stood there watching when Chief had her punished, and you didn't do a damn thing about it. If you care so much about the kids in this zone, how can you just watch when a kid like Walter can lose his life for just being a kid? I stand quickly, the chair I was sitting on threatening to tumble over the unexpected motion. I don't need your help, I say, dryly. I'll find Ella myself. Samuel, he sighs, giving me the impression he was expecting this type of reaction from me. We can help each other, I promise. We can find her together. I make my way toward the exit, trying to formulate a plan that doesn't involve Ramos. The sensors detect the movement close to the exit, and the doors slide open. Cooler air from the hallway hits my face and blows a strand of my hair into my eyes. Wait! Ramos calls from behind me. I know your father. Top memories with Dad I try not to think too much about because they send me into a realm of feels. Number 4. The first time he tried to teach me how to ride a dirt bike when I was 6. We spent all day out in the desert behind our house, but I could never quite get the hang of it. He had an unlimited amount of patience though. At the end of the day, I was so discouraged I didn't get it but he hoisted me up on the kitchen counter to patch up my busted knees and elbows and said, You kept trying, though, and you didn't give up. I'm so proud of you for that. Number 3. When he brought me to the police department for the first time and gave me a tour, he showed me the dispatching room, where they collect evidence, where they train the canines, all the weapons and equipment they have, let me see a real jail cell, took me on some ride-alongs, and even had my first shooting lesson at the range. As a five-year-old, it was like Disneyland. And even though I'd know now that my dad was just a regular guy, seeing him in action forever made me see him as a hero. Number two. He had me convinced for many of the earliest years of my life that babies came from space. He told me that they were designed in UFOs. And then when it was time for them to be born, they would beam them down in a ray of light straight to their mother's arms. I begged them for a baby sibling for years. I had no interest in actually having a brother or sister because then I'd have to share my toys. But I really wanted to ask the aliens if they'd give me a ride to school so my friend Frankie would be jealous. Number 1. Painting Ella's Nursery as soon as we found out that the baby was a girl, and yes, they'd had the real talk with me already at this point, and yes, I was disappointed to learn there are no UFOs involved. We went to the store and spent a good hour picking out the perfect shade of pink for her room. We got all the supplies, and he let me give the money to the cashier. The rest of the day we worked together to paint every wall. Mom brought us snacks in between paint fights and splattering wacky designs on the walls before painting over them and making it all perfect. We wanted everything to be just right. And for a minute there, everything was. Chapter 12 Just like that, I'm back like a dog begging for scraps. I wish it wasn't that easy to lure me in. Why is information about my father still so valuable to me? I wish I could just walk out of this door and never wonder. After all these years of knowing absolutely nothing, why do I still care? Wordlessly, I return back to the plush sofa chair I almost overturned and plop down casually, pretending to be only slightly curious by what he has to say. I fold my arms across my chest, still pissed, a shame that I'm back in here so easily. I glare down at my arms, refusing to look at him. 
It's silent for a long moment before he lets out a relenting sigh. I knew your father, I should say. I knew him a long time ago. And by the way, it killed me to have to stand by and let Sergeant Hollows punish Ella that way. It haunts me. But I have to pick my battles, Samuel. To keep this place running, to avoid suspicion. That's the price of a position like mine in the underground. I refuse to show any signs I'm even listening, let alone interested in what he has to say. Maybe it's just my stubbornness, or maybe it's because I don't want him to know what kind of hold my father still has on me. I've always tried to appear disinterested in front of other people, refusing to let any kind of hope show that he could still be alive. If I don't hope for the best, I can't be disappointed by the worst, right? So instead, I make fun of kids who believe their parents are going to come back someday, like Foster. Samuel, before I tell you any of this, I need to know you'll do whatever I need you to do. So you're bribing me, I say flatly, finally meeting his eye. I like to think of it as a negotiation. You help me, I help you. Why? I ask. Why is finding my sister so important to you? Why are you willing to take a risk like this? He is quiet for a long second. I can hear the clock ticking on the wall behind me and the dull murmur of adults talking down the hallway. I tap my fingers on my knees to an uneven rhythm, the rough fabric of my work pants catching on the calluses of my fingertips. I know this is going to be a lot for you to take in, he says finally. But I became mayor of C9 for a very specific purpose. A purpose that has to do with a debt I owe to a very great man. My fingers freeze on my knee, mid-tap. My father? First, do we have a deal? I weigh the pros and cons. Best case scenario, Ramos uses his connections as mayor to help me find Ella. Worst case, this is all an elaborate trap and I face possible expulsion for conspiracy against authority. But if I leave now, I'm still left where I was before, with no plan, no resources, and no Ella. A voice in my head reminds me of the danger she could be in. I imagine her scared and cold and alone. I imagine her calling out for help. For my help. Warily, I make my decision. If there is even a tiny chance of this being true, that means there's a tiny chance of being able to find Ella, which is more than I have on my own. I have to take the risk. It's really the only way. This blows. I hate relying on other people. Yes, I reply simply, worried if I say more, I might accidentally talk myself out of it. Ramos sticks out his hand to shake mine, his hand thick and slightly sweaty, but surprisingly strong. As we shake, I can't help but wonder if I've just made the worst decision of my life. How could I agree to leave the fate of Ella in the hands of him? Am I really prepared to trust him that much? Ramos pushes his wheeled desk chair backward toward the thin table under the far window. It's the same oak as his desk, narrow and slightly dusty with various decorations, painted vases, of different shapes and designs, framed certificates and awards, cigar boxes, and two small framed photographs, so dusty I can't even see the photo beneath the glass, one of which he picks up carefully, dusts off with a tissue, and hands to me. I stare at the photograph, mesmerized by the smiles beaming up at me. In the picture there are two uniformed men standing in what looks like a forest-type environment, Large pine trees shade them from the midday sun. Tan-colored grass grows high above their knees. Their uniforms are caked in dirt and sweat, but their smiles distract from their disheveled appearances. They both look a little to the left of the camera, looking as if someone off-camera was trying to make them laugh. Even under the uniform and the dirt and the grain of the photograph, I'd recognize my father's smile anywhere. How could I have missed it all these years? Ramos next to him is barely recognizable because there is only like half of him in the photo. Where's the rest of him? 
the extra 200 pounds. Though several inches shorter than Dad, Ramos stands tall and confidently next to him, a youthful laugh in his eyes. They both look strange without their facial hair. Dad lacking his typical beard and Ramos missing his thick black mustache. I tried to memorize every detail of the photo, every crease and fold of his uniform, every wrinkle next to his eyes from his smile. We were in the same unit for years. We were both deployed out of Phoenix HQ to Kazakhstan shortly after being brought in. I was a mess when they separated my wife and I. Wife? I feel a sharp pang as I realize how little I actually know about Ramos' life before the underground. I listen intently, feeling a little guilty that this is the first time I've actually listened to him. He picks up the other photograph and dusts it off as he continues. Suzette was so dignified and strong. She excelled at every training and held her head high. It was like she was meant to be there. I never heard her complain once about the draft. She put me to shame. They sent the women in our unit to Egypt. Your father was my lifeline when we got separated. He was the essence of positivity, always looking on the bright side of things. Even when we were being shot at in the middle of the desert. He hands the frame to me. In the photo, a much younger Ramos is wearing a sharp black tuxedo and a powder blue bow tie. A tall, beautiful woman in a simple white gown smiles at him adoringly. Her bronze skin and dark hair seems to shine in the photograph, contrasting with the bright white of her dress. They stand comfortably next to each other, their bodies fitting familiarly to each other in front of the camera. They look so carefree. When we got word that your mother had... He breaks off and makes a gesture with his hands to imply his meaning. Anyway, he was never the same. I can't even imagine my dad's reaction upon hearing the news. Was he quietly heartbroken? Explosively miserable? I somehow can't imagine my dad either way. All I remember is my silly, playful dad chasing me around the backyard with a garden hose or reading me a bedtime story with different accents. The most serious I had ever seen him was when he was telling me goodbye for the last time. It was August a couple years later, Ramos continues. His expression is far away, his eyes not seeing his bookshelves and desk, but rather a scene from a distant memory. We were on our regular patrols around Corgos. It was a small lakeside village, so we patrolled on foot there. It wasn't a high-risk area. We were there mostly to just be a presence in the town. You know, just in case. I had gotten comfortable with the routine, with the dormancy of our area. It caused me to get lazy, careless. I watch as his face changes from nostalgia to shame. He shakes his head, as if scolding his stupidity. Even after all this time. He saved my life, he simply says. I look at the photo of my dad and his bright smile. When I was younger, I admired him with everything I had. He was my hero. Whenever he left for work, I imagined him rescuing families from burning buildings and catching bad guys and literally saving the world. He would let me play with his badge sometimes, and I would pretend to be him. I thought he was indestructible, and then he was just gone. I always felt like he lost that day. That the great hero had been conquered. I never thought that by him leaving, he was just becoming someone else's hero. Seriously, how much more self-absorbed can I get? We both promised that whoever got home first would take care of each other's families. I shattered my knee the following June. I could barely walk. They discharged me shortly after when I proved I could no longer be useful, and just like that, I was on a plane back to the States. They sent me directly to E3 to fill an assistant position for an ex-governor. There, I was able to find out where they had sent you and Ella. I pulled your file, looked at your ID pictures, studied your lives. I just wanted to be able to give your father a full report when I saw him again. I sit quietly, Processing all of this information, how is it possible that in all the years I've known him, 
he sat on this big of a secret. I feel lied to and betrayed, but also guilty. I've disliked him for as long as I can remember. Has he really just been looking out for me this whole time? He continues, leaning back in his desk chair and resting his arms on his large belly. I gained a lot of important connections during my time in E3. I worked hard to climb up the ladder, and I did. It opened up a lot of doors for me, ones I never thought I'd even consider. I was just trying to keep myself busy, trying to work hard so I could have a good foundation in the underground for Suzette to come home to. I wasn't sure how I'd get to you two, but I knew I made a promise to look after you. That's when the mayor position opened up. I was really just in the right place at the right time, with the right connections. The first time I met you, he laughs, you said my mustache looked like a greasy rabbit had died on my upper lip. I snort, remembering. I think I was 13 then. I didn't know he was the new mayor. I just thought he was someone's dad coming to pick up his kid. I hated him right away only because he wasn't my dad coming to pick me up. I found out shortly after how wrong I was, but never apologized for the greasy rabbit comment. I never was big on first impressions with authority figures anyways. Sorry about that, I say, allowing a small smirk to creep on my lips. He chuckles. I knew who you were right away. You looked just like him, even then. His smile fades and he stares past me with a faraway look. He sent me a letter when he found out Suzette didn't make it. I think I might still have it here somewhere. He trails off and rummages through the drawers in his desk absent-mindedly. I feel that pang in my chest again. I whisper it, afraid to ask, but also afraid to disturb the stillness and reverence in our atmosphere right now. What happened to her? Ramos hands me a crumpled envelope with a small piece of lined paper inside of it. I study the handwriting each familiar twist and curl of Dad's S's and O's. The top lines are visible from inside the unfolded envelope. Vic, there is no way to express how sorry I am for your loss. Suzette was an incredible woman. He sighs with a grief I have come to know well. From what I heard, her whole unit was ambushed in Cairo. Surrounded on all sides. Never even had a chance to defend themselves. I got her dog tags, a folded up flag, and a copy of a letter from the president. Thank you for your sacrifice. I avoid looking at him. I finger the sharp edges of the stiff envelope quietly, trying to build up the nerve to ask. Maybe it's just better not knowing for sure. Maybe wondering is better. He reads my thoughts somehow, without even asking permission or making sure I want to know. He answers my unspoken thoughts. That was the last time I heard from him, Sam. There wasn't a return address on the letter he sent me. I tried looking, but I couldn't find any reliable information on where he might be. You have to understand. We traveled so often. He didn't write again. I just assumed the worst. I'm so sorry, Samuel. I wish it was a story with a happier ending, but life isn't a fairy tale, unfortunately. I sniff, handing him back the letter. Yeah, I figured that out a long time ago. Chapter 13 This is why I don't cry. Like, ever. I don't even feel my legs as I burst out of Town Hall into the bustling plaza of the square. Everyone is enjoying their short break before curfew. The overhead lights are dim and warm to symbolize the sun setting and the day ending. A few guys are tossing a football around in an uneven rectangle. Some kids are running around and chasing each other. The kids' laughter feels far away, echoing in my ears, like I'm dreaming. I feel heavy, sluggish. The weight of everything is like a stack of steel on my shoulders, like I just blinked, and then everything was suddenly piled up, 
It's suffocating. I don't even hear Foster the first couple times he calls my name. I'm too wrapped up in my own baggage to notice him until he's standing right in front of me. Hey, I've been calling... Oh, you look like hell. His red brows pull together under the thick frames of his glasses. His eyes shimmer with a concern that extends beyond the obligatory friendliness. In this moment, everything I've been holding inside for the last eight years rips out of my chest. I fall to my knees in the middle of the pathway, sharp gravel digging into my kneecaps, and the floodgates bust open. I grieve everything. My mother's death, being taken away from my home, this life underground. Witnessing Seth's graphic death. Ella's horror when I told her the truth. Her disappearance. Learning about my father. I mourn it all for the first time. It barrels out of me, a flash flood going 50 miles per hour. I can't slow it down or fight against it. I feel completely out of control. A hostage to this grief I've never allowed myself to feel. I realize now it's always had a hold on me whether I acknowledge it or not. It's always been there, subtly wrapping its grip around me, slowly, patiently, all these years, never loosening up even a little bit. I thought not acknowledging its presence would remove its existence, that pretending to be strong could eventually heal me. But I'm not healed. I'm broken. Shattered in more pieces than I realized. Foster kneels next to me and pats my back wordlessly, not interrupting, allowing me this time to hurt. It's like I am that fragile eight-year-old boy again, crying into my mother's arms, missing my father. That scared, helpless little boy. All these years, I've tried so hard to be strong for Ella, to mask the hurt inside with sarcasm, cynicism, a middle finger to the world. A don't care attitude. I've never allowed myself to show that I miss my home and my family. That I'm lonely. That the death I've witnessed haunts me every night. That I'm scared to be drafted in a little over a year. I've never allowed any of this to show for Ella. I need her to stay positive. To keep the hope I lost long ago. I need her to keep her light. Her light is the only thing that keeps me crawling forward in my darkness. Without Ella, I have nothing. I've lost my only source of light. Hey, Foster says, still patting my back. Why don't we head back to your quarters so you can rest? It's going to be okay. She's going to turn up. Foster helps me to my feet and guides me by the elbow back to my quarters. He raises my limp wrist to open the door for us. I stumble up the steps, feeling Foster's sturdy grip on my arm. I crumble onto Ella's bottom bunk and exhale. I close my eyes and try to breathe in what's left of her scent on her lumpy pillow, trying to think of her laugh. I get lost in the memories of her jokes and pranks, her rebelliousness, all her hopes and dreams, the contagious energy she radiated to everyone around her. I barely hear Foster's footsteps exiting the quarters, only noticing his absence when I realize how quiet everything is. I glance at the time, unsure of how long I've been lying down. It feels like centuries have passed. It's several minutes past curfew now, according to the time. Teo and Eddie are sound asleep, even though the overhead lights remain on. I sit up slowly, careful not to hit my head on the low bunk above me, my head pounding with an ache that I massage with my fingertips. My eyes feel raw and swollen, and my nose won't stop running. This is why I don't cry. Well, this, and the aforementioned unhealthy coping mechanisms. I sigh. The sliding door to our quarters has caught on a stray tennis shoe, that was left lying by the door, smushing the poor shoe like a pancake and preventing the door from shutting completely. The open crack lets in a draft that brings the temperature down even more in here. I shiver. Groggily, I step toward it and push the door open the rest of the way, 
freeing the smashed sneaker. I pick it up and try to form it back to its original shape. That's when I hear a hushed voice coming from nearby. Curious about the noise past curfew, I follow the voice, shoe still in hand. A whisper. I really can't talk right now. Can I please call you back another time? I pause to listen, hoping to evaluate the situation before I reveal my presence. It could be a guard. There is a brief silence. I hold my breath. It's not my fault they didn't... Pause. Yes, but there are other zoners here just as good as her. I promise I'll still fulfill my end of the deal. I round the corner and see Foster whispering severely into a small flip phone. He's pacing, his body turned toward the square, hiding his face and keeping my presence hidden. Who could he possibly be talking to at this hour? Fulfill his end of the deal? What deal? I need more time. I'll get you a new one by the end of the week. The shoe drops from my fingers, making a loud plop on the gravel ground. A new what? Foster whips around, shutting the flip phone quickly. His expression tells me everything I need to know. His eyes widen, but my hands are around his neck before he can even say a word. I throw him up against L quarters, his head thwacking against the metal wall. Who were you talking to? Where is she? I growl digging my fingernails into the sides of his neck as my grip tightens into his throat. He gasps and splutters, trying to pry my hands off his neck. I don't know what you're talking about, he squeaks. You're lying! I throw him onto the ground and pin his arms down into the concrete with my knees. He coughs and gasps for air, saliva dripping out of the corners of his mouth. I punch him across the face, the force throwing his glasses across the ground, my knees pressing harder into his forearms. I heard you just now. Who were you talking to? What deal? He doesn't respond. I punch him again, harder, and again. What do you have to do with this, Foster? Where's my sister, you son of a- Sam! What the hell? Teo, awoken by the commotion, pushes me off Foster and links my arms behind my back with a surprising strength. Eddie helps Foster up to his feet, and hands him his bent glasses. What is going on out here? Teo demands, prodding for an answer by twisting my arm at an unnatural angle. I groan with pain and reply through gritted teeth. Ask. Him. Teo and Eddie turn their focus to Foster. Foster wipes the blood from his nose and shifts awkwardly. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. I lunge toward him, blood pumping through my veins at high speeds. But Teo keeps a strong grip on my arm. I'm going to kill you, Foster! What did you do? I shout, trying to rip my arms away from Teo's hold. The adrenaline blurs my vision, making it impossible to read his features. How can this even be happening? Other zoners from surrounding quarters start peeking out of their doors at the noise, and Foster tries to hush my yells, looking nervously around at the growing audience. Sam, calm down. I'm not allowed to... Where is my sister? I roar, ignoring his nervous shushing. I can hear nothing except the growing rage that is filling my body. I feel it bubbling and rising from my toes up to my ears the longer I go without answers. Then he does the one thing that would make this situation even more unbelievable. He runs. Teo loosens his grip on my arm in surprise, and I too remain frozen in shock before I realize he's actually trying to run away. Kevin from L Quarters, a member from our eavesdropping audience, is quicker to action than either of us and grabs Foster by the forearm as he passes. Stunned by the sudden stop, as well as affected by gravity and the interruption of his momentum, Foster stumbles to the ground in a heap. He remains on his knees for a long moment, facing away from us, his head hung and his breaths rapid. Kevin helps him to his feet, but doesn't release his grip. 
The crowd around us continues to grow as other zoners get word of what's happening. People stand shoulder to shoulder, circling around us, pushing each other to get a better view of the confrontation. It seems I've been the live entertainment of C9 lately. There is a tense silence as we wait for Foster to explain himself. Whispers around the circle range from cries of disbelief, to hopeful doubt, to demands that match my own for an explanation. Though I can think of little else besides trying to make sense of this situation, I do feel quite annoyed at the level of noisiness in our zone. Can't this just be the one time where people mind their own business? As the anger inside of me reaches its simmering point, the reality of the hurt seeps into the rage, filling in through the cracks. The betrayal sinks into my gut like a black hole, one that devours everything around it, and I'm paralyzed by the weight of it. There's got to be some kind of explanation. This can't be what it seems, right? Foster, what's going on, brother? Teo says quietly, compassionately in a tone of voice only Teo could muster in a time like this. Foster's eyes drop to his feet, his shoulders twitching with anxiety. They said they had my parents, that I had a debt to pay, he whispers finally. Suddenly, deafening alarms blast around us. Red and yellow lights flash blindingly. The alarms bounce off every steel surface and echo with an ear-splitting magnitude. Everyone around us falls to their knees, covering their ears, squeezing their eyes shut. The alarms ring in what feels like every crevice of my brain, and the sheer loudness of the shrill alarms is excruciating. There is a tug on my arm. I try to read Teo's lips in frantic arm movements. He pulls me to my feet, dragging me toward the square, pointing wildly in all directions. What is he saying? He's gone, he mouths. Foster. I took my eyes off him for one second, in the shock of the alarms, and he vanished. Teo and I bolt toward the square. My heart beat drums wildly in my deaf ears. My wrist ID warm on my inner wrist from the hike in adrenaline. We've almost reached the outer circle of Elder Quarters when we notice dark figures marching toward us from the east side of the square. Our eyes adjust to the dim light from the windows of the surrounding buildings and I can finally make out the figures approaching us. I squint to be sure I'm seeing this right. Teo grabs my arm, a stunned reaction that matches my own surprise. It's a line of guards in full riot gear. Black carbon fiber body armor covers them from head to toe. Close-fitting headpieces with slits of clear polycarbonate to reveal shaded eyes. Exaggerated shoulder and pectoral pieces that elevate the appearance of their brute strength. All the way down to heavy metal plated boots. They march in perfect unison toward us. Their mace batons are brandished threateningly at their sides, the jagged spikes glistening brightly in contrast to the shadowed surroundings. Their rifles are strapped to their backs. They stop directly in front of us, close enough to where I could reach out and feel the cool metal of their shoulder plates. They stand completely still in front of us, and completely silent. I raise my hands up to signify my innocence but this sparks a series of time-stopping reactions from the guards. Each of them whips their batons out in front of them and step into close formation with each other. Before I can even blink, the guard directly in front of me whacks my right hip with a sure, swift hit, numbing the entire right side of my body. I cry out in pain, doubled over and gasping for breath. A tingling sensation shoots to my toes and my fingertips. Warm blood drizzles down my pant leg. Teo drops to his knees beside me, experiencing the same pain from his own hit. His cries are muted by the continued sirens, but his face is twisted in a pain that matches my own. The alarms finally cease, but the ringing in my ears still prevents most sound from coming through. I feel like I'm underwater, only muffled noise around me. Muffled boots marching as more guards arrive. 
muffled cries of stunned zoners being torn from their beds and thrown out into the crowd. Muffled shouts from the guards lined up in front of me. The guards yank me and Teo to our feet and drag us toward the podium. The feeling has returned to the right side of my body, but the pulsing pain radiating from my hip prevents me from walking normally. I limp stagger as fast as I can to keep up with the guard's swift march. His grip firm on my upper arm. Behind us, the remaining guards are whacking more people and shuffling the crowd over toward the podium with us. The fear around us is silent but palpable. Everyone shocked and scared and disoriented. But even the smallest kids know better than to cry or vocalize their fear. Soon, the whole zone is gathered around the podium, with me and Teo standing dumbfoundedly in the front row. The guards line up around the podium, half on one side and half on the other. Their batons are fastened again to their belts, and they stand with their arms behind their backs, standing still and facing straight ahead. Mayor Ramos and Chief cross in front of them and stand directly in front of the podium, They converse in hushed tones with each other. I look at the time. 9.27 p.m. Curfew was almost a half hour ago. What's this all about? A penalty this late? I glance around carefully for Foster. I'm careful not to move my body from facing straight forward so as to avoid further confrontation with the guards, sure that he must have also been herded in by the guards in the frenzy. But I don't see him anywhere. With the ringing in my ears and the pain in my hip, I'm too distracted to notice at first that Chief is staring right at me. A cold, hard stare. I blink when I catch his gaze, unsure of what I did this time to deserve the glare. I hold eye contact for a few long seconds out of stubbornness, but break it to whisper to Teo next to me. Is it just me, or is Chief up to something? He shrugs, massaging his wounded hip also using his peripherals to search for Eddie. I try to catch Ramos' eye, so hopefully he can give me some kind of reassurance. We're partners now, right? He avoids making eye contact, pretending to be very busy, smoothing the folds of his suit. Why won't he look at me? Chief steps up to the podium, his hands drawn behind his back and legs hip-width apart, as if he is awaiting orders from someone. A few kids whimper quietly nearby, a cough somewhere else, but otherwise you could cut the silence with a knife. Due to the events of tonight, we have gathered you here to conduct an emergency expulsion trial. Chief's voice is low and raspy, but with a volume that echoes around us. The expulsion trial of Samuel Carmichael. A comprehensive list of all the possible causes of my death I expected more than this. The usual causes of death. Accidental drowning. Tragic accident. Heart attack. Cancer. A seal plate falling from the upper shell of the underground and impaling me. My wrist tab getting caught on something and ripping out of my artery. Causing me to bleed out. Atomic bomb from an enemy country, falling off the top bunk, eventually choking on my abnormal amount of self-loathing, getting bit by a radioactive spider that just kills me instead of giving me awesome superpowers, Bart, the zone AI, gaining self-awareness and seeking revenge, killer ants teaming up and taking me down, a duel defending a beautiful woman's honor, Shark attack. A rogue group of Girl Scouts with a taste for blood. Zombies. Stumbling upon an active grave and getting possessed. Aliens that experiment on me. I could go on. Chapter 14. Q Admiral Akbar Impression. It's a trap! Teo gasps beside me as do many of the surrounding zoners. Chief signals to the guard on his right, who marches toward me with heavy-booted footsteps. He grabs me by the arm and drags me up the steps onto the raised platform of the podium. 
I trip over the top step, stumbling over myself, but his firm grip keeps me from falling to my knees. He holds my arms firmly behind my back. Although my muscles adjust to this familiar position, my gut knows this is out of the ordinary. I can hear my heart thudding in my ears, beating to the rhythm of my racing thoughts. His gloved fingers dig into my skin, and I'm sure he can feel my wild pulse through his thick, lever gloves. I scan the crowd, reading the expressions of the audience, hoping their surprise will reassure me that this is all some big misunderstanding. But all I see is apathy. Do all these people really care so little about me? Have I not lived among them for eight whole years? Worked beside them in functions? Sat next to them at meals? Even taken penalties for some of them? And they're not even moderately affected by this sudden turn of events? Chief reads the charges. Samuel Carmichael is hereby charged with the following crimes. Violation of Zone Code of Conduct. Assault. Defiance to Zone Authority. Conspiracy. And the felony of treason. Hush murmurs spread among the zoners. Treason? Are you kidding me? You can't possibly accuse... The guard silences my protest with a solid whack in the back of the knees with his baton. I cry out in pain and crane my neck to try to make eye contact with Ramos for explanation or reassurance or anything, but all I can see of him from this angle is the back of his head. This is a joke, right? Chief is really resorting to fake charges to finally get me out of the way? There's no way Ramos will allow this to happen. Chief continues. It has come to our attention that Samuel has been plotting to overthrow our zone leadership and spark a rebellion. Foster Jenkins stood up to him tonight, attempted to stop his plan of action, which prompted that altercation you all witnessed. This just shows that Samuel is willing to go to any lengths for this anarchy, even if it means betraying his closest friends. As a long-standing member of our zone, it may be hard to believe he could be capable of such hideous crimes. But let me assure you, that is simply just part of his manipulation. Because you have all been granted generous homes here, away from the horrors, upstairs. A rebellion would give the FPA cause to take those privileges away. Samuel was trying to get your homes, your freedom, your lives taken away from you. I let out a disbelieving laugh, shocked. That's a pile. The guard snatches my words right out the air as he shoves me onto my stomach, pressing my face into the rough wood surface of the podium with his boot. He presses his baton into my back, daring me to speak again. The spikes of his baton prick the edge of my spine. I groan, pained, feeling suddenly panicked. Ramos is going to stop this, right? I go through every scenario in my head, trying to imagine one in which I can turn this around on my own. But how can I turn this around if they won't even let me speak for myself? I think of Walter's frantic screams when he was pronounced guilty, the helplessness, and the echoing bang-bang of his sentence being fulfilled. Guilty, and then just gone. I strain my neck in Ramos's direction, trying desperately now to catch his attention, my only hope. He can stop this. He can tell everyone this was a mistake, that I'm not really a criminal. He can put Chief in his place. He can save my life. But nothing. Not even a glance in my direction. The very fact that he refuses to look at me confirms my nightmare. It was all a lie. Our deal. He really used my father as a ruse to get me to trust him. And now I'm paying for that mistake with my life. This is really happening. How could I have been so stupid? Chief continues that due to the gravity of the crimes, they would have to vote now rather than within the week. I wonder bitterly what Chief is offering as my guilty incentive. 50 RP? 100? 500? What lengths is he willing to go to make sure he's rid of me for good? I try to wiggle myself into a better position to see Teo, 
but the guard responds by squishing my face even harder into the wood. Scraps of the wood break off into splinters, like little knives that dig into my cheeks. There are a tense few minutes as everyone votes. They tap their wrist tabs and seal my fate, innocent or guilty. From my current vantage point, I can only see the zoners standing in the front row. They are close enough to hear my ragged breaths, to see the fear creeping its way into my eyes, the fear that is now slithering through my bones like a snake toward its prey. I study their blank faces. My neck stretches as I continue to look out into the crowd. I'm desperate to make eye contact with someone, anyone, to plead with them to vote innocent, to plead for my life with the desperation in my eyes, but no one even looks at me. I am nothing to them now. I wonder sadly how Foster is voting. How deep will his betrayal go? He already took Ella from me. Might as well also take my life. I can't believe how stupid I was to trust Ramos. I knew it. Every instinct was telling me not to, but I trusted him anyway. He made me vulnerable, fed me lies about my father just to get me to lower my guard. How long had he been planning this? Weeks? Months? I can't believe this is how they finally get me. After all this time, it really came down to a trap? I feel Walter's panic and fear as Chief delivers the unsurprising verdict. Time slows down to half speed, and the next moments are a blur. It's almost like I separate myself from my body. I observe in slow motion, as a separate entity, watching from afar. My shouts of protest that are unheard by an indifferent audience, that carry on with their evening. The guards that drag my flailing body toward the southern boundaries. I watch as Chief follows closely behind, removing a loaded magazine from his belt and clicking it into his point forty-five as he walks. Time and sound reunite at normal speeds. The cocking mechanism of his gun scrapes and clicks together, and I return to my body with a dropping sensation like I'm waking up from a dream. A hazy glaze remains over my vision, my senses muggy, the booted footsteps halting around me. Chief's low voice sounds hollow in my ears. I knew as soon as I met you eight years ago I'd have to do this one day. I snap out of the haze. Bet you just couldn't wait. I spit, remembering my rage, remembering how much this man has taken from me, and for what? Samuel, Samuel, you take things too personally. He chuckles, humorlessly, standing directly in front of me. He examines his weapon casually, rubbing off dirt and smudges with one hand, holding it delicately with the other. He is close enough where I could reach out and touch the graying beard on his face, close enough where I can see the sweat gathering at his brow. If I could free my hands from the firm grip of the guard, I could get a solid hit in. Would that buy me enough time to get far enough away? Where would I go? I'm a simple man, he continues keeping steady eye contact. As he speaks, I'm surprised I don't see the usual malice flooded in his eyes. His expression isn't hate-filled as it usually is when he communicates with me. Now, it's only worn. Tired. The wrinkles around his cheeks look deeper than usual. Canyons, now. That betray his advancing age. Years and years of a permanent grimace that is now carved on the creases and curves of his face. They put me in charge of discipline here because I'm a simple man. Follow orders. Do what has to be done. Take care of loose ends. I can feel the rhythmic purring of the gates behind me. The low vibration synchronized with my heartbeat in an unsettling symphony. The guards push me to my knees and cuff my wrists together behind me. Too tightly. The cool metal of the cuffs puts an unpleasant pressure on my wrist tab sending a tingling sensation down my fingers. I consider my options. Chief to my front. Electric gates to my back. Two guards on my left and two on my right. If I charge forward into Chief, it will only buy me a couple minutes. The guards will have to restrain me. He'll have to pick himself up and dust off his gun again, 
he'll probably draw out my execution then. Maybe shoot me in the leg first so I feel the pain and the fear. If I run backwards, Chief will probably just shoot me from behind. Or I'll get cooked by the gates. I realize soberly that that's it. My only two options. I remember Seth's charred corpse and shudder, considering how that death might feel. Would it hurt? Or would it kill me immediately? At least I would be in charge of my own end. I decide with sudden clarity that I'll do anything to keep Chief from winning. Anything. Even if it means I end up like Seth. Blackened and twitching with the pulse of electricity flooding through my lifeless body. After everything he's done to me, I will not let Chief be the cause of my death. He will not get that privilege. I'll have to stall him. Maybe I'll get some answers before I go. So is that why you did it then? I ask, surprised at how level my voice is, considering what I'm about to do. To follow orders or to do what has to be done. I inch my way backwards ever so slightly on my knees, so slowly that hopefully the guards won't notice or at least won't care about my gradual, harmless movement. The material of my pants scrapes against the pavement as I inch backwards. Chief cocks his head slightly at my question, but doesn't answer. Instead, he tests the sights of his pistol, aims straight at me, left eye closed, and then lowers the gun again. I scoff. Really? After all these years, you're finally at a loss for words. I thought you'd love rubbing this in. Another inch. You'll have to just be a little more specific. He replies, almost disinterested. His eyes still uncharacteristically void of emotion. Why did I exaggerate your charges, or why did I exaggerate your guilty votes? Another inch. Why did you take my sister? Do you really hate me that much? At that, he actually laughs. There is so much you couldn't possibly understand. He takes a few slow steps closer toward me, closing the small gap I've been able to create. He taps the barrel of the gun into the palm of his left hand. This is so much bigger than you and me. He stops right in front of me. I've gradually inched backward enough that I can feel the energy of the gates pulling at the hairs on the back of my neck. The electricity creeps up my spine, buzzing through my muscles and tendons, almost like it's enticing me to fall backwards into its embrace. Like I said before, it's nothing personal, but... He whispers, crouching down so our eyes are level. You wouldn't believe how much they gave me for turning that feisty little bitch over. I slam my forehead into his face as hard as I can, our heads colliding with a dull thud. He staggers backward from the force of my hit, surprised. Although I can now feel my pulse in my throbbing forehead, I don't regret it. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. He stands up with a sardonic snort wiping blood from his bottom lip, the usual hate returning to his expression, his eyes flooding with the usual disdain. He raises the gun, and my eyes instinctively close. I will myself to act, just a quick roll backwards, and it'll be over. The force of the blast may even take Chief, too. Okay, on the count of three, bang, bang! The gunshots ring in my ears, my eyes shoot open wildly. Bang! Bang! My available senses scan for the point of impact on my body. Chest? Stomach? Head? Where does it hurt? Then my eyes focus and make sense of what is in front of me. Chief kneels before me, a shocked, empty expression plastered on his face, his hands covered in blood. His own blood. Mayor Ramos stands behind him. The gun still aimed. Chapter 15 If you try dying, don't you die trying? And other existential questions. I'm stunned as Chief's stiff upper body falls into my lap. 
I can feel his warm blood seeping through my work pants, making sticky contact with my skin, a violating, unwelcome trespasser. My body is still scanning itself, searching for the damage it had prepared itself for, making sure this isn't just some illusion. I'm sorry you had to see that, son, Ramos says quietly, helping me push Chief's body off of me and onto the ground. He lies stiffly on his side next to me, his face still positioned right at me. A final accusation. Chief's eyes are empty, unblinking, staring into nothingness, but it still feels like he's staring right at me. This should have been you, the eyes seem to say. Those eyes, just like Seth's were, empty shells. Ramos unlocks the cuffs, and my sore wrists cry out in relief. My shoulders and forearms are sore, tingling from the blood returning to them after what feels like years of firm captivity. The bodies of three guards are also lying lifeless around me, two on my left, one on my right, pools of blood seeping out next to them, flooding the cracks of the pavement with an angry red. The one remaining guard, his face still covered by the armor, kneels with his hands up, praying he isn't next. Ramos cuffs him to a nearby support beam. I feel cold, thinking back to just moments ago when I was prepared to die. All the fear gone, just ready to take my life into my own hands. Would I have actually done it? I'm quiet as Ramos helps me to my feet. He grabs my shoulders with both hands, nearly shaking me. Are you okay? He hugs me, suffocating me in his giant embrace. Told you to trust me, he says to the top of my head. A little heads up would have been nice, asshole. I mutter into his suit coat. He separates from me, but keeps one hand on my left shoulder. His eyes are compassionate, fatherly. I couldn't risk it. I didn't know who I could trust. He gestures to the fallen guards. Tonight was a test. My head is spinning, trying to process the events of tonight. All the betrayal I felt, all the anger, it still lingers. Like a whisper, a shiver on the back of my neck. Like the magnetic pole of the electric fence, breathing at me to come closer. It feels hollow. Ramos must read my mind because he smiles apologetically. I know you must be so confused right now, but we don't have much time. Uncuffing him from the beam, Ramos pokes his gun into the guard's back, ushering him to move. He gestures for me to follow, and just like that, we're on the move. My legs feel like spaghetti, and I probably look like a baby deer learning to walk as I attempt to keep up. He walks quickly, but quietly, in the shadows of the southern quarters. Although there is no one out at this time of night, we are careful not to be seen or heard. We sneak our way into Town Hall and to his office where there is someone waiting for us. I hear him and feel his presence before I see him. The light in his office is blinding, and it takes my eyes a while to adjust, my eyes had become accustomed to the dim past curfew lights of outside. Through my squinted eyes, I make out the shape of a man. He's older, I'd say mid-fifties, a graying beard and receding hairline, almost skeletal frame. A vaguely familiar face, though it's hard to tell through the distorted features who he is. He's sitting handcuffed to a metal chair that has replaced the usual sofa chairs. The man is a mess. He's crying uncontrollably, blubbering things like, Let me explain! And, I didn't mean for anyone to get hurt! Ramos instructs the guard to sit in the open chair next to the miserable man and is then also handcuffed. I look to Ramos expectantly, hoping for some answers. I'd love to finally be let in on whatever this master plan is that he's been carrying out. A little prior heads up would have been really rad. It sure would have made these last few hours less... 
I don't know, less of one of the worst nights, top five of my life? Coming face to face with what you thought was a sure death, and being wrongly accused of deserving that sure death, I might add. Being put in a situation where you'd consider taking your own life in one of the worst possible ways? Can someone just tell me it's okay I'm now having an existential crisis? It was almost anticlimactic. Like making your way up the roller coaster to the big drop, but right when you are about to make it to the top, it just suddenly stops. The roller coaster doesn't move backward or forward, just stops without explanation. And you're just left there stranded, like, hello, does anyone know I'm up here? Where do we go from here? I just feel weird now, in a guilty way, and a scared way. The first time I felt peace in a long time was when I was about to literally die. That scares me. The lingering nagging, that voice in the back of my head, keeps deepening the guilt. You wanted to die, it says. What would Ella think? What would Ella think if I had done it? Would she think I had given up? Would it have been more heroic to let Chief kill me? Would that have been easier for Ella to live with? See what I mean about the guilt? How can I possibly think like that when she's out there, probably terrified, and waiting for me to come find her? And I was really about to end my life without doing everything I could to find another solution? Ramos's voice startles me. Are you okay? I nod, unconvincingly. You've got to be okay, son, he says, his lips in a hard line. It's going to be a long night. He moves closer to the two men. He removes the black helmet from the guard's body armor to reveal a sweaty, reddened face. It's the face of the young, rookie guard that brought me to Ella when she got in that fight. He hasn't been here in the zone that long. How could he possibly have gotten involved in something like this? From the rising body count of the evening, it would appear Chief was right. This does go beyond just him and me. Exactly how many people were involved with the kidnapping of these children? From an anonymous, quiet zoner like Foster, all the way up to a high-ranking officer like Chief? How long has this been going on, and why? And of course, the obvious question I'd like answered. Where are they? Ramos gestures to the older man. Sam, you know Dr. Coombs, right? Our revered zone surgeon? Ah, that's why he looks so familiar. He looks absolutely disconsolate. He hasn't stopped crying this entire time. His whimpers are heaving. Desperate. Kind of pathetic. The kind where you know he'll tell you anything you want to know just to save his own life. We shouldn't have any trouble getting information out of this one. Please! He whimpers. Just let me go! Ramos continues talking to me. Almost like he's not even there. His tone is surprisingly bitter. Hardened. He almost sounds like me. Dr. Coombs here, it turns out. He says stiffly. After my extensive investigation this past week. Is quite deeply involved in this little scandal of ours. Would you like to explain, or shall I? Dr. Coombs can't formulate any discernible words through the wailing. Ramos sighs. Come on, Barry. That's enough. The wails grow louder in volume. Ramos pushes him by the shoulders, clutching the collar of his shirt with both hands, so his chair is leaning on the back two legs. I said that's enough. The chair falls back down onto four legs with a clunk, and the man's wails reduce to a quiet blubbering. His eyes wide and fearful. I wonder how long he's been here, handcuffed to this chair. Still deciding if I feel bad for him. It looks like the guard next to him is trying to decide as well. He watches the interactions nervously, preparing himself for his turn. So I'll say that again, Ramos continues. Would you like to explain, or shall I? Coombs sniffs. His voice is ragged and tired unsurprisingly. 
they forced me to uh 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 ramos interrupts holding up a finger the man whimpers before restarting quietly i was provided with sniff with a large sum of money to develop a a micro scrambler that could be inserted into the wrist tab in order to ramos prods impatiently in order to misrepresent an individual's location but still retain necessary functionality. Mm-hmm. Now tell him what you did to the kids, Barry. I fold my arms across my chest tightly. Not sure I want to know. Just please tell me she's okay. Please. Dr. Coombs doesn't answer. Just whimpers pathetically. Tell Sam what you did to his sister, Barry. My stomach drops, like that roller coaster has finally started its descent. I'm so sorry, he howls. I didn't intend for anyone to get hurt. I had never performed an insertion to the wrist technology before. It's a very complex techno-biological configure- His head hangs, now unconscious due to a blow to the head from a heavy encyclopedia off of Ramos's bookshelf. My pulse has slowed, anxious to receive the very news that has been haunting my nightmares. Sorry, I just couldn't listen to that incessant... Is Ella... I breathe. Ramos puts his hand on my shoulder. No, Sam. She's alive. Ella was Coombs' first successful trial of the Scrambler procedure. Although I'm relieved... I still feel the weight of what this means. So the other kids... Ramos doesn't have to answer. His hard expression says it all. Chapter 16 A rat's favorite game is hide and squeak. I shake my head slowly, feeling the weight of these needless innocent deaths. And for what? Money? They were children. Who would pay him to do this? And why? Ramos turns to the guard, who up to now has just been listening intently. His eyes now widen at our attention. That is what you are still alive to tell us. Look, guys, the guard says hoarsely. I don't know anything. We were all just following orders. I had no idea this... He jerks his head toward Coombs. What's going on? It's... sick. It's... Following orders from whom? Sergeant Hollows. He is our commanding officer, sir. We were just doing our jobs. Like I said, I don't know anything. I'm a nobody. Ramos cocks his gun casually, his tone flippant. The only reason I kept you alive was so you could give me information. But since you don't know anything... He points the gun at the guard, whose eyes widen. Okay, wait, wait, he says hurriedly. Just wait. I didn't think anything of it until just now. Ramos lowers the gun smugly. Two days ago, I was instructed to open the southern gate at exactly 11 p.m. and then close it again at 11.13 p.m. I thought the times were odd, but I didn't really think much of it. I just assumed someone was coming through to see you, sir. Two days ago, Ramos repeats slowly. Two days ago, I was trapped in my bathroom for hours with unrelenting... He pauses, considering. A split second passes before he cries out in disbelief. That bastard poisoned me! I snort at the thought of Ramos shoveling down his evening soup without even noticing it was packed full of laxatives. Ramos glares at me. Sorry, I say, holding back a snicker. It's not funny. He ignores me and instructs the guard to go on. Nothing really happened. That's why I never really thought anything of it. A black town car showed up at probably 11.05 and then left again a few minutes later. 
Did you see a license plate number? Uh... He thinks for a minute nervously. No, no, I don't think so. Ramos shuffles around to the other side of his desk and activates his desk tab. I follow curiously. He makes a few swishes and waves at the surface quietly. What are you... Accessing the security camera footage from two days ago. If we can get a license plate number, we can at least get a general idea of where the car came from. My brows furrow, confused. If there are security cameras around the zone, why couldn't you just watch them to figure out who has been taking all the kids? Ramos waves his hand at me, annoyed. His attention still focused on the footage in front of him. As he works, he mutters something about how obviously they conducted business in known blind spots and grumbles why am I wasting time asking stupid questions. We study the videos in front of us, looking for clues, but all I see are dark spots and occasional movement. There isn't much to make out from complete darkness and spotty resolution. He waves his hand to speed up the footage. Sure enough, at 11.05, a dark car pulls up slowly to the gate, a shadowed driver at the wheel. It disappears from view. We watch the nothingness on the screen for the next several minutes of footage. Our quick breaths, the only sound in the room. Ramos pauses it quickly as the rear of the car comes back into view. There. He flicks his thumb and index finger to zoom in to the paused video. The graininess of the footage and the poor lighting makes it impossible to read the whole plate number. Only the first three digits are discernible. 2-7-G. E2, Ramos declares. This car came from E2. The first digit signifies zone. Ella is in E2? Ramos doesn't reply as confidently as I hope for. It's our best lead, he says, shrugging. I know I shouldn't, but for the first time in a while, I feel a small shimmer, a tiny minuscule speck of hope. This is more information than we've known so far and I'm eager to get to work. He flicks his index finger again to resume the video. Before it disappears from view, the car stops suddenly. The brake lights shine in the grainy darkness. A man appears in view and approaches the driver's side window. A small item is passed from the man through the window into the driver. Ramos and I both peer closer at the display, trying to make out who it is. As the figure turns to walk back the way he came, his wrinkled face comes into view. Ramos shoves a stack of books and papers off the desk angrily. I'm going to kill him. He storms over to Dr. Coombs and starts slapping his face to get him to regain consciousness. Barry! Slap, slap, slap. Barry, wake up! Dr. Coombs groans and slowly comes back to consciousness. His eyes are tiny slits as his vision adjusts to the lighting of the room, but they widen real quick when Ramos holds him up by the collar again. What else are you not telling me? Ramos roars at Coombs, his face menacingly close to him and redder than I've ever seen it. I don't like when people lie to me, Barry. Coombs blubbers out a series of excuses. I don't... What are you... I'm not... Suddenly, Ramos whips the gun out from his side pocket, cocks it, and fires it at Coombs, shooting his lower leg. Blood splatters all over his shoes, the carpet, the stack of papers on the ground next to him. Coombs screams out in pain, wailing uncontrollably, nearly causing the chair he's flailing on to topple over. I blink, surprised, my ears ringing from the gunshot, but I don't interfere. In fact, after what I've just seen, it's my current personal mission to stay out of the mayor's way. Explain to me how you're on this security footage if you don't know anything else. Coombs whimpers. Please let me go, please. I'll ask you this again, Barry, and this time... Ramos waves the gun in front of Coombs' face, his voice scarily slow and quiet. 
You better not lie to me. Who hired you? Coombs continues whimpering and blubbering, a mixture of snot and tears running down his withered face. Losing patience, Ramos's thick hand flies to his throat and squeezes it tightly. His eyes bulge, his face flooding with a purplish tint. He gags and chokes. His shoulders thrash around, I'm sure causing the cuffs on his wrist to dig into his skin further. Vegas! Coombs squeaks, barely understandable. Pardon? Ramos cocks an eyebrow. He lets go of his throat, allowing him the chance to repeat himself more clearly. Coombs coughs and chokes, gasping for air. It takes him a minute to get his breath back enough to be able to speak clearly again. He goes by the alias Vegas. I don't know anything about him besides that, I swear. Coombs cries. I swear, please. How have you been communicating? He has only ever called me, and always with a blocked number. His voice is too modified to be able to identify. He also sends me messages. He nods to his left pocket, and Ramo searches it, pulling out a small stack of playing cards. He spreads them out on the desk, examining them closely. I step to his side to study the cards with him. The cards are a variety of different suits, colors, and numbers, appearing to have no visible pattern. I pick up the King of Spades and look at it closer. Something catches my eye inside the King's sword. Look, I say to Ramos, gesturing to the card I'm holding. He squints at it and then turns pulling a magnifying glass out of a nearby desk drawer. He sets the card back on the desk and studies the card. He mumbles as he reads the tiny writing on the card. What does it say? I ask. He ignores me and instead examines the rest of the cards from the stack. What do they say? I repeat, growing impatient. He returns to interrogating Coombs, but hands me the magnifying glass so I can see for myself. How were these cards delivered? Coombs moans pitifully, still crying from the pain of his wounded leg. I don't know. And that's the truth. They would just show up. He has eyes, ears, and hands everywhere. I think of Foster. What other zoners might have been involved in this? Who was driving the vehicle, and what did you give him? When Coombs doesn't answer right away, he repeats himself, this time slower. I study each of the cards, attempting to examine and listen to Coombs at the same time. Some of the messages are looped into the clothes or equipment of the Queen or King cards, and some are simply curved around the numbers or suits. The writing on the cards reveal really no information, and it's clear they were created specifically for Coombs. No one else would make sense of these messages if they ended up in the wrong hands. Most of them simply state a date and time, for which I assume are meeting times or deadlines for Coombs to finish the procedure. Others have vague threats or reminders of the agreed-upon incentives. Overall, pretty unhelpful to finding this Vegas or Ella. I gave the driver what I had been paid for... Coombs whispers breathlessly. The kids. Well, kid. And the instructions for the successful scrambler procedure. They said they planned to distribute the instructions to... to other involved surgeons. I returned my attention to the continuing interrogation. Who is the driver? He's only a driver. Not important from what I've gathered. Don't even know his name. From E2? Coombs nods. His face is growing increasingly pale from the loss of blood. His leg still dripping from the gunshot wound. It looks like he could pass out at any time. Ramos looks at me asking with his expression if I have any questions for Dr. Coombs. I take my chance. How did Foster Jenkins get involved in this? 
He said something about Vegas having his parents and a debt to pay? Coombe shakes his head. I don't even know who that is, son. Like I said before, he has eyes and ears everywhere. I'm sorry. Truly. I sigh. Well, it was worth a try. I look at Ramos. So, what next? He looks uncomfortable. He massages the back of his neck and doesn't make eye contact with me. You're not going to like it. He seems to forget his plan up to this point already hasn't been that great for me. Anything else I might not like about tonight would just be icing on the cake. Without explanation, Ramos seems to spring to action. He grabs a large canvas backpack from behind his desk and throws it over to me. It's heavy but manageable. I sling it around my shoulders and await further instructions, swaying on my sore feet, suddenly exhausted. But then in a split second, I drop back into full consciousness as I remember. It's like I'm shaken from a dream and thrust back into reality. Wait, I say. There's something I need to see. I turn back to the security footage still hovering over Ramos's desk as he watches silently, seeming to understand, or at least not question, my actions. I locate the footage for the cameras right outside Town Hall for the morning of the previous day, three days ago, right before Walter's trial, the day Ella disappeared. I need to know. I play the footage a few minutes before the time we were released from jail. The black and white video shows the front lawn and near barren trees in front of Town Hall. Various zoners come in and out of view as they make their way from different directions toward the upper quadrant where the mess hall is located. A few guards pass by as they enter the hall and disappear. The view cuts off right at the steps of the hall. I watch intently making sure not to miss a single detail. I watch for what feels like forever. After a brief period of nothing, sure enough, he comes into view. Foster. He walks into view from the mess hall. He's wearing his uniform, but no coat. He walks slowly, his hands in his pockets. He looks freezing, shivering or shaking noticeably. He waits, but not patiently. He paces in front of the steps, checking his wrist tab several times in quick succession. Then my heart stops. Ella comes running out of the town hall doors. Her arms are flailing wildly as she runs. I can't see her face. She sees Foster immediately and runs straight into his arms for an embrace. I want to throw up as I watch. He pats her back gently. She is visibly upset, and he consoles her for a few seconds. He lowers his head to say something to her, and they are on the move. They move in a southwestward direction towards the other side of the hall. He keeps his arm around her, comfortingly, as she cries. He leads her out of view, all within a matter of seconds. She didn't even suspect a thing. She trusted him completely. So did I. A tear wells up in my eye, but I brush it away angrily. I check the other cameras desperately, hoping to see where they went, but there is nothing. Anyone watching that footage would just think he was comforting her, like any good friend would. No one would ever put the pieces together. That instead of leading her to a comforting place, he was really leading her to her kidnapper. How did she get mixed up in this? I cry, outraged. Why would he do this to me? He let me search for her like a madman for days. He allowed me to believe she had run away because of what I had told her. He made me think it was my fault she was missing. How had I missed so many red flags? Foster is a terrible liar. He can't even lie as a joke. Anytime he tries, his ears get red and his eyes get twitchy. He always comes clean after only a couple minutes. 
How did he get away with this for so long? Ramos's hand touches my shoulder, but I shake it off. I don't want to be comforted. I want to stay angry. I want this betrayal to fuel me. I want it to envelop me and drive me to find her. I will find her. We need to talk to him, I say to Ramos. He ignores me and instead uncuffs Dr. Coombs from the chair and yanks him to his feet, keeping a strong grip on his forearm. Foster, I continue. He can tell us more information. He doesn't look at me. He avoids making eye contact and busies himself with moving Coombs toward the exit. I glare at him, refusing to move, knowing he's keeping something from me. He sighs and looks up at me. I just didn't want to worry you. I raise my eyebrow, a signal to proceed with more details. I tried to find Foster right before your trial, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I have no idea where he is. We have other objectives tonight, but finding him and questioning him is a priority of mine. We just have to keep moving. Ramos drags Coombs through the exit. So? He says. You coming or what? I sigh and follow, having learned by now it's no use to protest. Wait, wh what about me? The guard calls after us, panicked. I almost forgot about him, actually. Y you can't just leave me here. Ramos exits without a word, dragging Dr. Coombs behind him. Wordlessly, I follow them out of town hall and toward the hospital. My eyelids droop against my will, my footsteps heavy and slow. I am tired in every way. Mentally, emotionally, physically. Everything in me is begging for rest. Even just a few minutes. I tell myself soon, you'll have rest soon. But I know full well it's a lie. I haven't been able to sleep for days anyway. I follow the two men in the darkness toward the hospital, not really able to see much besides outlines of buildings and trees. I shuffle forward sleepily. Suddenly, I'm lying face first on the hard concrete sidewalk. Sharp pain throbs in my forehead. Really? I get up slowly, massaging my forehead, trying to make sense of what I tripped over. There is a dark, indiscernible bundle next to me. Flashlight, I mutter to my wrist tab, and the light shines me in the eye, causing loss of vision for a few seconds. My eyes finally focus, and I make sense of what is in front of me. It's a body. Not just any body. Foster. On his forehead, painted above his lifeless eyes, are three blood-red letters. Rat. Chapter 17 I always thought laughing gas would be a lot more fun. Ramos covers my mouth to stifle the screams, hushing me and soothing me quietly. He pats my back gently, giving me time to calm myself down. Shh, shh, he whispers. You've got to pull yourself together. I am disoriented. I can't get my body to move. Hey, he says, but I still don't move. I don't look at him. I don't look at anything. All I can see is Foster. His image fills every crevice of my vision. Hey, Ramos says again, more abruptly. He slaps my face twice, bringing me back to reality. I blink, shocked at the sting on my cheeks. Every minute is important for the remainder of this evening. We don't have long, and we don't have time for you to fall apart. Get yourself together. He slaps me again to get the message to sink in. I stand slowly, silently, rubbing my prickling cheeks. He pushes me forward, and I stumble toward the hospital, forced to leave my best friend behind me. Every time I think this night can't get worse, it does. Every nightmare I could have constructed, every possible horrible scenario I could have imagined, 
has become reality tonight. Something subconscious, some other will or force of nature, must be moving my two feet after Ramos right now. Because I know it's not me. I want to just crawl behind one of these buildings and disappear forever. I want to go back to Teo and Eddie, to tell them everything that has happened, to mourn with them, to develop a plan. I just want a second to breathe, to grieve, to work through these questions I have, to try to make sense of everything. But something is pulling me forward, this external force of nature, whatever it may be, knows my best shot is to keep these two feet moving forward after Ramos as much as I want to just fall to my knees. So I keep moving forward and try to blink away the image of Foster that is now burned into my eyelids forever. Dr. Coombs still sniffles pathetically, but remains quiet as we move silently into the empty building. The sterile, too clean smell of the hospital, mix of chemicals, and lemon-scented cleaning products whisks me back to my first week in the zone eight years ago. They had separated Ella and me for orientation, and it felt so weird not holding her in my arms. It felt like I was missing a limb or something without her warm presence in my arms. I hated it. I worried about her so much then, wondering if she was scared or if they were hurting her. I sat nervously in the waiting room for my turn to be processed. Alone. Hungry. Scared. Cold. It's exactly as cold now as I remember. And I'm pretty much exactly just as alone, hungry, and scared. A wave of the surgeon's wrist tap gets us into a back room located behind the patient examination rooms where zoners go to be treated for sicknesses and wounds. The lights in the room flicker on, recognizing our emotion. I cover my eyes with a groan, blinded by the sudden brightness. The bright white room, floors tiled with pale yellow and white squares, and walls covered with a sickly, greenish floral wallpaper, is small and only contains a desk with a computer, an examination table, and a few different monitors and tools. A tiny sink in the back has the normal doctor necessities. Soap, gloves, syringes. Ramos throws Dr. Coombs onto the wheeled stool, and it rolls backward from the new momentum. Dr. Coombs cries out pitifully as his shoulder collides with the back wall. Ramos grabs a few items from the cupboards above the sink. Moist towelettes, gauze, bandages, tweezers. He throws them at Coombs and gives him time to dress his wound. I stare at him in disgust, examining the deep wrinkles around his eyes, which betray a time in his life where laughter sketched itself into his face. How do you go from that to literally mutilating kids? How do you get to the point in life where any sum of money can drive you to doing something so awful? He deserves whatever comes to him. My only hope is Ramos doesn't go easy on him. Ramos finally breaks a silence. He doesn't talk to anyone in particular, just thinks aloud. The FPA believes Sam has been expelled. Chief Hollows sent the charges and the verdict to HQ immediately after the vote. Soon after an expulsion, we are supposed to remove and deactivate the wrist tab to let them know it has been carried through. He was right. I don't like where this is going. Before long, they're going to notice that your tab is still active. He turns his attention to Dr. Coombs, who up until now has been unaware of his involvement in our next steps. He stopped the bleeding on his leg with several bandages and gauze. He has now been massaging out his bruised shoulder and halts mid-rub when he notices Ramos watching him expectantly. His eyes widen. Not me. I can't. Ramos reaches for his gun at his waist. Dr. Coombs whimpers. Please. You're going to help us, Barry. Or I'm going to kill you. Ramos says simply. 
you will program the scrambler to appear as deactivated instead of as a pinpointed location. I protest, really not fond of the idea of Dr. Coombs splitting my wrist open and potentially rupturing my ulnar artery. Don't I get any say in this? Ramos looks at me stupidly. Do you want to save Ella or not? It's not a question. He knows my answer. I clutch my wrists in grim acceptance. How bad can it be? It's now three o'clock in the morning. At this point in the evening, I wish Chief had shot me in the head when he had the chance and put me out of my misery. It took Coombs two hours to implant the scrambler to my wrist tab. Although it doesn't seem like a win to me, considering my hazy vision, headache, and inability to walk straight, Coombs was very proud to report that I only lost a quart of blood during the procedure. You lost four ounces less than... well, never mind. The plus side is Ramos has given me 30 minutes to take a quick nap while he takes care of Foster and Chief. I've also requested he let Teo and Eddie know I'm okay. Those guys are probably a wreck thinking about what they assume happened to me. At least I hope they are. What kind of friends would they be if they aren't? But I guess the lesson of the night is that people can surprise you. I drift out of consciousness as I wait for him to return. I don't fight the sleep that comes. I watch curiously as Ella digs into my wrist with tweezers, trying to attach the implant to my tab. She isn't gentle. She ignores my screams of pain and keeps digging, twisting, and prodding with the tweezers. Patches of blood, my blood, stain her white surgical coat. I can hear my blood dripping drop by drop onto the ground. But it's not the yellow and white tile. It's the fake grass outside town hall. Foster sits cross-legged nearby plucking out the blood-soaked needles of grass and tying them into a bow. He hands them to me with a grin, his freckled skin stretched over his cheekbones. I try to get up but realize my ankles have been strapped to the examination table. My feet are bare, cold. I don't see him, but Chief's voice echoes in my ears. Samuel Carmichael has been voted guilty and will be sentenced to immediate expulsion. The word expulsion repeats and echoes over and over again. Ella mouths the words, but it's Chief's voice coming out of her mouth. Expulsion, she mouths. Samuel Carmichael has been voted. Sam, wake up! Burly hands on my shoulders shake me to consciousness. I gasp in surprise and sit up quickly, sending a rush of blood to my brain that makes me dizzy. Ramos hands me a black hoodie and granola bar and instructs me to eat and walk at the same time. My wrist throbs with a dull pain, like a growing pain or cramp, just a lingering, constant ache that extends all the way up my arm and to my collarbone. I shiver thinking about the dream I've just awoken from and feel a twinge of pain thinking about Ella digging around in my wrist with tweezers. At least Coombs put me under for his procedure. Our footsteps crunch on the ground. We pass the elder quarters and continue northwards. He's wearing the large canvas backpack around his shoulders, and he carries a small metal box in his left hand. We have to get out of here before the others wake up. This will never work if people know you are alive. Out of here? Where's Dr. Coombs? I ask groggily. He doesn't answer, only looks at me with a solemn expression. Oh. Ramos's body count is sure climbing fast this evening. How is he going to explain all of this to the FPA? He changes the subject. Let's review what we know. Ramos says quietly, careful to not wake up zoners as we pass by the cabins. We know that three days ago, 
after being released from your overnight stay, Foster lured Ella to the hospital, where he handed her over to Coombs. She remained there at the hospital, where she underwent her... He glances over at me and chooses his next words carefully. Procedure. There she stayed until the following night. At 11.10 p.m., she exited C9 in a black town car from E2 and was taken to someone who goes by the name of Vegas. And for whatever reason, this Vegas person doesn't want the FPA to know Ella is there. Hence, the scrambler. So that's all we know. I feel sick thinking about why this Vegas dude would want Ella and all these other kids. I can't wait to find him because I'm going to kill him. Brutally. We've now walked all the way up to the northern boundaries. It's eerily quiet. Too quiet. I remember waiting here at this threshold just last week, begging Seth to come back before he hurt himself, and then watching his body writhe and squirm in agony as the electricity burned him alive. I shiver. I realize the airspace around us lacks that same buzz of electricity, let alone the warning sirens. Ramos hands me the backpack and the small box. He smiles reassuredly. You can do this, he says, his hand on my shoulder. You can find her. I know you can. I laugh incredulously. That's it? He can't be serious. He seems to not realize the complete lack of information he's given me. The lack of instruction or even preparation of this so-called plan. I've got to be missing something here. A crucial piece of the puzzle. There's more to the plan that he's just not told me yet, right? I finally find my words, at least enough of them to formulate what I consider to be the most basic and obvious questions. How do I know where to go? What do I do when I find her? Wordlessly, he presses a series of buttons on the small metal box in my hands. The sides of the box fall open and begin expanding and unfolding, morphing into something new. I drop it in surprise. It clanks on the ground but continues unfolding, growing larger in size. Ramos clicks his tongue at me disapprovingly and inspects the object to make sure no damage has been done due to my negligence. My eyes widen as it completes its transition into its final shape. No freaking way. Ramos smiles and hands it over to me carefully. I take it from him, reverently, and absorb its beauty in complete awe. I stroke the cool titanium finish, the matte gray of its surface. I admire the curves and the grooves, every marking, every inch of it. It's a mag board. I've been lusting after these on the marketplace for years, dreaming about cruising through C9, about feeling the cool air on my cheeks as I fly by the other zoners. In these daydreams, I always point and laugh pretentiously at the other zoners that aren't cool enough to have such luxury, to have the privilege I have. These daydreams are crushed often by the sobering reminder that I will never earn enough RP to buy even a broken one. But here it is, in my hands. Ramos touches the head of the board, powering it on and causing it to shudder to life in my hands. A blue halo of LEDs light up around the curved edges, casting a blue shadow on the ground below, near my feet. Ramos touches the head again, and a distorted lit-up projection casts onto the ground a few feet ahead. I look at Ramos confused. He gives me a look of, Must I do everything myself? And sets the board on the ground. The board recognizes the surface and rises a few inches off the ground, making the projection cast on the ground in front of the board now crystal clear. My eyes widen. It's a map. I've plugged in the coordinates I have for E2. This should get you there. Stay on the roads. If you go off course, the map will lose its signal. 
so you'll be lost underground. Oh, but no pressure or anything. My hands tighten around the straps of the backpack. Once I report that Chief Hollows was killed by a rogue guard, an investigation will commence, and FPA agents will likely come to the zone using the same roads. It's also possible they could find out we disconnected your tab and that you're still alive. Stay hidden, especially when the lights come on during the day. You'll be more easily spotted in the daytime. Don't trust anyone. He pauses, I'm sure expecting me to ask more questions, but I'm way too overwhelmed with everything that has happened to even formulate my own thoughts. I'll leave a signal for you, for when you come back. He points to Town Hall in the distance. Light on in the steeple means it's safe. Light off means I've been compromised. His eyes are kind, but clouded, concerned. He knows the chances of this working are impossibly low. He brings me into a tight hug, and I hug back, gratefully, still not sure why he would risk so much to help me. Find her, he whispers, and then get back here safely. Chapter 18 A Weirdly Nostalgic Run Through the Desert It took a few minutes for me to get comfortable on the unsturdy surface of the mag board. Several falls backward in surprise due to my too eager accelerations. Several falls off either side as I try to get used to steering with just the weight and positioning of my hips. Many attempted slower takeoffs and retries, but eventually I got the hang of it, and now, as I speed through the unknown ahead of me, I never want to walk again. I don't think I'll ever really get used to the unsure wobble beneath my feet as I glide inches off the ground or the magnetic push and pull with the road as I ride across it. It is a constant rhythm, one that tickles the soles of my feet and sends vibrations up my calves. I'm still pretty wobbly and a bit motion sick, but I feel like I'm flying. I'm finally free. Two of my biggest dreams have suddenly combined into one experience, escaping C9 and riding on a mag board. And it's everything I dreamed of. The cool air whisking my face as I speed through the damp darkness. The butterflies in my gut with every sharp turn or curve. The space in front of me that is finally new and mine to explore. Nobody telling me to slow down or to get back to work. No more threats or penalties or chief yelling in my face. No gray uniforms around me. No more dull fear that fills our routine as much as our meaningless work. After being trapped for years in C9, it's hard to believe I'm finally out. I press the arc of my left foot down to accelerate, bringing my board up to a breathtaking rate. I stretch my arms out beside me and soak in the feeling of this control. I ride along the road as fast as I can go, the butterflies in my stomach telling me faster. The mostly dark space around me and the chill on my face only heightens the thrill of the ride. Since it's still late, really the only light is from the dim, orange street lights that line the road intermittently, stretching for miles ahead. The landscape on either side of the road is sandy darkness, not completely black but shadowed at this time of night spotted with mounds of dirt that have hardened into different shapes from the cycle of wetting and drying from the irrigation rains. It actually looks a lot like the Arizona desert I grew up in. A strange nostalgia warms me. Huh. Never thought I'd ever miss that ugly desert brown. But overall, the silence is what is the weirdest to get used to. No persistent buzz of electric gates. No guards yelling through my wrist tab. No one around me laughing annoyingly loud or arguing with their roommates. Everything is just finally quiet, except for the whoosh of air around my ears as I fly across the road and the chirping of crickets, cicadas, and other insects that have made this new space their home. 
two headlights suddenly come into view in the distance on the road ahead of me. In panic, I slam my heel down on the board too forcefully. The board squeals to an abrupt stop, thrusting me face first onto the road. My face and elbows scrape across the pavement as I tumble to a stop. Groaning in pain, I crawl as fast as I can over to the board. I touch the curved edge on the left side to power it off. The glowing blue LEDs switch off and it clanks to the ground. I snatch it quickly and take off into the dark unknown to my right. Crouching as low as I can, I sprint through the sandy landscape, praying the dirt mounds will be enough to shield me from view. Looking over my shoulder, I can see the headlights growing brighter and brighter as the vehicle gets closer. I push myself faster, crouched low to the ground, hoping I can put more distance between myself and the road before they pass. To my horror, a large black pickup truck screeches to a stop at the exact place I just biffed it. Behind me, two doors are thrown open and light beams from flashlights cut through the darkness on either side of me. Hey! Get back here! The shouts behind me are gruff, authoritative. I sprint faster, horrified that they had seen me, clutching the mag board against my side tightly. My only hope now is to outrun them, but is that even possible? It gets darker the farther I get from the road and the orange street lights my feet sinking into the dirt with every step. The dark shapes I race past are only faintly lit up by the overhead moonlight. Boots making contact with the ground and the shouts behind me grow in volume as they chase after me through the shadowed sand. Stop! Don't trip, Sam. Don't trip. Flashlight, I murmur breathlessly into my wrist tab. With new visibility, I confidently zigzag through the obstacles. I look back over my shoulder, and my heart drops. They are gaining on me. Two men, both dressed in black. One has a baseball cap on, the other is bald. They both wield flashlights and what looks like tasers on their belts. Guards? I push myself faster, telling myself I will not be caught. I will not go back to C9, at least not without Ella. The distance between me and the men grows. I continue sprinting straight ahead, hopping over obstacles as they come. I run as low as I can, hoping to hide my figure with the surrounding mounds. Faster. I memorize the space in front of me, the placement of the mounds, the available valleys between them faster. I just need enough space to escape their light beams for just a second. Just a few seconds is all I need. I look over my shoulder. Is this enough? I whisper to my tab to switch off the light and take a sharp left. I sprint in this new direction as fast as I can. Get as far as I can in these few available seconds. Time's up. I dive behind the biggest mound around me and flatten myself into the cool sandy earth, praying they will continue running straight. Please, please let them go straight. Their light beams bounce from point to point as they continue chasing what they think to be me. Don't move. Don't breathe. Cold sweat prickles across my forehead and in my armpits. Their shadows bounce past the flashlights scanning the area. To my relief, they continue moving straight, unaware that I made a sharp change of course. They slow when they realize they can't see me anymore. The light beams separate and begin searching the area. The bald one makes his way left as the one with the hat goes right. I will myself to sink into the earth, praying it will just consume me like quicksand. I cover my mouth tightly, hoping my anxious breaths or the cloud of fog they create won't give me away. 
They shout for me to show myself, that they are here to help me, they won't hurt me. Who are these guys? They search behind mounds and inside potholes in the surrounding space for several minutes, searching for any sign of me. The stretching shadows of boots get dangerously close. The light of the flashlight now shines directly above me. I squeeze my eyes shut and hold my breath. Is this it? An indiscernible shout comes from across the landscape from the man with the hat, causing the bald one in front of me to turn, his light beam shooting across the opposite direction. Another shout. To my surprise, he breaks into a run toward the shout, yelling over as he runs. You got eyes on him? Both men start running in the opposite direction, continuing to shout toward something that's not me. Their light beams shrink as they get farther into the distance, and after only a few minutes, it's silent and dark again. Are they really gone? I'm not going to risk it. That was far too close. I lay perfectly still in the sand for two entire hours, praying that while I lie here, they've moved on down the road again and have given up the search. I drift in and out of a light sleep, never fully able to relax as a constant deep shiver from the cold runs through my blood. I finally decide to allow myself to move, reasoning that I'm definitely not important enough for two random men to spend two hours looking for aimlessly in the desert. I should be in the clear now. I stretch my neck up and around the dirt pile in front of me, scanning the area for any sign of the men or the headlights of the truck. Nothing. By the time I push myself up off the ground, the sunrise lights have begun to brighten warmly as it gets closer and closer to morning. The warm lights, however, do nothing to warm up the chill, and if anything, just make it worse in contrast. I stretch out the tightness from remaining still for so long, and I remind myself I need to be more careful. I got way too caught up in the freedom, the escape, and the magboard experience that I got reckless on the road. I had momentarily forgotten the very real dangers of being caught out here. Especially after what all happened at C9 tonight. Especially since I'm supposed to be dead. But I'm relying on a corrupt surgeon's beta technology to keep the fact that I'm actually alive a secret from the FPA. So, yeah, it's really not a good idea for me to get caught. So moral of the story, don't get caught. It's funny because I got so caught up in the feeling of freedom but the reality is that I'm not really free. Who knows if I ever will be. It was just an adrenaline fantasy that caused me to almost lose everything we worked for tonight. I can't let it happen again. I pick up the mag board and power it back up. The bright blue lights sting my eyes that have gotten used to the dimly lit shadowed landscape around me. I expect the board to project the map onto the ground ahead of me, like it had before. But all it projects is a loading sign. The loading sign circles and circles, but nothing comes up. Ramos's warning from earlier echoes in my brain. If you go off course, the map will lose its signal, so you will be lost underground. I curse at myself. Really, Sam? I set the board on the ground. I wait a few seconds as I expect it to rise and await its passenger. I nudge it with my foot. I groan, cursing again. I guess the mag component of the mag board only works on the road too. I roll my eyes at my own stupidity. Of course. Why would they spend time and money treating unused dirt with the magnetic components when important people would only ever be on roads. I sigh and start making my way back toward the direction of the road. I guess that's the only way, to risk it on the road. I'll just have to be more careful, stay more alert. As I walk back toward the road, I touch various buttons on the mag board to familiarize myself with its different features. A projected menu displays different personalization options, 
like the color and brightness of the lights underneath, different heights of elevation off the ground, sensitivity preferences, a choice of right or left foot acceleration and braking, and the choice to set a max speed. I also figure out how to set different foot controls like the ability to tap my left toes twice to turn the lights on or off and tap my left heel twice to view the next step in the navigation. It's then that I realize I've been walking toward the road for a while. Did they really chase me this far? I look around, expecting the road and street lights to be close by, or at least in view. The space around me now illuminated in warm morning light. Nothing. I spin around in all directions, hoping I will be able to spot the orange glow of the street lights, or some kind of sign I'm at least making my way in the right direction. Still nothing. Well, just when I think this morning can't get any worse, I get lost underground. Signs I'm possibly going insane. 1. My wrist tab flashlight keeps casting shadows all around me that keep scaring the bejesus out of me. You'd think after the twelfth time, I would realize it's not a ghost, dark figure, or apparition following me, but it gets me every single time. 2. To entertain myself, I've begun singing all the old TV commercial jingles I can still remember, which manifest themselves at odd times, such as this. I'm currently working on a mashup of a diamond company and an accident attorney local to Arizona. It's pretty sick so far. 3. I spent a good couple hours using my very little geographical and topographical knowledge to determine where this part of the underground is located. I narrowed it down to underneath either Albuquerque, New Mexico or Memphis, Tennessee. I ultimately decided on New Mexico. I like the idea of that better. Feels closer to home. 4. I just had a full-blown conversation with Santa Claus about how his naughty and nice list is pretty exclusionary, and also why didn't he interfere when all the other reindeer were bullying Rudolph, and just knowingly let them all pick on him and not let him join any reindeer games. Kind of a dick move, Santa. 5. Even though it's really unclear how I'm even going to survive, I somehow still believe I'm actually going to find Ella. Chapter 19 More hallucinations? Or is this just what hope feels like? According to my tab, it has now been three days since escaping C9 and subsequently getting lost in the cold, dark unknowns of the unused underground. Try saying that ten times fast. It's currently 10.17 p.m., well past sunset, so my wrist tab illuminates the path ahead. I'm sleep-deprived, hungry, and definitely starting to have some crazy hallucinations because of it. I'm also still wet from this morning's irrigation rain, so on top of sleep-deprived and hungry, I'm also wet and extra cold. Ella is constantly on my mind, and it's making me insane, so that could also be contributing to my hallucinations. Am I okay? No, probably not. But what even defines the term okay anyways? Ella is definitely not okay, so I don't deserve to be either. She could be absolutely anywhere. I'm basing this entire plan, well, the plan before I utterly decimated it, off of guesswork. What if I get all the way there and it's too late? What if I get all the way there and it turns out she was never even there? What if I truly never see her again? Ugh, see what I mean? This desperation to find her, the constant imaginings of where she is and what could be happening and slash or happen to her, how she must be feeling. I can barely even keep my feet moving thinking about all of this. The part of me that keeps questioning if she's even still alive just wants to lie down and quit. To just lie down and stop existing. To let my body and soul shrivel up and sink into the earth. 
A world without Ella is a world I don't even want to exist in. But a tiny part of me, the part that keeps these two feet moving, is at least a little reassured that wherever she is, whoever has her, I know she's giving them hell. I've had to ration what's left of the water and trail mix Ramo stocked in my backpack. I went a little too hard on the beef jerky the first night, so that is off limits until further notice. I've decided for now that my best and only option is to keep walking. Eventually, I'll run into a road or another zone with a signal I can use to pull the map back up. They always told us the nearest zone was too far to walk to, but I always thought it was an exaggeration to keep us from running away. Guess it wasn't an exaggeration. But until I find something, I've collapsed the magboard back into its tiny box form and stuffed it in the bottom of my backpack. So dumb that something so cool is so completely useless right now. At least I got a few hours of joy with it before it just became extra weight. I take a sip of my water to soothe my dry throat, careful not to drink too much. I hate myself thinking about how if I had just gone in the right direction back to the road, I would probably already be in E2 right now, gathering more clues on Ella's whereabouts, rather than just walking aimlessly in the barren sandy wasteland of the underground. Ramos gave me literally one job, stay close to the road so you don't get lost. He should have known to give me at least a backup plan, preferably two. So this is his fault, really. I wonder often how he's doing. I left C9 behind in basically ruins and bodies. Chief, several guards, Coombs, Foster... That can't be easy to explain to the higher-ups. I pray he's okay. He risked so much to help me, to get me out. It would kill me if something happened to him because of it. I tell myself he's a grown man who made his own decisions. He knew the dangers, but I still feel guilty about all he has risked. If the FPA knew that he, one, killed a sergeant, two, killed several guards, three, faked an expulsion after a trial, and four, helped that fake expulsion escape, there's no way he wouldn't face serious consequences. Do expulsions apply to mayors too? I try to shake away the thought, to ease my own conscience mostly. I'm so caught up in my own thoughts that I don't notice it right away. Is that fire? I squint to try to see it better. My eyes finally make out a definite orange glow and rising smoke in the near distance. I switch off the light of my wrist tab that has been lighting my night travels. It's warm on my wrist from hours of extended use. I quickly formulate a plan. I'll walk quietly in the dark toward the fire. I'll approach the fire and keep my distance, staying completely unseen. I'll observe and watch from a safe and unseen location. With any luck, there will be some supplies there that I can snatch without being noticed. Maybe even a signal I can use to get my magboard map back up and running. My pace is quicker. My tired legs excited, I finally have an obtainable objective. It feels good to be moving toward an actual destination rather than just wandering. My pulse quickens for the first time in a long time with this new hope. As I near the orange glow, I slow down and tread more carefully through the gritty ground crunching beneath my feet. I crouch behind a dirt pile that is close enough to see them, but far enough for them to not see me. There are five silhouettes surrounding the fire, all sitting on a variety of items from crates to actual camp chairs. They don't make much noise, but it's booming compared to the absolute silence I've been experiencing the last three days. Their laughter, conversation, and, is that a guitar? Blend together into a harmony of sounds. I watch them from afar for several minutes, trying to stitch the sounds together into coherent information. I hear pieces of sentences, but nothing to really let me know anything I need, like who they are, why they're out here, where out here is exactly, 
etc. A shiver runs down my spine, mostly due to my wet clothes, but also from the anticipation. Their campsite is simple and obviously transient. It's clear they don't stay here permanently. There are two vehicles nearby. A dirty white truck with a patchwork camper shell over the bed and what looks like a dirt bike parked next to it. There is another dark silhouette sitting away from the group in the front seat of the truck, their legs resting on the edge of the frame of the open door. There are boxes and crates scattered around the campsite, as well as sleeping bags, both rolled and unrolled, near the fire. I squint to try to see if any of the crates closest to me contain any food or useful supplies. Maybe once they're asleep, I can snoop through them. My ears pick up a familiar tune being plucked out on the guitar. I can't place it, but it feels like a song my dad would have had playing in the car as he dropped me off to school, or as we drove to the hospital to visit mom on one of her shifts. An old rock song, maybe, that he would whistle to with the windows rolled down. I soak in the nostalgia and familiarity of the melody, trying to remember the words. My eyes close instinctively as the music soaks in. It's been so long since I've heard a guitar playing. I used to love that distinctive tinny clang of the acoustic. A low growl behind me rumbles. I shoot up from my crouch in surprise. I turn slowly and carefully. Creeping toward me threateningly, bearing its sharp teeth, is a huge dog? I squint at its dark shape doubting myself. A dog here, underground? Sure enough, pointed ears with white tips, long black snout, brown and black coat, white feet and tip of the tail. German Shepherd, I think? Maybe a mix? My surprise doesn't change the fact that it's still stepping toward me, teeth still really sharp, its growl still really bloodthirsty. I notice in surprise, and almost chuckle at the irony of it, that the dog has a pink floral collar. The cutesy collar is quite the contrast to the sharp teeth that could tear me apart limb from limb. I reach my hand out toward the dog slowly, shushing it, uh, her, and taking gradual steps back. Shh, shh, it's okay, I whisper, hoping I can show my innocence. Maybe make some kind of peace offering? I slide my backpack off my shoulder, carefully, thinking I could maybe snap off a piece of jerky to offer. I gotta say, getting mauled by a German Shepherd is really not the way I would have chosen to go. Famous last thoughts. Would it be worse to get mauled by a German Shepherd or a Chihuahua? Because a Chihuahua... To my horror, the dog barks in response. No, 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 no. Shh, shh, it's okay. Shh. I drop to my knees, hoping maybe by some miracle the camp didn't hear. But the bark seems to echo through the dark, bouncing off the upper beams miles above. I continue trying to shush her, but to no avail. Why? Why? What you find, loon? A female's voice from behind me calls out and steps follow, nearing. The dog barks back, and I shut my eyes, groaning. I guess this is where it ends for me. Suddenly, all I can smell and taste is the gritty earth that was once at my knees. My head is being pushed into the sand by a booted foot that doesn't let up. Tiny rocks mixed into the sand dig into my cheek and forehead. Good girl, Looney Loon, the female voice coos above me, then to me, gruffer. Who the hell are you and why are you here? She pushes down harder on my face with her boot for extra measure. My response is muffled by dirt and by the fact that when I try to answer, the boot pushes down harder. Other voices surround me, their voices blending together, a chorus of surprise, distrust, and even anger. One voice, from my upper left-hand side, sticks out above the rest, 
a child's voice. Guys, he says, nearly yelling so he can be heard above the rest. Guys, he's cuffed! The boot immediately lifts from my head, allowing me to finally breathe in air, rather than rock-filled dirt. Cuffed? I massage the back of my head as I pull myself up to a sitting position. My eyes adjust quickly to the dark crowd around me when I see the gun pointed at my head. I put my hands up, palms forward in surrender. Whoa, whoa, hey, hi, I mean no trouble. We'll do the talking. The man holding the gun has a deep voice, quiet in volume, but with a bass to it, a vibration that fills the space without being loud. He holds the gun steadily, his posture practice. His face is blank, expressionless. The whites of his brown eyes seem to glow like moonlight in contrast to his midnight colored skin. Yes, sir. I peek around the surrounding circle. It's been a while since I've seen a group of people so disheveled looking. They all sport patchy, mismatched clothing with unkempt hair and facial hair and a kind of crazy in their eyes that makes me think they'll do whatever it takes to survive. The people in the group are as mismatched as their clothing. Six people surround me, all different ages, genders, races. The voice at my upper left belongs to a young boy who looks to be around six or seven. His hair is long, dark, and pulled back into a ponytail. He is ghostly pale and bony thin, his posture kind of crooked. I notice how his right arm falls more limply than the other one. The flashlight his left hand holds doesn't help the translucent tint of his skin, but he's mostly covered, bundled up in warm flannel pajamas. He glares at me suspiciously when he catches me watching him. There is a tall woman standing next to him with sleek, dark hair, so long that it reaches her waist even pulled up in a ponytail. Her full lips are pursed in distrust. She pulls the boy closer to her side protectively and whispers something in Spanish to him. The man gestures with the gun for me to stand. I obey, slowly standing, my backpack still at my feet. I lean to pick it up, but the woman snatches it away. She and another woman, with salt and pepper hair, cut short, deep frown lines, and an oversized canvas jacket, begin rifling through it, tossing the contents to different members of the circle to examine. Hey! I begin to protest, but the gunman cuts me off with a look. He gestures toward the fire, and I walk toward it carefully, my hands still up. He instructs me to sit with my legs straight forward, and I do so, grateful, at least, for the tingle of the fire warming my cold fingertips and nose. Maybe my clothes will finally dry. Honestly, all of this sure beats getting ripped apart, although the dog sitting just a few feet away, still as a statue, eyeing my every move, reminds me it isn't off the table just yet. I've met German Shepherds in the K-9 unit at my dad's police department. I know full well they'll do anything they're told when trained by an attentive owner. Anything. The gunman steps behind me and binds my hands behind my back with what feels like a zip tie. Too tightly. It puts pressure on the top of my tab, which makes me feel lightheaded, and it pinches the skin on the inside of my other wrist. He secures my feet with another zip tie, too tightly. My ankles are crushed together uncomfortably. He leaves me, joining the rest of the camp members, who have grouped together on the other side of the fire. They talk in low voices, but not low enough that I can't hear them. The girl with the dog watches me nearby, slightly separated from the rest of the group. The dog sits slightly in front of her, protectively eyeing me but awaiting her command. The girl stands with her hands on her hips, almost like she's waiting for me. She is wearing a pair of glasses which kind of resemble diving goggles I used to wear when I took swimming lessons at the city pool. Night vision maybe? X-ray? 
outrageously unnecessary sunglasses? I can't see her eyes, but she stares in my direction, her expression untrusting, suspicious. I try not to stare back, but the way her deep brown skin glows next to this campfire is kind of mesmerizing. I look at the group, at the dog, at the campfire, at different areas of the camp, stealing peeks back at her in between. I'm really not trying to be a creeper, I swear. I'm just purely curious about her. Maybe it's the weird sunglasses. Maybe it's that she somehow has a dog here. Or maybe it's the fact she had me pinned down just minutes ago. But... Dude, you're staring again. Avert eyes. Ah, what a lovely dirt mound over there in the other direction. Peek. Her black overalls are torn at the kneecaps, and one of the shoulder straps hangs loosely at her waist. This time, I decide to just own the stare and smile, hoping maybe a little charm will help my survival odds. She turns away in response, stepping closer to the group's conversation. She pulls half of her hair up out of her face as she listens. She separates the hair into two little pom-poms that rest perfectly on top of her head. Even with half of it pulled up, her hair is still huge, the tight coils all perfectly symmetrical and bouncy around her face. I move my attention to the conversation, suddenly remembering I'm currently held captive and they could dispose of my body really easily out here. We can't kill them. It'll alert them right away. They're probably on their way right now. Who are these people? What are they doing all the way out here? Why aren't they in a zone? Why aren't these adults drafted like everyone else? My thoughts go wild thinking about the action-packed possibilities. Like them all escaping from a zone after some kind of revolt, sticking together out here in the wilderness like bandits, and forming this tight-knit community that would do anything for each other as they raid government convoys and steal from supply trucks headed towards zones. I think I watched too many movies as a kid. And in all honesty, with the solitude, the darkness, and the rationed food slash water the past few days, the overall lack of sleep, my mental state probably isn't ship shape right now. The dog continues to stare at me. She sits on her haunches, just a few feet away, still as a statue, barely blinking. Her dark eyes never break eye contact. I shift uncomfortably, the cold air slapping my cheek at the slightest movement away from the fire. She growls in response. I sigh, but try to position myself where I can remain still to keep this dog happy. I watch the group from across the fire. The young boy fiddles with the cube of my mag board, but he hasn't figured out how to open it yet. Just please don't drop it. They're probably listening to us through it right now, the woman who took my backpack says. I crease my brow as I listen to them refer to it and them. Are you talking about my wrist tab? I call across the fire. Their heads turn to me sharply, as if surprised I can speak English. No one answers. Cool. A memory from C9. It was Christmas Eve when Ella was four or five. Our zone leadership decided to reward us with a movie night to celebrate our hard work and the upcoming holiday. But it was really just a way to keep us distracted and occupied so the guards could take a night off and all go get drunk in Chief's quarters. They had us all congregate in the square. They set up a huge screen and projector and even had popcorn for sale. I remember it being so dreadfully cold. I tried to share a blanket with Ella, but she wouldn't sit still, so I could barely focus on the movie. It was some kind of girly cartoon princess movie. I remember being so disappointed that the movie choice didn't involve more explosions, or robot takeovers, or fast-paced car chases, but that kind of movie would have made us too rowdy. Ella, on the other hand, was uncontrollably excited. 
until we sat down to watch the movie. I guess I had forgotten that she had never seen one before. I just always talked to her about movies like she had seen them too. Her eyes lit up when she saw the princess on the screen, and she laughed so enthusiastically at the funny parts. It almost made me forget how cold I was. Ella never stopped talking about it, and I always pretended to be annoyed about the girly princess stuff, but I secretly loved talking with her about the only movie we've both seen. Chapter 20 Pink Floral Collars and Baseball Caps Not much for conversation, these folks. Do you guys not have one? I ask, confused. How do you breathe out here? They continue to just stare at me like I'm an extraterrestrial. The salt and pepper haired woman even barks a laugh in disbelief at my question. I analyze them back. Seriously though? How are they breathing? I've been told for the last eight years that my tab creates oxygen and I'll suffocate if I remove it. Is that all BS? Guess Teo's conspiracy theories may not have been too far off base. Well, anyway, I grumble, feeling dumb. It's disconnected. A tall, skinny man with a long, gray beard who resembles someone I'd expect to be able to play the banjo and spit tobacco into a tin can steps toward me. What do you mean, disconnected? His voice is slow, like honey dripping from a honeycomb, with a drawl from the deep south. His hands hide in deep pockets of green canvas work pants, with a red and blue flannel tucked into the waistband. Well, it's kind of a long story. Do you want me to start at the beginning? Crickets. Okay. I answer myself again. This isn't getting annoying at all. The short version, then. I take a second to assemble the most important details. So my sister was kidnapped by my best friend after I told her our mother died, so I kind of thought for a while that she ran away. But that's actually impossible in the zones because of the electric gates. I watched somebody get cooked once. Not pretty. Anyway. We found out that there is this big conspiracy where someone is rounding up kids for some reason, and they paid our chief a lot of money to help, and also our surgeon to implant. I'm just gonna kill him. The bearded man snatches the gun from the gunman, and cocks it as he steps toward me. We got to be smart about this, Beardsley, the older woman says, resting her hand on his inner arm, pulling him back toward them. Beardsley? I can't decide what would be better. This bearded man having been born with a perfectly ironic name, or the group having nicknames. Make it quick, boy. Beardsley drawls, still holding the gun. Okay, okay. I sigh. My wrist tab was implanted with a scrambler that tells the FPA I'm dead. The group huddles back together immediately and starts conversing again quietly. I hear bits and pieces. Obviously lying. Can't trust him. Probably undercover. How else could he get out? Um, excuse me? Guys? I call over to them. Yeah, I'm kind of in a hurry, so... They ignore me. Hello? You know I can hear you, right? As they continue to pretend I'm not here and carry on their conversation, the young boy wanders over toward me, walking with an obvious limp, still holding the magboard cube. To my surprise, he sits down across from me. He doesn't glare at me anymore. He just looks curious now. Hi, I say. Are you out here looking for your sister? He asks. He has a slight lisp. Actually, yeah. I reply. I think some bad people took her. 
He looks back down at the cube and doesn't respond. What's your name? I ask him. Pony boy. He replies, still studying the cube. What's yours? I blink, surprised. Sam. Is that your real name? It is now. There's a brief second of silence between us. You know, it opens if you press those three buttons at the same time. I nod my head toward the direction of the button, my hands still unavailable due to handcuffs of the zip tie variety. These ones? The board starts to open, and his eyes widen as it lights up and takes form. Whoa! I smile, watching his pure excitement grow. Pony? The Hispanic woman calls, her English heavily accented. Pony! She scurries over and yanks him up, pulling him sharply away from me like I'm a rabid animal. She grabs both of his arms and begins scolding him in Spanish at a NASCAR level speed. I don't speak Spanish fluently, but I do hear a couple words I recognize from Teo and Eddie's lessons, like hombre and mayo, peligroso. What does that one mean again? Sam was just teaching me how to open this cool thing. He holds up the board to her proudly. She pulls him by the arm back to the rest of the group, glaring back at me as she goes. He follows, limping after her, continuing to push every visible button on the board, messing up all the settings I had perfected on the way here. I sigh, feeling anxious. Will they just decide what to do with me already? Or at least listen to me when I talk? It feels like a waste of time, just sitting here all tied up. I've already wasted three days, wandering around through the sand. Any more time that I'm not on my way to E2 is just more time Ella is in danger, and more time that I'm not doing anything about it. I just now notice that the dog isn't anywhere in sight, no longer staring at me with those black eyes and razor-sharp teeth. Where did she go? Does this mean I'm in the clear? The group separates finally, and Beardsley approaches me slowly. He pulls a knife out of a thigh sheath and lowers himself down to my level. Wait, I protest, panicked. I promise I'm not here to make trouble. I'm just trying to find... To my surprise, he cuts the zip ties at my wrists and feet. Now get... Beardsley says, like I'm a stray cat begging for scraps. Ponyboy hobbles over and hands me my board. He smiles, grateful to have been able to play with it. The older woman throws my backpack at me. You'll walk away from here in that. She points. Direction. And you'll keep walking in that direction until tomorrow at 9am. I crease my eyebrows. Confused. So that's it? You're just letting me go? Can you at least tell me where... Beardsley begins counting down. Five. Four. I waste no more time. I'm definitely not interested in what will happen when he reaches zero. I fumble to gather my things, looking back at the group a few times as I scurry off into the assigned direction. Well, that was weird. I keep walking, but rifle through my backpack to see if anything is missing. It appears everything has been put back where I left it. All of my trail mix. Jerky. Water. They even left me the pocket knife Ramos had stored in the front pocket. Why did they just let me go? I definitely wouldn't have let me go if things were reversed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining they let me go. I'm just disappointed. Disappointed I'm right back to where I was before, wandering, walking with no idea where I'm going or how to get to the place I need to go. I had such high hopes when I saw the campfire at first. I thought it could be the answer to all my problems and get me back on track to finding Ella. Still lost. I stomped through the sand, kicking various piles for good measure, hating myself even more for getting lost in the first place. 
Although the weird thing is, I don't feel lost. It reminds me so much of home out here that it has been bringing me a surprising level of comfort these last few days. So I sink back into that nostalgia as I barrel through the dirt, hoping it might make me feel better. I think back to a memory. A happy one, actually. From before everything changed. I had to have been about seven years old. I was still allowed to go to school. To have friends. To just be a normal kid. A friend and I were riding quads through the desert by our neighborhood, because what else is there to do in Arizona? This desert was our adventure land, our space that felt like it stretched on forever to the horizon. We were having a blast going way too fast over mounds of dirt, taking sharp curves and nearly falling off, hunting for snakes and spiders as we accelerated through the Palo Verdes and dodged the cacti. I had no idea how my life was going to change in only a few short years. If I had known, would I have done anything differently? If I had known I soon wouldn't be free to ride that four-wheeler through the desert anymore, would I have gone just a little faster? My nostalgia freezes in place as the orange of another campfire glows ahead of me. Seriously. How many nomad groups are out here? I crouch immediately, determined to not have another run-in like my last one, as I'm sure I won't fare nearly as lucky the second time around. I approach quietly, inching forward as slowly as possible. I hear them before I see them. Not getting away this time. To my horror, there is a familiar sight ahead that I hoped I would never see again black pickup truck, the same one that screeched to a stop behind me only a few days ago and almost led to my capture. I observe the men sitting around the campfire. Sure enough, baseball cap and baldy. This time, they are accompanied by two other men and now have guns strapped to their waistbands. They obviously didn't have those before. Otherwise, they definitely would have just shot me instead of conducting a wild goose chase. And that's not all. I inch closer, squinting. Sure, I'm not seeing this right. Lying there in the dirt, tied to the back wheel of the truck, is a dog. The same dog, with the pink floral collar. What's she doing over here? A muzzle covers her snout. I snort at how karma really worked in my favor here. Take that, you mutt. But then I notice how her front left paw is raised and bent slightly so it doesn't touch the ground. I remember when my childhood dog Buddy hurt his paw once. He had gotten a nasty splinter after playing on some pallets we had in our backyard. He had held it just like that. Did they hurt her? I stay perfectly still behind this mound, determined to only listen, try to get some information on who these guys are, and then make a quiet break for it. No harm, no foul. But I can't stop looking at the dog, all tied up and muzzled there, teamed up on and cheap-shotted, possibly hurt. Wait, what? I shake the thought out of my head quickly. What is wrong with me? Not even an hour ago, that same dog was looking at me like a Thanksgiving feast, and now I feel bad for her? Nope. Time to go, Sam. I inch backwards silently, careful not to crunch on any collections of rocks. But then I think of X-Ray Goggles Girl. How worried will she be when her dog doesn't come back? Worrying and wondering all night where she is and if anything had happened to her. Will Ponyboy be sad when they realize she's gone? His little smile was so innocent and pure. Baldy speaks up. Now that we finally got some leverage, we got the upper hand here. All we have to do is nail the surprise tag, reveal the dog, and we've got him. All I'm saying is they better make it worth our while. Baseball Cap grumbles in reply. All this time we've been tracking these guys, 
better be worth it. Especially after all the trouble we had to go through with the feds to get this heat. He taps the gun on his hip. You know it will be, Kip. The bounty on the lady alone is worth our while. The other Anons are just the cherry on top. So they're bounty hunters. I think of the group I just left and wonder which lady they are referring to. The older woman or the one who was so protective of Pony Boy? What did either of them do to earn such a huge bounty over her head? Are draft dodgers and escaped kids really worth so much to the FPA that they would offer a bounty? I tap on my thigh anxiously as I watch here, considering what to do, feeling like I have an angel and a devil on my shoulder. Devil. Run, you idiot! Why are you even still here? Angel. But they did kind of spare your life. Don't you owe them at least a heads up that they are about to be ambushed? I consider the guns these men have. I think of Pony Boy's limp, wondering if he'd be able to run away like everyone else. Angel. He could get hurt, especially without a head start. My quads burn as I squat here, but I remain still. One of the men gets up from his folding camp chair and stretches as if he's been sitting there for a while. He saunters over to the truck and kneels in front of the dog. He waves what looks like a piece of meat in front of her muzzle, taunting her and laughing. The other men join in on the laughter as he continues to tease her with the meat. You want it? He goads. Go get it. He tosses the meat a few feet away. She doesn't fall for it. She just lies there, head resting on her good paw, seeming to know she's trapped. Did you hear me? The man gets closer to her ear, raising his voice. I said go get it! He laughs, a horrible, demonic cackle, as he continues egging her on, flicking her ears, blowing in her face, trying to get her to react. When she doesn't play along, he grabs her hurt paw and squeezes. She cries out and jerks her paw back, jumping back toward the truck and away from the man's touch. Aww! Did that hurt? He sneers. The men roar with laughter and throw various trash items at her. Empty water bottles, paper plates. I remain hidden, boiling with fury as I watch them. The dog steps toward him and growls deeply. Oh ho! The man chortles, standing. She's mad now. He grabs his gun from his hip and points it at her. I cover my mouth and crouch lower, trying with every atom of my being to stay silent. Angel and devil, if you intervene now, you die. Be smart, Sam. And what are you going to do about it? He says, his tone more severe. Huh? He flicks the gun upwards, threateningly. The dog stares at him for a long minute and then lies back down on her belly never taking her eyes off of him. Stupid mutt. He kicks her sharply in the ribs. She yelps in pain. He backs away toward the campfire, toward the other men, laughing. Suddenly, the dog lunges at him, pulling the rope tout, which stops her just inches away from him. He falls back onto his backside in surprise, the gun clattering out of his hands as he falls. The dog's growl rumbles deeply. The other men roar in laughter, pointing at him and making fun of the scared expression plastered on his face. They shout taunts at him as he pulls himself up. He laughs nervously, trying to play it off. You should have seen your face! Baldy is doubled over, pointing at him, his barking laughs coming out in between gasps for air. The man pushes Baldy's shoulders jokingly, but with a serious undertone, his face reddening with anger. Shut up, man, he says. I'd shoot that mangy little bitch right now if it wasn't bait. He pulls a beer can out of the icebox, cracks it open, and plops himself down on his camp chair, 
not saying another word. The rest of the men continue conversing, but I don't listen. My entire attention is on the dog. The dog and the black handgun that fell right next to her. Chapter 21 Dog People Are Their Own Subspecies of Human Before I really even know what I'm doing, I'm making my way to the opposite side of the truck in full stealth mode. I haven't really thought this through and I have absolutely no plan, but I somehow can't stop my feet from taking me over there anyways. Maybe my feet are the ones who can explain why the hell I'm risking my life for this dog I don't even know, and for strangers I don't even know, because I sure don't have an explanation. I always knew I was a dog person, but really, this? But complaints aside, in my heart, I know I could never leave her with these idiots after what I just witnessed. No one, not even an animal, that would attack me in one second if given the chance, deserves that. From the other side of the truck, I can still see the men talking around the fire. The dog is lying on her belly, her head resting on the ground between her paws. Her body is parallel to the truck. Her breaths are quick, probably due to the inability to pant with the muzzle. Slowly and silently, I pull the knife out of the front pocket of my backpack. I drop onto my belly and have to laugh to myself when I realize how ridiculous it is that I'm putting this much trust in an animal. This completely depends on her not giving me away. German Shepherds are smart though. Right? Guess we'll find out. I army crawl under the truck, slowly, caterpillar-like. She sees me. Her head tilts to the left curiously. Does she recognize me? Her blinks are slow, like she's recovering from some kind of tranquilizer. Hopefully she can still run, because we'll need to run like hell. I put my finger up to my mouth and whisper a shh, praying somehow she'll know I'm trying to help her. I crawl closer, remaining hidden under the bed of the truck. I slide as close to the edge as I can get, ever so carefully. I put the knife between my teeth and take a deep breath. Stretching as far as my arm will go, I reach for the gun. It's just out of reach. I extend my fingers farther, stretching farther. They barely brush the edge. I scoot out a tiny bit more, keeping my head low to the ground, aware that I am now poking out from under the truck. Stretch! Got it. Quickly but silently, I slide back to the shadows under the truck. I tuck the gun into my back waistband and take the knife back in my hand. All this time the dog has been watching me, staring at me with those black, deep eyes. This is where it gets tricky. I pat the ground in front of me, signaling to her to get closer to me. She just stares. I pat the ground again and then put my finger back to my mouth. Shh. It's okay. I breathe. I push myself backwards a bit and then crawl toward her to show her how. Come here, girl. It's okay. Slowly, she moves her body slightly in my direction. Yes, good girl. Good girl. I hold my breath, praying that the sound of her movements won't alert the men. I pat the ground again. She crawls toward me ever so gradually until her head is under the truck, right up close to my face. Her eyes seem to stare right through my soul. Using my pocket knife, I quietly begin cutting through the rope that is tied to her collar. As I'm cutting, I notice a bone-shaped tag hanging from the collar. Luna, it says, along with a phone number to call if she gets lost. I'm amused at the irony. Okay, Luna. Let's get you out of here. The last string of the rope snaps, freeing Luna from the restraints. I move backwards, continuing to pat the ground as I go. To my relief, she follows. We get to the other edge of the truck, and I stand slowly. 
Stay, I whisper to her, looking through the windows. She obeys and sits next to me patiently. The men are completely unsuspecting. They don't even notice she's no longer in view. Baseball Cap has even fallen asleep in his camping chair, his head limp, not stretched enough to rest on his shoulder. It just kind of hangs. I walk to the back end of the bed and squat down low to the ground. Stay, I whisper again to Luna. Crouched low in the shadows, I slip over to the nearest dirt pile, back the exact way I came. Come. Shh. I gesture to Luna to follow. She creeps over to me, her ears back and her steps careful. She waits at my side. We repeat this pattern until we have made our way to the other side of the campground. What the? Where's the dog? My heart drops. In the shuffle of confusion around the campfire, we do the only thing we can do. Run. Hey! Hey! The chase begins. Luna limp runs next to me as we weave our way around mounds and potholes as fast as we can. Shouts and boots bustle behind me. I crouch lower, pulling my head down to my shoulders as a shot cracks behind us. We run faster, zigzagging our way back to the other camp. We have put a good distance between us and them, but will that distance be enough to warn the others? They fire more shots in our direction. I grab the gun from my waistband and pull the top shaft down to drop around into the chamber like Dad taught me. I take a deep breath. I look back and take a shot. Miss. The shouts behind me grow angrier. I barely even pay attention to where we are going. I step heavily on a big rock and feel the pain shoot up through the arc of my foot. But I keep running as fast as I can, pushing the thoughts of the pain to the very back of my brain. I let Luna lead the way back as I continue taking shots behind me, aware that I probably don't have many shots left. Look back. Fire. Baldy cries out and trips, landing face first in the rocky dirt. I fire again, aiming this time for the man who kicked Luna. Miss. Fire. This time the bullet grazes his side, and he shrieks in pain. He falls to his knees, gripping his abdomen. I feel a smug sense of victory. The remaining two send shots our way but miss as we keep zigzagging through the shadows and valleys around the mounds. They try to keep up, but the distance grows until they are no longer in sight. We are close enough now that I can see the tendrils of gray smoke twisting above the fire. Hey! I yell, hoping we are close enough for them to hear. Run! Luna runs ahead, gathering speed as we near the people she loves. As I run into camp, I am met with dumbfounded looks from each of the camp members. Beardsley, the black man, and the older woman jump to their feet. What is going on? Beardsley shouts. Luna runs right to Goggles Girl. She gasps. Luna, where have you... Breathless, I attempt to relay the information. Bounty, hunters, guns, have to go now. Goggles Girl removes the muzzle, and Luna runs, nearly hopping, back and forth from me to the girl, barking hysterically. The black man grabs me by the collar of my shirt. What are you? You have to go now, I yell, despite being nearly lifted from the ground. They're coming, don't you hear me? They're coming after you. Luna returns to my side and grovels at the man. Surprised, he drops my collar. The girl gasps in disbelief. Luna! They have guns. We barely escaped. I say, still breathless. We? The confusion on Beardsley's face matches everyone else's. Luna barks in confirmation. He blinks in surprise. 
Luna barks again, almost like she's talking to him, pleading with him to listen. Bounty hunters! I yell wildly, frustrated that no one is moving or taking this seriously. I heard them talking. They've been tracking you. They're right behind me. Didn't you hear the gunshots? You have to move now. There is a shot behind me. I crouch down instinctively. Headlights of the truck cut through the darkness right toward us. Beardsley springs to action. La la, get pony, he yells. Red, help Q get in the back. Let's go, let's go. There is another gunshot as everyone rushes to their places in the truck. The Spanish-speaking woman scoops Pony Boy up and nearly throws him into the back seat of the truck. She climbs in after him and slams the door shut. The man, Red, Goggles Girl, and Luna hop into the camper shell covered truck bed. Red throws open the window on the other side of the shell and sticks the top half of his body through so he can sit on the edge of the bed. He cocks the gun and aims at the approaching truck. More gunshots ring out, ricocheting off the truck with a clang. Beardsley hops into the driver's seat, and the truck revs to life. To my surprise, the older woman straddles the dirt bike and kicks it started. Well? Beardsley yells impatiently at me. You coming or what? Chapter 22 The one where I add assassin to my resume. I'm frozen for a second, surprised. The truck begins rolling forward, and I have to sprint around the truck to make it in the passenger door before I'm left behind. I climb in and slam the door shut behind me, barely making it in time. Beardsley slams on the gas, squealing the tires and kicking up a tornado of dust around us. We speed off into the dark landscape, the black truck close behind. Gunshots echo around us, both from the man in the back and from the approaching enemies. I roll my window down. What are you doing? I stretch my body out and aim at the truck, bracing myself on the frame of the truck door. The cool air whips my face, and I have to squint to keep pieces of flying dirt and gravel from getting into my eyes. I fire off the last of my bullets, barely even able to see through the thick fog of dust, but hoping maybe one of the bullets landed where it needed to. I plop back down, and Beardsley looks at me, dumbfounded. I'm out. I toss the now useless gun into the center console between us. My ears ring from the blasts. In the back seat, the woman, Lala, is holding Pony Boy, covering his ears and comforting him. It's okay, it's okay, she says to him softly. The other woman speeds next to our truck on the dirt bike, using us to shield herself from gunshots from the other truck. She pulls a gun from her waistband. I watch as she slows the bike so she's next to the man in the back, who is currently ducking taking cover behind the camper shell. He stands again, takes a shot, and then ducks back down. The woman slows down further, so her bike is peeking out from the back of the truck bed. She fires at the truck, popping off three shots, maneuvering her bike with one hand. She speeds back up and approaches my window. They're after me! She shouts across me to Beardsley. Careful to still watch the space ahead. I'll lead them to the other direction so you guys can get out of here. Not gonna happen, Steel. He yells back, his eyes going back and forth from the dimness ahead of us and the rear view mirror. Don't you dare. She's right, I say. I heard them talking. When Steel backs up, and out of view from my side window, Beardsley bangs on the steering wheel. He points a finger at me, his face beat red and contorted. If you had anything to do with this, he growls, I'll tear you apart, I swear I will. 
You'll wish Luna had gotten a hold of you first. I'm a zone runaway, I answered offensively. They could probably get a nice bounty for me too. My answer seems to suffice for now, but he doesn't respond and instead continues to curse and pound on the steering wheel. I turn in my seat and make nervous eye contact with Lala, who is covering Pony's ears tightly. Through the back window, we watch Steel speed away from us and toward the approaching black truck, which can hardly be seen aside from its bright headlights. She swerves, dodging bullets and potholes. The dirt bike squeals as it accelerates past the black truck, its single headlight cutting into the dimness ahead. The truck slows. In a quick moment, our truck veers leftward, making a sharp U-turn, dust tornadoes out from under its tires, engulfing all of the surrounding airspace. We speed onward in the opposite direction. The back window that separates the bed from the cab screeches open, and Goggles Girl shoves her head through, her face twisted with an expression of livid disbelief. What are you doing? She slaps the glass of the window. Turn! Around! We can't just leave her behind! What else do you reckon I'd do, Q? Beardsley shouts back, eyeing her through the rearview mirror, his hands flying every which way. Risk the safety of everyone else? We knew they'd find her one day, and she was prepared to accept the consequences. No! Pony Boy cries. We can't leave her! Beardsley's right, Miho. Lala speaks up, soothing Pony Boy. Besides, she can handle herself. She'll be fine. The girl, Q, is interrupted by exciting barks from the back bed. I turn and my stomach lurches at the sight of headlights advancing behind us. Three headlights. The engine revs as Beardsley accelerates, his grip tightening on the steering wheel. I hear the familiar squeal of the dirt bike. Steel speeds to the left of our vehicle and gives Beardsley a salute before speeding past. She veers left and the truck follows, gunshots flying in all directions. A bullet ricochets off the driver's side mirror and clanks off the top of the truck. What in the Sam heck is she doing? Beardsley voices what everyone is thinking. We watch Steel accelerate faster and faster, the truck following nearly just as fast. They are getting closer, their bullets getting nearer to their target. Suddenly, her bike takes a sharp right. The sudden turn topples the bike over, and Steel tumbles off the bike nearly flipping over on top of her. Her body scrapes along the rocky floor, skidding to a stop. She lies still on her side, facing away from us. No! Pony cries. The tires of the black truck squeal and groan as the driver slams on their brakes and takes a sharp right, as Steel had done. The momentum causes the truck to flip, Time stops as it rolls and keeps rolling, as if in slow motion, the body of the truck crushing like a soda can with each roll, sending tidal waves of dust in every direction. Hell's bells! Beardsley slams on the brake so hard that my forehead slams on the dashboard, and I have to thrust my arms forward to keep myself from flying through the windshield. Red is the first one out of the truck. He hops out from the bed and sprints over to Steel, who is struggling to pull herself up. Stay in the car! Beardsley yells to everyone else. I ignore him and rush out to the wreckage, massaging the throbbing pain in my head. A drop of blood makes its way down my temple. Hugh has also ignored his instructions and runs next to me. She pulls her goggles down over her eyes shielding them from the thick dust coating the air around us. I keep my hand in front of my face as I run, but it doesn't do much. Particles of dirt stab my eyes. We reach steel. The dirt bike is crumpled 
a few feet away from her, upside down, the back wheel disfigured but still turning. Q kneels next to Red, who assesses Steele's damages. She assures them weakly that she's okay. I don't stop. I follow Beardsley to the flipped truck. Hey, Key! Red calls behind me. He tosses me his handgun and nods before picking up the very resistant steel to carry her to the truck. Q helps hold up her weight on her other side, asking repeatedly if she's sure she's okay. Too full of adrenaline to analyze Red's surprising support, I jog up to Beardsley. He slows and gives the gun a leery look through slitted eyes. I ignore the obvious mistrust and follow him toward the truck. The truck is balanced on its right side, the wheels still turning, the engine steaming and boiling. Stepping closer, I keep my eyes focused on every detail. We pass the obstacle that had caused such a sudden change of course. It is a huge trench-like ditch several feet wide and several feet deep. It would have swallowed the truck's whole front end and caused it to flip the other direction. It's a miracle they even saw it at all in this lighting. Did Steele know this was here? Is this why she was guiding them in this direction? Out of my peripherals, I see Baseball Cap round the corner, his gun drawn and pointed at Beardsley. My reflexes must act before I do because without even knowing what I'm doing, I'm firing the gun twice. Baseball cap flies back from the force of my hit and falls out of view behind the truck. Beardsley and I look at each other and I'm just as surprised as he is. We jog over to the other side of the truck. Baseball cap lies in the dirt in front of us, blood pooling out of his chest and mouth. Beardsley kneels next to him and checks him for a pulse. He looks at me and shakes his head once, confirming his death. Holy crap. If I slow down at all, I'll probably break down thinking about the fact that I really just took someone's life. So instead, I step over to the driver's side window. I can barely see into it, as it's still extended into the air. I step into the rim of the tire to get a better view. The other man from the campsite sits in the driver's seat, his head hanging limply, blood drips from his forehead, past his open and lifeless eyes, down his stained cheeks. His seatbelt holds him in place, but his arms hang unnaturally at the truck's unnatural angle. Hey, kid, Beardsley calls. He's about ten feet ahead, kneeling. I hop down from the wheel and run over. He's kneeling in front of another body. The body lies crumpled there face down, his arms and legs contorted at unnatural angles. His face is in the dirt, but I recognize him immediately as the man who was bullying Luna. It looks as if he was flung from the bed of the truck when it flipped. His shirt is stained red from where I shot him earlier fresh blood still pooling out. I scan the diameter around the truck, keeping my gun aimed and focused sharp. Where's Baldy? There was one more guy, I say as Beardsley looks at me questioningly. We look all around the truck and the surrounding space but see no signs of him. Huh. I put the gun's safety on and tuck it into my back waistband. We make our way back to the others. I did get a decent shot in when Luna and I were making a break for it. Maybe that took care of him. To my surprise, Beardsley laughs and slaps me on the back. Well, paint my nails and call me Mabel. You're all right, kid. Chapter 23 Maybe it's the smoke from the campfire getting to my head. A few hours later, find us back at the campsite, warming up around the fire. After squeezing the crumpled dirt bike into the back of the truck, we all return to the abandoned camp to find all the crates of food and supplies still waiting for us. I gorge myself gratefully on the hot soup they shared with me. 
It's bland, but my growling stomach accepts it without complaint. The steam I breathe in from the soup is helping to soothe my aching head. I can feel my pulse through my forehead still, but it has stopped bleeding finally and is already starting to scab over. It doesn't change the dull pain that still radiates through my head and down my neck though. It's really just impressive I'm even functioning right now. I can feel my body slowly shutting down, exhausted from the neglect of the past few days. My eyelids are heavy, but there is still some leftover adrenaline from the excitement of tonight lingering in my blood. I've had time to process what I did tonight. I'm a little worried about my soul, though, because I don't really feel bad. It was him or Beardsley, and I made a reflexive decision to protect him. Weird, considering I don't even know Beardsley. But if I'm being honest with myself, I wanted to kill him. I wanted to kill all of them. Not just because of their cruelty to Luna, but I also think a part of me wanted to prove something to myself. Maybe to prove I have what it takes to survive out here, that I have what it takes to rescue Ella, to do whatever it takes to save her. I'm wrestling a bit with what kind of person this makes me. I'd always grown up feeling, personality deficiencies aside, like I was a decent person with some kind of moral code. But I just killed someone, and I don't regret it. Maybe I gave myself too much credit back then. Everyone around the campsite is doing their own thing, acting as if tonight was totally normal. And even though according to my tab, it's past midnight, no one is sleeping. Beardsley is lying back on his camping chair, his ankles crossed in front of him on a plastic crate. His eyes are closed, and his head rests on the back of the chair. He plucks an unfamiliar tune on his guitar softly. The notes he plays are slow and relaxing, almost like a lullaby. He hums the melody quietly. Red is playing a fast-paced card game with Ponyboy on the other side of the fire. Through the sparks and pops of the fire, I watch them, and I can't help but smile. The expression on Red's face shows great restraint, and when Ponyboy hops up in excitement because he won, I realize why. Red chuckles deeply, a low rumble, and gives him a high five. Steel and Lala work together nearby on the dirt bike, hammering out dents, screwing back on loose parts, mending damaged valves, and wiring on the engine. They converse quietly, laughing occasionally as they work. They haven't told me to leave yet, which is a good sign. I'm waiting for the right moment to ask for directions to E2. Directions and necessities. And maybe some snacks. I'm sure they know how to get there, and I'm desperate to stop wasting time. The constant worry is always lingering. Even when I think I've momentarily forgotten about it, the worry tickles the back of my mind, reminding me, chipping off pieces of my sanity. Slice by slice, I know I'm slipping fast constantly worrying about something I can't control. I refuse to say the worst, though. To even think it. There's no way she could really be gone. It's impossible. I've come too far. The girl Q gets up from her chair on the other side of the campfire and plops down on a crate next to me. She stares at me for a second without saying anything. I lower my soup spoon mid-sip, insecurely at her gaze. I give her an awkward, tight-lipped smile. I'm just gonna come right out and say it. Why'd you do it? She finally says, her dark eyes now narrow slits. Luna joins us, sitting between me and Q, close enough to be pet by either of us. She looks at me expectantly, so I pat her head. Her tongue hangs out, and she pants contentedly, almost looking up at me like she's smiling. 
I see she's entirely forgotten the circumstances of our first encounter. Do what? I raise the spoon back to my lips and slurp another spoonful. Q drops her elbow onto her knee and rests her cheek on her fist. She furrows her brows at me like she's trying to figure me out. Why did you help her? Why did you help us? I don't answer. Slurp. You don't even know us, so what do you want? I did it for the fame and fortune, I joke, gesturing to the meager campsite with my soup spoon for effect. And the soup. She blinks at me, not amused. Another awkward second passes, and I feel so uncomfortable I could die. Well, she's a little intense. I'm much more used to the giggly, hair-twirling type at C9, who pretty much just laughed at whatever I said, even if I didn't intend it to be funny. I didn't really even have to try, which was good because I've never been good at the whole making conversation thing. But they weren't ever really paying attention anyway. They were just looking for a distraction, too. There was never anything like this judging, analyzing stare I'm experiencing right now. I don't know what to say, so I just smile, showing all my teeth in a dazzling sort of way. This usually works when words fail me. She doesn't crack a smile, but she hands me a cold soda can. Here, she says, gesturing to my head. This might help. It's unspoken but this offering feels almost like a thank you. Thanks. I press the cool aluminum onto my forehead, and it almost burns. It slows the ache for at least a few seconds, though, and I'm grateful for the brief relief. I expect her to leave, but she doesn't. She stays seated next to me and stares into the fire, the orange glow reflecting in her eyes and in the clear plastic of the goggles nestling in her curls on top of her head. So, how do you all know each other? I ask, breaking the silence, hoping I can finally get some of my many, many questions answered about this strange group. She doesn't answer right away, and doesn't look away from the fire. We're family, she answers simply. I gesture to Red. Is he your dad? She looks at me blankly. You think just because we're both black that he must be my dad? My mouth falls open stupidly. Good job, Sam. Messing up a perfectly normal conversation, as always. She sees my distress and actually smirks. I'm just messing with you. I chuckle nervously, a bit relieved, but still wishing I could hide under a rock. He's not my dad, though. But he's probably the closest I've got. Where are you all from? Were you in a zone? I crack open the soda and take a sip. I haven't felt the burn of a soda for so long that it makes my eyes water. The sweet, bubbly taste is so nostalgic, so familiar. We're all from different places. I look at her and raise my eyebrow. Vague much? She stares back, her eyes evaluating me, deciding whether she trusts me or not. I study her face stubbornly in return, taking the opportunity with her goggles off to take note of her features for the first time. Her eyebrows are thick and arced, one a bit higher than the other making her look constantly skeptical. Her dark eyelashes frame deep brown eyes, eyes that still hold mine and seem to stare straight into my soul. Freckles are scattered across her cheeks and nose. She has one single freckle right above her upper lip. I surrender the staring contest when I realize this is probably the most eye contact I've ever made with another human and suddenly get insecure. I take another sip of soda and attempt to lighten the mood. So, are you going to apologize for taking me down earlier 
like a pro wrestler. I pretend to massage my neck in pain. She pulls a soda can from the cooler next to her and cracks it open. She responds with a straight-faced insult about my manhood and flips the interrogation back on me. How did you get out of your zone? It's a long story. My dad, he, well, the mayor... Your dad's a mayor? The way she's suddenly looking at me makes me freeze, stopping me from correcting her right away. Her one brow is arced in a surprise as well, but her eyes assess me in a new way. Instead of looking at me, but seeing past me, like people usually do, she looks at me now like she's seeing worth or importance, like she misjudged me. I'm caught off guard because no one has ever looked at me like this, especially not a girl. I've only ever been just another, another zoner, another gray uniform, another obligatory friend or distraction. I've never been extraordinary in any way. I soak this in, feeling it shift something inside of me that I didn't know I was longing to feel this sense of value. I'm surprised at myself that I want to be this person she's seeing right now. Is that completely shallow? While I have an opportunity to reinvent myself, why not take advantage of it? Yes, my dad's a mayor, but don't tell. Hey guys! Her raised voice startles me. His dad's a mayor! Beardsley's guitar stops mid-strum, and surprised responses surround us. Ponyboy hops over to us excitedly. Great. Really, Sam? He squeals. So your dad can help us? Help you? Yeah, help us get out! Oh no, what have I done? This is not good. Is that true? Q looks at me again, her wide eyes filled with the same awe as before. Could he really help us? Did I seriously just dig myself into an impossible hole just because I wanted to impress a girl? Who am I? It's way too late to backpedal entirely, but how can I fix this without completely ruining the chance of getting them to show me the way to E2? I open my mouth with the intention of coming clean, but the way Q was staring at me, and now Ponyboy is looking at me like I'm some kind of superhero, bouncing in anticipation for my response. Yeah, probably. It slips out before I have time to even consider the logistics of what I'm saying. I mean, maybe. Well, he can at least try. I add quickly. What is wrong with me? Pony Boy cheers and hops over to Beardsley. Sam's dad can save us, Beardsley! Did you hear that? Did you hear it? Just when I thought my overall sense of self-loathing couldn't get worse. Beardsley shushes him, trying to get him to quiet down. But he smiles down at him affectionately. A softness that slips through his hardened face only when he looks at him. Don't you be getting our hopes up for nothing, boy, Beardsley warns, looking at me, the hardness returning to his face. I gulp. The rest of the group gathers around us, pulling up seats to sit with us by the fire. Q pulls the goggles back over her eyes, as if using them to analyze me. Red speaks up from across the fire, his face glowing a deep orange from the flames. For the first time, I notice his English is accented. His syllables have a certain bouncy rhythm to them. How did your sister go missing if your father is so significant? I realize now what my subconscious must have realized earlier. This isn't about impressing Q or even Ponyboy. This isn't about validation or insecurity. At least, not entirely. I need them. I need their knowledge of the underground. 
I need their resources and their skills, not just their directions. I have no idea how to get to E2. My mag board doesn't work out here. I have very limited supplies left. Without their help, I will never find Ella, and I'll probably die trying. A knot forms in my stomach as I realize what I need to do. With the events of the evening, they are beginning to trust me. I just need to be helpful, win them over one by one, and hold their trust long enough to find Ella. Nothing matters after that. Ella is my only priority, and I'll do whatever it takes to find her, even if it means making promises I know I can't keep. I dive into the story. Luckily, most of it is true. Kids have been going missing in our zone for weeks. My dad realized it and was investigating. He didn't know who he could trust. It wasn't until my sister went missing that he filled me in. The more we investigated, the deeper the corruption went. Our chief of discipline, guards, and even other zoners were involved. My heart tightens, thinking of Foster. We had to fake my expose, well, my death, to get me out. And we still don't have much information, but here's what we do know. Many people were paid by a man who goes by the name Vegas to help kidnap these kids. We don't know why. We think he's most likely in E2. Q's lip turns down at the edge, disturbed. What could he possibly want with a bunch of kids? I shrug and swallow the lump lodged in my throat. Probably my conscious manifesting itself. Of all the times to suddenly make an appearance. Win them over, I remind myself. I force my voice to sound as sad as I can, which isn't actually that hard to do, considering I actually am sad even though I never allow myself to feel that way. It's been almost two weeks since I've seen my sister. I'm scared to death thinking about what could be happening to her. That's why I have to get to E2. There is a brief silence. I take another opportunity. Gotta make this convincing if it's going to work. I'm desperate for help. I have no idea where I'm going or what I'm doing. That's true. My dad would be so grateful if you helped me find my sister. That I'm sure he'd be happy to help you guys in return. I pause, before deepening the web of lies even more. He's done it before. He has a lot of connections. That catches Beardsley's attention. He got someone out? Yes. I reply, trying to sound confident. A family friend. Well, Dan, no. Beardley mutters quietly, considering. No way, Steele interjects. No way! First of all, we don't even know this kid. And second, what about our deliveries? We barely have enough time to get them all done, let alone form an extraction. Deliveries? If you can just get me there, I'll figure something out on my own so you wouldn't have to... Lala interrupts me. He can help with our deliveries, make them go faster, and it wouldn't be much trouble since we're going there anyway. They're going to E2? I promise not to be any trouble, I say. Well, you know, except for the whole manipulating you into helping me thing. I try to swallow that part down. We still don't know anything about him, Steel counters, speaking about me as if I'm not here. He could still be getting tracked by the feds. They argue back and forth about the pros and cons of letting me accompany them in their travels, but I'm distracted. This annoying, nagging sense of right and wrong keeps hoping. Delusionally, maybe they'll see through my lies so I don't have to carry this out. So maybe I don't have to ever break the news that my real dad's actually dead. And Mayor Ramos is probably dead too by now with how messy I left everything back at the zone. 
And even if he's not, he doesn't know the way out. He's basically a zoner with a title. He doesn't have any real power. I've known that my whole time in the underground. What will Ponyboy's reaction be like when they find out I can't get them out? I shake my head and shove these thoughts aside, swatting them away like mosquitoes. This is the only way. I have to keep telling myself. I try to keep my thoughts off my face and try to look as innocent as possible as they are assessing my merits. Beardsley puts it to a vote. He looks around the circle at the camp occupants, an eyebrow raised. Red? Red considers for a moment, stares at me, and then back to Beardsley. For whatever reason, he came back to warn us about the bounty hunters. He didn't have to put himself in danger like that. I don't see the harm in letting him tag along, he finally says. He can help us, Pony Boy inserts, bouncing, making his vote known. And we can save his sister. We have to. I smile at him gratefully. At his age, you know he can be useful during the E1 delivery, Lala reasons to steal. She nods affirmatively to Beardsley signaling her vote. They're going to E1, too? Who are these people? Q? She turns toward me, her goggles shielding her expression, as if they act as her brick walls. I feel naked. The hairs on my arms prickle, uncomfortable at being studied so closely. Will she know I'm lying? Will she know I can't really get them out? Do her goggles have x-ray vision for liars? Or x-ray vision at all? I shift in my seat insecurely at the thought, moving my hands over my lap just in case. I owe him, she says simply. She pats Luna's head, who has her tongue out and mouth wide in that same near smile. I smile at her gratefully, but she looks away, awaiting Beardsley's final decision. Well, Beardsley smacks his legs as he stands. Guess that settles it. You help us with our deliveries, and you can come with us to E2. And if I'm feeling generous, maybe we'll lend a helping hand in the sister extraction in exchange for a conversation with your pops about getting us out. If this Vegas feller is as bad as you think he is, you'll probably need all the help you can get. Deal? He sticks out his hand for a handshake. The relief soaks over my whole body, and I suddenly feel choked up. I can't believe this is working. I can't believe there's finally a plan. I'm going to find her. I don't have to fake the fact that I'm choking the words out as I return his handshake. Yes! Yes! Think! We'll leave in the morning, Beardsley interrupts. Just now. He steps close to me, his face nearly touching mine, the deep wrinkles on his face hardening. I'm a war vet and a redneck. If you don't hold up your end of the deal, I will not even blink when I blow you to smithereens. Yay! Pony cheers, hopping up and down despite that gruesome image Beardsley just described. He gives me a high five. Completely oblivious. I shake off the threat and nod at Beardsley to signify I understand. Thank you. I tell him earnestly, the gratitude not hard to fake. As long as I don't think about the warned repercussions, that is, I'll figure that out later. I just need to get to E2 first. Nothing else matters. I just have to find her. Beardsley nods back, as if that settles it and then turns to steel. Don't forget you got first watch tonight. I hope you know what you're doing, she grumbles back to him before throwing open the front door of the truck and lifting herself up into the driver's seat. And on that note, they all begin settling in for bed, not giving me another thought. So that's it. They're really going to help me? I soak up the glow of the sense of victory I feel. It's like I actually did something right for once. Well, not morally right, but I did it. 
I made it happen. I might actually find Ella after all. Getting lost in the desert underground really makes you doubt your capabilities. So it's just nice to be reassured that I'm not totally useless. Lala and Ponyboy lower the tailgate of the truck and climb into the back with two sleeping bags and blankets. Pony pokes his head out of the window and calls out a cheerful, Good night! to the camp. Beardsley unfolds a modest army cot and settles down onto it, pulling a plaid, quilted blanket over himself. Poking out of the end of the blanket and off the cot are his still booted feet. Red throws me a sleeping bag and rolls his own out a few feet away from the fire. Q does the same. I follow their lead and wiggle myself into the slippery fabric. I zip it up and lie down on my side. As I do, my joints pop and crack, and I notice the deep ache that has settled in my hips and back. I stretch out, but the hard ground and thin padding do nothing to soothe the days of walking and the mere minutes of tense sleep in between the miles. My feet throb but cry out in relief at the break they're now receiving. Q is lying on her back a few feet away. The shadows cast by the flickering light of the campfire silhouette the smooth profile of her face, accentuating the curves of her goggles, nose, and lips. Luna lies next to her, in between us, out like a light, understandably tuckered out from the excitement of the evening. Hey, I say, propping my head up on my fist. Thanks for having my back. Her head turns in my direction, pushing the goggles back up on top of her curls. The brief look of interest in her eyes showed before has completely dissolved, and she has returned to looking at me indifferently. Just like everyone else always has. Don't let it get to your head, she says flatly. I just hate owing debts to people. She turns her head back so she is looking upward again. You helped Loon, so I'll help you. Then we'll be even. I brush off the sting, feeling stupid that I thought her opinion of me even mattered. When have I ever cared about what someone thought of me before? I can't believe my momentary lack of judgment. In one inconsequential conversation, I relinquished some of the bitterness that has been guarding me all these years. I decide to make her the first person I win over. My first objective, win Q's complete trust. Her own brick-walled defenses will be hard to climb over, but then the rest of the campers will be easy in comparison. So how did you even get her down here? As much as I try to ask casually, I can't mask the awe in my voice. I hate to admit it, it's just pretty impressive. That's smuggling level 2000. All I was able to get in was my ratty old baseball glove. That's one of the benefits of nobody really caring about foster kids. I don't reply. Just stare at her and give her a chance to elaborate. She doesn't, seemingly satisfied with the response she's given. Again with the whole reply but don't actually answer the question thing. I figure she's probably used to most people accepting these vague non-answers. Or maybe she's used to people just not caring enough to listen. She hides behind ambiguity like I hide behind sarcasm. Defense mechanism. This one will be tough to crack. When she notices I'm still watching her, her eyes turn to daggers, her face twisted into a can-I-help-you expression. I bristle. This girl is testing every single nerve I have. When have I ever tried this hard? It feels like the task I've given myself is not worth the effort, but I will myself not to give up. So I force myself to wear a mask of patience, and I match her expression with one of my own that says, I can wait all night. I hold her eye contact stubbornly. She must realize I'm not giving up, and finally concedes in an exasperated tone of voice. She's apparently not used to being out stubborn. The foster family I was with had just given her to their real kids for Christmas. 
I notice the sour tone shift when she says, they're real kids. As the weeks went by, and she grew, they cared less and less about her. When it was our time to be rounded up, they were going to just leave her behind, not even take her to the FPA Animal Safe Haven. She scoffs, disgusted. She was still small enough that I could fit her in my backpack. Did they not search you? Not right away. They loaded all of our region's foster kids onto a bus and took us straight to the zone. C7, I think? They had us all lined up for orientation, and I decided pretty quick I didn't want to stay. Turns out she's a pretty good distraction. Her lips actually curl into the hint of a smile, recalling the memory. She distracted the guards, got me a running head start, and found me a minute or so later outside. But the gates? There was another bus coming through. They had been deactivated at just the right moment. She shrugs as if it's nothing, not seeming to realize how impossibly ballsy and lucky her escape was. I was on my own for a little while until I ran into Red and Lala. My mouth has a mind of its own and hangs open for a second too long. I try to cover it up, but all I can do is huff incredulously. Wow. She smirks but breaks eye contact, looking almost embarrassed at my gaze. There is a brief moment of silence as I consider what that experience must have been like. Living on your own and being your own boss all the time. No chief or guards telling you what to do. No fear of penalties or expulsion. But then I remember being chased through the dark by those bounty hunters, and that fear. The worry I was drinking my last drop of water, or eating the last food I'd get in a while, not knowing where I was or where I was going. How long had she felt like that? I guess that's just a different kind of misery. The fire crackles and pops next to us as I think. I change the subject when I catch myself drifting away into my imagination. Stay on task. Operation Break Defenses. So what are those? I nod to her goggles. Wow, you really don't shut up, do you? She says. But she pulls them off of her head and tosses them over to me. They are heavier than I expected them to be. The lenses are actually glass, as opposed to the plastic I had expected. The rubber of the inner eye and nose piece is molded to her facial features. I bring them up to my eyes, snap the rubber headband over my head. I blink violently to adjust my vision to what I see. Through the lenses, it is as bright as day, though the colors are off. Instead of tan dirt, we are surrounded by vibrant greens and yellows. The space above, normally a warm brown, is now a deep purple. I look down at my hands, which seem far away and detached from my body. There is a greenish tint to my skin, making me look kind of like an alien. The new brightness to the view brings other details to my sight, like moths circling above the fire. The dirt scuffs that stain my sleeping bag. The scar next to Q's left eye. I stare at her for an extra second, admiring the new deep purple tint of her skin. She tucks her curls behind her ear and chuckles at the obvious wonder on my face. I remove them, and it takes my eyes a moment to adjust to the real hues and brightness level of the space around me. Wow, I remark, tossing them back over to her. Those must make me look extra good. She scoffs, tucking the goggles into the pocket of her overalls. More like a dying hospital patient, actually. I nod in agreement. That's fair. Where did you get them? I acquired them on one of our raids. They were being delivered to E1. I figured I was doing a public service, making an E1 socialite's life a little more inconvenient. Thank you for your service, I joke, saluting. How do they work? No idea, she shrugs. VR, I'm guessing. They have extra capabilities at E1, apparently.
like movies and stuff. But you need another device to access those features, I guess. I'll acquire one of those eventually. I respond enthusiastically. I always appreciate good tech I've never been able to afford. She seems to have a similar appreciation. Okay, good. Establishing commonalities. That'll help. A beat. Okay, please explain the nicknames to me. There's got to be a story behind them. We all have our own stories, she answers, most of her focus on the task of tucking her massive hair into some kind of colorful scarf she has tied onto her head. A couple curls still frame her face. I expect her to leave it at that, but she actually continues. We all had to reinvent ourselves for one reason or another. The new name. It's a literal new start, but also kind of symbolic. Like, taking our identity back, you know? I nod, understanding completely the longing for a fresh start and a new identity. I guess that's why I was so easily tempted to lie about my background. After living in the zone for so long, I always dreamed Ella and I could start over somewhere and finally have our own life. A new beginning. Take back the sense of self and meaning that was taken from us in the zone. There comes a point where that sense of you is really all you have left. And when that's taken away too, there's no explaining how empty it can feel. I understand more than you know, I say, my voice coming out quieter than I expected. I clear my throat quickly. So how did you come up with it? Where does Q come from? I didn't come up with it. I earned it. Okay, so how can I earn a nickname? Do I have to go through initiation? Do you have to, like, cover me in feathers and make me do the Macarena or something? Oh, you already have a nickname. She bites her lip to hold back a grin. The edges of her lips curling ever so slightly to reveal deep dimples in her cheeks. I sit up, surprised. I do? What is it? Shh. Red hisses nearby at my not-so-quiet demand. Luna lifts her head at the sound, looking around to make sure everything is okay. Her head drops again tiredly when she confirms the safety of the area. Q covers her mouth. Muffling a disconcerting laugh. What is it? I press, unsettled at her response. Beardsley calls you pretty boy, she whispers, snickering. My jaw drops. What? Why? It's the hair, I think. She flips her hair mockingly, flicking her head to the side like it's in her eyes. What's wrong with my hair? She laughs at my expense in reply. Pretty boy? Really? I plop back down on my elbow, scowling. Just my luck that I'm on the run with a group of wanted fugitives with badass nicknames, and I get stuck with this. Pretty boy? What does that even mean? I've never been called pretty in my entire life. Q is even more amused by my reaction, which deepens my glower. What makes Beardsley the nickname authority anyway? I mutter. Okay, since you think it's so funny, tell me what yours means, then. Wouldn't you like to know? I would, actually. She rolls her eyes. I don't have to tell you anything. I don't even know you like that. Will you tell me when you do? A beat of silence as she considers. No, probably not. But she smiles. Just for a second, but I caught it. I call that a maybe. Chapter 24 Operation Crack Defenses I feel a little carsick as we fly across the mounds and rocks and valleys of earth at high speeds. Each time we hit a bump, my head thwacks the hard plastic of the camper shell which is really not helping my head injury from yesterday. The truck bed is pretty crowded, and not comfortable in the slightest. There is barely any room for me to extend my legs, 
due to all the equipment and supplies packed nearly to the top of the camper. Crates full of non-perishable food, gallons of water, toiletries, along with toolboxes and sloshing red gas cans that scrape across the bed every time we hit a bump or make a turn. I keep my few personal belongings close to me as we travel. The backpack Ramos gave me with my mag board inside never leaving my line of sight. The hard metal I'm seated on sends a sharp ache through my tailbone as our journey to E1 progresses. But being back here with Q is giving me the perfect opportunity to continue my quest to crack her defenses and win her trust. Though the available space is tight, Q is playing with Luna across from me. She's tugging on a makeshift chew toy that looks like it was made from an old tire. With some effort, Q pries it from her teeth and tosses it over to me. Luna nearly pounces on me in pursuit, but I throw it back to Q, laughing. Luna dashes back and forth between us as the toy keeps evading her grasp. Our back and forth goes on for several minutes before Luna manages to snatch the toy out of thin air. She takes it to the other end of the truck bed on the far side of the gas cans and toolboxes and gnaws on it at a safe distance away from both of us. I'm glad to see her hurt paw is feeling better and that she doesn't appear to be too badly shaken up by the events of last night. Ponyboy watches from the cab, turned backwards in his seat, giggling at us through the back window. His eyelids droop sleepily, and he eventually falls asleep, his head at an awkward angle with his cheek resting against the window. Red, Beardsley, Lala, and Steele converse quietly in the truck cab, too quietly for me to eavesdrop on their conversation. But I still strain my ears to try anyway. Mostly just paranoid, they've discovered the truth about me and are conspiring about how to kill me most efficiently but I try to assure myself that I've appeared nothing but earnest about my background. I've been nothing but trustworthy so far. Steele is still wary of allowing me to join their ranks, but conceded after much debate this morning. Next to Q, she'll be the toughest to win over. The plan is I will accompany them on their delivery to E1. There I will assist however they need me and prove my worth. Then we head to E2 for the next delivery. At that point, they'll decide if they will be helping me look for Ella, after which we will make our way to C9, where I will introduce them to my dad, who will show them the way out. I haven't really figured out how Ella and I are going to get away before that step, how we'll escape the others and make it back to Ramos and C9 on our own. I guess I'll wing it when it comes to it, seems to be working out for me so far. Although I wish we could just go straight to E2, I feel better than I have for weeks. My heart soars, just knowing I am finally making progress toward Ella. It feels good to be on my way, despite the ever-present fear about what could be happening to her, and the ever-present doubt I might not be able to find her, or that I might find her too late. I try not to dwell on these doubts and worries to keep myself clear and alert. I can't afford to slip down that black hole because I might not be able to pull myself out and do what needs to be done. I decide to distract myself. I address Q, breaking the silence. Did you say you ran into Red and Lala after getting out of C7? Q has taken off her combat boots and is pouring out the dirt and small rocks that have nestled their way inside them. Yeah, why? Not Pony Boy? She looks at me, confused, her eyebrows drawn together. Is she not his? She shakes her head as she realizes what I mean. His mom? No, she's not. Pony was an E2. He got out with Steel when she... She pauses long enough that it piques my interest. When she escaped. Is that why she has such a large bounty on her head? She tugs her boots back on and laces them back up tightly. She folds her legs up cross-legged and smiles secretively as she flicks a tiny bug off the knee of her overalls. 
That's part of the reason. So I guess I'm not allowed to know, I say sarcastically, ever annoyed that it's still like pulling teeth to get any kind of information from her. She still doesn't trust me. But I guess, why would she? I'm lying through my teeth every time I talk to her. If she wasn't so frustratingly reticent, that would probably be a lot harder to do. She eyes Ponyboy cautiously to make sure he's still asleep. Not because it's any of your business, she starts, her voice low. It's just a great story, and it empowers me to tell it. She leans forward toward me and rests one of her elbows on her inner knee. So Steele was married to a filthy rich CEO, right? He was in charge of some huge solar tech company that contributed a lot to the construction of the underground. I guess he built them this huge, fancy house in E2 and everything. I inch closer toward her so I can hear her lowered voice. Her minty breath creates a cold fog between us. It was the night before their anniversary, and she caught him having an affair with her sister, who lived next door. She kept it together until the following night. She got him into bed, tied him up, and... She stops herself and makes a slicing gesture across her neck as Ponyboy rustles a bit in his sleep. Yeah, so that's why she's wanted. I laugh disbelievingly into my fist. She just killed him? Just like that? Just like that. Wow, definitely don't mess with Steel. I look through the truck and analyze Steel sitting in front of us in the cab with new eyes. It was a little extreme, but kind of badass. So how does Ponyboy fit in with all this? Q's smile wilts. That's not as great of a story. We hit a bump, and the back of my head hits the shell again. I wince in pain but try to play it off. I'm sure by now you've realized some symptoms of his... She lowers her voice to a grim whisper. Condition. Muscular dystrophy, he says. We think there's more to it, but who can be sure down here? Well, anyways, it qualified him to be categorized as disabled, so you know what that means. I stare at her blankly. She raises her eyebrows as if to say, you know, but I have no idea what she's implying. Are you serious? You really don't know? The irritated expression on my face that I don't conceal must answer her question. The FPA obviously can't have disabled adults as their brute force, but why do you think you've never seen a person with disabilities in your zone? My face contorts in thought as I speculate. Did I really never notice that C9 didn't have a single disabled kid? Where... I don't complete my question, afraid to know the answer. I can't believe you don't know. Are you really that ignorant? Her face has reddened with anger, her lips twisted into a grimace. They're basically slaves in the E-zones, pretty boy. Slaves? I repeat bleakly, just when you thought it couldn't get any more messed up down here. Steele says it's awful, since many of them have conditions which prevent real labor or even them being able to take care of themselves. They're usually bullied, mocked, or even abused. It's just a joke to the elites. It's sick. I've hated the FPA for almost a decade. I've blamed them for every negative in my life, every hardship. I have complained about my life underground nearly every single day, feeling like the way we are treated in C9 was unjust and inhumane feeling sorry for myself for everything Ella and I had to endure. But everything seems inconsequential as Q continues educating me, sharing stories she's heard of torture, twisted games, even sexual abuse. Every story makes me feel sicker, angrier, but I listen anyway, hanging on to every word she says. How can they treat people like this? Human beings. I think of a boy with Down Syndrome who went to school with me before they all closed. Evan. 
he always greeted me with the most excited smile. He wasn't in my class, but we had the same recess. He would play tag with me and my friends sometimes. Always the most enthusiastic player. I wonder sadly where he is now. What he's going through. What kind of slave labor he has been forced into for simply being a little different. She tells me Ponyboy was sent to E2 when he was only three years old, separated from his family. Parents drafted, siblings zoned. He moved from job to job because of his age. Many household owners eventually grew impatient of having another young child in their home, regardless of how low maintenance he may have been. He was often made to entertain elite children who just mocked and bullied him because of his lisp and limp. He was denied an education, a family, any hobbies or interests, free time. He never even learned how to read. When he was placed in Steele's household, she took a liking to him, protected him from further mockery and harm, including from her husband. She knew when everything went down with her husband that she couldn't leave Ponyboy behind to face possible blame. Wow. I still look at Ponyboy, snoozing peacefully in the truck, his pale face still squished up against the window. I never would have guessed, looking at him now, that this is what his life so far has been like. You would never see this trauma pass his bright smile. I've known him for less than 24 hours. How can I feel this angry, this protective over him? I can't explain it. All I know is if I ever heard anyone making fun of him or hurting him in any way, I'd shoot them dead. The way Q whispers these stories, the disgust plastered over her face like a dark mask and her voice shaking with fury, I know she agrees. But the question is, is she the kind of person that would hand the gun to me or would she fire it herself? And will she fire the gun at me too when she learns what a liar I am? Chapter 25 If ignorance is bliss, I'm freaking euphoric. The truck slows down to a stop, and my heart lifts in anticipation. Are we there? Looking out the window, I am disappointed to see miles of nothing on all sides. Beardsley kicks open the driver door and steps out, stretching and yawning loudly. Steele crosses around and taps on Pony's window with a smile. He awakes groggily and unclicks his seatbelt. She comes around and lets down the tailgate for us. We have to slide out on our backs to keep our heads from smacking the shell on the way out. Everyone else unloads too and takes a few minutes to themselves. Stretching finding private spots to pee, refilling water canteens with gallons of water in the truck bed. Q takes Luna on a jog around the perimeter, letting her run free and stretch her legs. Red pulls bread, peanut butter, and jelly from a crate in the back and begins preparing sandwiches for the group, using the tailgate as a table surface. I decide to grab a knife and help, and attempt to make progress with Red. But as I spread peanut butter... I'm in a sort of trance, disturbed by what I've just learned. It makes my skin crawl to even think about the kind of lives people like Ponyboy and my old friend Evan have to live. That it's somehow legal to enslave them like this, like they aren't even human. I like to believe if I saw something like that I would intervene, but then again, I've been learning a lot recently about the kind of person I really am. Am I a coward as well as a guiltless liar, con artist, and murderer? I'm clearly not receiving any Human of the Year awards, so why is this new information affecting me so deeply? How old is your sister? Red asks, breaking the silence, kicking me out of my personal ethics evaluation. She just turned eight, I reply, my voice strained. I clear my throat quickly to play it off, but he notices. He looks at me, his eyes soft and gentle. I am sure she is fine. We will find her in no time. His kind smile is so genuine it coils my stomach. 
I do not deserve this kind of kindness. Guilt whispers at me from the depths I have pushed it down into, begging me to give in, to let it take over. I push it back down, forcing myself to keep it together. I have to keep it together. Thanks, I sniff. So, what's your story, Red? I busy myself with spreading the thick jelly carefully onto a piece of bread. How did you end up here? He takes my finished sandwich and adds it to a towering stack on a paper plate next to him. I came to America many years ago from Ghana to find work. His voice is level, but injured underneath the surface. I was sending money to my family back home. We had planned for them to join me after a couple years of saving. But then the borders closed, and the red and blue civil war started. I could never return. I took red upon myself to always carry my country with me, my flag, and my family. Is your family still over there? He nods. I haven't seen my wife or children for eleven years. I breathe in sharply. Eleven years? When they started sending people under, I volunteered for the draft. I hoped after I served my time in the military and proving myself that they would let me return home. But after a few years of service, they sent me down here instead. I was employed in E1 and held a few jobs over a couple years to try to get information and make connections. He would still be stuck there if it wasn't for me. Lala winks at him, takes a plate of sandwiches, and distributes them to the group who has now gathered close by. She eats her own sandwich over by Steel and Q, who stand to the right of the truck, listening in to our conversation. Beardsley is taking a quick nap in the front seat of the cab. I can hear his snores from where I sit on the tailgate. Pony Boy is drawing pictures in the sand with his finger. Red nods over at Lala. I met La Reina at my last job. We were both working at a restaurant in E1. She has a lot of connections with the underground underground. That's how she got down here in the first place. I raise an eyebrow at her and grin in surprise. How did I just so happen to run into a group of the coolest people in the underground United States? She chuckles modestly, pushing her long ponytail over her shoulder. Ren and I have similar stories, but we have different goals. He wants to get out. I need to stay in. I take a bite out of my sandwich. Why? I have to find Miss Hijos, she replies. We were separated many years ago. I look closer at her face. Despite her youthful appearance, it's clear the years of heartache are etching themselves onto her face. Deep lines of worry cut across her forehead and around her lips. Were you drafted? She snorts bitterly. No. She continues her story, pausing occasionally to try to find the correct words in English. They didn't want me. We came from Mexico. We were undocumented. We just wanted to live a quiet, safe life. We didn't mean any trouble. But then there started to be so much fear and hate spreading about the border, calling us murderers and rapists. A neighborhood reported us to the FPA. I had known her for years. Our kids even went to school together. But she was convinced by what she heard on the news. El Odio. They took my kids under and prepared me to be deported. Next to her, Steele spits out a passionate slur of profanities. No one is phased by it, seemingly used to these outbursts of fury. She rants, using her hands to illustrate her anger, but then mutters an abrupt sorry when she notices Pony listening in. I get a little worked up about it, but I'm not wrong. She grumbles. Even when calm, her voice has a constant rasp to it, sounding a bit like she's been at a party all night and her vocal cords are now paying the price. 
she shoves her hands into her jacket pockets, looking mostly like a suggestion to herself to keep calm. I work through the pieces of Lala's story in my head. Wait, I say slowly. They sent your kids to a zone and then deported you? Without them? I'm embarrassed by the shock in my voice and try to avoid eye contact with Q. I don't want to prove her right, that I really am that ignorant, but I realize what a bubble I really have been living in for the past eight years. How could I possibly think I had seen the worst of what our government was capable of? How could I seriously be so naive? What I kept learning today really shouldn't surprise me. I know that. But I still can't help but marvel at how this could possibly be allowed to happen to real people. How this could possibly be legal. I always knew the FPA was messed up. But I thought the corruption started and ended with the zones and the draft. But why am I so surprised it doesn't stop there at all? I guess a government that can separate children from their parents under the pretense of protection and liberty for the greater good would be terrifyingly capable of anything. So I really shouldn't be shocked as Lala continues sharing her story. They wouldn't even let me say goodbye to them. They said they were safer without me because I probably wasn't even their real mom anyway. Just a smuggler. The outer shell of her words are hardened but a quiver betrays the decaying core of hurt inside them. One moment we were a family, and the next, they were gone. Q notices the quiver too, and puts her hand comfortingly on Lala's shoulder, who smiles gratefully back at her over her shoulder. She puts her own hand over Q's appreciatively. You're still a family, Q says to her quietly squeezing her hand. Steel takes over, and it takes her great restraint to keep her voice level and her language child appropriate. We've been looking for them for a couple years now, for the kids and for the exit. We follow the commands of the underground making their deliveries, raiding supply trucks on their way to zones, tracking down people every once in a while. In return, they give us supplies and information. Well, at least they're supposed to. Red bellows next to me. They're dangling us around on the end of a wire, like puppets. That's why a connection to a legitimate mayor is such a game changer for us. Lala explains enthusiastically with bright eyes, and it's hard to swallow the lump that has formed in my throat. We can finally get some real information. I could finally find out where my boys are. Deflect. Does this underground not know where the exit is? If they do, they're not telling us. Beardsley's sudden booming voice from behind startles me. He saunters over to where we are and rests his elbow on the edge of the truck bed. If we didn't need their help to survive out here... We would have stopped running their errands a long time ago. I nod, looking at the crates of food and jugs of water in a new light. Isn't it dangerous? I ask, my voice low, glancing over at Ponyboy. They need us too much, Red answers, shrugging my question off surprisingly nonchalantly. Steel knows the E-Zones like nobody else. With Q, we have an in with the younger crowd. Lala's connection to their ranks. Beardsley's, well, his sheer insanity. They really could not have put together a better team themselves, and they know it. But the FPA, aren't you worried they'll find out what you're doing? Won't they want all able-bodied adults out there fighting? They can't push what they can't catch, Beardsley jokes. And I've never been one to care much what the government wants. Southerners. Q jibes. Punching Beardsley playfully on the arm. Damn straight, he replies, putting her in a headlock in return. Her laughing protests are muffled by her hair and Beardsley's thick flannel. He eventually lets her go and she flips him off teasingly. 
I nod, accepting their surety. Though still having doubts of my own about the safety of trusting a black market to keep your identity hidden from an overpowerful militant government. Not that I have any experience, obviously, but years of watching action movies with my dad as a kid taught me that things like this never really end up well. But what do I know? I have to wonder if Vegas is somehow connected to this underground, and if that's the case, it will put us all in a kind of a bad spot after we carry out our plan. Infiltrating their child trafficking ring and stealing Ella back, hopefully, while actually technically being employed by them, probably isn't the best idea to double-cross them. But again, what do I know? Red, Steel, and Beardsley begin chatting about the delivery to E1 and our plan of attack. I try to listen, hoping to learn as much as I can about the plan to steady myself, to give myself something more tangible to grasp at times when I start feeling unsure about my own plan of attack. Lala moves closer to me, leaning up against the edge of the tailgate. I don't need to get out. She reminds me softly her pretty brown eyes nearly pleading. If your dad could just tell me where they are, that's all I want. Does he have access to that kind of information? Pang in chest, lump in throat. I'm sure it wouldn't be too hard. I force out through my teeth. She smiles back, flashing her straight, bright teeth at me and puts her hand on my arm. Gracias, mijo. Gracias. I force myself to smile back, hoping she can't see the lie bubbling underneath my skin and behind my eyes, waiting to erupt. Deflect. Keep it together. Earn her trust. So tell me about your sons? Well, my oldest is Mateo, and my baby is Eduardo. Things I 100% did not expect, not in a million years. That. Chapter 26 Well, this complicates things. And by things, I mean everything. We have resumed our travels to E1, and Q and Lala have traded spots. She sits with me in the truck, bed now and listens to me with tears in her eyes as I tell her every detail I can think of about my longtime roommates, her sons. The truck cab is silent as everyone listens happily, all of them as surprised as I was to learn of this connection. Ponyboy and Q sit backwards, watching us, and listening brightly. Pony laughs wildly at every story I tell, flapping his hands excitedly. Even Q smiles as she listens. Luna sits next to me and rests her head comfortably on my thigh. As I speak, I hear the sound of my voice, but it feels separated from me, like it's not actually coming out of my mouth. It's like I'm in a daze. It's just insane, right? Something this crazy and coincidental never happens in real life. But I'm in a daze mostly because this complicates things. How can I seriously continue using these people and lying to them, knowing one of them is Teo's mom? But I will say, I love telling her stories about Eddie and Ella's shenanigans, even though most of the shenanigans happened to me. I love remembering Ella this way, thinking of her mischievous smirk when I was in for it, causing me to keep looking over my shoulder and being on guard at all times. But despite my best efforts, I would still get blindsided anyways, every single time. Her tiny cackle laugh when their prank had been successful. Their smug high fives with each other when they pulled it off. The way she could barely get the story out when they were relaying it to their other friends because she was laughing too hard. I feel a bit closer to her as I tell everyone more about her friendship with Eddie. They were inseparable, I say. I tell them about the time we were all eating breakfast. Teo and I were unsuspecting, as always. Eddie offered to go buy us each a glass of milk to drink with our meals. I usually never splurged on milk, only drank water to save money. So I said sure. 
Teo also agreed. He said they could spare the extra money to treat everyone to a nice beverage. The first red flag should have been when Ella offered to help him carry back the glasses. Didn't catch on. The second red flag should have been when they only brought back two glasses. Didn't catch on then either. Luckily, Teo was thirstier than I was because he took the first eager drink. What he thought to be a nice, cold, refreshing glass of milk turned out to be watered-down glue. He was scraping bits of glue out of the cracks of his teeth for almost a week. I tell Lala about all the shaving cream and feathers on pillowcases, all the missing left socks, stolen towels right at shower time, the yelping at random times just to see us jump. She soaks it all in, just glowing as my stories about her sons continue. Teo always had my back, I say feeling a guilty stab in the gut as I think about leaving him behind without even a goodbye. He was the most loyal friend I had. I tell her about how he always helped me up after I had gotten a penalty. How he always helped me limp back to the room to help me clean up the scars that reopened every time. How Eddie was so worried when Ella went missing. Thank you, Miho. She squeezes my hand gratefully. This has been the best conversation I've had in seven years. What? Beardsley calls from the driver's seat, his hand on his heart, feigning a hurt expression. I thought I was your best time. He winks at her teasingly in the rearview mirror. She rolls her eyes. You wish, redneck. Her laughter is loud and unapologetic and contagious. The truck slows, and I look out the window, happy to finally get to work, and to get out of this crowded, stuffy truck. We are parked behind a huge RV-sized dumpster that obstructs an immediate view of our destination, but I hear it all right. Different upbeat songs blare out of E1, all of the sounds competing with each other for dominance. We all hop out, Pony Boy more literally than the rest of us his excitement making him even more unbalanced than usual. Although he doesn't have a job in this delivery, he shares my excitement for the adventure awaiting, the potential dangers not worrying him one bit. We're here, we're here, he sings. Luna skips around him playfully, energized by his bouncing excitement. Ponyboy throws her chew toy, and she bounds after it eagerly fumbling in the dirt after it as the toy bounces away from her. The stench wafting out of the huge dumpster is not pleasant to say the least. It's mostly just one compounding, well-rounded smell of everything terrible in the world, but a few smells I can place at this moment are rotting eggs, moldy produce, and sour milk. My nostrils sting a bit at the first breath, but eventually adjust. I stand around uselessly as everyone makes themselves busy with making routine preparations, not bothering to give me an assignment. I clutch the straps of my backpack and fidget awkwardly. Red slides a box out of the back of the truck and slices it open with a pocket knife. He and Lala take the items from the box and organize them into four wild-looking bags of varying shapes and colors. All of the items piled into the bags are wrapped mysteriously in a plain brown packaging, labeled with only a name and a three-digit number. I take advantage of the lack of any responsibilities to peek around the dumpster, my nostrils picking up a sudden whiff of burnt popcorn. I make an audible gasp as I take in the sight that is about three football fields away from me. Elite Zone 1 in front of me is basically Las Vegas and New York City, superimposed onto each other. It is a colossal cityscape with architecture of varying sizes, shapes, colors, and designs. Some of the buildings stand so tall it looks like they could possibly brush up against the upper shell. High above, close to the rooftops of some of the shorter buildings, 
Snaking through the structures and around the perimeter of the zone is some kind of track for a train of sorts. Huge oak trees fill every available space with limbs stretching and hanging in every direction, bright leaves peppered along every branch. The trees growing close together create a green canopy above the roads and sidewalks, making it kind of resemble a green and neon industrial rainforest. I'm baffled by how gigantic they are. There's no way those are real. The little trees and plants in C9 I could wrap my head around. Irrigation rains, UV rays from the shell lights, the greenhouse effect. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But these? Other than the sheer size of everything, what shocks me most about this view is how colorful it is. I don't think I've seen this much color in eight years. Have I ever seen this much real color? In my time underground, I've become so accustomed to seeing only neutral. Kind of like if you left all of your clothes out in the sun for three years. How they would fade to such a slight shade that you'd almost forget the true vibrant color even existed once. Everything in C9 was gray. Gray walls, gray gravel, gray uniforms, gray eyes and faces. And everything in the landscape outside of C9 has been tans and browns. Even before coming under, I lived in Arizona, so I never knew what the color green looked like anyway. So in comparison, E1 is so vibrant it almost hurts my eyes. Some buildings flash with wall panels and bulbs of bright neon blues, reds, purples, each with some kind of theme. Some tropical with neon signs of palm trees and beach balls. Another one, Parisian, with a neon Eiffel Tower light panel taking up the entire wall. Other buildings have only reflective walls, which currently are reflecting the neons of other buildings, and also the soft pastel pinks and oranges of the upper lights of sunset. The most surprising is some other buildings have outer panels that light up and coordinate together to display a video or moving image. I watch one building display the side profile of a girl with cropped orange hair and a schoolgirl's uniform and heels, walking like a model across the building. When she gets to the far side of the wall, she disappears around the corner, and another girl appears from the closer end. This girl has longer, rainbow-colored hair, and a plaid jumpsuit instead. She walks the same direction and disappears around the same corner as the other girl. Ponyboy's voice behind me makes me jump. Cool, huh? Yeah. I breathe, not trying to hide my awe. Not many things impress me, but this view is really something, I admit. Come on! He pulls me by the elbow back over to the group. Everyone is standing in a semicircle around the lowered tailgate of the truck. As I get closer, I see they are analyzing a handwritten map, pointing to and discussing the boxes, circles, and lines on the paper. I look over Steels' shoulder, trying to absorb what they are saying, trying to make sense of the shapes and match it with the cityscape I've just seen. But the sloppy drawings are basically Russian to me. Q must notice my overwhelmed expression. Don't worry, pretty boy. I'll protect you. She purrs mockingly. I scowl at her. Beardsley and Steels' heads whip over in my direction. Steel gives me a once-over, and then glares at Beardsley. You wanna try to tell me again why this is a good idea? He's useless. I mean, she's right, but wow. Beardsley folds up the map, and takes a bag of items to be delivered from Red. He hands the second one to Lala, and the third to Steel. I don't know what to tell you, darling. We can be twice as efficient if Pretty Boy comes along, and that's all there is to it. I protest. Can we not call me... Steel cuts me off by shoving the bag into my chest and knocking the air out of me. I mutter my complaints about the nickname under my breath, no one paying me much mind as they make their preparations. The bag I've been given is a brighter messenger bag, 
made of a multicolored leather-like material. I decide to consolidate and take my cubed mag board out of my own backpack and drop it into the bag. I throw my backpack into the truck and I slide the bag over my shoulders. I continue to wait awkwardly for further instructions. Ponyboy makes himself helpful by carrying a burlap sack around, pulling cuffs of metal out of the bag and handing one to each person except Steel. I watch as Q slips the cuff onto her wrist and realize they're made to resemble a wrist tab, like mine. A sleek metal band tight around the skin, dark screen on the underside of the wrist, kind of like a square, upside-down watch. I'm intrigued as each person slaps on their pretend tab. From a distance, you can't really tell a difference. Now finished with his task, Ponyboy stands next to me and swings the bag around, hitting me in the stomach with it playfully. I groan in mock pain from the force of his hit, and he giggles. I snatch the bag out of his hand and swat him back. He shrieks in amusement, trying to evade my hits. He grabs it back and runs behind Red, peeking out at me from behind Red's massive protective body. He sticks his tongue out at me. Red bellows a laugh but grabs the bag from Pony and tosses it over to me. Q steps next to me and throws me her usual condescending smirk. Okay, children, settle down. I ignore the condescension, trying to remember that I'm supposed to be winning her over, so I swallow down what I'd like to say to her and nod to the cuff instead. So people in E-Zones have wrist tabs too? Just E-1. Huh? The group has come back together now and they each hold a bag. Now for the fun part! Lala sings excitedly. She hands a bag to me with a smile. Red and Beardsley don't seem to share the same enthusiasm for whatever the fun part is. Judging by their pained expressions, it's not fun at all. We had to use some spare items and some of Steels' things to put this together for you. It's the best we could do on short notice. I peek in the bag as everyone else, with the exception of Steel, begins pulling items out of their own bags. All I can see is a mixture of bright colors and textures. I'm hesitant to reach in. Something this bright has to be dangerous. I could lose a finger. Instead, I watch Beardsley and Red in amusement, laughing from afar as they pull out their bright items from their bags. They ignore me. I watch Beardsley take out crisp yellow slacks from his bag, and I snort as he pulls them on. He pulls his flannel shirt off and throws it at me, the sweaty shirt in my face punishment for laughing. He puts a bright purple blazer on over his bare shoulders, his wrinkly bare torso left exposed. He looks like a hairy, shriveled up Easter egg. I can't hold back my laughter at the sight. He flips me off in return. I look over to Red to see what his bag contains. He takes out what looks like an afro, forest green in color, and glittery? But he puts it on without complaint. Does he not realize how ridiculous he looks? I'm in disbelief as this madness continues. I watch everyone put on bizarre items of clothing, outrageous accessories, and hair pieces and shoes that barely look wearable, all without question, comment, or complaint. If this is the standard E1 uniform, I'm all of a sudden feeling a little bit more appreciation for the corpse gray uniforms at C9. If I ever have to go back there, I'll never complain about those uniforms again. Q looks pointedly at my own bag, a sharp, wordless instruction to get dressed as she pulls a metallic gold dress over her overalls. She pulls her overalls off from under her dress and replaces them with ivory feathery knee highs. The glittered gold boots she tugs on have a heel on them, making her taller. Maybe even taller than me. Isn't this all a little much just for a couple deliveries? Here, I'll help you, Sam! 
Pony takes the bag from me cheerily and reaches in. I wait warily, bracing myself for what kind of torture is in store for me. Ponyboy hands me a dress, and I laugh, thinking this must be some kind of joke. It has a floral pattern of bright orange and purple, nearly neon in vibrancy, and is adorned with a huge multi-layered navy blue ruffle that stretches all the way from the collar down to the midsection. Guys, I think there's been some kind of mistake, I protest as I hold it up against my body. It goes nearly to my knees. Stop complaining and just put it on, unless you want to stay and babysit. Q replies, rolling her eyes. I observe the assembly line the three women have created. Q sitting on a crate in front, Lala kneeling behind her, and Steel standing behind Lala. They each help the person in front of them with their wild hairstyles. Q holds a mirror to her face. She is busy brushing a shimmery gold paint onto her temples, cheekbones, and lips. Lala stands behind her, tying springy metallic coils into her curls. Steel is working trying to tame a giant bubblegum pink wig on Lala's head with a comb and pins. Somehow, all of her hair is stuffed up inside the beehive of pink curls. The cropped bangs barely cover her real hairline. Steel pins a yellow flower, nearly bigger than the hair itself, onto the wig. My jaw hangs open as my eyes flick over to Red and Beardsley, who are helping each other with their ridiculousness. They both look positively miserable, but do not look like this is as out of the ordinary as it seems. Beardsley detangles Red's giant afro, and Red smooths the frizz of the neon blue beard wig Beardsley has on, securing it behind his ears. Red holds a sheet of colorful transfer tattoos, and Beardsley helps him apply them to his left cheek and down his neck. What is happening? Ponyboy urges me to lift my arms, and prompts me to pull the outfit over my head. I do so grudgingly. It smells like B.O., bringing back uncomfortable memories of P.E. in elementary school back home. The outfit is tight across my back and shoulders, but fits for the most part. I mutter at the absurdity of them giving me a dress, but no one is acting like it was a mistake. The next layer is a navy-colored blazer. The fabric has a sheen to it, and it is embroidered with a black swirling pattern. Next, Ponyboy hands me a pants of sorts. When I resist removing my own pants, he gives me more encouragement. The pants I'm instructed to wear are a nylon-type material that stretch over my legs as I pull them on reluctantly. They are a rougher texture than the blazer, but the color and pattern are the same. There are no shoes in the bag, so I put my work boots back on. You look great! Ponyboy exclaims genuinely. I scoff in disbelief. There are no mirrors around, but I know I look like a frickin' clown. Q has moved from the crate and crouches next to Luna. She and Steel use some kind of chalk to coat her fur, giving it a shimmery, multicolored glow. Lala takes my arm and basically shoves me down onto the crate. She stands in front of me and analyzes me with determined focus, her fist under her chin as she thinks. The pink wig and the thick makeup coating her face makes her look like a completely different person. If I didn't watch her transform into this alter ego, I never would have recognized her. Her cheekbones and lips glow with a pearly lavender that matches her shiny, balloon-shaped dress. Feathery eyelashes curl out from her eyelids. Her eyebrows are coated with a tan-colored powder, making them nearly invisible. We don't have an extra wig, she muses to herself. So what can we do with your hair? Q steps next to her and joins the analysis. Her gold-tinted lips stacked to one side of her mouth like she's biting the inside of her cheek. Her arms are folded and the strap of her goggles hangs off one finger. 
ignoring my not even close to polite protests, they set to work on my face and hair, throwing around powders and glitters and glue-like products, transforming me into more of a clown. Losing Ella has been the closest thing to torture I've ever experienced, but this is a close second. Chapter 27 E1 First Impression Basically, exactly what you'd expect. After everyone completes their absurd ensembles, we pile back into the truck. The sun has set, leaving only darkened overhead lights and the bright neons of the zone, giving us plenty of shadows to use to our advantage as we drive slowly, headlights off, toward the outskirts of E1. Everyone in this truck is used to this procedure after making these deliveries all this time, but I feel nauseous. I was trapped in a zone for years, barely escaped with my life, and now I'm willingly stepping back inside one with people I barely know. My knee bounces nervously, and I can't quite stop fidgeting in my seat. To the regular eye, E1 looks like a regular city, one with the ability to come and go as you please on normal roads. Unguarded, unsecured. But the zone is apparently gated with the same unseen electric fences C9 was, preventing anyone from entering or exiting without permission. To someone who is unaware of this, they would drive right on in without even suspecting a thing, only to be baked alive like Seth was. Sounds like C9 and E1 are a lot more alike than I realized. From what I've learned tonight, there are two service exits, the location of which change frequently, where there is a gap in the fence. This allows maintenance workers, all of whom are people who have been discharged from the draft or people classified as disabled, to exit the zone with just a code on their wrist tab. With these service exits, their entire safety perimeter doesn't have to be turned off for tasks, such as just taking the trash out. Our person of contact will meet us at this designated entry point and get us in that way. From there, we will split up and make our deliveries to the locations on our list. We've split up the deliveries into four parts. Beardsley, Red, and Lala are each taking their own, and Q, Luna, and I are taking one. Q complained about having to always be babysat, but the other adults insisted we stick together. Lala was her usual teammate before, but she can now take her own deliveries with me lending a helping hand. Despite how teeth-clenchingly frustrating she is to be around, at least I can make progress towards stealing her trust. Tonight is crucial. So, how to impress a girl like Q? I mean, you'd think rescuing her dog would win her over, but that only let me through a tiny slice of her defenses. What's it going to take to get this girl to crack? Steele drives the truck slowly through the shadows. She always stays behind with Pony Boy never wanting to risk being seen by anyone she may have met in her prior elite lifestyle. We pull up to a shadowed corner, coming to a stop about 50 feet from the building. We all tumble out, and my legs feel like jelly. Luna shakes her coat, frustrated by the thick glitter coating on her fur. She scratches her head and neck with her hind leg, trying to get it off. Her collar and the tag clink together softly. Hey, pretty boy. Steele calls to me from the driver's window. I step over to the truck door, surprised she's even acknowledging me. Awful nickname or not. Lado, she says, her elbow resting on the window. I furrow my brows. Excuse me? It's a bar, she clarifies. Ask for Willie. He's a friend. If this Vegas guy is running an operation like you claim, he'll probably know about it. Thanks, I say, surprised. 
I'll run it by the boss. I nod to Q and Steele smiles. Good luck. She and Ponyboy wave goodbye, and the truck crawls back into the shadows to wait for our return. We advance closer to the gates, and the hairs on my arms stick up as we near the pulsing electricity. The familiar deep vibration of the electric gates settles in my nervous system like an old friend. The buzzing intensifies as we step closer. I'm going to be sick. Q notices and gives me a fiery once-over, pulling her goggles down and over her eyes. You good? Her tone holds a lethal trace of, you better be. I huff in mock confidence, brushing off the apparently obvious nerves. Yeah, I'm good. Are you? Please, she says, stepping in front of me, the metallic coils bouncing in her curls as she walks. You'll only slow me down. I clutch the strap of the messenger bag tightly and follow the group. Near the back, of course. I obviously don't want to be the first guy to test out a supposed invisible gap in an invisible death trap. Luna stays close, seeming to understand the dangers we're nearing as we approach the threshold where the opening in the gates apparently is. Beardsley and Red step through together and continue up to the building. We follow through the gap. Some of us, me, more hesitantly than others. The electricity around the gap buzzes in my ears, tickling the little hairs on the lobes. Beardsley raps on the door five times, in quick succession, and steps back. Only a few seconds pass before the door creaks open, revealing a young man who looks to be in his early twenties. He wears a waiter's uniform, and his dark hair is slicked back, revealing a neck full of colorful tattoos and ears lined with piercings. He greets the group brightly, and we follow him through the doorway. The room we enter is a dimly lit industrial kitchen, with other men and women who don't even look at us as we pass. They continue preparing expensive-looking appetizers without even a glance in our direction. Muffled music pounds from outside the kitchen. It's a fast tempo with a deep bass. We congregate in an empty space near the door in a disfigured circle. The waiter stands next to Q comfortably and easily. They converse familiarly. He says something to her in a low voice, and she snickers, covering her mouth to muffle it. They stand close enough that their arms are almost touching. What the hell? Where's all the snarls and smirks and insults? Why am I the only one who gets those from her? It would make my charm Q objective way easier if she was that nice to me. Or would it make it harder, like morally? I shake off that train of thought and shift my attention to Beardsley, who's giving the final pep talk. We have till midnight before the exit code changes, he says. We'll meet here then. Blend in, stay quiet. Get in and get out. That's the way we do things. He points to me sharply. And you. Don't think for one second you have my whole trust. The only reason I'm letting you come is because I know Q and Luna can deal with you if you don't act right. You're damn right, Q chirps in agreement. I gulp and on that note, the circle breaks, reminding me of a team of football players breaking from a timeout and heading into the gridiron. Same energy, same anticipation, adrenaline, nerves. Beardsley exits first, the blast of music replacing him. Lala touches her lips and blows a kiss to Q with a good luck in her eyes, nods to me with a warm smile, and follows Beardsley out the door. Be careful, Red says, mostly to Q, barely heard over the music. His eyes are severe, protective, creating a slight crease in the tattoo swirling under his eye. Always, she replies with a reassuring smile. Stay together, he calls over his shoulder before exiting. 
The waiter is kneeling in front of Luna, petting her and cooing to her. She eats up all the attention and seems to shine at being called a good girl so enthusiastically by this young man. Q watches them interact with a smile. Like an actual smile. Not a sarcastic one. Or her usual smirk. A smile. What am I doing wrong? Ready? I interrupt, hopefully hiding my irritation. I gesture to the bag of delivery strapped across my chest. Now that the worst part is pretty much over, the whole might get fried alive by invisible shields thing, I'm pretty anxious to get started, hoping to get these done as quickly as possible so we can go pay a visit to Steels' contact at Lido. I'm also kind of excited to have an actual, real E1 night, though I'd never admit it. Goes against every bitter and angry code I stand for to have fun. The guy stands. Well, good luck, he says, smiling with bright white teeth that line up next to each other perfectly. Of course they do. I smile tightly in return. Q attaches a leather leash to Luna's collar. If Luna could roll her eyes, it looks like she would. She seems to have an expression that says this measure is absolutely unnecessary. I'm not a child, guys, her eyes say. Q scratches her head reassuringly. She waves goodbye to the waiter, and without another moment, we're on our way. We step out of the kitchen into a room only lit by flashing multicolored lights that circle around the dance floor and occasionally blind you. I freeze in my tracks when I take in the people filling in every available inch of the room. These people make our group look normal by comparison. The level of ridiculousness I thought we had achieved by our appearances is barely enough to even blend in. It takes everything I have to keep my jaw from dropping as I gawk at the people nearest me. As I attempt to follow Q through the crowd, the appearances seem to get even more wild and extreme. Everyone here is young, basically our age, and all appear to be having the best night of their lives. They all dance closely, creating one body of color and texture. They look absolutely insane. Hair of every size, shape, and color. Hair pieces and accessories bigger than a small child hang off their heads and bodies. Colorful outfits of wild patterns and textures with shoes that don't even look like shoes. Some people don't even wear clothing at all, and instead sport body paint, fish netting, plastic wrap, stickers, tattoos. Skin is every color of the rainbow, or glittered, or metallic. Some have body modifications that look absolutely horrifying. Gaping piercings on noses, lips, and eyes. Implants of spikes or gemstones, misshapen body parts, like ears, chins, and shoulders, tattoos covering every inch of skin. Every possible line is blurred. Human slash inhuman, masculine slash feminine, lifelike slash unnatural. They are everything at once. I have to push my way through the crowd with my elbows and shoulders to keep up with Q and Luna. The distance between us grows, and I can barely see her springy curls. There are people moving to the music all around me, and I'm pretty sure someone just grabbed my butt. Nice. The bass vibrates through every muscle of my body and settles beneath my rib cage. The pulsing beat and flow of the music is mesmerizing, unifying the bass and bodies into one. The bouncing bodies around me seem to slow, like they're moving in slow motion. I can't help but stare. Their disfigured smiles are distracting, blending with the lights and other faces like a kaleidoscope. The music moves to a new song, one that feels deeper and lower. It tickles the back of my neck. I sway in place, pushed from side to side from all directions. I kind of feel... peaceful. My body feels heavy and weightless at the same time. Weightless like a huge stress has finally been lifted off my shoulders. The weight I've been carrying around everywhere is suddenly just... gone. 
I only feel heavy from the weight of the music, pressing my heels down into the dance floor. I suddenly can't remember what I was doing that brought me here, but I don't really care. I'm not worried about anything for once. Worryless for the first time in almost a decade. I feel new and free. The colors of the flashing lights fill my view. I'm moving closer to the group of people around me and sway with them in their rhythm. They welcome me, like I'm one of them. The face of the person next to me seems to morph and swirl. It looks so ridiculous that I start to laugh uncontrollably. The group laughs with me, and we become one. Their heat, their being, sizzles in my bones. Flashing red, then blue, purple. I don't ever want to leave. I'm finally home. A memory from C9. Ella was a slow talker, very curious, alert, and observant, but she was very quiet. The elders kept assuring me she would talk when she was ready, but I was always worried there was something wrong. She would smile or laugh in response when I would talk to her, but she just didn't have anything to say back. Not even any babbling or baby talk. I'll never forget the day she said her first word. We were running around outside the nursery before breakfast, the other littles running around with us, some with older siblings of their own, and others completely alone. Ella had run ahead of me to pick up a ball that another kid had dropped when she tripped on the pant leg of her uniform, which was just a little too long. She fell face first, scraping up her chin on the rough ground. I ran over to her as fast as I could. When I got there, her blue eyes were filled with crocodile tears, her chin scuffed and nearly bleeding. Dada! She cried, reaching up for me. It broke my heart into a million pieces to have to say, No, it's Sam, not Dada. It shattered me that I had to correct her on the very first word she was brave enough to say. How do you look at a baby and tell her she doesn't have a dada anymore? It took four months for her to talk again. Chapter 28 Solar Systems, Vintage Stereos, and a Wicked Come Down. I noticed first the blaring ache coming from my head. Then I noticed the blackness. Why is it all black? Where am I? What happened? I start to panic my breaths getting quicker in my chest. Oh, eyelids. With great effort, my eyelids slit open just a crack, feeling heavy and swollen. My eyelashes linger over my field of view like a shadow. Blurred colors, moving colors. A female's voice. A warm tongue on my arm? He's up. The shot worked. I blink, trying to focus on the figure above me. I see the gold tips on the edges of her eyelashes first. Her goggles are resting on top of her mountain of curls and coils. Q? It comes out a rasp. My throat is dry. My tongue feels puffy and thick. She hands me water, and I drink it desperately but the room temperature liquid does nothing to soothe the dryness and thirst. Why does my head hurt so bad? Luna licks my face excitedly, like she hasn't seen me in a while. I pull away in disgust, my face now covered in slobber. But I pat Luna's head fondly, appreciative that someone's happy to see me. I wipe my wet face off with my sleeve, Remembering too late that the blazer they gave me to wear may have been expensive. Oops. This is why we don't have nice things, Sam. The giant ruffle collar of my shirt feels like it's choking me. I tug on it, trying to loosen it up off my neck. I'm going to suffocate. I try to sit up. Nope. Q says, pushing my shoulder down. You're on bed rest, pretty boy. I groan, the ache pulsing in my forehead. What happened? Where are we? The lights are dim, but it looks like we're in some kind of office. 
there's a desk covered in papers, boxes, and crates lining the walls. The floor I lie on is carpeted but hard. My head rests on a scratchy pillow. Q sits next to me, her legs bent to one side like an L, her golden brown thighs showing through the sheer tights. Luna lies between us and rests her head on my stomach. An arm's reach away is a needle and syringe, like one you'd use to get a flu shot. What's the last thing you remember? She hands me another water bottle. I furrow my brow, trying to think. I take a few gulps of the water. Um, I was following you through the people at the club. The music was loud. You were getting farther away. Anything else? I strain my memory. I remember... I stop, embarrassed to say it, especially to her. Her trademark smirk tugs at the left side of her lips, deepening her dimple. Go on, she prompts. I remember... I think I was... dancing. I hang my head in shame. She barks out a hysterical laugh, making fun of how humiliated I am and the growing red on my cheeks. I don't dance, I add, as if that explains things, pushing my hair out of my eye in a huff. Why was I dancing? The door behind Q opens, and a man walks in. He has a long, Gandalf-esque beard, and every inch of his visible skin, even his face and ears, is tattooed with bright colors. He holds a rag, one used to wipe down tables or counters. How was our patient? He says, his voice a higher pitch than I expected. I stare at the solar system tattoos around his eyes and forehead. Good. His memory's coming back. Q answers, the laugh still in the undertones of her voice. He's remembering some things he partook in while he was out, like... She pauses, before whispering mockingly, a hand cupped around her lips. Dancing. The man joins Q's laughter, and I scowl, sipping my water. Hey, no judgments, man. I've done way worse on Vibe. One time I woke up naked on a rooftop with the right half of my beard shaved off. I sit up with much effort. Q doesn't push me back down this time. Luna adjusts to my new position and lays her head in my lap. Vibe? Yeah. It's the trending party drug right now. It's pretty wild. My mouth hangs open, and I look back and forth between Q and the man disbelieving. Drug? But how? Q rubs the back of her neck sheepishly. Yeah, that's kind of our fault. None of us have one, so we didn't even think about it. She nods to my wrist tab. I look down at it dumbly, not understanding. The man clarifies. Different clubs shower different drugs. Just inhaling them doesn't give you a noticeable high. They're designed to go straight to the blood. He taps his wrist for effect. Well, this sure explains the headache. I'm apparently coming off a wicked high. One I don't even remember, for that matter. Just my luck. I look at Q and feign to betrayal. You drug me? If you wanted to have your way with me, you could have just asked nicely. Please, you're lucky I saved your ass, pretty boy. Q wears a you're welcome expression. She crosses her arms exaggeratedly, as if to punctuate it. The only way I could get you out of there was to tell you we were going to meet Darth Vader outside. I knew you were a closet nerd. And I always knew you were a closet con artist. I say, crossing my own arms. And frankly, I'm hurt. First you drug me, and then you seduced me with the prospect of meeting Darth Vader. Who wasn't even real? How could you? She rolls her eyes, a hint of a smile on her lips. You're so lame. But I saw it. I saw the smile. I'll call that a tally in my favor. The man chimes in. Well, it's almost eleven, so you better get moving. Eleven? How are we going to get all of our deliveries done? 
I struggle to pull myself up onto my feet. Once I'm up, I offer my hand to Q to help her up, but she pushes herself up without my help instead, giving me a look like I should have known better. She smooths her dress down and straightens a metallic coil that has fallen over her eye. I notice how the gold paint on her cheekbones kind of reflects in her eyes, giving them a glint of gold and how it makes her freckles shimmer. I look away quickly, snorting at how stupid I am to think something so lame. Luna stands and shakes out, causing clouds of glitter to flurry everywhere. We'll be fine, Q says, mostly to reassure herself, slinging the messenger bag over her shoulder. I know my way around. She hands Luna's leash to me, and I pat her on the head. I hope Luna is the only one who sees me sway on my feet a bit unsteadily. But I balance myself quickly and fortify my posture. Q pats the man's shoulder gratefully. Thanks for your help, Willie. We obviously can't bring this one anywhere. The name rings in my ears like a church bell. Willie? Steals his friend? Willie extends his hand to shake mine. The one and only... His handshake is firm and confident. Behind him, just past his ear, something catches my attention. It's so small that I never would have noticed if I weren't looking right at it. My back tenses, feeling immediately flighty. On the desk, behind him, is a single playing card. I move past him and pick it up for closer inspection to confirm my suspicion. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up. To anyone else, this would just be a normal face card, but I know it's more than that. It's a calling card. Vegas's calling card. I think of the stack Dr. Coombs had with minuscule messages inscribed on them. The tiny writing on this one loops around the heart shape. Live free, it says. My dry throat feels even drier. Is Willie also working for Vegas? Is Willie Vegas? I look over my shoulder at him to see them both staring at me. I say nothing, only hold up the card. Q looks annoyed and tries to snatch the card from my hands. We don't have time for- I move it away quickly from her reach. Live free? I read aloud, hoping it will bring some clarity if I say it vocally. Or die, Willie replies and makes a fist in front of his heart, his expression somber. There is a beat of silence. Q's eyes flick back and forth between us. Willie breaks the silence with a bark of laughter. What a load of bull, am I right? He puts a hand on his chest, his laugh more like a crazed shriek. Your faces! I chuckle nervously, still not sure exactly what's going on. What does it mean? I ask. All the kids are saying it these days, he says, grabbing the card from my hand. Some fad going around the zone. The kids around here will step behind any trend, no matter how ridiculous. He tosses the card back on the desk. Something about the way Willie ushers us out of his office a little too hastily makes me instantly suspicious. Wait, I say as he is pushing us out of the office telling us how lovely it was to see us, and to please pass his regards to Steele, and to be careful with our deliveries, and to have a good night. The door is almost closed behind us before I have time to even think. Wait, I say again, bracing my hand against the door to keep it from closing. He pushes from the other side of the door, his weight against mine. What do you know about Vegas? His weight on the other side lightens for just a brief second causing me to fall through the doorway. He picks me up by my ruffled collar, forcing me to my feet and shoving me out. I stumble back into the counter of the bar, knocking over a glass bottle. Its shatter isn't even heard over the upbeat music and the rowdy patrons of Lado playing pool across the room. His finger is right in my face, his tattooed face furious, Veins in his neck looking like they're going to pop out. I know nothing about that name, so don't you dare say it in my bar again. Now get out! 
he flips a 180, pushes his way past Q and Luna, and slams the door of his office shut behind him. What in the... Q breathes, incredulously. Do you want to tell me what the hell is going on? I barely even hear her, everything around me suddenly going dark. All I can see is this tiny glimmer of hope, this tiny chance someone might know something about Ella. This tiny glimmer is all I can see, and I'm not going to leave it behind. I pound on the office door. Please! Pound, pound, pound. He took my sister. If you know anything, it can help me find her. My voice sounds crazed, but I don't care. I don't choke it back. No answer. I jiggle the doorknob. Locked. Willie! Please! Pound, pound, pound. My sister is only eight years old. She's probably scared and possibly hurt. I have to find her. The pure desperation finally spills out entirely. The composure I've tried so hard to keep these last few days completely overflows over the edges. I know he knows something. He has to help me. He has to. Please! She's only eight! I kick the door. Kick after kick. But the heavy oak doesn't budge. No answer. I let my forehead clunk into the door, slapping the door a few more times uselessly, trying to get composure before turning to Q. How can I convince her to make the deliveries herself so I can stay here and keep harassing Willie? I turn around, and she seems to understand, pity drawn all over her face. I sigh. Great. Just what I need. More people to feel bad for me. Even Luna steps toward me and licks the tips of my fingers, nuzzling my hip as I walk closer. I take a breath, trying to quickly come up with some kind of sarcastic comment to play off the scene they just witnessed. Well, it's a good thing... Click. The lock. We turn sharply. Slowly the door creaks open, and Willie's head peeks out. He stretches his neck out and looks in all directions. He gestures hurriedly for us to come back in before shutting the door and locking it tight. He doesn't say anything, just gives me a look of reluctant surrender. It's hard to miss the fear in his eyes. The pupils of his dark eyes are so dilated that they're almost entirely black. Why are you so scared of... He shushes me, ignoring me completely. It was kind of a dumb question anyway. I remember all the crazy that happened in C9, which was just a few short days ago. Though it feels like a lifetime. In a matter of an hour, Vegas had somehow found out that Foster had told us even minimal details about his involvement with Ella's disappearance. I shudder thinking of the blood-red rat drawn on his forehead. I remember Coombs' fear, his reluctance to reveal any information for that exact reason. He has eyes, ears, and hands everywhere, Coombs had said. I think of the horrific procedure he'd done to my wrist, the one he'd done to six children prior to me. Vegas was willing to go to any lengths to ensure this master plan, whatever it is, was carried out, even if it meant Coombs would have to brutalize five children before successfully performing the operation. Five children, like they were nothing. What else is he capable of? Willie has flipped on a vintage stereo under his desk and turned the dial so the music is all the way up. It is distorted, blaring loudly through the old blown-out speakers. The clanging music sounds like something you'd hear in an old movie. Like a really old movie. I look at Q, and we share the cringe. He rummages through the stack of papers on his desk. I know nothing about that name. I've never heard it before. He repeats loudly, too loudly, over the music, not even looking at us. He searches his desk for something, almost like he's forgotten we're even there. Q and I share a skeptical look. She taps her fingers on her wrist impatiently. He finally finds a pen and scribbles a message onto the back of a receipt. 
E2. Fresh air. Be careful. I open my mouth to ask for clarification, but he shushes me again sharply. Fresh air? Willie finds a magazine on his desk and scans over the pages at lightning speed. He gets to a page in the magazine and tears it out. He hands it to me and runs his fingers through his beard anxiously, his eyes darting around crazily. I take it slowly, trying to remember the last time I held an actual magazine in my hand. Do they really have magazines in elite zones? Is it actually so ridiculously boring that they would? His expression interrupts my train of thought. He raises his eyebrows and with his eyes gestures pointedly down at the page. I bring it in focus, and Q looks over my shoulder. I can feel her breath on my neck. It's an advertisement to some sort of casino? The page is taken up by a photograph of what looks like a craps game. A man in an expensive-looking suit has just thrown the dice. His arm is still outstretched toward the dice, which are suspended in mid-air above the green felt table. Two pretty women in sparkling, low-cut dresses drape themselves over his shoulders, their smiles excited and seductive. Other animated people surround them, sharing their anticipatory expressions, each donned in suits with loosened ties or cocktail dresses that fall off the shoulder. They hold drinks in their hands, and their ease tells me this carefree game is a regular experience. But what is most alluring about this photo is not the beautiful women or the promise of fun and excitement, and it's not the prospect of winning big money. It's that upon closer inspection, the background appears to lead outside. Yep, that's definitely blue sky, spotted with puffy white clouds. The thrown dice seem to fly toward the caption in the lower left corner. I blink in surprise as I read it again and again. Live free or die. It takes me longer than I'd like to admit to connect the pieces. Vegas. Face cards. Casino. Okay. Makes sense. Is Vegas upstairs? I ask, hoping it's not true hoping that what looks to be actual blue sky is some kind of illusion engineered to resemble the bright sunshine. If Vegas is actually upstairs, that makes my plan a lot harder. He makes an X with his hands and a pained expression to shut me up, his eyes wild with the fear of someone listening. With a finger over his lips, Willie points to the handwritten message on the receipt. E2. I fold up the ad into fourths and nod in thanks, relieved, examining him closer as I slide the ad into the inside pocket of my blazer. A shadow I didn't see before haunts his colorful face, the shadow hiding behind the brightness of his tattoos, the sadness, the starry Milky Way curving from up around his right ear, under his nose, and across his cheek can't hide the dark heartbreak painted on every inch of his face that is so visible now, although the bright artwork was a solid effort. I see past it, seeing my own defenses mirrored in his tattoos, a distraction to hide the pain. Only someone who shares the same pain would even notice. Q reaches out for him, also seeing it, noticing the tears welling up in his nearly black eyes. He pushes her hand away gently, declining the sympathy but gives her a tight-lipped smile gratefully. Why are you doing this, Willie? I ask quietly, but just loud enough to be heard over the still-blaring stereo. It now plays an old song I recognize from before, one of my mom's favorites. An upbeat rock anthem with energetic guitars and passionate angsty vocals. Under different circumstances, I may have even been tempted to sing along, honoring her. Honoring the memory of her making breakfast for me on Saturday morning, sliding along the kitchen floor in her socks as she performed the song for me, using the ketchup bottle as a microphone. I stopped singing along when I reached an age where I thought I was too cool. 
He pulls a photograph out of his wallet and hands it to me, wiping a fallen tear off his cheek of deep blue and purple galaxies. The photograph looked like an old Polaroid, weathered, the white edges worn and discolored from moisture. In the photo is a little girl, who looks to be four or five. She sits in a kiddie pool filled with water. She is wearing a pink ruffled swimming suit, and her happy splashes are frozen in time. Blonde curls fall over a bright, toothy grin, and tiny sunglasses shield her eyes. If I hadn't been such a coward, he attempts, overcome with emotion, my daughter... Q steps toward him despite his prior decline of sympathy and squeezes his arm comfortingly. We wait, the emotion in the room seeming to absorb the loud music. He sniffs and looks to me, nodding. Find your sister. For me. For my Beck. I give him the photograph back and try to give him a sincere expression of gratitude. I hope I can convey just how thankful I am wishing I could do more for his grief. I will. Thank you, Willie. Chapter 29 Death by Magboard I expect Q to yell at me when we finally break out of Willie's club. I expect her to lecture me for wasting so much time and reminding me of our deadline. But surprisingly, she doesn't. And that scares me. I must be in for it. I look at her expectantly. She ignores me, studying the map, trying to make a plan for how we can get our deliveries done most efficiently. It's only when I stare at the map over her shoulder that she looks back slowly and gives me a deadly look. I put my hands up and surrender, stepping back. So what's the plan then, boss? I check my tab for the time. We have 35 minutes. It's then that I really take in what's around me, forgetting for a second I'm still in an underground zone. Instead, it feels like I'm in a futuristic movie scene set in New York City. Wow. I breathe, speechless at the sheer excess all around me. Towering buildings line a narrow cobblestone street, a street that is filled mostly with wild pedestrians and an occasional mag-powered taxi vehicle whose occupants hang out of the windows and sunroofs, shouting indiscernible things at the people they pass, the drinks in their hands spilling everywhere. The giant buildings surrounding us have signs of flashing neon so bright it's nearly blinding. Ladeau's own sign above its entrance is a vertical screen that hangs off the side of the building and above the sidewalk. It is a moving display that features a set of leggy twins standing side by side on top of the boxy Lido logo. They're sharing a giggling secret, occasionally pointing out to the street and laughing. They take turns whispering something into the other's ear and giggling into their hands. The buildings that line the street appear to be a mix of ritzy restaurants, clubs, stores, and hotels. I crane my neck, gawking at the size of the walls around me, trying to see how high the buildings stretch. Partiers gush in and out of every entrance, appearing to have absolutely zero cares in the world, and that pisses me off. I had always wondered how the elites could be so carefree when so much bad was happening all around them in common zones and right above their heads upstairs. I always wondered if we saw in the weekly propaganda messages was just staged to make us hate them. There's no way real people could be that vain and shallow. Yet here we are. If you think that's cool, Q says, not even looking up from the map as she tosses her goggles to me. I fumble with them awkwardly, almost dropping them on the ground. I put them over my eyes and breathe in wonder as the already bright color explodes before my eyes. The Ladeau twins are now 3D, looking like they're basically right in front of me. I reach out to try to touch them, but the image passes through my fingers. They've moved past the secrets and are now sharing a bottle of champagne excitedly. 
These goggles make it feel like I'm with them. Like they're inviting me to share it with them. A wall across the street has a moving ad that takes up the entire wall. It looks like an ad for clothing or some kind of brand. It has a couple wild-looking teens laughing and smoking, a colorful cloud of smoke billowing out of their mouths and floating over at me. I look up and nearly fall to my knees in surprise. Above me is the most realistic virtual image I've ever seen. It's the sky. Blinking stars glitter across the deep blue, the full moon radiating in bright white. I reach out, knowing it's not real, but stretching my arm toward its beauty anyway. Wow. What I would give to just lay out and stare at this view for the rest of the night. Warm memories of looking at this very view with my family floods over me. Someone zooms past me on a mag board and it startles me back into reality. My neck kind of hurts from the stretch, but it's only a small price to pay to see it again. Something about this night sky gives me hope, like maybe one day I'll see the real thing again. I haven't felt that way in a long time. I hold on to that hope as I remove the glasses and the view disappears. Laughing groups stagger past us and into Willie's club cooing at Luna as they pass, squealing with delight at the music blaring through the door and spilling onto the sidewalk where we stand. Q folds up the map and tucks it into the front pocket of our messenger bag, which she shoves into my chest curtly. I take the strap and loop it over my head and onto my shoulder, handing Luna's leash and the goggles over. She meets my eyes, and I feel the storm coming that I expected. All she says, though, too calmly, is, Are you done slowing me down, pretty boy? Are you done slowing me down? A joke right now is risky, but I'm a creature of habit. I've been trying to get out of here for ages. I dodge her punch ungracefully and end up bumping into a passing partier who shrieks. Hey, watch it, mister, she slurs. She walks backward away from us, stumbling a bit in her platform shoes, shaped like the Eiffel Tower. At the top of her tower shoes are sleek ribbons that wind up her legs and around every curve of her otherwise bare body. To my surprise, her face softens, and she blows me a kiss. Her feathered eyelashes blink, and they nearly reach her chin. Her pace slows, and she beckons me to follow her, gesturing, come here, with her finger. Whoa. If the girls looked like this in C9... Q clicks her tongue in disgust at my gawking. Are you done? I laugh at the look on her face, the bright glitter paint across her cheeks, a stark contrast with the dark look of death she's giving me. I shrug, giving her my best sparkly smile. What? I've always wanted to visit the Eiffel Tower. It's a beautiful historical landmark. I have to jump back to avoid another punch, and I laugh so hard it hurts my stomach. The Eiffel Tower girl curses at me, offended I didn't follow, and staggers back to her rowdy group of friends. I honestly could not care less who you gawk at, pretty boy, Q snaps, spinning on her heel and starting down the sidewalk. Literally all I care about is getting these deliveries done so we don't get trapped in here. You can go take a tour of Paris another time. I chuckle to myself and follow her across the road. We keep our pace brisk, but not too fast, so we don't look out of place. We try to match the carefree and casual vibes of everyone else. Now that my eyes have adjusted more to how weird everyone looks, what sticks out to me most now are the smells and the warmth, even outside and after dark. The overhead lights match the moonlight, but it feels like the sun is blazing down, but not in an Arizona summer type way, more just like a sunbathing in the park kind of way, and the smells. Each club and storefront we pass has its own unique smell. Some are beachy or ocean-like, some resemble feasts or home-cooked meals. 
Everyone adores Luna. Although she tightens her grip on the leash protectively every time, Q doesn't stop anyone from kneeling down and petting her. Luna's tail wags happily each time as she soaks up all the attention. We stop in front of a boutique. Q double checks the map to be sure we have stopped at the right place. The huge windows are lined with Hollywood style bulbs that flash neon. There are two metallic gold mannequins on display. Their arms interlocked. One wears a beaded outfit and a wig of different shades of pink tubing, like the gold ones in Q's hair, and the other wears a crocheted outfit and a wig of green tubing. The door slides open as it senses our approach, shooting out a flurry of cool air which, compared to the warmth outside, feels like a slap across my cheeks. I step in after Q, but she stops and holds up a hand. Maybe you should stay out here. Her eyes point down to my wrist tab. You know, just in case. I sigh and hand her the messenger bag grudgingly. I lean up against the brick wall and nudge Luna over to me, so she's out of the way of the group of staggering partiers passing by. Well, Luna, guess it's just you and me out here. She sits next to me, looking up at me curiously her tongue lapping out to the side of her mouth. I'm pretty useless around here, huh, girl? I say, ignoring the inner me that is reminding me how stupid it is to talk to a dog. She cocks her head, her left ear pulling back. I guess it should be no surprise, I'm pretty useless in general. I go on, even though I know she can't understand me. I guess it's more for me voicing the things everyone else probably thinks of me already. I'm really just dead weight, everywhere I am. I slide down the bricks and plop onto the sidewalk, suddenly weighed down when I realize how true that really is. Sam the dead weight. I tear apart a fallen crunchy leaf from one of the giant oaks above that provide the jungle-like canopy of greenery above us. That's me. My parents knew it. Ella knew it. Foster knew it. Everyone here knows it. I toss the leaf remnants on the sidewalk and pet behind her ear. And even though I keep my voice high and playful like how you talk to dogs or babies, she seems to know I'm not saying playful things because she keeps staring at me with those deep black eyes. Maybe if I wasn't so useless, I could actually figure out another way to get Ella back without having to screw over. Q's voice above us startles me. Am I interrupting? I hop up and shove my hands into my blazer pockets, keeping a firm hold on the leash. Actually, yes, Luna and I were just having a lovely discourse on Plato's notion of the unreliability of human perception. Care to weigh in? She blinks, and I'm just as surprised as she is. I laugh. I have no idea where that came from. She snorts. Just when I think you couldn't be any weirder, pretty boy. Before I can retort, with some snarky comment, a pair of men in their late twenties approach us. I step in front of Q subconsciously, and Luna steps with me. Their heads are shaved bald, and their bare scalps, necks, and shoulders are painted with matching glow-in-the-dark body paint. They wear black, flowing clothing that almost resembles robes, they look like cultish glow sticks, and I have to bite my lip to keep from laughing at the thought. They greet Luna first, kneeling in front of her and scratching her head. Beautiful night, Q says, her tone careful, and I share her suspicion. They both express their enthusiastic agreement as they rise to our level. Then they stare at us blankly. They wear contact lenses that are coated in the same neon color of their body paint. It gives their eyes a horrifying glow, like wolves in the dark woods. I tighten my grip on the leash and step closer to Q, unnerved. Her posture stiffens. There is a beat of silence as they keep staring. They look like they are expecting us to say or do something. Q and I share a glance, and she looks as freaked out as I am. Beautiful night? Q repeats again, 
a question mark on the end of her statement this time. The pair smiles, looking at each other like this is all perfectly normal, and repeat more agreeing statements about how beautiful the night is. Then without another beat, they nod and turn to make their way down the sidewalk. Live free, they say in unison, as casually as a goodbye. Another group is passing by right as they say that, and even though the statement wasn't directed to them, the group responds, or die. They share fist bumps, high fives, and pats on the back with the unusual glowing men, like they share some kind of secret. Each of the groups makes their way in different directions, not giving us a second glance. Q and I are silent as we process what just happened, not really sure what to make of it. And that, kids, is why you don't do drugs, I finally say. You're one to talk, you junkie. Too soon, Q, too... Then I see it. Tucked under Luna's collar, my mouth goes dry. Q sees it too, and gasps. A red playing card. I take it from under her collar carefully, as if I'm expecting it to be laced with an explosive. I hold it close to my eye, inspecting it for a message to confirm if this really is from... The tiny scrawling letters... Support life, support freedom, live free, or die. Vegas, Q breathes next to me, confirming my very thoughts. You don't think he... She looks at me, her eyebrows drawn in fear. You don't think he sent this to us, right? Just as I'm about to try to reassure her, and myself, that this was just completely random and coincidental... A passerby snatches it out of my hand, as if I was holding it up for him. Live free, man, he drawls. Or die, I say. He stuffs the card in his back pocket and continues on his way. Okay, this is the weirdest night, is it not? The weirdest, Q agrees, her voice still concerned probably remembering how scared Willie was to even say his name. Eyes, ears, and hands everywhere. I remember, too. I shudder. I'm choosing to believe this was not a personalized message of warning, and instead just a random occurrence. I say matter-of-factly, mostly to assure myself. And, anyway, we really need to get going. I cringe at the time and remember something that can help us. I wince as a light from a circulating neon beam hits the goggles atop Q's head just right, reflecting right into my left eyeball. Though I'm temporarily blinded, I reach for the bag and dig under the packages. She watches me impatiently, tapping her wrist to remind me we're running impossibly late. My fingertips brush its cool metal, and my heart automatically swells. So we really need to speed this up, I say, finally holding my magboard cube up in my hand delicately. Due to an unnamed member of our party, you know, getting drugged, lied to, kidnapped. Q huffs. Get to the point. Right. I'm kind of relieved to see she looks like her normal self again, annoyed and not scared about the possibility of Vegas targeting us. Back to normal. Her impatience turns to curiosity as I touch the outer panel of the cube and it immediately unfolds and spurs to life. The LEDs lighting up bright blue. Q's eyes widen when she takes in the shape in my hands. Is that... Then she lights up, snatching it from my hands and inspecting it in closer detail. Is this really a second gen mag board? I nod, sharing her excited smile. We've delivered a few of these, but I could never test them out, obviously. I've always dreamed of trying one. Does it really go as fast as they say? Her eyes are brighter than I've ever seen them, and it actually kind of warms my heart. Huh. Guess that confirms I do have one of those after all. Well, let's finish up these deliveries and find out. I drop it to the ground, and it pushes itself up, 
using the repulsive magnetic force from the treated cement to float above the surface. Ready to go for a run, Loon? Q says excitedly, nearly bouncing. Luna mirrors her excitement, having no idea what's going on other than the fact that it's something fun. You should probably drive, I say, remembering that I have no idea where I'm going. Yes, right. She takes a quick glance at the map to remind herself where our next location is as she unstraps her heels. She hands them to me, and I push them into the bag, and with them I try to push away the nagging worry that maybe it really was a message from Vegas after all. I shake it away. I help Q up onto the board and wait patiently as she adjusts to the wobbly footwork and the unfamiliar weightlessness. I show her a few controls and watch her timidly inch forward and backwards a few times. Well, if we don't see how fast it goes, at least we'll know for sure how slow. Very carefully, she crouches down and holds Luna's face close to hers in both hands. You have to stay right next to us, okay? No racing. Her tone is stern, and Luna's ears move down. Promise? Luna licks her nose in confirmation, and Q unclips the leash, stuffing it into the front pocket of the bag. She stands carefully. Luna circles around us excitedly, impatiently waiting for us to get going. Okay, she says, looking back at me. Her big, toothy smile is confident, but her balance is still looking a little unsteady. Let's go. I step toward the board slowly, and suddenly my heart drops as I realize the logistics of sharing a board with her. Sam, what were you thinking? So, uh... I say awkwardly, any charm or cheekiness leaving my existence completely. I'll have to... Her brow raises. She doesn't help me out at all. And I want to just say, Forget it. I'll run with Luna. I sigh, running a hand through my hair sheepishly. I don't want to, you know, fall off and die. Is it okay if I... She grins the smile actually traveling all the way up to her eyes. Are you asking if you can touch me, pretty boy? I huff, trying to play off the heat that has risen to my cheeks. Well, I wouldn't have used those words, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure you'd rather I... Shut up already and get up here. Right. I make sure the messenger bag is secured around my shoulder with the extra weight of her shoes, and I step carefully up onto the board, using my core to balance myself. My face is right in her gigantic curls and coils, and it smells like some sort of flower. When was the last time I smelled a flower? Lavender, maybe? I keep as much space between our bodies as possible. Sort of like when you see a mountain lion in the desert, and all you can do is just move slowly away with your hands outstretched in hopes you don't aggravate it and it doesn't tear your guts out or push you off a speeding mag board. Luna gives an impatient bark. Q looks back over her shoulder, and I'm instantly aware of my lips right next to her cheek. She doesn't seem to notice my inner freakout, and instead fortifies herself. Ready? Ready, yes, sorry. I hesitate before tentatively resting my hands on her hips, trying to not overthink the placement too much. Too high, and you're in trouble. Too low, and you're also in trouble. My hands are in a respectable middle, right? Shut up, Sam. Why do you have to overthink every little thing? Just be normal. Before my overthinking can take me down a spiral, Q slams her foot down, and we zoom forward so fast I think my skin is still back behind us. I tighten my grip on her waist in surprise, feeling the air whiz by my ears. The street and pedestrians blur by, and Luna runs joyously next to us, her ears back, tongue out, loving the speed. Q whoops out in delight, not slowing down even slightly as we curve around the street corners and maneuver around people, buildings, and vehicles. I hide my face in her hair as she refuses to slow for any obstacles, my chest smushed up to her back. My insides clench 
feeling like I left my stomach behind on the top of a roller coaster. I think I might be sick. What's wrong, pretty boy? Can't handle the speed? She yells back at me, the volume of her voice getting mostly lost in the airspace around us. This? Speed? Felt a little slow to me, actually. I lie, whooping back loudly to the street around us to prove just how fine I am, despite the butterflies attacking my gut. Going at light speeds is so much different when you're the driver. Trusting someone else so completely has never been my strong suit, and I feel ill. She whoops again, this time holding out her arms and raising her face up to the canopy of green draped over us from the huge trees. She soaks in the weightlessness, the feeling of flying. I remember loving so much when I first tried out the board, the feeling of freedom and control that I hadn't felt in so long. I'm sure it feels amazing to her, too, after so many years of feeling trapped and lost. We near our destination, so Q lets her foot off the acceleration slightly to slow us down. She takes a dramatic swerve to avoid hitting a group of stumbling elites, and I nearly fly off, my hand placement getting momentarily questionable as I try not to fall to certain death. Too suddenly, like so suddenly that if we were in a movie and if we were driving a getaway car, the tires would be squealing, we come to a stop. The inertia from the sudden stop makes us stumble forward onto the board. I steady myself, holding my hands out to my sides for balance. Luna also screeches to a stop next to us, panting. We are stopped in front of an Italian restaurant, with a line curving out the door of people waiting to get in. Images of pizza and pastas are painted along the long glass window, and I'm instantly hungry. When was the last time I had pizza? My mouth waters at the thought of that cheesy goodness. Wow. Q breathes as she hops down off the board, untangling her curls and adjusting her dress. Yeah, wow, is all I can say as I hand her the package, my heart still racing. I take back what I said about not knowing how fast we could go. I did not expect her to go so fast after just barely learning how to operate the board. There was nothing timid about that ride. Nothing timid about her in general, actually. Skipping the line, she strides into the restaurant barefoot, leaving me out with Luna again, who was breathless, but still happy as ever, probably feeling the adrenaline just like I am. Enjoying the freedom without her leash, she approaches the people in line who are overjoyed to see her, and she sniffs their clothes and shoes curiously. They pet her enthusiastically. To my surprise, there are two other leashed dogs farther down in line. Two tiny lap dogs with dyed fur and frilly ribbons. They yap at us furiously from their spot in line as if reminding her that this is their turf. This is their side of town. Why are little dogs always so angry? I warn Luna to stay close. She obeys. Wow. She's seriously the best trained dog ever. So weirdly obedient that she's nearly human with fur. I wonder how long it took Q to train her to be so good, or if she's just naturally good-natured. Wait, hold on. Regular people are allowed to have pets in these zones? Are there any rules here? Is there any luxury they aren't allowed to enjoy? Despite the anger that is now boiling up inside of me, I play the part of the casual elite who definitely belongs here, casually saying hello and thank you to the many people who gush over Luna as I wait for Q to return. I get a few live freeze and respond back cordially as I've learned. Soon enough she's back and with dread. I step back onto the board prepared to once again face my impending doom. Chapter 30 I always knew I hated elites, but this just confirms it. The time nears midnight, and we fly through the streets, finishing the rest of our deliveries. Fly, stop, deliver. Fly, stop, deliver. Repeat and repeat until our bag across my shoulder gets lighter and lighter. 
Luna slows down as we near the end of our deliveries, panting more heavily as she tires of the exercise. I'm waiting outside the final location, a vintage-looking salon, eyeing the time as it inches closer to midnight, worrying about not getting to the rendezvous point in time and getting trapped here. Q planned our route perfectly, so our final delivery would be the closest to the meeting point, so it's basically right around the corner, but I still worry anyway about what it would mean for us to get stuck in here. I clip the leash back on Luna's collar, and she scratches at it with her hind leg in frustration. I pet her head in apology. I power down the board and stuff the cube back into the nearly empty bag next to her boots. She never seems bothered to make the deliveries barefoot, and I don't blame her for not wanting to strap the huge heels back on. Seems like a lot of work, though they're pretty mild compared to some of the crazy shoes I've seen people wearing tonight. Why is it fun to purposely make yourself uncomfortable? I tap the side of my thigh with my fingertips anxiously, waiting for Q's return. The street is no quieter than the others, and I have to wonder if every night is like this. Do they ever get tired of constantly being reckless and wild? Do they ever have responsibilities or burdens? What's it like around here during the day? I pace by the edge of the sidewalk, trying to picture the streets less crowded and full of daylight instead of the shining moon when I notice a red playing card stuck on a cluttered billboard of a storefront next to the salon. It has the same saying on it as the last one. What does it mean? Support life, support freedom? Are these cards supposed to be some kind of propaganda? Is Vegas trying to collect followers? I think of all the live free or dies I've heard tonight, and it dawns on me that that's exactly what he's doing. And he's doing it well. That's terrifying. What could he possibly need a bunch of elites for? What does he need their support for? What is this support freedom movement he's spreading? Q's sudden voice behind me scares me so bad I nearly pee my pants. I laugh at myself to try to cover up how bad I jumped. Luckily, if she noticed, she doesn't comment. She just gestures for us to get going, and I follow her down the road. We are quiet for a moment as we walk toward the meeting point, and I worry about her bare feet on the dirty sidewalk, but she doesn't seem to care. On the tracks above us, a light rail whooshes by, sending a gust of wind through my hair. My eyes are momentarily covered, I shove it out of my face and glance at Q. She actually looks relaxed, pensive, or maybe just tired. I don't dare ask her what she's thinking about. I know she won't tell me anyway. I decide to just break the silence. You know, I say, chuckling, my sister Ella would have probably shucked me out of my skin on the magboard too. Q laughs. In that case, I'll probably like her better than you. You probably will, I say, kicking a rock out of my way. It skips across the sidewalk and into the road. Most people do. What's she like? She tucks her curls behind her ear. The sparkling gold earring dangles down so far it nearly brushes up against her bare shoulder. Tough, feisty, compassionate. I suck my teeth, trying not to think too much about those sapphire eyes and the way those sapphire eyes looked the last time I saw her. Betrayed, hurt, confused. Is that how they look right now? I try to keep the mood light instead of dwelling on what I can't control. She could probably take you, actually. She's a bit scrappy. Q puts her fists up in a boxing position. I'd like to see her try. I'll whoop an eight-year-old. Don't think I won't. Oh, I believe you. I laugh. But then my smile falters as I think of Ella's tiny fists and her fiery passion, which is actually a lot like Q's. The thought makes me miss her bad. I swallow, with effort, a lump forming in my throat. 
I can feel Q's eyes on me. We're going to find her. Her certainty makes me pause before taking another step. You think so? She meets my eyes, and all I can see is the gold glimmer reflecting there. Yeah, I do. A beat. I mean, have you seen the people we're with? We're the craziest group in the whole underground. If anyone can find your sister, it's us. Her smirk returns to her lips, and I smile gratefully. You know, the last time I saw her, I spill without even thinking. I had just broken the news to her that our mother, that she had... I stop, shaking my head. What am I thinking? I'm sorry, you don't want to hear all this. I peek at her nervously and expect to see her smirk still remain, or to see her making fun of me. But she isn't. She's just listening. She raises a brow to urge me to go on, if I want to, like I did to her by the campfire on that first night. I click my tongue. Here goes. Well, I had just told her that our mother had died in childbirth, giving birth to her. Q winces. Yikes. And I assume she didn't take it well? I shake my head. No. So that's why I thought she ran away. As awful as this sounds, it was actually almost a relief at first to find out that she'd been taken. So at least she didn't run away just to get away from me. Your dad really never told her before? He made you break it to her? Isn't that kind of messed up? My heart drops down to my ankles. Right. My dad. My dad, the mayor. I had almost completely forgotten. For a moment, the guilt and the dread had actually left me. Maybe it was the mag board, taking the weight off my shoulders and letting me actually feel free for a moment. But like a bucket of water dropped over my head, it washes over me again, soaking me entirely in the dread of the mess I've gotten myself into. The lies. I try to salvage this before I completely give myself away. I can't ruin this. I'm so close to being able to get to E2. So close to Ella. I guess he just thought he would tell her when the right time came around. Q scoffs, and I look at her in surprise. Men, she says, shaking her head in disgust. Always have to control everything. They're so insecure that if the people in their lives don't need them, they won't love them anymore. That stings, and I consider it for a second. Why did it sting if I didn't think it was true? Do I really think Ella won't love me if she doesn't need me? I mean, yeah, I guess I do. Our entire relationship is based off of her needing me. I don't know anything else. Does it stem from insecurity? Control? I'd like to think it stems from just pure love. But why was I always so afraid of letting her down or failing her? Am I driving myself absolutely crazy trying to redeem that failure? And is it really that failure I'm trying to redeem, or does it go back even farther to my dad, my mom? Dang, I breathe, kind of mind blown with how deep my train of thought just went. I wasn't expecting such an honest evaluation of myself. Maybe Q actually sees me clearer than I see myself. Sorry, she says quietly, to my surprise. My timing always sucks. It's okay, I think you're actually right. A beat. Just this time, though. She chuckles, pulling Luna's leash tight as we pass a dog similar in size to her. A dog that wears an argyle vest, bow tie, and old-fashioned paper boy hat with holes for his ears to pop through. It's honestly so cute I could die. Who am I anymore? They sniff each other in greeting as we pass. We nod to the owner congenially. Looking down at their dog causes me to see another playing card in the corner of a storefront we pass. How many of these have I passed without even noticing tonight? I'm sorry about your mom, Q says, 
meeting my eyes as if to reassure her apology, her lips tight and stacked to one side, her dimple deepening. Thanks. At least you remember her, though, she replies softly. She stares now at her bare feet. A moment of silence as I try to think of the perfect thing to say. I come up short, words always failing me. I don't understand why it's such a struggle for me to just formulate sentences. You don't remember anything at all? I ask stupidly. She's quiet for a second, and I'm worried I just messed everything up as usual. I was five when she gave me up. I can't decode the expression on her face so naturally. I blubber. Right, of course. I'm sorry. She interrupts me, raising her hand to assure me it's okay. Her voice calm and reflective, not offended, to my relief. I don't remember much. I remember her braiding my hair, and I remember her tucking me into bed and telling me a bedtime story. Always the same one about a tiny, little, curly-haired superhero who would go on various adventures, helping old ladies cross the street and saving cats from treetops. The Adventures of Super Curly Q. Super Curly Q, I repeat with a smile, understanding. She smiles back. So, that's who I try to be. That's awesome, I say. Well, you sure took me down like a champ. You've got a wicked need for speed, and you have an animal sidekick. So you're either a superhero or Disney princess. Why not both? She teases. I nod in agreement, kind of shocked because we're actually talking. Did we actually just have a normal conversation without me messing it up too badly? Without her getting mad at me? She suddenly stops walking. And I stop too, worried there's some kind of impending danger I didn't see. But there isn't. She just stares at her feet again, looking like she wants to say something, but she's fighting with herself. She puffs out a sharp breath, as if finally deciding to just say it. Can I ask you a favor? There is a hard look between her eyes, a crease in her brow, a slight frown in her lips. So I decide that now is probably not a good time to make a joke about what kinds of favors she might ask me for. I shrug instead. Sure. Can he just tell me their names? She has stopped under a blue neon sign, making her skin appear a deep ocean blue, the goggles on her head reflecting the passing groups behind me. Your dad. That's all I want to know is their names. My stomach clenches, my tangled web of lies probably wrapped entirely around it, keeping me from being able to speak. She looks like she's finding the right words, her eyes busy in her own world. If I get out, she says quietly, almost like she's just saying this to herself, reminding herself of her own intentions. When I get out, I'll spend the rest of my life tracking them down. Her voice rises in volume and anger, her hand slicing the space around her as she continues. I only want to find them so I can look them in the eye and tell them I didn't need them. I grew up strong without them. I didn't need their family. I found my own. I swallow the lump in my throat as she meets my eye, now expecting a response. I promise to do all I can to help you find their names. And as I say it, it feels like the truth. Can I do that? Can I help her find out who they are somehow? Maybe Ramos has access to those kinds of records. Maybe I can, at the very least, find a way. Maybe it could make up for everything else. Thanks. We turn the corner at the edge of the final block, just a mere block away from the same club we apparently dispersed from. I obviously don't remember that part of the evening, since my consciousness was otherwise occupied. Otherwise tripping, I should say. I hope I can make it through the club this time, and to the back without losing it. Maybe if I hold my breath? 
We pass a street light with another playing card stuck to the base, and I add it to some kind of mental inventory. Right down the street, past the club, there is a man with a broom and dustpan, sweeping up all the loose garbage the partiers so carelessly leave behind. Alcohol and energy drink bottles, snack wrappers, magazines, clothing, shoes. Litter of all kinds lines the streets as the night goes on. Something about this man makes me second glance. Is he... It can't possibly be him. But his features remind me of my friend Evan. The one with Down Syndrome. I watch as he sweeps up the litter with a smile. My blood turns to bubbling lava as I remember what it means that this man is sweeping here. He's a prisoner. A slave. All because of that chromosome. Q sees me looking at him but doesn't say anything. We walk in silence toward the club, our pace quickening as it gets scarily close to midnight. I tear my eyes away from the man as we approach the club entrance. I prepare myself to hold my breath, hoping it will help slow the drugs down in my blood. I'm tying a piece of my long shirt dress over my wrist tab when I see it. I freeze, stopping mid-step. It's like it happens in slow motion. I watch the man, smiling and sweeping, pass by a group of elites who are straight plastered. I watch as an oily-haired man sticks out his pointy-toed boot and trips the sweeper, causing him to fall. He reaches out his palms to catch his fall and lands hard on his hands and knees. The group explodes with laughter. His face blurs, and in its place is my friend Evan's face. Pony boys. Tormented and tortured. Day after day. By people like this. I must step toward them subconsciously because Q's grip is tight on my shoulder. A warning to let it go. I shake off her hand and keep moving toward the club entrance. But they don't stop. The group throws garbage at him. Points at him. Croons disgusting slurs at him as he struggles to pull himself up. But it's when the oily-haired man and his buddy take turns kicking him in the stomach that I'm running before I can even think twice about it. Q's yells behind me fade to the wind as I run toward the men as fast as I can. I pull my chin down to my chest, and with all my weight and all the force I can summon, I tackle the oily man right into the street. His head bounces off the cobblestone with a whack. I punch him in the nose, causing a sickening crack of the bone, blood splattering all over my fist and sleeves. The women scream. Other passerbys stop to enjoy the action, yelling fight, fight, and making bets on who will win. Laughing at the sight of one scrawny kid taking on two men, throwing garbage at us and wads of dollar bills. The other man tries to pull me off his friend, but he's so drunk that he stumbles into the road right by me. The group around us laughs. I fly off the oily man and onto the other guy, throwing punches now at his face. My fists scream in pain with each hit, but it doesn't slow me down. His slowed reflexes mean he barely struggles, his eyes rolling back into his head. Oily man next to us tries to get me off, but he can't. Q has caught up to me, and I expect her to pull me off the guy, but she lands a few kicks in Oily Man's gut instead. The audience cheers her on explosively, throwing money at her, now too. The man groans in pain on his hands and knees, slurring drunken curses at us both. She helps me up, and I stand, breathless, my knuckles burning and crackling. Their friends are still screaming at us, shouting horrified exclamations about why I would do this and what is my problem. Luna steps toward the group and growls the most menacing growl I've ever heard her make. Everyone shuts up and scatters in haste, worried about the rabid beast before them, stumbling away in a hurry. The men stagger up after them, wiping the blood from their noses as they go. My heart shrivels a bit as I look behind me and see the sweeper standing against the wall, 
looking like he's trying to shrink into its cracks, his eyes wide with fear. He is visibly shaking. I pick up his broom and dustpan from the street and hand them to him. He recoils at my movement toward him. I'm sorry, I say, approaching him carefully, slowly. I didn't mean to scare you. I give him a tight-lipped smile and pat his shoulder, wishing there was more I could do for him, hating that this is the reality of this man's life and there is absolutely nothing I can do about it. We have to go. Now! Q says, taking my arm and turning me away from the man as she realizes the time. We have two minutes. We have to go. I look over my shoulder at the man one last time before following Q down the street. The man's voice behind me is so quiet that I barely hear his timid, Thank you. We're sitting in the back of the truck, decompressing after our narrow escape from E1 as we speed through the night to our next destination, E2. Finally, on our way to Ella. The only light in the truck is from the dashboard clock, which is several hours wrong. It's pretty quiet except for the sound of Beardsley's keychain dangling from the ignition that clinks the console every time we hit a bump, and Lala's low hum as she strokes Ponyboy's hair, whose head lies in her lap sleepily. For some reason, I'm having serious flashbacks to a childhood memory, the kind I typically shove down into the crevices of my consciousness, but this one I reminisce on fondly, maybe sleepily thinking about a camping trip we took when I was young. It's one of my earliest memories, but I still remember very specific details about that day. Mom singing to the radio as we drove on the winding roads up the mountain, Dad's keychain clinking on the console just like Beardsley's. Thinking about it now, basically everything about it was a failure, so you'd think I'd remember it as this giant flop, but I remember thinking it was the best day ever. We had gotten a flat tire on our way up the mountain, which is enough to make any normal person think, well, that's probably a sign things aren't going to go well tonight. But my dad had this way of never giving up. Call it stubbornness. Call it wide-eyed optimism. Call it whatever. But to a kid, my dad was always the one who could make everything fun, even off the side of the road with a flat tire. He showed me how to change the flat, and we had a race about who could wheel the spare around the car faster and who could get the lug nuts on faster. I don't remember all the details about the rest of the trip, but I remember the smoke from the campfire that tickled the back of my throat. I remember the gooey chocolate dripping onto my hands from the s'mores, cozy pajamas, and waking up to an inch of water in our tent from an unexpected storm. Mom and Dad woke up in a panic and scrambled to pick up our stuff. Using a dripping wet jacket to shield me, ironically, from the pouring rain as we made a run for it to the truck. Sitting in the back of the truck, huddled together in the wake of our ruined camping trip, I expected my parents to be disappointed, to apologize, or to look sad. But they just laughed. And I laughed too. Then we got all cuddled up together in the back of the truck letting the sounds of the rain hitting our windows soothe us back to sleep. And I don't know why, but thinking about the warmth of their laughter and the safety of huddling close to them as I drifted to sleep causes tears to fall down my cheeks. I can't stop them once they start. A tear for Dad, for Mom, for Ella, Foster, leaving Teo and Eddie, the Down Syndrome man at E1 for Ponyboy's earlier life of misery, for the life I took yesterday. It all pours out of me like the unexpected rainfall that ruined our camping trip all those years ago. I try to keep my face turned so Q can't see the tears, ashamed of the way they keep rolling hotly down my cheeks. But she notices anyway. Of course she does. I can feel her looking at me, I try to wipe them away quickly, preparing my comeback for when she inevitably makes fun of me. I sniff, then cough to try to play it off, continuing to avoid meeting her gaze. 
She doesn't say anything, though. Instead, she takes the blanket from around her shoulders and offers it to me. I almost push it away and insist that I'm fine and I could never take her blanket. But before I do, I meet her eyes. And something about the understanding beneath her eyes makes me accept the blanket without pride. I give her a tight-lipped smile gratefully, and she smiles back. She brings her knees up to chest and rests her head against the camper, her eyes closing. I watch her for a second, mostly in surprise. I watch how her fingers still trace through Luna's fur even with her eyes closed. How her fake eyelashes still flutter against her cheek. And then I see the subtle shiver. Unfolding the blanket as I slide across the bed of the truck, I fill the space next to her, my left leg brushing up against hers. I drape the blanket across our legs and turn my head to watch out the far window as the night blurs by. Her eyes open and look down at the blanket, then at me. And then they slowly shut again. My head leans back onto the shell, and before I realize it, I drift to sleep. Chapter 31 Mini Castles and Swimming Pools Really? I awake to the sound of the truck tailgate being dropped with a clunk and blinding light hitting my face. Luna sits up immediately, and her excited tail whacks my shoulder repeatedly. I'm way too sore and still way too tired, so I don't get up right away. Instead, I just let out a low groan. I'm lying on my back, the boxes and storage in the truck bed keeping my legs from being able to stretch out all the way. I try to move them out of their weird angle, but the tightness in my muscles prevents mobility for a few seconds. On the other side of Luna, Q stirs sleepily, flipping over to her other side, grumbling something about really needing to acquire some kind of mattress. I finally push myself up to sitting when Ponyboy's cheerful good mornings sound just outside the truck. He bangs on the tailgate and sings to us to wake up. Luna shoots out of the truck bed and tackles Ponyboy straight to the ground, attacking his face with licks. Q sees my smile and props herself up onto her elbows, untangling the lingering gold coils from her mountain of curls. Yeah, it's not as cute when you've had it as an alarm clock for the past three years. How can you even say that? I've never seen anyone so adorable. I scoot toward the tailgate, rubbing out the soreness in my neck as I go. Hey, she says behind me, and I look at her over my shoulder. The heavy black makeup that ringed her eyes last night is now smudged around the edges. You know, you could have gotten us caught with that stunt you pulled last night. Causing a scene? We could have been found out. I turn my body toward her and open my mouth to defend myself, but she puts a hand up. But, she continues, her face softening just a little, I thought it was pretty cool. I shrug. It was the right thing to do. She scoots past me and pops off the edge of the tailgate. You're a bit of a softy, aren't you, pretty boy? Before I can retort, I'm being attacked by both Ponyboy and Luna, who team up and manage to tackle me to the ground. Ponyboy squeals in delight as I lift him above me like I'm doing a chest press. He squirms and kicks but his laughs echo off the side of the truck. Luna barks next to us in excitement and bounces around us, licking Ponyboy straight in the mouth as he's midair. Soon enough, the whole gang surrounds the tailgate, and I suddenly feel embarrassed to be playing in the dirt with a kid. I lower him to the ground and pull myself up, brushing off all the dirt and dust from my clothes. I lower myself onto the tailgate, and fold my arms in amusement as he hobbles over to Beardsley, who in one swift move throws him up onto his shoulders and swings him around upside down. Pony shrieks and squeals, and everyone in the group can't help but laugh with him. Lala swats Beardsley's arms sternly. Aye, Cortayo! She meets my eye with a playful smile, though. She puts her arm around Q who rests her head on her shoulder. 
When Ponyboy is finally free from Beardsley, he makes his rounds to everyone, giving them enthusiastic hugs and hellos. I smile, watching as he shares some kind of elaborate secret handshake with Steel, and as Red crouches down to accept a tight hug. Most of the crew has shed their E1 getup from last night, but there are still remnants of makeup, accessories, and glitter on everyone's faces and bodies. Beardsley still sports his beard wig, and he strokes it mindlessly, as if it were his own, as he waits for the camping stove to heat up. Lala still has her feathered eyelashes on, but they droop off her face like they'll fall off any minute. The swirling temporary tattoos on Red's face and neck are beginning to peel up at the edges, but the vibrant patterns are still bright on his skin. Suddenly, I remember where we are, and I push off the tailgate. E2. I step around the corner of the truck and take in the massive zone in front of me. After seeing E1, I expected it to be big, but the sight of it still leaves me breathless. While E1 looked like it was built to resemble Las Vegas, E2 looks more like Los Angeles or Seattle, with the same huge buildings, skyscrapers nearly, that stretch up close to the upper shell. But this one lacks all of the sparkle of E1, like the neon, the music, the VR panels, the flashing lights. It's like E1, but the wrinkled, golf-playing, polo-wearing, receding hairline version. A similar light rail track weaves through the city, and the windows of the buildings reflect the warm sunrise tones of the artificial daytime. While E1 had the canopy of green overhead from the trees scattered through the whole zone, E2's trees line the outer border to create more of a wall around the zone. Tall, stone watchtowers, almost as tall as the trees, line each of the two entrances. It makes me wonder how we'll get in without being detected. Do we also have the unseen electric gates to worry about too? I'm sure there's a plan. They've been making these deliveries for all these years without hiccups so far. I take a minute to let this all sink in. I can't believe I'm standing outside E2. Like this is actually happening. Well, if they decide to help me after we finish our deliveries. But I'm here. I'm here. Ever since Ramos and I learned Ella could be here, I've imagined constantly how this day would go. How it would feel to be standing at this very place, right on the brink of finding her. I've been trying to remind myself that nothing is for sure, but I just can't shake this hope I feel, this optimism. I just know it. Today's the day. She's here. I can feel it. That has to mean something. It just has to. I jump as Steels' voice behind me rips me from my thoughts. Here you go, she says, handing me a bag. I groan with dread, imagining what kind of torture is in the bag this time. Don't worry, she chuckles dryly, slipping one hand into the pocket of her jeans. This one's more normal. I give her a tight-lipped smile and thanks, and she turns back to the group. But she stops, staring at me for an extra second, her sharp gray eyes slicing through me. The wrinkles by her eyes look like years of riding her motorcycle into the sunsets from before. She lost the sunset forever, but the wrinkles remain, a reminder of an entire full life she got to live before this. A life I may never get to experience, or Q, or Ella. Q told us, she says, the natural rasp in her voice like gravel, ripping me from my thoughts again, about what you did last night. I shove my hands in my pockets and remind myself to receive my punishment with dignity. I'm trying to win Steel over after all, so a heated defense probably won't work in my favor. Just apologize and accept the lecture. There's a brief silence as she continues to analyze me. Her eyes kind of stormy looking, with just the slightest hint of blue. I chew on the inside of my lip. I'm... And I've been watching you with Pony, she interrupts. Her words slow, as if she's really laboring 
over every single syllable. Anyway, I guess I misjudged you. Wow. I actually wasn't expecting that. Aw, I love you too, I say. And she actually snorts. She shakes her head and heads back to the group without another word. I would feel good if I didn't feel so guilty. I misjudged you. I feel like a sack full of bricks has just been dropped on my gut. A heart-to-heart -heart with Q last night, and now steel. I really did it. I won them over. All of them. Ugh. I wish I could just scream. Maybe it would help me not feel so sick about all of this. Just one good scream. That's all I need. Over the last few days, I've actually come to like these people. These people who took a chance on a stranger looking for his sister. Also, that stranger could make their dreams of escape come true. Part of me wants to go to the group right now and come clean. Beg for their forgiveness. But I know I can't do that. Because having Steel on my side now confirms what I've been hoping this whole time. They've decided to help me find her. And I'm too close. Ella is so close. So I do what I have to do. What I've always had to do. I shove away the feelings, plaster on a carefree look, and head back to the group. To my relief, E2 outfits are much more normal, though I'm pretty sure they gave me one of Steels' old pantsuits. What's worse is it actually fits me like a glove, though it's a little tight around my butt. Oh well. Better than yesterday's clown suit. Red is tying my tie for me standing way closer than I'd normally feel comfortable with. He has the sleeves of his maroon button-up rolled up to his elbows, revealing his muscled forearms, the bright tattoos swirling around bulging veins. Are you ready? He asks, his face so close to mine that I can feel his cool breath on my forehead. To get your sister back. I let out a breath through my teeth and smile. You have no idea. He tightens the tie, straightens it out, and pats my shoulder. It will all be okay. The ever-genuine, fatherly kindness in his eyes and his reassuring smile makes a lump form in my throat. Why do these people have to be so nice? It would be a lot easier to deceive them if they weren't so good. Thank you, I choke out. Sincerely, hoping maybe it will make a difference in the long run that he knows I really do appreciate everything. Really, thank you. He takes off a chunky leather bracelet from his wrist and hands it to me, gesturing to my wrist tab. So you do not stand out. I usually wear it to cover this. He shows the underside of his wrist to reveal a jagged scar that spreads all the way across. I examine the placement of the scar, and my eyes widen. Did you used to have a tab? He nods. All workers at the E-Zones are given one. When Lala got me out, her connections with the underground removed it in exchange for a commitment to service. One cuff for another, so to say. He pats my shoulder before going to tidy up the area while everyone finishes getting dressed. I secure the bracelet around my tab, fastening it so it fits around it tightly. I imagine what it would feel like to have the tab off my skin forever. Would I give it up in exchange for serving this underground? Or instead just trust Coombs' scrambler with my life forever? My attention flicks to Ponyboy, who bounces around from person to person each sporting office-like attire. Beardsley wears a pinstriped suit and a hat, looking kind of like a mob boss from old movies. He's trimmed up his beard and combed his hair, and actually cleans up pretty nice. Lala's plain gray sweater might make someone else look dull, but her vibrant smile brings such a brightness to her face. Her long hair is swept up into a clean braid, Q steps next to me and looks me up and down with a laugh. 
nice suit, she snorts, and I notice with horror that the one she's wearing looks exactly the same. Her hair is pulled back into a giant bun on the top of her head. Her plain black flats make us closer in height than last night. I whip the tails of the jacket above my butt and stick it out theatrically. Girl, you wish you looked this good. I croon with a wink. She barks out a disbelieving cackle. Yeah, okay, pony boy. Who wore it best? Definitely Q, he says without hesitation. And we all laugh. Traitor! I tousle his hair, and he looks up at me with an apologetic smile. With everyone dressed, we gather around the truck to formulate our plan. Red helps Ponyboy up onto the tailgate, and he swings his legs happily off the edge, resting his head on the glass of the shell behind him. The delivery bags sit in a line next to him, already filled with the brown-wrapped packages ready to get to their new homes. I notice that although there are much less packages overall to deliver, the dollar amounts written on the outside of each package are much higher than they were at E1. I wonder in awe what kind of drugs, tech, and weapons could possibly be in these packages to cost so much more. Beardsley unfolds a hand-drawn map and smooths it out, handing it to Red to hold up for everyone to see. Similar to the E1 map, it is a hodgepodge grid of hand-drawn boxes of varying size, each with a number in it. Lines for roads, and light rail tracks, and a compass sketched at the top left corner. Steel separated the deliveries this time into east, central, and west. Beardsley points to the map to demonstrate. I'll take the east. Red and La Reina will take the central. Q and Pretty Boy will take the west. Q nods affirmatively next to me. Let's hope Mr. Pretty Boy doesn't get knocked out this time. Everyone laughs at my expense, even Pony Boy. Yeah, thanks for that, by the way, everyone. I grin. Well, you're alive, aren't you? Beardsley drawls with a wave of his hand. I snort and prop my elbow up on the truck. While we are making our deliveries inside, Steel will head down to the warehouse for our next batch of deliveries, which hopefully we won't even need to make. Right, pretty boy? I nod, probably too vigorously. Way to keep it cool, Sam. And while I'm there, I'm going to try to arrange a new wheel for my bike, Steel adds, thankfully not seeming to notice my guilty mannerisms. Cab riding is too stuffy for me. No offense. More room for me, Lala teases in reply, stretching out her arms for effect. After my deliveries, Steel, I'll meet you right out here to help you sort out and wrap the new batch, while y'all, Beardsley nods to the rest of us, hopefully execute a successful extraction. I smile at him hoping to convey my gratefulness. Let's review again what you've learned last night. Steel rasps, her arms folded across her chest. Well? Q responds slowly, eyeing me, as if including me in her response. Willie informed us that our guy Vegas is in the Fresh Air Resort and Casino, and that's about it. I nod. We still don't know why he's collecting kids, but we do know that he's gathering followers in E1 for some reason. Support life, support freedom, live free or die, whatever that means. His propaganda was everywhere. Support freedom, Red repeats. If he's planning some kind of revolution, perhaps the children could be used for that? Maybe. Steel muses. But they're kids. What use could he possibly have for kids in a revolution? Is he hurting them? Ponyboy asks meekly. Lala is at his side immediately, bundling him up in her arms. 
No, Miho, of course not. She shoots daggers at all of us as she strokes his hair. Steel proceeds more carefully, stepping to the map that Red still holds outstretched. Well, all I know is that the fresh air is back central, she points. I've never been inside. It was still being constructed when I lived here. So after you finish your deliveries, Beardsley nods to us. You'll meet Red and Lala outside the casino. I look at Q, who nods unworried. I'm glad at least one of us isn't freaking out. I, on the other hand, as the details start to come together, am suddenly thinking about everything that could go wrong. I fidget with my wrist tab, trying to focus on the gentle pull of skin whenever it moves. Our first step will most likely be to connect with an employee and... Red pauses, looking over at Ponyboy carefully. Ask him very nicely to give us information. He and Beardsley share a smirk. I let out a slow, discreet breath to try to calm myself. When I made the decision to use the group to help find Ella, I didn't expect to feel this way. I thought if I could just get to this point, nothing else would matter. But it feels more complicated than that now. I look at all the faces of the people I'm quite literally sending into battle. The people I've come to know and respect and even care about. And I've seen firsthand what Vegas is capable of. I would never forgive myself if something happened to any of them. I mean, how could I ever look Teo in the eye again if I was the reason something happened to his mom? That is, if I ever even see Teo again. I decide to speak up. I can't do this without making sure they know what they're getting into. That way, if anything happens, it was 200% their choice. Are you guys sure you want to do this? This Vegas guy is dangerous. I have no idea what to expect or what kind of operation he's running. All the more reason to get your sister to safety. Red smiles reassuringly. You've risked your pretty little neck for us, Q says, shoving me with her shoulder. So we kind of have to. That's what we do here in this family. Lala puts her arm around me and squeezes my shoulder tight. Damn straight. Beardsley hollers. This family. Hot tears burn on the edges of my eyes as I take in the smiles surrounding me. I can't even choke out a thank you. After a brief moment of awkwardness for me making a softy out of myself yet again, we finally get cleaned up and on the move. The plan is to sneak in through the residential area, which is near the entrance closest to us. I learn that due to more business and trade happening in and out of this zone, there aren't any E-gates, just a guard posted at the front and back entrances and camera surveillance. Our connection with the on-shift watchtower guard will cause the cameras to blink just long enough for us to enter at exactly 10.15. He finishes his shift at 4, so we'll need to finish all of our deliveries slash rescue missions before that time or we'll get stuck inside for at least three days until he works the tower again. We approach the entrance, and Steel pauses, waiting for a signal from the guard above to enter. The entrance is a huge arc made out of bright red bricks, stretching all the way from one brick watchtower on one side to the other tower on the other side. Green ivy hugs the towers and spirals all the way up the sides. Etched into the arc, like a welcome sign, is a sweeping quote that sweeps across the whole arc above us. What is now proved was once only imagined. William Blake. Creepy. We get the signal and speed under the arc and past the surveillance cameras, advancing through to the suburbs in front of us. Before us is a cobblestone road that splits off in three directions. We veer right, and my jaw drops as I take in the neighborhood around us. Massive manors sit atop huge, impossibly green lawns. 
Each house looks different and looks like it was built custom for each owner. Lawns are decorated with stone fountains, sculptures, hedges, gardens, or trees. Some houses take on modern clean-cut architecture, while others are more themed like mini castles or old-fashioned mansions. It seems like the deeper we go, the more luxurious the houses get, if that's even possible. Q watches me take it all in. Disgusting, right? I click my tongue in agreement, still mesmerized by the sheer excess. Our cabin in C9 literally didn't even have a heater, I say flatly. And here? Like swimming pools? Are you kidding me? Yeah, they've got it really rough. We stop and unload quickly, trying to be conscious of the fact that steel is wanted for murder here. Something that I think about often. What she could do to me. So any extra time here is a risk to her being recognized. The shabby truck with the busted motorcycle on top also doesn't really fit in around here. Q is crouched down in front of me holding Luna's face with both of her hands, resting her forehead on Luna's. You be a good girl, she coos, kissing her furry face. She gestures for Luna to hop into the cab next to Pony Boy, and she obeys. She licks his face enthusiastically, and he groans in pretend disgust, wiping the slobber off with his sleeve. She notices my raised eyebrow, she sticks out too much here, unfortunately. If someone in E2 has a pet, it's like a tiny prissy lap dog or a cat. So she always stays with Steel and Pony. I feel a little sad, actually. I've gotten used to Luna always being around, always nuzzling my leg or licking my fingertips. She's the only one around here who actually likes me, and that's only because I saved her life, so she kind of has to. I straighten my tie, tugging at the collar of my shirt. I can't remember the last time I wore a suit like this. To my grandpa's funeral when I was six, maybe? And it feels like it's suffocating me. Q hands me our bag of deliveries as she flicks a clump of dog hair off the sleeve of her blazer. Beardsley taps the hood of the truck, and Steel pulls away slowly. Ponyboy waving enthusiastically with Luna's head sticking out the window next to him. Her tongue flaps out, and she looks like this is the best day ever. Steel makes a U-turn, and heads back out the way we came. We start to step in our assigned directions, but Beardsley stops us. Y'all be careful out there, he says, and then mostly to Red. If it's looking like it's unlikely, observe what you can. Call it quits, and we'll try again on our next batch. And then to me. Don't be stupid. Normally, I'd try to make some kind of witty remark to defend my honor, but I try to read the room and just keep my mouth shut. I opt for an affirmative nod instead. He nods back and makes his way eastward. We will see you soon, Red says, checking my watch. My guess is we will be done in one hour. I look in our bag and take a quick count of our packages. We'll try to get ours done in an hour too. I look at Q for confirmation and she nods. Lala blows us a kiss and we part ways. Chapter 32 A Shocking Encounter Hey, Q says, her voice lacking her usual sarcasm. It's going to be okay. We are standing in the maintenance alleyway of the Fresh Air Casino, waiting for Lala and Red to meet us. We share the alleyway with a few wheeled trash cans, a stinky dumpster, and some empty crates. I'm leaning up against the brick of the casino to steady myself. I make a face at her, trying to play off my obvious nerves, but her surety does help me slow my breaths at least a little bit. Speed walking the suburbs of E2, we finished our deliveries in record time. A pattern of quick and easy transactions, usually with a housekeeper or nanny. When we got to our assigned block of the inner city, 
The transactions were pretty simple there, too, and mostly only required a quick step to the front desk of an office building. For as busy as Itsu appears to be from the outside looking in, the streets have been surprisingly clear. We typically only shared a street with passing executives who were too busy on their devices to even take notice of us. As our bag got lighter and lighter, my nerves got heavier and heavier. It began to be harder just to take steps, my shoes feeling like they were full of concrete. Now that we're here, the feeling of concrete has spread to pretty much my entire lower half. I can't really explain my mental state right now. It feels kind of like we're at the bottom of the mountain looking up at the journey above, and at the same time also feeling like I'm nearing the top. When I think of how far I've come, and how close I am to Ella, I try to remind myself it's almost over. But something keeps pulling at the bottom of my gut telling me that the journey hasn't even started that I'm still at the very bottom of the towering mountainside. It's that nagging feeling of something is going to go wrong that keeps me from being able to take normal breaths right now. What are you so afraid of? Q had asked me during our deliveries. I couldn't formulate an answer then, but I've been thinking about it ever since. I'm afraid I'm too late, I blurt out suddenly. Saying it makes me feel like I've just puked my guts all over myself. I've refused to let myself even think of this possibility, let alone voice it out loud. The worst case scenario is that she was here, but now she's... I choke on the word. Dead. I'm afraid she's already dead. She turns her head to me, confused for a second. But then her face softens when she realizes I'm answering her question. She leans up against the wall next to me, looking toward the dumpster. From this proximity, I can faintly smell the scent of flowers from her hair. I still can't figure out which kind of flower, and I'm grateful for the brief distraction as I rake through the very little botanical knowledge I have stored in my brain. Almost like she has made a sudden decision, she turns her head to me, her eyebrows set firmly. I refuse to believe you've come all this way for it to be too late. I think for a second before responding. The nagging in my gut, the weight pulling my insides down and weighing my every breath, whispers the very real likelihood that, even if I'm not too late, things will not go according to plan today. But is that just my pessimism talking? Is that what's preventing me from believing Ella will be coming home with me today? Or is something warning me, the universe, God, whatever's out there? Is something trying to get me to turn around and leave before things get worse? Before I get caught. Before I get thrown back in the prison-like walls of C9. I'm flirting too much with the very minimal luck I've gotten handed to me. It's eventually going to run out, and this freedom I've had these past few days will be gone. Freedom or not, something I do know for sure. If Ella is already dead, there's absolutely no reason for me to continue to stay alive. I hope you're right, I respond, trying to shake off those thoughts that will only lead me down a dark tunnel. How can you be so optimistic? She crosses her arms into her chest. Her nose crinkled thoughtfully, her freckles stacking on top of each other. I just have to believe that there's more to life than this. That there's better things coming. What if there's not? Well, I'll find out when I'm dead. Until then, I'm just going to keep hoping and hustling. I push myself off the building and shove my hands into the pockets of the suit jacket. I can't look at her. I stare at one of the light red bricks of the casino. My chest tightens as the reality of what could be awaiting us inside suffocates me. I can barely choke out a sentence. If she's... If it's too late... There's no way I'll be able to... What I'm saying is, you might have to... She cuts me off. What we're not going to do is speak that into existence. 
I meet her eyes. Her brows are pulled together sternly. She puts her hand on her hip for emphasis. What we are going to do is find her and then we're going to get her out. Got it? I nod stupidly. We wait in silence for a few more minutes until Lala and Red find us in our alleyway. Even Lala's smile looks a little dimmer, and that makes my nerves even worse. Ready? Red rumbles. He rubs his hands together and bobs his head, as if pumping himself up for battle. Q straightens out the lapels of her blazer and looks to me with an eyebrow raised, like she's daring me to say one more discouraging thing about our mission. I press my lips together and let out a sharp breath through my nose. Let's do this. I march out of the alleyway and straight to the front doors with a determined stride, repeating affirmations to myself to keep my feet stepping forward. I can do this. I can do this. The black wrought iron doors are huge, stretching way above my head. The building itself seems to stretch all the way to the top of the shell. I reach for the twisted, ornate handles in front of me, and I try to play off the fact that the door is heavier than I expected. I fumble with it at first, readjust my grip, and then accidentally overcompensate, throwing it open so hard it bounces off the wall with a thwack. Oops. I steal a glance at Q, who says nothing, but she smirks as she follows me through the doorway. A blast of cold air whips my face as we step through the entrance. It takes my eyes a minute to adjust as we step into the colossal room. We are almost completely surrounded by white, hexagon-tiled walls, like stacked bleached honeycomb, meet marble floors that shine so spotlessly, it would be blinding if the lighting wasn't so dim. There are no lights on except for blue LED ambient lighting peeking out of exposed beams in the ceiling, casting an underwater vibe on the entire room. The room lacks the traditional slot machines and rowdy poker tables like I had expected. Instead, individual desk-like tables are scattered around the room that look like they have a mix of interactive surfaces like table tabs, VR, and holographic displays featuring different types of games. It's surprisingly quiet, and the only people I can see are a few scattered patrons who are sitting atop huge leather sofas in the lounge areas or draped over the surface of their slot table, visibly hammered. My eyes widen as they fall upon the massive aquarium in the center of the room. The water-filled glass spans all the way up to the ceiling, and giant, glowing jellyfish flow up and down in the tank as slowly as if they're stuck in thick honey. It's mesmerizing. Lala's hand on my arm breaks my trance and I remember that we're trying to make it look like we belong here. Look like you know what you're doing and no one will suspect you. We move, attempting to look completely casual and carefree, toward the closest attraction, which is a bar that lines the whole left side of the room. Blue and purple LEDs under the white surfaced counter cast glowing shadows onto the white padded leather stools. Angular chandeliers hang above the countertops, and the wall behind the bar is lined with bottles of every shape and size. No one else is over here aside from one single man sitting head down on the far side of the bar, who looks to be either passed out drunk or taking a midday snooze. We are all acutely aware of the security cameras in every corner pointed directly at us. A tiny red dot blinks on it, signifying the likely live stream. I shift my weight to my other foot uncomfortably feeling the hair stand up on my arms at the thought of being watched. Well, I could sure use a drink, Lala says loudly, hoisting herself up onto the padded stool. Yeah, me too, Q replies, taking a seat in the stool next to her. Don't even think about it, young lady, Lala hisses through the clenched teeth of her fake smile. A bartender steps out from the back room her hair slicked back neatly into a bun. Her face is void of any emotion, even as she asks us how we're doing. She wears an unimposing uniform and a strange black necklace I'm trying really hard not to stare at, a choker of sorts, made of matte metal. 
the left side of her face is illuminated with the blue glow of the ambient lighting, making her look like she's made of neon. We order our drinks and wait for her to pour them, the tense anticipation visibly building around us. Everyone's nervous energy is really not helping calm down my nervous energy. But I'm trying to stay focused on the tasks at hand, instead of getting caught up by how crazy it is. Anyone up for some games? Red nods his head toward the other side of the room, where more people are congregated. It looks like there are more employees that way who can be of assistance to us. I'm down. Q plops down from the stool, the bun on top of her head bouncing. Love this enthusiastic character you've chosen. It's so unlike you. I whisper with a smirk. At least I'm not going to blow this whole thing like you. She hisses back. You're going to give us all away with how clearly up to no good you look. Your acting skills need serious work. I take a sip of my water, which has a very faint lemon taste to it, and I'm delighted by how cold and refreshing it is. I down the whole thing in one gulp. Wow, I must be more dehydrated than I thought. Oh yeah? How's this for acting? I throw my arm around her shoulders and pull her with me, stepping in line behind Lala and Red as they make their way toward the tables. I'm going to kill you, she says sweetly, a rabid smile on her face that shows all of her teeth. Aw, oh, don't say that, sweetie. Not on this. The day of our anniversary. Twelve blissful years together, and we couldn't be happier. I say it so loudly that Lala and Red look over their shoulders with entertained but warning expressions of keep it down. Happier than ever, darling. She croons back in an almost yell, her eyes sparkling with dangerous amusement. Especially after you spent all day crying in my arms, begging me to fire my assistant. But how could I when he takes such good care of me when you're away all those long, lonely nights? We step in sync together, my arms still tightly around her shoulders. I can hear Lala and Red snickering ahead of us, and I try not to bust up laughing with them. I know it's impossible for you to resist Marco's irresistible stomach rolls and body hair, but think of the children! Q bites her lip to choke down a laugh and fights to keep her face serious. Little Helga and Otis will never- Lala cuts Q off with a sharp sh sound, and a forced smile as a casino employee passes us with a tray in his hand. My breath catches in my throat. He wears the same uniform as the bartender. White button-up and black pants, an apron, reserved hairstyle, as well as the same weirdly blank expression and the same strange collar. But what sticks out the most is his shock of red hair. The freckles that scatter across his whole face under boxy black glasses. The shape of his nose, the curve of his mouth. He looks just like Foster. A tightness fills my chest as I think back to the night everything unfolded with him. They said they had my parents, he had whispered, that I had a debt to pay. Could that be true? Could this be Foster's dad? He gives us a curt nod, taking his tray to a group of patrons behind us. My arm falls off Q's shoulder. I'm quiet as I follow them around other groups and bustling workers. What would I have done if it were me? Would I have done something terrible to a friend if someone from my family had been threatened in that way? I look at Q, at Red, and Lala. The lies I'm telling them right now because someone from my family is in danger. Tears prickle on the edges of my eyes, my heart softening just a sliver with new understanding. Foster did what he had to do. I shake the tears away before anyone can notice and bring my focus back to what I have to do. Red leads our group to a lounge area of white leather couches and armchairs circled together with a stone coffee table in the center. There is an intricate twisting marble statue sitting in the middle of the coffee table, with a vase next to it filled with colorful flowers. We all take a seat and pretend to be having a grand time as a server approaches us, the same tight collar around his neck. With his closer proximity, I can get a better view of it and notice how a tiny blinking light embedded into the metal as he takes our order. His voice is overly cheery, but
but he never directly meets our eyes. He leaves in a hurry to get our appetizers. Red leans forward, gesturing for me to lean close too. We wait for a server to take a break. He nods behind me. I look back and see a restroom sign pointing to a small hallway. No cameras. We all nod, understanding the plan, and then lean back into our respective seats. The server returns with a steaming tray of assorted hors d'oeuvres. My stomach rumbles hungrily as the smell overtakes my senses. He asks quickly if there is anything else we need before leaving again in a hurry. I stuff my face immediately, not caring the least bit about Q's judging expression. Lala pulls out some dollar bills from her purse and divvies out the cash to each of us. We split up and each sit at a game with a view of the restrooms. I plop into the armchair at a table, set my nearly empty glass in the cup holder, and stare at the empty surface in front of me, trying to figure out how to start it. After more minutes than I'd like to admit of frustrated inspection, I finally find the money slot where I feed in my dollar bill. The table comes to life in front of me with a horizontal holographic 3D image of a roulette. There are two levels to the roulette, each divided into even sections. Each slice of the roulette has a different aquatic animal on it. A blinking start button pops up right in front of me, and I swipe at it hesitantly. It indents on my touch and moves out of view, leaving only the now spinning roulette. The two levels move in different directions. After several rotations, each one slower than the last, it looks like the two dolphins might actually line up with each other, which would make me the grand prize winner. But at the very last second, it settles on the seal instead. An animation crosses the display, encouraging me to play again and that I'd get half price if I take another spin. I grumble at what a stupid waste of time and money this game is, but I feed in another dollar anyway. Just when I'm about to touch the start button again, a server heads into the restroom hallway. I make eye contact with Red, and he nods discreetly. Lala and Q gesture affirmatively too, but stay seated at their games to keep watch instead of following us into the bathrooms. Red goes in first, and I follow him into the nearly dark bathroom. Where the outside interior was all white, the large restroom is nearly all black. Even squares of black tile line the floors and meet walls of black paint and black stalls. Even the urinals are a matte black porcelain. Strange abstract artwork covers the walls, and I take a second glance at the one closest to me. Does that look like what I think it does? Anyway, ever casually, I stand in front of a urinal like I'm going to go, the server relieving himself next to me. Behind me, the deadbolt clicks as Red locks the door from the inside. The server zips his pants and looks at me with a furrowed brow. I just give him a tight-lipped smile in return, as if everything's fine. He turns slowly around to see Red standing right behind him, the blue LEDs right above him casting a blue shadow over him. The man staggers backward in surprise, nearly falling butt-first into the urinal. What the hell? I lean up against the side of the stall on the end, my tone nonchalant, almost bored. We just want to ask you a few questions, that's all. The server stares at us blankly. Questions? Look guys, I really have to- He tries to walk past Red, but a firm hand to his shoulder stops him in his tracks. A visible shadow crosses over the guy's face. You don't understand, I really have to get back to work- he gestures to his collar. Red and I share a glance. Then you'll just have to answer our questions quickly, I say, shrugging, so you can get back to work. The server looks back and forth to me and Red nervously. Who the hell are you guys? Red ignores him. What do you know about the children? The server's eyes widen so fast I worry they may pop right out. I don't know anything about that he says too quickly. Red takes a menacing step toward him, causing the server to stumble backwards again. This time he trips over his feet, falls, and his hip bounces off the tiled ground with a thwack. He shrieks in pain. 
Red squats down and repeats his question slowly. I stay leaned up against the wall, casual as ever, as if this is an everyday thing, but I'm actually just watching Red in awe. I have to give him props, he can really switch on the scary. I would have never expected he'd be useful during something like this because of his gentleness and calm demeanor, but I have to say if he ever used this slow, low, threatening tone on me, I'd give up every secret I had in a heartbeat. And also throw up, probably. The server's protests are beginning to get more urgent. Guys, please, I don't know anything. Please let me get back to work. Within two blinks, Red has him thrown onto his stomach and has his arm twisted at an unnatural angle. He digs his knee into his back sharply and repeats his question for a third time. Tell us about the kids. The server groans in pain. Kids? Are you talking about the Tyros? Tyros? What kind of game is this Vegas guy playing? Kidnapping kids and then giving them a nickname? Red lowers himself so he's next to the server's ear. He growls into his ear so softly, I almost can't hear it. Start talking, or I'll start breaking limbs, beginning with your... He twists tighter for effect. Arm. Suddenly, a small beeping rings out of the collar around his neck. Slowly at first. But each round seems to be getting gradually faster. At the sound of the beeping, the server starts thrashing under Red's firm grip, trying wildly to break free. Please, I need to get back to work. Let me go, please. What is this? Some kind of self-destruct feature? The beeping is at a rapid pace now, seeming to get louder in volume every second. It seems to thud in rhythm with my heartbeat. The beeping echoes in my skull as it gets louder, as my heartbeats get faster. I'll admit, I'm getting a little nervous, and this incessant noise in my ears isn't helping the anxiety. Everything depends on this man's cooperation, and so far, his cooperation has not been cooperative. I decide to pipe in, maybe appeal to some kind of emotion. I kneel down next to his face and make my voice real soft. Please, we think my sister is here somewhere. She was kidnapped, and I'm just trying to get her back. Please help us find her. I don't know what you're talking about, he says through gritted teeth, his eyes closed and pained, still fighting under Red's weight. The Tyros are here on scholarships. They're here to learn about business and entrepreneurship. I stand in surprise, and Red and I share a long look. I'm disgusted thinking about what business and entrepreneurship could be code for when one single, long beep emits from the collar. No, 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 not! The server is interrupted by a stream of zaps that comes sparking and spraying out of the collar. Red hops up to his feet quickly, as if he's been sparked himself, and we both watch, dumbfounded, as the server spasms and jerks in front of us. We look at each other in shock, both hoping the other will know what to do. But all I can do is stand there like a useless idiot, watching the man sizzling like the 4th of July in front of me. Chapter 33 Laughter, Sunlight, and Other Things I Know Nothing About The zaps finally stop after what feels like a lifetime. The man remains face down on the cool tile, completely unmoving. I kneel next to him again and tap him on the shoulder. Please don't be dead. Please don't be dead. Hey! Tap, tap. Are you okay? He groans, and I sigh with relief. I really did not need this guy's death on my conscience today. Another groan as he comes back to consciousness. Then it's like he suddenly remembers the reason why he got zapped in the first place and nearly leaps out of his skin. He's on his feet, and almost to the door before we even realize he's moving. Not so fast, Red growls, grabbing the back of his shirt and then pinning him up against the bathroom door. His body connecting with the dark wood of the door makes a heavy clunk. The man looks like he might cry. Please let me go. Tell us where these 
Tyros are first. They could be anywhere right now, he whines, his face paler now than it was when this whole interaction began. They have to follow a strict schedule, but... He hesitates. But usually after lunch, they have recess in the courtyard. In the back. The code is 0371. Please let me go. Red releases his shirt, and the man stumbles back to his feet. Tell anyone about us, and we'll be right back here again. I warn, trying to use the most threatening tone I can muster, stepping closer so I'm right behind Red. I won't. I swear. Red unlocks the deadbolt with a clink, and the man scurries out of the door. The door shuts again, leaving just us here in the dim bathroom. A beat of silence as we consider what has just happened. We both start speaking at the same time. We couldn't possibly know. It's not our fault, he... We cut ourselves off, and there is a heavy silence for a second. I massage the back of my neck with my fingertips, considering the information we've received. They're here on scholarships. Yeah, I'm sure they feel so lucky, enduring God knows what. Oh, I mean business and entrepreneurship. Which actually, now that I think about it, is bad enough. Subjecting impressionable kids to that kind of boredom should be considered child abuse in itself. Red breaks the silence. We cannot lose momentum if this is still what you want. We don't have long before people grow suspicious, or our friend tells someone about us. Is this still what you want? I meet his eyes, deciding to be honest instead of soaking my answer in contempt. Yes. I choke out. It haunts my every waking moment what she could be going through. I'm not leaving here without her. He nods and slaps my shoulder. Okay, then let's keep moving. Since he was the first one in, he leaves first. I take advantage of the time alone to splash my face with cold water. I let my eyes close and take an extra second hovered over the sink, the water dripping down my neck and into the dark granite sink. I soak in the sound of the running water near my face, breathing in the refreshing coolness. I exhale and wipe the remaining water off my face with the sleeve of my blazer, repeating affirmations to myself. You can do this. You're so close. Don't lose your nerve. I jump a little when I open my eyes again and see myself in the mirror. What is that? Is that me? Yikes. Dark circles have tattooed themselves under my empty brown eyes. My pin straight hair though neatly styled and gelled back thanks to the women in the group, is longer than I've had it in a while. The back nearly brushes the collar of my blazer. My cheeks seem to cave in under my cheekbones, making me look thin and gaunt. When was the last time I ate? If I look closely, a tiny shadow of hair grows along the line of my jawbone. So there's a plus, I guess. Man, my shoulders are drowning under this blazer. I look like a little boy who found his dad's suit in the closet and played dress-up. His dad's suit. I blink at my reflection again. I look like him. My dad. The door bangs open behind me, and I shriek like a preteen girl at a boy band concert in surprise. As a burly man in a polo passes by, I try to play it off by faking a cough. I exhale sharply and try to get myself back in the zone. Don't lose your nerve. I throw the door open and make my way back to the group. I see them immediately, circled together, trying their best to look relaxed and casual. You'd only know Q's laugh was fake if you knew her. Two men I don't know are standing with them, and they seem to be all talking together. Hey there, a woman's voice behind me purrs, startling me a little bit. I turn to see a pretty blonde woman, who looks to be in her forties, with bright pink lipstick and heavy eye makeup. She is wearing a black dress with a bunch of sequins on it, and it looks like it would be really uncomfortable, especially because of how small it is. Everything, and I mean everything, is just popping right out. 
I give her a polite, tight-lipped smile and keep walking toward the group. She puts a hand on my arm, the long, manicured nails painted bright pink to match her lipstick. She circles around so she's in front of me, keeping her hand on my arm. What's your name, handsome? She says with a sultry smile, her brown eyes staring right into my soul. Or my pants. I can't tell which. Ben. I say with a toothy smile. Ben Dover. So mature. She smiles widely, completely unfazed. It's nice to meet you, Ben. She takes a step closer with a little giggle, and her strong perfume burns my nostrils a little bit. I'm Champagne, but you can call me. Nice to meet you, but I'm kind of in a hurry. Late for a meeting, very important meeting. I try to step around her, but she keeps her hand on my arm. Her eyes flash mischievously. I think you can be just a little late. We are just barely getting to know each other. I'm surprised by another voice that interrupts my own. Sweetie, we're going to be late. It's Q. She steps next to the woman and puts her hand on my arm. Am I interrupting something? She says sweetly, looking back and forth between me and Champagne. I splutter and stutter, pretending like I've just been caught in the middle of something scandalous. Champagne winks at me and pats me on the shoulder as she strides away. I try not to look at Q because if I do, I know I'm going to laugh and probably cause a scene. We walk together toward the group, arm in arm, like old people. So is that your type, pretty boy? Booby and blonde? Oh, definitely. Especially the ones who are old enough to be my mom. That really gets me going. You're so gross. What about you? I nod to the bearded men still standing next to Lala. Is that your boyfriend? That's actually my assistant, Marco, she replies, still keeping a mostly straight face, but her dimple gives away her small smirk. Thanks for saving me, from Champagne. Her smile widens. There's no way she actually said her name was Champagne. What? It's a beautiful name, I tease. Oh, she's a hooker for sure. That confirms it. Hooker or not, with your permission, I'd like to, you know. I lower my voice to a whisper. Get back to saving my sister. Did Red fill you in? Yeah, about the whole... Zzzz. She makes an electrified, seizure-like head jerk for effect. Thing? You're basically the worst person alive. You don't even know the half of it. We approach Red and Lala the bearded men still making conversation. Their cologne is overpowering, but what reeks most about them is the ego seeping off of them. You can just see it in the posture, the crispness of their expensive suits, the one-sided curve of their smiles, the look in their eyes when they look at Lala and Q. They don't even give me a second glance as we approach. After an over-friendly banter, full of overly friendly excuses for why we need to leave immediately and for why Lala would not be giving them her phone number, we are finally on our way toward the courtyard. Dang, Lala, I say, elbowing her teasingly. I didn't realize you had so much game. We've been here, what, an hour? And you pull two rich guys? Her laugh is hearty and unapologetic. Oh, mijo. That is so sweet, but completely untrue. She flashes a sly smile at me over her shoulder. One of them was into Red. Red brushes his shoulder with a smile, as if to say, Yeah, I still got it. Q and I share an impressed laugh. We walk in an arrow formation of sorts, Red and Lala at the head and Q and I at the flank, passing the games and the giant aquarium. As we pass by the huge glass tank, I try not to look at the jellyfish because watching them float through the water is basically hypnosis to me, and I'm trying to focus on my purpose. The casino is filling up with more patrons as it gets to be later in the afternoon. More dings and money sound effects fill the room as the slot machines fill with more occupants. 
and I notice more sequined women like champagne circling the patrons like vultures. I slow down at the sight of the sign above the door as we near it. Courtyard. I exhale and try to prepare myself for what we could see out here. Every awful thing I've been imagining all this time repeating in my mind, most of which involved torture or cages or what I imagine a kidnapper's lair to look like. I feel a little queasy as I try to push those thoughts out of my head. No matter what is happening to Ella when I get there, I have to keep it together. I have to stay strong until we get her out. Don't cause a scene. Q puts a hand on my shoulder and it feels heavy, like my knees might give out from under its weight. We got this, she whispers, nodding encouragingly. I nod, just ready to see her again. No matter the condition, no matter the circumstances, I step between them and punch in the code to the pin pad. It gives a ding and I push the wrought iron doors open. My eyes have gotten so used to the near darkness of inside, the dark blue glow casting a blue haze over everything, that the brightness of the artificial daylight burns my eyes. We all step outside and the heavy door clunks shut behind us. Through squinted eyes, I take in the courtyard. Umbrellas and aquatic-themed patio furniture circle the little coffee tables that are scattered around in no apparent pattern. The umbrellas are out fully, as if it's a sunny summer day, and not just another day underground. Tall and neatly trimmed hedges surround this patio, creating a separation between the furniture and a giant green lawn beyond it. Apart from the casual lobby music playing softly, the only other thing I can hear out here is laughter. I step through the arcway of hedge that leads out to the lawn, huge and shaded almost completely with sturdy billowing trees. I stop in my tracks as I take in the scene in front of me. A mass of children, not tortured, not abused, no lairs or predators. Children playing. It's a chorus of laughter and squeals of playfulness. Delighted cheers, teasing and chanting. Some run around in circles, chasing each other gleefully, yelling, You're it! to each other. Others kick soccer balls or jump rope. I watch, mesmerized, unable to tear my eyes away from it. Children played at C9, but not like this. There was always an undercurrent of fear in every game, worry laced between every laugh. It's hard to really play when you are worried your laughter might get a little too loud and might prompt retaliation from the guards, worried that if you actually have fun you'd forget you need to watch your back. You could never really let down your guard there. That's how people slipped up. That's how people get expelled. How they get killed. No, these children don't play like we played in C9. These children play like they are free. There's got to be some kind of mistake. I turn, searching for Q, searching for her reassurance. She's not looking at me, though. She, too, is mesmerized by the children, by their contagious joy. A smile even tugs at her stubborn lips. Red and Lala, too, watch them with a smile. Is no one else concerned that this is completely weird? A soccer ball rolls up and hits the edge of my shoe. The group of children runs up to me, expecting me to kick it back. My eyes drop to the tabs on their wrists. I guess Coombs' wrist tab procedure has caught on after all. I think of the children who died undergoing his initial procedures. How many children in other zones had to die for all the other involved surgeons to get it right too? The children in front of me smile, waiting patiently. My eyes pass over each of their faces hoping maybe Ella's blue eyes will meet mine. They don't. I stare at the ball, then back at them. I bend to pick it up and just hold it in my hands, staring at the colored hexagons that cover it. Why are they so happy? A booming voice behind me startles me and causes me to drop the ball. It rolls away from me, and the children resume their game. This area is closed to hotel guests right now. The patio is only open in the evenings. I ignore the voice and step onto the lawn. Where is she? 
Everything else around me drowns out as I try to strain my ears, hoping that maybe, just maybe, her laugh will stick out above the others. I scan every face desperately as they pass by me, searching for hers. I look for her hair, her eyes, anything. A sea of faces pass by, but none of them are hers. I try to take another step into the grass, but a firm grip on my shoulder keeps me rooted in place. I spin around to see a huge, bald man in a gray suit, obviously security, from his neck full of tattoos, sunglasses on top of his bald head, and CIA-esque ear pierce. His heavy fingers dig into my skin. Lala, Red, and Q behind him share worried expressions. There is another gray-suited man behind them, his hands clasped threateningly in front of him. I said... The man repeats, This area is closed. All I can think of is how close she is. I can feel her presence, feel her nearby. I shake off his grip and take another step closer to the group of children nearest me, only to be stopped yet again by his firm grip. Before I know it, I'm being dragged backward, my boots dragging on the pavers of the patio. I try to shake out of his grip, but his hold on me is too strong. I protest, trying to claim my innocence, why it's okay I'm out here, but he doesn't listen. What have I done? He drags me past Lala, Q, and Red, and back into the building. The group behind me tries to reason with the other security guard, making excuses for me and for my behavior. Too much to drink. This really is just a big misunderstanding. We'll go back to our tables immediately if you just... But they ignore their excuses and herd out our entire group toward the aquarium. I was so close. If I had just complied the first time, we could have regrouped and re-evaluated. I was blinded by the proximity. By her nearness. What was I thinking? Trying to fight him off? As we step right in front of the glass aquarium... I realize it's not just an aquarium, but also an elevator. The view from the front door makes it look like a full rectangle filled with water, but from this angle, you can tell it's really just a U-shaped tank of water mounted onto a see-through elevator. It dings, and the door slides open. Even as we are rising up in the elevator, Red and Lala try to reason with the guards making polite conversation about how this is completely unnecessary, and we'd love to just continue our getaway, and we really didn't mean any trouble, but the guards remain stoic and unmoved. I stay silent, staring at the jellyfish, considering how I managed to mess this up so badly. Outside when I was having a nervous breakdown about everything that could go wrong, I didn't consider that my biggest obstacle preventing me from finding Ella would be my own idiocy. I mean, I don't know why I didn't consider it, as it's completely on brand for me. You know, ruining things. Q squeezes my hand and gives me a tight smile. Her eyes still somehow reflect the same optimism she had when she was pumping me up outside, trying to get me to find my nerve so we could get this done. How can she still feel optimistic? We're literally in the custody of a murdering, kidnapping, mega-powerful, and mega-rich crime lord. How could things possibly get any worse? It feels like we've been going up forever, but eventually the elevator stops moving, gives another ding, and the doors slide open. Bright yellow light seeps in, a near-blinding contrast to the dark blues of downstairs and the elevator. We step out, and our collective gasps are audible. If it weren't for the guard's grip on my arm, Shuffling me toward the other end of the space, I would stand here frozen all day in utter shock. The entire ceiling is clear and open, and somehow reveals something I haven't seen for eight years. A blue sky, and what looks to be the actual sun peeking out from behind huge, puffy white clouds. How is this possible? Are we really up that high? Where the downstairs was the deep blues of the underwater world, up here is the pure light of the shore. This space shares the same cushy white furniture scattered about 
and grouped together in various arrangements, white tiled floors and white walls, bright artwork framed on the walls, and white and yellow LEDs instead of the blues from downstairs, to complement the sunlight shining through the clear panels of the ceiling. I stumble as the guard pulls me backward, my neck stretched up, trying to see as much of the sun as I can before whatever comes next. I can't believe this room isn't filled with people. Why would anyone spend time downstairs when this is just a few floors away? I meet Lala's eyes. They are wet with tears. She smiles at me and reaches for my hand. I squeeze her hand and return the smile. I suddenly feel grateful that, no matter what is about to come, I can at least be soaking in this view with a group who appreciates it as much as I do. Wow. Q whispers, tripping slightly next to me, just as clumsy as I am right now. Can you believe this? There's no way it's real, I whisper back, ever the pessimist. Got to be some kind of VR. VR or not, Red interjects. This is a view I sure have missed. I'm still so hypnotized by the way the clouds move ever so gradually that I barely even notice we've stopped moving. A smooth voice behind me brings me back to reality. A woman's voice. Light. And lilting. Almost musical. May I ask what you are doing in my hotel? Chapter 34 My Actual Worst Fears Worse Than I Thought After a brief shuffle, more forceful than I would have preferred, thanks to impatient guards, Q and I are seated next to each other in a spacious office that shares the same see-through sky roof and bright lighting as the lobby. There is a large mahogany desk in the center which takes up most of the office. On the walls behind it are enlarged framed playing cards, hung in a collage, a framed assortment of live freeze, a confirmation that this is who we've been looking for. Vegas. The guards wait outside with Red and Lala. They said there was only room for two, even though we are surrounded on all sides by available seating. I stare at the woman seated across from me in disbelief. Is this woman really Vegas? The Vegas? The card threat sending, foster killing, child abducting, bribe making Vegas? I'm not as surprised that she is a she, necessarily, just that she looks so normal. I guess I just pictured a scar-faced villain hiding in some dark lair filled with cigarette smoke and dripping pipes and prisoners crying nearby. This smiling woman in front of me is probably the last thing I expected. She looks to be in her early 40s, pretty, dark golden skin that deepens next to the shine of her bright white teeth. Long, dark brown hair with sandy highlights, lightly curled, the tips brushing the surface of her mahogany desk. Bangs hover just above long eyelashes, and deep brown analyzing eyes. Her expression remains pleasant, patient. Q speaks up first, wearing her best dazzling smile. I'm so sorry for this whole misunderstanding. She uses her hands for emphasis. We had a little too much to drink and we got lost outside. We had no idea it was restricted. Our deepest apologies. Thank you so much for your hospitality, I add, trying to mirror her tone of politeness and formality. This was all my mistake. I get a little disoriented when I drink too much. You know how tequila can be. I muster up a laugh and Q forces a girlish giggle next to me in solidarity. Vegas chuckles with us, her nose crinkling as she smiles. Her laugh matches the lightness and musical smoothness of her voice, like a song you might hear a Disney princess sing in the middle of the movie. That's why it surprises me when she says sweetly, still smiling. Are we ready to cut the bullshit now? I blink in surprise, my fake laugh morphing into more of a nervous squeak. I make hesitant eye contact with Q. She chews on the inside of her cheek, her brows scrunched in the middle ever so slightly. 
I adjust myself on the seat, the leather whining and creaking under my butt, and rest my elbows on the desk. I soften my face, doing my best to turn on the charm. Look, we really don't mean trouble, so if you can just... She waves a hand, as if swatting a fly out of her way, cutting me off. My mouth snaps shut stupidly. With another wave of her hand and a few taps on her desk, a colorful, holographic display materializes in front of us. It takes me a second to realize it's a video. Security footage. Security footage of us. Huh? Whatever happened to privacy? Even restrooms have cameras now? Gross. But sure enough, you can see everything. At the current point in the video now, Red has the server pinned up against the door, while I stand uselessly behind him, with my arms crossed like I'm observing art or looking at the Grand Canyon. Vegas taps three times on her desk, amplifying the volume of the server telling us where the kids were and my futile attempt at a threat before he scrambles out the door. She taps to pause the video right as it's about to replay from the beginning. Such a shame, Vegas trills, crossing her legs. Robert was my favorite employee. She waves across the surface again, this time like she's soaking in the smell of fresh-baked cookies. Another video plays. A red, blinking light in the upper right-hand corner signifies this is a live feed. It's the server. He is holding a tray under his arm and is walking through a huge industrial kitchen. There are busy workers scattered all over, and they all work almost frantically around each other, looking like they may bump into each other and cause a wreck at any moment. Vegas taps her desk, and the server, Robert, freezes at the exact same time. My insides clench. The busy kitchen staff around him pays him absolutely no mind as he falls to his knees, the tray clanging onto the tiled floor next to him. The silence in this room is palpable, and I can feel the air getting tighter around me as we watch in suspense, hoping this won't end the way it's looking. She taps again, harder, almost like she's banging a gavel or an executioner's axe. Robert falls face first onto the tile, convulsing and seizing like he had in the bathroom before. Wait, stop, I say, unable to watch this man die right before my eyes. My voice comes out as a choke. Please stop. I'll do whatever you want. Q joins my pleas for mercy, but Vegas ignores us. She relaxes back into her chair and crosses her arms over her chest. Her expression looks remorseful, as if she has no control over what's happening right now. Like it isn't because of her that this man is writhing in pain on the kitchen floor. Such a shame. I stand, throwing my hands through the holograph in outrage hoping to spark her to action. Do something! He doesn't deserve to die! How can everyone in that kitchen do nothing? He's literally dying right in front of them. He violated the terms of his sentence, she says simply, watching the video, her full lips in a disappointed pout. And I can't have workers here I don't trust. And as quickly as it began, it's over. Robert stops moving. He just lies there, face down. The serving tray still laying next to him. Another kitchen worker steps over his unmoving body, as if he were just a line of ants on the sidewalk. How could you just kill him? Just like that? I snarl, dropping into my seat rigidly. Her brown eyes flick to me, the corners of her lips curling into a frown, like a look you'd wear when a toddler falls down in front of you. You tell me, Samuel. Don't pretend like you're not the one at fault here. Q gasps next to me. So I didn't just hear her wrong. She said my name. My eyes narrow. If you know who I am, then you know why I'm here. Give me my sister back. Vegas leans forward, resting her elbow on the desk. Her bracelets fall with gravity and stack on top of her buttoned sleeve. Ella is no prisoner here. She's welcome to leave if that's what she wants. I scoff. <laughs> uh-huh, sure. 
Vegas looks amused, tucking a flyaway strand of hair behind her ear. Samuel, my Tyros are not hostages. They're here for education and opportunity. To learn. Develop skills. Liar. Q sees behind me. You kidnapped them. Vegas barks a laugh in derision, clasping her hands on the desk in front of her. Kidnapped them? I freed them, my dear. All of my Tyros were trapped in zones designed to keep them small, to stamp out any excellence. I am simply giving them space to shine. My generosity will pave the way for a better life for them. They're receiving an opportunity thousands of children would kill for. Kill for. My memory flashes to a dingy hospital room, to Dr. Coombs and his demonic procedure. My wrist tab aches in response to the memory. I shudder thinking of the children he mutilated, attempting that very procedure. Yeah, freedom, my ass. I need to get Ella out of here immediately. I don't know what kind of sick operation this woman is running here, and why, and I don't really care. All I know is we need to leave now. I stand, deciding to call her bluff. Well, I'm sure when she sees me, she'll want to leave. Will that be a problem? Vegas stands slowly, smoothing out her fitted gray pinstripe dress. There are tiny little ruffles at the hips, making it look like a feminine suit jacket that's just been welded onto a skirt. She smiles, butterfly lines creasing next to her eyes. Like I said, she replies sweetly. She may leave if that's what she wants. We follow her out of the office and back into the sun-filled lobby. More well-dressed patrons now fill the seating areas and lounge chairs. They all chatter cheerfully as they soak in the bright sunshine. It reminds me of the magazine ad Willie gave us of this place. The same feeling of complete excess. Carefree, rich people whose biggest worry is what their next drink is going to be. As we follow Vegas through the busy lobby, Q and I share a glance as we notice the absence of Red and Lala. Where are our friends? We'd like to leave together, please. Q's voice, though loud and even, gets a little lost in the din of the congregation. Vegas doesn't even look at us over her shoulder. Her stride toward the elevator is calculated and smooth, almost feline. Like she is used to being followed unquestioningly, her sharp heels clacking on the tile. They'll meet you downstairs. There is a tight twinge in my gut. I hope that's not code for, you'll probably never see them again. The elevator ride down to the main level makes me dizzy, as the weight of the day starts to settle onto my shoulders. A few other boisterous guests, reeking of alcohol, crowd in next to us. Vegas makes enthusiastic conversation with them, asking about their stay and their plans for the evening. They gush over the new slot machines and the drink menu, seeming to not even care that they've just left a view of the freaking sky. What's the plan? Q mutters through her teeth next to me. Sister, Red, Lala, run. I whisper back. She nods, chewing on her lower lip. Understanding what I really mean is that there is no plan. I tug on the lapels of my blazer, which feel too tight all of a sudden. The elevator dings, and the rowdy patrons clamber out, giggling and stumbling toward the bar. Well? Vegas smiles, gesturing us toward the back patio exit. The lights of this level and the water of the aquarium give her golden brown skin a blue shadow reminding me of that one movie I watched with my friends a long time ago with all those blue people and the huge tree. I can't remember what it's called. That feels like a lifetime ago. As we walk toward the exit, we scan the room, hoping to catch a glimpse of Lala's long braid or Red's maroon shirt. Nothing. We follow Vegas out of the double doors and out again into the bright daylight of the patio. The children are still playing, as they were before, every single one of them seemingly carefree and cheerful. Vegas's pace doesn't even slow as she steps into the grass, even as her sharp heels sink into the soil. We follow closely. 
The children smile at us as we approach, but don't stop their game of jump rope. Hi, Auntie! They all echo, and then continue with their rhyme. The jump rope hitting the grass every rotation with a snick. How many doctors does it take? One, two... Hello, children, she croons, stroking the hair of a small girl who steps next to her with a beaming smile. We're looking for Ella. Can you point us to where she is? Hearing this woman say her name makes my jaw tighten. The jump stops mid-rotation, and the girl in the middle points breathlessly behind her. I think she's over there by the creek with Katie and Amber. The other children affirm and trade places, a new girl moving to the middle of the rope. Thank you, darlings, Vegas says smoothly. Bye, Auntie! They all call behind as we move in the direction they pointed to. As we pass by crowds of children and listen to every single one of them greet this woman cheerfully, calling her Auntie, giving her hugs and high fives, it makes me want to crawl out of my skin. This woman is a murderer, and the children idolize her. What is really going on here? It makes me feel nauseous. Q's tight-lipped grimace tells me she feels the same. We approach a tiny creek, and I'm impressed with how real it looks. Water scampers across a bed of cobbles and small boulders, creating tiny splashes as it collides with the rocks. As we near, I smell the crispness of the water and feel the coolness on my cheeks. There is a group of kids in the middle of the stream, splashing and looking for rocks and other treasures in the water. My throat tightens when I see her. I freeze mid-step. She's really right there. She is laughing with the other children as a boy next to them holds up a small tadpole, waving it in their faces playfully, cackling as the girls shriek in mock disgust. Ella holds her hand out fearlessly, and the boy sets the tadpole in her hand. She squeals as it wriggles in her hands, but she examines it brightly. I just watch her in disbelief, blinking over and over again, as if it's just a mirage that will fade on the next blink. Her long hair is pulled into a ponytail. She is wearing just a regular kid's outfit, a blue ruffled t-shirt with jeans that are folded up above her knees the tip still dragging in the water. I don't know if I've ever seen her in a regular outfit that wasn't the gray uniform of C9. The blue of her shirt just makes her eyes gleam even more. I try to look for any sign of bruises or cuts or other injuries on her bare arms, but her skin is clear and healthy. My eyes well up with tears as I find my feet again. I race across the grass. Ella! I shout stepping into the creek, not even caring that the water soaks through my boots. Ella! Our eyes meet, and she brightens. She hops through the water toward me excitedly, the water splashing around her as she runs. Sam! The space between us closes, and she's in my arms. I pick her up and spin her around, choking down a sob. Ella, you're okay. I've been so worried about you. She laughs into my neck. Sam, you're crushing me! I don't care. And I punctuate it with a tighter squeeze. I carry her out of the stream and set her down on the grass, kneeling in front of her. I hold her face between my hands, just trying to believe this is real. She giggles, trying to squirm away from my grip. And at the sound of her laughter that I've missed so much, a tear falls down my cheek. I just can't believe it's really you! She wraps her arms around my neck and squeezes tight. I've missed you. I tug on her ponytail in return, wiping the tear from my cheek. I'm so glad you're here too now. She sings when we separate, tugging me up to standing, pulling at me to follow her. Let me show you around. I catch her hand, stopping her in place. I lower my voice acutely aware that Vegas is still standing close behind. Ella, we're not staying here. We have to go. Her smile falls. What? Why? She says, frowning. I like it here. I kneel again so my face is closer to hers. 
This place is dangerous. She is dangerous. Her eyes flick to Vegas behind me, and her brows crease in confusion. Auntie? No, she takes care of us. She loves... Ella. I say, squeezing her hand. You have to trust me. We need to leave. Now. She takes a step back, pulling her hand away. Her eyes cloud with doubt. I stand in surprise, reaching out for her again. Ella, we have to... She takes another step back away from me, and my heart drops. I don't want to leave! She whines. She looks like she might cry. Vegas steps next to her, putting a thin arm around Ella's tiny shoulders. Are you all right, sweetie? Ella nods, but doesn't say anything. Q's presence hovers next to me, but I can't look at her. I can't tear my eyes away from Ella. The way she nuzzles into Vegas' side like she's afraid of me. Vegas rubs her shoulder comfortingly, making my blood boil under my skin. I step forward. I grab Ella's arm and pull her toward me. It's time to go. She protests, trying to yank her arm away from mine. I apologize as I drag her with me toward the casino, trying to reason with her as she struggles and squeals, digging her bare heels into the grass to try to stop me. Sam, stop! She cries. I don't want to go with you. I'm happier here. It's like everything around me blurs. I stop. I barely hear Vegas behind me calling for security, or Q's firm grip on my elbow, urging me to keep moving. All I can hear are those words ringing over and over in my ears. I'm happier here. She pulls her arm free from mine and steps next to Vegas again, half of her body hidden behind her slim frame. It's like my feet bury themselves into the grass. Sam? Q's voice sounds like it's underwater. Sam! She repeats louder. We have to go. She pulls on my arm, but I can't move. Stay! I whisper, shaking myself back to reality, my limbs finally melting back into place. I'll stay. I want to stay. I repeat louder, more confidently. If you don't want to leave, I'll stay with you. Sam? Q repeats quietly through gritted teeth, her hand still gripping my arm. Security is coming. We need to leave. Well, it looks like she wants to stay, Vegas coos, stroking Ella's hair. And it's time for you to go. Vegas stares at me with a look of pity, her chocolate eyes big and her lips pouty, the same exact way she looked at Robert as she watched his death, watching as if she had nothing to do with it and had no way of stopping it. I step forward, my hands balled into fists at my side. I'm not... I'm stopped by a familiar grip, the firm hold of the security guard. No, I protest, hitting and scraping and kicking as he drags me off the lawn. No, Ella, please! Ella stares at me with wide eyes, the bright blues welling up with tears, just watching as the guards take me away. Get your hands off me! Q shouts as another guard drags her along next to me. Ella disappears from view, but the image of her is burned into my eyelids. Every single time I blink, it's there. Her tear-filled eyes, the look of fear when she recoiled at my touch. The children closest to the hotel have begun to clear out, moving back toward the creek where we just were, bringing their toys and sports equipment with them. Q and I look at each other, both noticing that as we near the hotel, the guards' grips loosen ever so slightly as if they were given specific directions to not cause a scene. We share an unspoken countdown and act in a quick motion. I shove my elbow into my guard's bread basket as she stomps on her guard's foot and then lands a swift kick to the balls for good measure. In a flash, we are running through the double doors and into the hotel. The lobby is filled with people now. It's hard to run in a straight line through the room because there are people everywhere. I try to follow closely behind Q, pushing people out of the way if I need to. 
The guards struggle through the crowd of people too, and aren't able to catch up. We pass by the jellyfish, past the ringing and cheering of the slot machines, past the lounge areas, past the bar, and finally through the front doors and onto the narrow street. The sidewalks are fuller now, bustling with people as executives exit from the office buildings that line the street. I speed up so I'm jogging next to Q, throwing a glance over my shoulder to be sure the guards haven't caught up with us. What about Red and Lala? We weave through a passing taxi and turn onto a perpendicular street, cutting through an alleyway and onto another road. They know the meeting point. They'll meet us there. If not, Beardsley and Steele will know what to do. Although we aren't being followed, we keep our pace up, running through alleyways, most of which don't look familiar to me at all. I follow Q's lead, hoping she knows what she's doing. My body falls into the pattern of the thud, thud, thud of my feet meeting the sidewalk over and over again. The streets and buildings and people we pass fade into a blur, the pounding of my heart in my ears. Her face, thud, thud. When Q asked me my worst fear, I had answered that my worst fear was that she was already gone. Never in a million years could I have imagined this possibility. The fear in her eyes, the way she stepped away from me like I was some kind of monster. Thud, thud. The way Vegas patted her shoulder and stroked her hair comfortingly like a mother would. Like our mother would. No, like I would. Like I did. Her whole life. Holding her tightly in my arms as she took her first breaths. Never letting go when they collected us and took us to C9. Rocking her to sleep as a baby. Keeping perfectly still all night so she could sleep. Comforting her through every nightmare as she grew. Wrapping the blanket around her shoulders tightly as she curled into a ball next to me. Squeezing her hand as we watched another penalty on one of our friends or as we watched the seniors' enlistment ceremony, both trying not to think about how that would be me soon with my hand on the flag. Suddenly I feel sick. I slow to a walk as a cramp seizes under my ribcage, and my chest feels like an entire bridge has been constructed on top of it. I struggle to catch my breath, and Q slows to a walk next to me. The houses we pass are beginning to look familiar, as I see some we made deliveries to just a few hours earlier. I revise my answer to Q's question in my mind, my throat tightening when I manage to actually string the words together. My greatest fear is that she won't love me anymore. Are you okay? Q asks, breathlessly, unbuttoning her blazer and peeling it off of her navy blouse. I laugh incredulously. <laughs> Am I okay? Are you serious? I meant physically, she says as we round a corner. But we can talk emotionally too if you want. I don't answer her right away. Not sure what to say. After all, I know there's nothing she can do. She can't erase the image of Ella's wide eyes from my memory. She can't change the fact that she didn't want to leave. But maybe Q can confirm I interpreted it all wrong. Maybe my perception was off. Maybe I'm remembering it incorrectly. That's possible, right? Did you see the way she looked at me? I managed to choke out, trying to swallow the lump rising in my throat. Q looks at me, her brows and lips curved in pity, and that tells me all I need to know. I didn't imagine a single thing. She doesn't answer. I guess I don't blame her. I wouldn't know what to say either. I snort sardonically. You know how horrible of a person I am? I caught myself actually wishing she had been trapped in a dark dungeon, scared and lonely, like I was picturing in my head this whole time. Instead of this. Instead of her being... being so... Happy? Q suggests quietly, and just hearing that word out loud sparks something in me. No. I shake my head deciding this suddenly and giving myself a new resolution. New hope. There's got to be some kind of explanation. There's something wrong here. I know it. Q sighs next to me, looking at me again with that same face of pity. 
Sam. I wave a hand at her, hoping to wave away the pity, the doubt in her eyes. I'm serious. I know my sister. This isn't like her. I try to say it confidently to convince her, but also to convince myself. This isn't like her. There is something wrong. Okay, she says, still sounding unconvinced, but like she's trying to be supportive anyway. When we get back with the group, we'll make a new plan. Strategize. I have to be right. I just have to. My muscles loosen as I shove this reassurance into every crevice of my brain, clogging every pocket of doubt or hurt with the confidence of three resolutions. One, I refuse to believe she doesn't love me anymore. Two, I refuse to believe she would rather be without me. And three, I refuse to believe Vegas when she says these children are free. There's something very wrong going on with these Tyros, and I'm going to find out what it is. Our pace quickens as we near the gate. We zigzag through yards and properties and mailboxes, down the cobblestone of the road, trying our best to stay out of sight as we approach, aware of the guards and the cameras monitoring the exit. It's well before 4 p.m., meaning our guy is still up there on shift, and will help the cameras look the other way as we exit. We duck out from behind the nearest house and wait nervously until we see a gesture from the watchtower waving us through the exit. I breathe a sigh of relief, relieved that Vegas didn't alert the exits yet. I don't know what we would have done if the exits were locked down. Hide in someone's doghouse for the unforeseeable future? We keep close to the brick of the ark, just in case, turning around the corner carefully and out of the zone. Just being out of the zone feels like one of the bricks on my chest has been lifted, Q's right. We can re-evaluate and make a new plan. When we all can put our heads together, we can figure something out. At least now, I know where she is. We walk in a westward direction toward the meeting point, which is around the corner and out of view of the watchtower. Steele and Beardsley will be waiting there with the truck. Ponyboy, Luna, and hopefully Red and Lala. We turn the corner and we both skid to a stop at what waits in front of us. Vegas surrounded by a semicircle of guards, frozen in place but ready, like jaws of a snarling beast, guns pointed to two kneeling figures, Red and Lala. Chapter 35 What Happens When a Panda Escapes a Zoo I step in front of Q instinctively, Stupidly, because she steps around me seconds later anyways. My eyes dart around, looking for the truck. We meet eyes and share a flash of relief that the truck, but more specifically, Ponyboy and Luna, are nowhere near. We step closer, slowly, and I can nearly feel Q's wheels turning a mile a minute, trying to figure out a plan. Her hands curl into fists as we get closer to our friends. Lala's braid has come loose, and her thick, dark hair is a waterfall that shadows her whole face. Red kneels next to her stiffly, looking straight forward, barely blinking, like his life depends on not moving a single centimeter. And maybe it does, I think, as I count nearly double the amount of guns pointed at him than at Lala. So many guns. I take a quick mental picture of all the surroundings, trying to strategize as discreetly as possible, but my head feels cloudy. It's just a little hard to formulate past the buzzing in my ears and the tremble behind my knees. Okay. Focus. There is an open door in the wall behind them, and through it is an alleyway filled with boxes, crates, and supplies. Some kind of service exit. Past the narrow alley is a sidewalk on which various pedestrians meander past, not even knowing what is happening just 100 yards away. Open space behind us and all around us. The only option I can see would be through the door and back into the zone, which is a really crappy option considering it's most definitely a trap, but we could at least find somewhere to hide until... You didn't honestly think we would let you go, just like that? Vegas says, without even looking at us. She examines her cuticles, 
bored. Like she's been waiting here for us all day. But she couldn't possibly have gotten here mere seconds before us. She makes a quick jerk of her head, and a guard marches over to me, grabbing my arm, his fingertips digging hard into the muscle. The guard yanks me across the short distance to where Vegas stands, her hands just folded neatly in front of her like a teacher waiting for her students to finish their tests. I barely even struggle, partly out of exhaustion and partly out of just straight-up fear. The guards, the guns, the tension... It's all bringing me back to that night at C9, my expulsion trial, the time where I thought I was about to die, but then everything else kind of exploded around me instead, literally and symbolically. Yeah, same energy. Vegas is right in front of me now, and I can see more clearly the creases in her makeup, the lines around her lips. I can smell her strong perfume. It smells like a mixture of vanilla amber, and sandalwood. It hurts my head. But that could also be from all the blood thumping in my ears. I try to hide my fear by looking straight into her chocolatey eyes. Her pupils are enlarged, like the blackness is going to envelop the brown completely at any second. They bore into my skin. I try to arrange my expression in my best disinterested face, as if I couldn't care less what she's about to say. Maybe then she won't see my shaking knees. You know, I expected better from you, Samuel. She sings, her full lips curved into a smile, never breaking our eye contact. With how much of a mess you left behind in C9, I expected you to be a little harder to acquire. I thought you would go down with more of a fight, but you came right to me. I stare back stubbornly, but don't answer refusing to play into her games. The guards have shoved Q over to where Lala and Red still kneel. Lala lowers her hands from her head hesitantly in order to reach for Q's hand. I try to meet Red's eyes, hoping for some kind of reassurance that there is a plan here, but his gaze never moves. It's like he's actually frozen completely. Not very reassuring, man. Vegas makes another jerking head motion, and, to my surprise, the guards help them to their feet. She blinks slowly at me, her long lashes nearly brushing her cheeks as she does. She gestures over to the kneeling group. You'll have to forgive the theatrics, she says with a giggle. I have to admit, I'm kind of a sucker for a show, and I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. She wiggles her fingers for effect while making a jazz hands motion. Lala brings Q in close, a shadow still darkening her usual glow. Her brows pulled together tightly. Red finally meets my eyes, and I try to send some kind of telepathic message. There's a plan, right? What's the next move? His expression hardens, and he looks away. Huh? Vegas makes another signal. I mostly just wanted to stage the perfect moment for when you found out. The guards step backwards into the alley and return with heavy-looking boxes. They stack them next to Lala and Red, making three small towers next to them. Q looks back and forth between Vegas and the guards, trying to figure out what is going on too. But Red and Lala don't move. They don't look at me. And it reminds me of my expulsion trial when Ramos refused to look at me, because he was keeping something from me. Q meets my eyes. I see the confusion mirrored in her face, and part of me feels relieved that she's just as lost as I am. So maybe there's an explanation here. But then that changes. Her eyes widen, as if she's suddenly coming to some kind of realization. She tries to step toward me, but Lala keeps her hand held tight locking her in place by her side. Red adjusts his weight ever so slightly toward them. Q shoots daggers back at them. Tell me you didn't! She hisses, ripping her hand away from Lala with a snap. Miha! Lala whispers, trying to reach back for her hand, but Q steps away, sending me a pleading look, but a knowing look. Vegas clicks her tongue next to me, 
putting her hand in mock comfort on my shoulder. Uh-oh, did they not tell you they were here for your bounty? My head snaps to cue, and a part of me hardens, the part of me I have allowed to soften over the last few days after keeping it safely guarded for the past eight years, the part of me that thought I had found a family. She steps toward me again, and this time Lala doesn't stop her. I didn't know... I bark out an incredulous laugh. You're telling me you had absolutely no idea. Her wordless sounds of protest are interrupted by another click of Vegas's tongue. Her hand on my shoulder moves down my arm, where she links her elbow in mine. I barely notice, though her cold touch does send a shiver up my suit jacket. I can't tear my eyes away from Q. The knowledge glowing guiltily in her eyes confirms my statement. Whether this was her plan or not, she knew this was a possibility, and she kept it from me. I'm such an idiot. Oh, Vegas says in her such a shame tone. How awkward of a situation. She squeezes my arm with her long fingers and moves her hands to her hips, a devilish smile playing on her lips. She is soaking in all the drama, living for it. How could you do this? Q says through gritted teeth to the solemn pair next to her. We voted. We decided we weren't going to go after the bounty. Lala reaches for her hand again, trying to get her to calm down while Red answers quietly, as if trying to prevent me from hearing. But his voice carries. He lied to us, Q. About everything. We just found out. If I could feel anything, I probably would feel my heart drop. They know? Q's eyes shift to me, a crease forming between her brows, which deepens when she analyzes my knowing expression. I feel both glued in place and like I'm melting into my boots. How to explain that I promised them a way out of the underground from my mayor father, who not only is not my father, but also likely can't get them out, just so they'd help me find my sister. What are they talking about, Sam? Vegas feigns a gasp next to me, as if this were a thrilling movie she was watching for the first time, and it just took a shocking turn. Did you forget to tell your little girlfriend about all the murders? Really, Sam? You'd think that would be kind of an important tidbit? My head whips to Vegas, and she seems pleased by my reaction and I know in this moment that anything I say will just feed into this show she has orchestrated. It will just fuel the fire. I want to tell her she could have at least come up with a better believable lie. Really? A serial killer? Telling them I was Santa Claus would have been less ridiculous. I look at Q, expecting her to be thinking the same thing. But she's whispering with Lala and there's just the smallest sliver of doubt clouding her face as she processes whatever she's saying. And that tiny sliver is enough to shatter me. She believes it? Even a little? That I could be capable of doing something like this? A part of me wants to defend myself, to question Vegas, to prove my innocence. But everything apart from the cloud of doubt on Q's face fades away in a blur. I barely hear Vegas continue. I barely hear anything at all. I told them all about the mess you left your zone in, Samuel. Her voice is near, but sounds far away, like she's on the other side of a tunnel. About the fight you got into with your best friend Foster, and the next moment he's found dead. I told them about your defiance to authority, your expulsion charges, and how then the sergeant in charge of your hearing also winds up dead. Then you somehow managed to escape your zone, leaving a dead mayor and surgeon in your wake. How bloody coincidental. Did she do something to Ramos? He can't really be... No, I refuse to believe it. She's just trying to get a reaction out of me. But hearing her even mention him, after all she's done, awakens a fury in me. I take a step toward her, ready to strike, tackle, anything. But the guards are quicker and throw me to my knees. A sharp pain shoots up my kneecaps and through my thighs. I wince, spitting out my protest through my teeth. What did you do to Mayor Ramos? I swear, if you hurt him, I'll... Vegas barks out a single laugh, 
adjusting her dress and hair as if I had messed them up by simply speaking to her. You mean your dear old dad. My insides clench as the final pieces of my lies unravel. Quite clever of you, Samuel. Kill the mayor to escape the zone. Evade capture from your bounty hunters. Feed the group lies. Tell them your father could provide a way out so they would provide you with some protection from being caught and punished for your crimes? My body starts to shut down, seeming to know that anything I say will just make me look guilty. Because everything she's saying is halfway true. How do I defend my innocence when I'm not really even innocent at all? And why do I want to? They betrayed me. Traded me in at the first opportunity to the highest bidder. My blood simmers under my skin. Furious that I'm trapped in a corner and furious that I still care what they think of me, even as the money they were given for me sits at their feet. Q's voice from behind me is slow and level. Is this true? The guards allow me to turn my neck in her direction. Like it even matters to you, I hiss. Just take your money and go. She flinches, as if I've slapped her across the face. Lala brings her in close at the waist and urges her to move. To move away from me. She does. They begin picking up the boxes, stacking and balancing them in their hands carefully. How quickly this entire group has turned on me when I would have given my life for any one of them. How quick they were to believe the worst about me for their own gain as if I meant nothing. There is a stinging sensation behind my eyelids, but I blink it away furiously. They are nothing. Ella is all that matters. She is all that has ever mattered. That has not changed. Yes, Vegas purrs, waving them away. Please just go. Samuel and I have more important matters to attend to. She holds out her hand as casually as if she were asking for a pencil from a classmate, and the closest guard sets a black pistol in her palm. In a smooth, familiar motion, she cocks it and holds it at her side, her other hand placed on her hip. I have to say, I've faced death by way of firearm way more times lately than I'd prefer. You promised you would not hurt the boy, Red rumbles behind me, and the fact that his presence feels just a sliver closer brings me comfort. We had a deal. Vegas shrugs. I'm a woman in a man's world, love. You don't get to be where I'm at by playing fair or by playing nice. She lifts the gun from her side and points it at Lala, somehow knowing that if she pointed it at Red, he would not fear for his own life. I'll give you one last chance. Take the money and go. Or I'll kill every single one of you, and I'll give you a hint. I'm not a very patient woman, so you better make it quick. I just have one question. Q's voice behind me is level, and I hate how calm she sounds, and I hate that I care how she sounds at all. Why do you need all those elites you're recruiting at E1? At that, Vegas actually smiles, as if she's been waiting for someone to ask, so she can revel in the dramatics. She lowers the gun and sets it in her other palm. I'll allow it, only because I like you, she says, winking at Q. All my life, no one expected me to really succeed to the degree I wanted. They expected that I would succeed only as much as a woman could, that I was capable of obtaining a level of success, but that I would be required to serve my oppressors in order to get there or else be content with a quiet and submissive life. Dream small, they said. I've been questioned every step of the way in building my empire. She smiles. My competitors tell themselves I got here because I slept my way to the top. I steal a glance at Q. She is chewing her lip, her brows set firmly in some kind of decision. What is she up to? I decide to play along. Instead, you got here through murder and fear. And kidnapping and manipulation, Q adds. How does that make you any better than your oppressors? Vegas laughs, a tinkling sound that echoes off the walls of E2. I'm not here to be a role model, my dear. 
I have no interest in winning the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm here to get what I want by any means. I'm the most powerful person in the underground. But it's not enough. It's not enough until I win. Until every single man in power has to answer to me. My revolutionaries in E1 will help me get there. And the children? Q asks. What do you need with them? Lala tries to urge her to move again, anxious to get away from the impending danger. But Q gives her a quick look. So quick, I almost miss it. Is she stalling? Asking questions just to get Vegas talking to take up time? Does this mean she has a plan? Vegas cocks her head and smiles fondly, thinking of the children. My Tyros, I'm preparing a bright future for them. They will be the rising generation of a new world. I decide to assume Q really is trying to stall and to contribute as much to that as I can. Considering my death is likely at the end of this rope here, it's in my best interest to stall too. So, I say, how do I fit in with all this? Why did you want me? She laughs and gives me an almost piteous look. She steps forward and pats the top of my head pathetically. I shift my weight on my knees awkwardly. Oh, Samuel, you boys always take yourselves so seriously. You were just a loose end, sweetheart. She strokes my hair, curling it around my ear, and I feel uncomfortable with how close she's standing to me. A sibling of one of my Tyros could never be expected to just move on with life quietly, and I can't afford anyone asking questions. Your expulsion trial was supposed to take care of that, but you're a tricky one to get rid of. She taps me on the nose with a boop. The bounty was just a very busy woman solution to a very annoying problem. I nod, appreciating the degree to which she shattered any remaining shred of self-worth I had left, beating down the tiny part of me that had thought, well, at least someone wants me, at least enough to offer a bounty for. But, no, just another person. I mean, nothing too cool. Am I actually mad this murderer didn't want to, like, recruit me or something? Or hold me hostage at the very least? Is my need for validation really that messed up? What is wrong with me? And what about... Vegas lets out a large sigh, cutting off Q's question, using the gun to both silence her and to move a strand of hair out of her own eyes. I think that's enough chitter-chatter. I'm afraid you've now used up all the time you had left. Like I said before, I'm not a very patient person. She points the gun at Lala, then to Q, then to me, then to Red, like she's playing eeny meeny miny mo. Lala and Red protest, promising to leave immediately, apologizing for the questions, thanking her for her generosity. They start to step away, but Vegas makes a signal. In one motion, the guards step into some kind of formation, aiming their weapons at us. One last show, she says, a wicked sparkle in her eye. You decide who goes first. It's my favorite game. Really reveals one's true character. None of us speak or even move. We just look at each other, strenuously, barely daring to move our eyes. No? Vegas clicks her tongue disappointedly. No one even wants to beg to be last. There's always at least one. Silence. Why aren't they offering me up? If they believe I'm some kind of murderer, don't I deserve to die first? Very well, Vegas shrugs, before pointing her gun back to me. I'll start with the pretty one. I sigh, annoyed. I can't be given a sliver of dignity, even in my last moments. Pretty? Really? You too? I eye the open alleyway behind her and decide my chances. With at least three guns pointed at me, what are the odds I'd even make it to the doorway, let alone through the alley? And would Q and the others follow, or would I just be leaving them behind to die? I can't see any other option here. I look at Q and muster up a smile. I try my best to convey through my smile that I forgive her, and I hope she forgives me. She smiles back at me, tears welling up in her eyes. 
I wish I could hold her hand through this. Do for her what she's done for me all day. Encouraged me to be strong and to stay hopeful. I wish I could return the favor. I look back to Vegas. The feeling of peace I had when I looked at Q now completely dissolved. All I feel now, when staring at the woman who took everything I had away from me, is molten, hot hatred. As I imagine all the ways I could make Vegas suffer, I let my eyes close, bracing myself for the end. I try to convince myself that at least Ella believes she's happy. She believes she's safe. She is around friends. The air explodes around me, and I accept my end as it comes. Chapter 36 It Causes a Pandemonium But the air doesn't stop. It whooshes and blasts and billows around me, waves of heat slapping me across the face, sending me reeling onto my back. My ears ring so loudly that I feel like I've gone deaf. I land on something sharp and it sends a dagger of pain up my side. I clamber to my feet and another pain shoots down my thigh, making it hard to stand up straight. I squint through the new smoky fog coating the space around me. Pockets of fire and destruction are in place of what was just the line of guards. An explosion? The line of guards and Vegas have leveled, and I'm unsure of what is bodies or what is rubble from the force of the blast. A hand grabs mine and pulls me through the smoke, and I limp after her without hesitation. Q. She pulls me toward a dim shape. The truck. Beardsley and Steel. A hoot of triumph bubbles in the back of my throat as I see that ugly old truck. Beardsley in the driver's seat gestures to us hurriedly, and our pace quickens. Steel is nearer to the wall, helping Lala and Red get to their feet. As the ringing in my ears lessens, normal sounds start to come through. The fire's crackling, our footsteps crunching on the gravel as we limp our way across, Luna barking madly from inside the truck. Q tries to laugh at the sight of her hopping wildly in the back seat, whacking Ponyboy across the face with her uncontrollable tail, but it comes out more like an overjoyed gurgle. Suddenly, there is a sickening clunk, and Q buckles to the ground next to me. A hand on my shoulder whirls me around and there is a gun touching my forehead, before I can even blink. Vegas's dress is torn in three places, and her face and hands are covered with dirt. Her bangs are separated on her forehead, her hair dirty and disheveled. The calm composure I've seen from her all day has disappeared, and is replaced by a craze. The orange fire is reflecting in her eyes, amplifying the rage there. I stumble backward, tripping over a shriveled up shrub intended for border landscaping around the wall. I wince as I land on the same spot as before, a new shooting pain joining the old one. Q lies on the ground next to me, her face toward me, a calmness on her unconscious face, barely even dirtied by the ground on which she lies. Her hair has fallen out of its neat bun, and her curls spool out around her head and onto the ground. I sigh with relief at the sight of her shoulders moving up and down with breath. I move backwards on my hands, like a crab, away from her and the truck, hoping to draw Vegas away from everyone else. She follows, the gun pointed at me. My heart falls a little bit when I hear the groaning and grinding of the truck refusing to start. Beardsley's curses and pounding on the steering wheel. Luna's barking and whining. Four remaining guards, injured and disheveled but alive, have caught up to Red, Lala, and Steel. And I watch disheartened as they knock them to their knees in a quick motion. To my relief, the guards begin handcuffing them, revealing that they intend to keep them alive. Vegas laughs, taking in her victory, giving signal after signal to the guards, keeping the gun aimed steadily at me. Her hair has flattened and falls at weird angles around her head. It emphasizes the deranged look in her eyes. Did you really think you would be the first person to evade me? She barks out a single laugh. A scrawny, insignificant little boy. I've worked too hard to let any loose ends threaten what I've built. I will stop at nothing to win. You are nothing. 
It's like time goes to half speed, like it did when it was announced I was found guilty and qualified for expulsion. The time stopped, and I separated from myself, observing everything around me in a slow motion almost. I see the guards dragging a thrashing Lala, Red, and Steel through the opening, into the alleyway. I can hear them even as they move out of sight, protesting and fighting with the guards to let them go. I see Vegas pull the trigger, the firing mechanism sparking to life inside its machinery. The bullet leaving the chamber and spiraling toward its target, me. I see a dark blur crossing in front of me, stopping the bullet in its tracks and tackling Vegas, sending her flying off her feet, hitting her head on the ground with a thwack. A millisecond of still and silence, and then screaming behind me. Time jolts back to normal speed, and I drop back into this dimension, sound and sight clashing back together into a deafening explosion. The screaming, pony boy screaming, Luna! I realize in horror that the motionless blur in front of me is not just a blur, it's Luna. I drop to my knees, next to her panting body, her breaths quick and labored. A sob escapes my lips as blood drips on the ground next to her, from the bullet wound that was meant for me. So much blood. Like my mother's blood. Blood that kept pooling and pooling and pooling, until it stopped, and then she was gone. She was just gone. Luna, I beg, get up. Come on, girl, get up! I stroke her face, the hot tears burning my cheeks as they fall, and she stares at me with her black eyes, her tongue out, as always, in her constant smile. If she could speak, I imagine she'd say something funny like, Now we're even, you asshole. She whines a little as her breaths get slower. Hey! I shake her body as her eyes start to close. Hey! You've got to fight, damn it! Luna, you better fight! Beardsley's sudden voice near me startles me into action. We have to go now! He yells, jerking his head toward Vegas, who, despite an obvious head injury, is stirring back to consciousness. He bends down to scoop Q up in his arms and runs her back to the truck, sitting her down quickly but carefully in the front seat, letting her head rest on the middle console. With some effort, I do the same with Luna, scooping her giant body gently over my shoulder. My knees wobble as I stand under her weight, but I will myself to stay balanced. I climb into the back of the truck, holding Luna tightly in my arms, her fur covering me like a blanket. Her breaths are slowing ever still, but haven't stopped. I feel the warmth of her blood soaking through my pants. Ponyboy sobs into his hands next to us trying his best to stay quiet, still obediently secured in his seatbelt. At the steering wheel, Beardsley tries again to start the truck, but it revs and revs unsuccessfully. He pounds the wheel, shouting every curse word at the engine. Beardsley! I cry, pointing to the guards that have returned through the wall opening, marching toward us quickly. Come on, come on! He hisses through gritted teeth. Rev. 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 Vroom. By some miracle, the truck vrooms to life. We hear the shouts of the guards through the open windows, and clouds of dust billow in as we take off, tires squealing as they catch the ground. Within seconds, we are flying through the wasteland before us, farther and farther from E2. I've spent my whole life doubting myself, doubting that I was capable of being Ella's guardian never truly believing I could ever give her enough or be enough for her. Well, I'm going to trust myself now. I am enough for her, and I know there is something wrong here. I just know it. Ella would never push me away like this of her own free will. Vegas is somehow responsible for this. It's here in the back seat, with Pony Boy sniffling next to me, Luna cradled in my arms, that I make another vow just like the one I made on my knees the day my dad left. Except this time, I'm not on my knees. I will never be on my knees again. Vegas is going to pay. This has been Buried, 
The Underground Series Book One. Written by Kennedy Plum. Narrated by Devin Barrington. Copyright 2021 by Kennedy Plum. Production copyright by Kennedy Plum.